The story began at night. A couple of lovers and their dog were standing over a manhole because the girl had dropped her phone there. The guy called his girlfriend to find the phone, and it was under a manhole. When he opened it, he saw that the device was lying in frog eggs. No matter how disgusted I was, I had to get the phone. The guy reached for it and screamed. He pulled out his phone, his face showing surprise and fear. Slimy eggs stuck to his hands in the device. They seemed to be devouring the boy's body. The girl screamed in fright. The caviar began to grow and attach to her hands. Appa called for help, but the girl chased him away and eventually ran away scared. She ran so hard that she tripped over her own foot and fell. When she stood up, she noticed that she had fallen near a river, the banks of which were covered with disgusting eggs. The events moved to the bus, where the young man looked at the time on his phone and waited for arrival in Seoul. It was the first day of the school trip and his first day in the capital. Despite the boring two-hour ride, he was in a good mood because Soyan, a beautiful dark-haired girl, sat where he could see her perfectly. At school, Yan Wu couldn't talk to her properly, so he didn't want to waste any time on the trip and invited So Young to go shopping and eat. Yan Wu blushed heavily when he was called from the front. It was Kim Jubin, a friend of his who was a fan of Oki, who noticed the unhealthy look on his face and offered him some gum. A girl blogger interrupted their conversation. She pulled out a tripod with a phone and told them to wave if they wanted to be featured on her blog. The third grade class of Chang'an School waved in unison for the Hong Kong TV blog. It was a small class, taking up only half the bus. Blogger Hanmi filmed their every move wherever they went. Even the class teacher managed to catch a few words for VTube. The teacher said they would stop at a park to rest. Everyone stood next to Hanmi and took pictures for the blog, but Yeonwoo stayed away. His head was filled with dubious thoughts. He imagined that if he had his own blog and made videos like Hanmi, so Young might talk to him. Kim Jubin interrupted Yan Wu's thoughts. They talked about how blogging is child's play. Jubin talked about his favorite singer's performance, but Yan Wu's attention shifted back to Seo Young. Hon Mi started filming her. She asked him about his impressions of soul, and the guy looked at her with calf like eyes in love. During the monologue, So Young noticed that Yan Wu was looking at her and responded in kind. He was embarrassed and quickly turned away. The girl was approached by other classmates to get into the blog. Yonwu hoped that when they made eye contact, the girl was looking back at him. Kang Ji-hoon, the head of the class and a tall, blonde, handsome man, approached the group. He easily joined the conversation. Yonwu wanted to be able to talk to them in the same way. Hanmi spotted two alienated boys and headed over to them, as the guys hadn't introduced themselves for her blog yet. It was Yonwu's turn. He introduced himself and his excitement was palpable. Hanwi called him cute enough which made him even more embarrassed. During the interview, Yonwu was still distracted by Soyeon. She was called to take a picture. He couldn't take his eyes off the girl. They were interrupted by the class teacher, who suggested that they all take a picture together. Suddenly, ugly pigeons flew at them and the class moved away from them. Only Yonwu noticed that the birds looked rather strange. Blood and what looked like frog eggs were visible from the hatch grate. The pigeon decided to peck at them when suddenly either the hatch or the eggs sucked him in. He fell through the grate. The elder lured the boy's attention. He wanted to know why John Wu was hanging out alone. Another boy, Kang Jihoon's friend, approached them. The headman asked him to do him a favor, and his friend asked if Yan Wu knew what loyalty was. The matter was not so urgent and could wait until the hotel. Even though the conversation with the boys had interested Yonva, he was still thinking about what had happened to the hatch and the pigeon. But he was still thinking about what had happened to the trap door and the pigeon. The class arrived at the hotel. Hanmi also filmed this event for the blog. The teacher went to get the keys, leaving the starosta in charge. The blogger wasted no time in filming everyone in the hall. While everyone was cramming into the frame, talking complete nonsense, Hanmi noticed that Yanwu was sitting alone, carefully looking at something on his phone. The boy was reading the correspondence in the class's group chat. They were discussing a photo they had sent together. Park Seo Young also commented on it. John Wu noticed that the girl had also changed her profile picture. The guy clicked on the photo and admired it when Hanmi appeared out of nowhere behind him. Frightened, Yan Wu was lucky that the sun lit up half of the screen, so his classmate could not quite see whose photo the boy was staring at. However, Hanmi was very inquisitive and asked whose profile Yan Wu was looking at. 
because she was not satisfied with the answer, no one's. The girl attacked the guy's phone like crazy, demanding that he lend it to her for a second. John Vu was lucky. Hanmi was taken away to film her classmates preparing for a talent show. As she left, the girl said she would talk to John Wu. The guy could not find a place for himself. Hanmi is a real insider. If she finds out who it was, the whole blog will know about it. Yan Wu's self-exploration was interrupted by the headman. He had been looking for the boy for a long time and took him to the toilet to talk. When Kang Jihoon arrived, he opened his briefcase. It was completely filled with soju. Yan Wu screamed in surprise. Other classmates appeared from behind the booth and brought drinks as well. A party was planned for tonight. Yan Wu was required to be the carrier of the bag. Even if he is caught, he will still be a hero on this journey. But the guy just turned around and was about to leave when Jihoon offered something that John Wu simply could not refuse. The headman also invited all the girls to the party. And if a guy wanted to get closer to someone, it was a great chance that should not be missed. Mentally, Yan Wu had already given up. Even if So Young was there, he would not participate. The cool Kerwanik returned to the hall. John Wu was sitting with a briefcase full of soju. Nothing bad could happen. The students had to be divided into rooms. Teacher Chung Ang helped them with this. He asked everyone to come to him. Yong Wu could not find a place for himself. He was worried. Jubin came up behind him and scared him. His friend noticed that the guy was nervous. Jubin took the cards out of his pocket. They were forbidden and he could be kicked off the trip for that. But Yon Wu was not an easy man either. He opened his briefcase to show what he was hiding in it. His friend screamed. Yong Wu tried to shut Jubin's mouth, but it was too late. Chung Ang heard them. He asked me to give him the bag to check. There was no turning back. Yon Vu was finished. The boy was talking to the class teacher. There was a soja next to him. Jon Wu said that this was all he had brought. The teacher was furious and said she would talk to his parents when she arrived. A broken Jon Wu returned to the room, imagining how angry his parents would be. There stood the headman and his friend. They immediately attacked the guy, thanking him for saving them. He was a hero to them. Yan Wu noticed more soju in Ji Hoon's briefcase. The headman said they were going to a party with alcohol. He asked where it would be. Ji Hoon said they hadn't decided yet, because the teacher was on patrol. Promising that he would tell everyone about John Wu's actions, they left. Finally, they told him to get some rest. They will call him when they find a suitable place. It was nighttime. John Wu sat on the edge of the bed. There had been no call from Ji Hoon. What was worse was that the place where everyone was gathering, so Yinka could have been there too. John Wu was furious. He had been sneakily framed and used as bait to sneak in alcohol. The next day, the class arrived at Namsan Tower by cable car. Jubin told Yong Wu about the road, but he did not listen to him. The boy felt empty. He looked at Seo Young and wondered if she had been with them yesterday. Yong Wu waited for Ji Hoon, but he kept making excuses. And now he ignored the boy. Yon Wu's anger knew no bounds. Ji Hoon, the shameless bastard, had wanted to use the boy from the very beginning. He didn't understand why he hadn't been called. Did the others not want to see him? Just then, Jubin told the girls in front of him that it was the first time Yon Wu had ever ridden the cable car, that he was scared. The boy's frustration was transferred to Jubin, because one of the girls was Seo Young. However, the girl reacted very nicely. She said she had never been on a cable car before and that it was very cool. Her friend asked Yanwa what happened yesterday. So Young was supportive and asked if it was true that he had been caught with alcohol. The girl was impressed by John Wu's courage. The boy said it was very simple. John Wu was over the moon. It was the first time So Young had ever taken an interest in him. Unfortunately, the conversation was interrupted. It was time to go into the cockpit. He felt that they were very similar. It was time to get closer to Soyeon. John Wu had intentions of talking to the girl. We received a long notification on our phones warning that there was an outbreak of some kind of virus in Seoul. Then a bird crashes into the booth. It was a pigeon that looked quite strange and frightening. It made a hole in the glass with its beak. A second later, other pigeons began to crash in one after another. The booth seemed to be covered in huge layers of white. Danger was approaching. John Wu said it looked like frog eggs he had seen in the manhole, but no one supported him in this hypothesis. One egg leaked through the glass crack and fell to the floor of the booth. Everyone was jostling and panicking. A strong stampede began. Someone stepped on John Wu's foot. He screamed. 
He turned around and saw that it was Soyon. Yanwu was scared and apologized for his leg. So young was very close. She was holding on to John Wu's back with her hand. She was literally breathing down his neck. Suddenly, I heard the class teacher shouting from behind me. She asked me to calm down and stop fighting, otherwise she would be crushed to death. Kang Ming, a friend of the headman, stepped forward. He came closer to the frog egg to take a closer look. When he looked closely, he noticed that the egg was moving. The booth arrived at its destination. The controllers inspected it in shock. It was not a pretty sight. As soon as the door opened, the children ran out one after the other, screaming, despite the warnings of the controllers to go down the stairs carefully. There was chaos in the booth. Everyone was screaming, storming around, and some refused to come out. But Yeonwoo was preoccupied with his own thoughts. He realized that Soyeon was standing behind him. It was time to talk to her, and he didn't know when he would get another chance. Jeonwoo started to apologize for stepping on her foot. Soyeon didn't let him finish, because he had already apologized for it. His mouth seemed to have a life of its own. He was talking nonsense and made a bad joke about a cable car and pigeons. Calling himself an idiot in his head, he gathered himself and mumbled an invitation to Soyeon. The girl did not wait and asked if Yeonwon was trying to tell her something. This question sent him into a panic. Looking into Soyeon's eyes, he gathered his thoughts. The sweet, light expression on her face acted as a calming influence on the boy. He gathered his thoughts and invited Soyeon to go to the observatory with him. But the girl's attention was drawn to someone screaming. It was Gail. She was sitting on the floor. A crowd of people gathered around her, including the class teacher. Her leg was beginning to be covered with frog eggs. They spread like a spider's web on the girl's body. According to the girl, the virus jumped out at her out of nowhere and sprayed her. She screamed and kicked her leg until someone fell down the stairs. It was Minji. She was shaking and could not get up on her own. She gathered a crowd of caring people around her who helped her get up. No one expected to see this when Mingzhi stood up. The faces of his classmates showed great surprise and fear. Her pale, once pure face was now covered with white eggs. Her gaze was strange, like a madness. A supervisor ran up to Gail. He wanted to help her because she was still screaming and shaking just like Minji. The girl grabbed her rescuer and begged for help. Her eyes were full of madness, and her body was becoming more and more covered with white eggs. Mister's hand immediately began to be covered with the virus. The girl was still begging for help. The controller, noticing this, immediately pulled away from the girl and screamed. Both his hands were covered with eggs. He was as scared as she was. In shock, he started running around like a madman. Other workers ran away from him in terror and screaming. His hand was completely covered with the virus. Others, who had not yet managed to leave the booth, watched with horror in their eyes. The classmates decided to close the cubicle as soon as possible to prevent the virus from reaching them. The headman, who had closed the door, held it with all his might. Hanmi asked what was happening because she could hear Gale's screams. The sight made my blood run cold. Gale was lying in a pile of eggs as if a huge spider wanted to completely wrap her in its web. Hanmi was worried about her friend. She wanted to break out of the booth and help her. Jihoon stopped her. The girl was being reckless. He yelled at Hanmi. Didn't she realize that the virus was spreading through her? Gail looked like a monster. Their screams were interrupted by a knock on the glass. It was Gail's hand, or rather the hand of a monster, white as a corpse, covered with white eggs. When everyone returned, they could not believe what they saw. The once sweet girl, Gail, now looked like a zombie. Her skin was unnaturally white, the color of the eggs that covered everything, and her eyes were cloudy and teary. The girl begged for help because it was unbearably painful to endure. The booth was in chaos. Everyone was screaming and shouting. They wanted to escape from this nightmare, but they couldn't. Gail clung to the door and screamed frantically. The voice did not sound like hers. It was the voice of the devil. The events moved to the entrance to the observatory. There, the class teacher and the security guard talked about the booked excursion and the route to it. Suddenly, their conversation was interrupted by a sound like a herd of elephants running by. The teacher turned around in fright. They were students who ran out screaming and screaming. The teacher tried to calm them down and unite them. She was shocked by what was happening. But her attention was interrupted by something else. It was Mingji, lying helplessly under the stairs, shaking. The class teacher rushed to the girl's aid because she was responsible for the children. 
Kneeling down in front of Ming Ji, the teacher wanted to pick up the girl, asking if she could hear her and asking her to stand up. When Ming Ji looked up, the teacher screamed in shock. Her face clearly showed wild fear. The girl could not be recognized. All that could be seen was her mouth, begging for help. She was in great pain. The events moved back to the booth. The frightened students huddled together and sat on the floor. One of them asked to see Min Gale. No one wanted to do it, but still, Kim Jubin turned around and saw a horrible picture. Gale's body seemed to be decomposing and rotting alive. The guy screamed, and chaos and pushing to the other end of the booth began again. After clearing his throat, John Woo realized that he had goosebumps all over his body. The way Gale looked was frightening. The boy's attention shifted to Soyon. She was standing next to him, trembling. Her expression screamed of childlike fear. When they met his eyes, John Woo decided to ask if the girl was okay. But she didn't have time to answer. They received a warning about a dangerous virus on their phones. The report says that a previously unknown virus has been spotted in the Seoul and Gwangwamun areas. Citizens should be cautious. There was complete chaos in these areas. Infected people were falling and lying on the floor. Others were running away. Frightened teenagers read this message and could not understand what was happening and what to do. Again, John Woo said it was because of the frog eggs. But this time they didn't listen to him because they knocked on the glass. When Kang Ji-hoon returned, he could not believe his eyes. He screamed in fright, which scared the others, their faces full of shock. The headman fell down and held on to his classmates who were standing nearby. He was shouting something about her coming. When they returned, they saw Gale standing like a zombie at the entrance to the booth. Everyone screamed. They thought Min Gale was dead. They started calling for her, but she was silent, not raising her head. This picture was driving them crazy. Yon Wu was the closest to the others. The frightened headman hid like a coward at the feet of his classmates and held someone's hand. He told John Wu to ask if Gale was okay. The boy was indignant why he had to go and not someone else. A frightened Soyon stood next to him. He looked at her and felt that he had to protect the girl. She was trembling with fear and seemed completely defenseless. There was no choice. Yon Wu volunteered for Min Gale. He hesitantly asked if she was okay but received no response. Gale stood silently in front of the entrance to the booth. The crowd heard that the zombie girl could hear everything. She just had to ask louder. Gathering his strength, Yon Wu came a little closer and started asking questions, but he was interrupted and not allowed to finish the job. They received another alert on their phones. There was a lot of tension in the booth, and the sound of the alert scared the teenagers. John Wu took out his phone. The message was again about the virus. This time it had spread even more and had caused damage to almost all of Seoul. No matter how hard he tried to pretend to be brave, he was incredibly afraid to approach Min Gale. So he breathed out a sigh of relief when the notification came. But the joy did not last long. When it seemed that things couldn't get any worse, Gale raised her head and they met John Woo's eyes. Her eyes were white, without pupils. There was mascara and eyeliner smeared around her eyes, giving her a creepy look. Her face was covered with ugly white spots. Gale turned to the noise from the stairs. She could hear a group of people running toward the cable car. They seemed to think that they would be safer near it. But unfortunately, when they got to the top, they were met with fear in the face. Three young men stood a meter away from the zombies. Seeing them, Gale opened her mouth and hissed at them. It felt like she was out of touch with reality. This was no longer Min Gale. This was a monster. The company screamed in fright. They did not understand what was happening on the cable car. There were only unanswered questions in their minds. Suddenly, something strange happened to Gale. The stuck egg separated from her body. The girl screamed. It seemed to be very painful. A mass of eggs attacked the company. The sight was simply horrifying. Gale's skin was peeling off as if she was in spring molt. My classmates were shocked by what they saw. They could never have imagined that this would happen. Meanwhile, the white mass sucked on the face of one of the boys, although he tried to defend himself. The virus seemed to suck out the guy's face, and the mass became new skin, firmly growing into the body. A friend from the company approached the victim. He wanted to help, but he was ordered to run away as fast as possible. The guy realized that he wouldn't survive, so he just held this shit up to save the others. He tried to fight to the last, but the more he resisted, the more the virus got a hold of him. 
Gale's hands also reached the boy and clutched his neck tightly. The teenagers became even more frightened as they watched. Despite this, Kim Jubin offered to help the boy. But another classmate was scared to death and didn't like the idea. He was shaking with fear and fell to the floor, covering his ears and closing his eyes. While everyone was panicking and saying goodbye to their lives, John Woo was staring at the door. Surprisingly, he put aside his fear and thought critically, analyzing the situation. The boy realized that it was not Gale. It was a monster, and she was unlikely to wish them well. To protect himself and his friends, Yon Wu knelt down so that the zombie wouldn't see him and locked the door. Now no one could get in. His classmates were surprised by this heroic act, although some of them may not have understood why he did it. Yon Wu realized this and began to explain that it was better to close the door so that the monster would not open it when he was done with the company and wanted to find new victims. Suddenly, a guy, scared to death, was banging on the door. His screams frightened Yonva, who was standing right in front of him on the other side of the door. The guy begged to open the door and let him in. His look was terrifyingly frightening. But the monster was approaching him. The zombie became even bigger. Gale was unrecognizable. The guy started pulling the handle in a panic and praying for John Wu to open the door. It was a matter of life and death. His classmates huddled in a corner, but Yon Wu remained in the city and thought about what decision to make. He realized that others were obeyed by fear. He was the only one who was thinking critically, so John Wu could not endanger others and did not open the door. At that time, the monster got to the boy and bit him on the elbow. There was no chance of escape. John Wu stood in front, blocking his classmates. It was very loud in the booth. It was as if the class was watching a horror movie but it was happening in reality. The poor man's blood splashed across the glass, accompanied by a nasty crushing sound, as if someone wanted to make orange juice. The sight was so disgusting that even the boys turned away and screamed. No one wanted to see it. Meanwhile, the victim was almost completely consumed by the monster. It was the guy's last scream before he died. It looked like quicksand. The poor man was being sucked in by the mass and slowly sank to the bottom. The more resistance there was, the stronger he sank into the mass. John Wu's body was covered in cold sweat. The blood ran cold in his veins. They will never forget what happened. It was a nightmare come true. The most terrifying thing was the monster's face. All that was left of Gale was her beautiful black hair and a neat nose. The zombie monster stood up. There were so many masses on the girl's poor body that she was lying on the floor revealing a view of her bony spine. John Wu looked the monster in the eyes. He could not believe that Gale was no longer with them. Unfortunately, the monster noticed them and screamed, letting them know that they were the next victims. His classmates clung to John Wu as if he were their last hope. He was still blocking the classroom and Soyeon, and she clung to him as well. The monster seemed ready to attack them when his attention was drawn to the sound of the door opening. Other tourists were climbing the stairs. Shocked, they began to scream which attracted the attention of the zombies. The second the monster attacked them, it found more victims. There was silence. The stairs were covered with blood mixed with mucus and eggs. The picture resembled an apocalypse. My classmates were sitting in the corner. For a minute it seemed that everything was over and the monster was gone. Like here, a pigeon on the wall started moving, which attracted the attention of teenagers. The whole class was shaking so much that the whole booth was vibrating. Suddenly, the pigeon screamed loudly. It had been considered dead for a long time, just like Gale. Would the nightmare repeat itself? This thought flashed through John Wu's mind. It made his face look very scared. One of my classmates shouted why this was happening to them, and the headman covered his mouth so that he would not be heard. The class heard a noise coming from the stairs. Was it the monster coming back? They whispered what they would do if the zombie monster came back and the panicking classmate was gagged even harder to keep him quiet. The teenagers were trembling and waiting for the monster to come back for them. The sounds began to fade and move away. It looked like Min Gale had left. The danger seemed to be over. I heard someone whimpering from behind the booth. It was Hanmi. The girl cried because she blamed herself and the whole class. She thought that Gale was dead because of them. They could have saved her. The headman Kung Jihoon immediately yelled at Hanmi. How could she say such a thing? Didn't she see what Gale was doing to the others? He said that if John Wu hadn't closed the door, they would have all died long ago. It seems that they had chosen the wrong headman. Just then, after clearing his throat, 
Kim Jubin noticed something. His attention suddenly shifted to the ceiling of the booth. He grabbed the hatch on top with his hands and tried to open it. Fortunately, the guy's height allowed him to reach the ceiling. The class watched in bewilderment until Jubin fully opened the emergency exit. The guy started to climb out. The headman yelled at him and told him to stop. Jubin didn't understand why he shouldn't get out of the booth. After all, there was no telling what would happen if Gail returned. While she was gone, he had to get out of danger. But the starosta insisted on his point and said that they would not be able to escape from her. Yanwu's attention turned to Soyeon. The girl was shaking, hugging her knees, and her eyes were staring into space. It was clear that she was very scared. Despite this, So Young noticed that Yan Wu was staring at her and put him down. She put the guy to shame. She looked at him and asked if he wanted to tell her something if he was looking at her like that. Of course, this question shocked the guy. Uncertain of her name, he said that he just wanted to know if she was okay. The girl was in a stupor. I could see it in her eyes, which indicated a lack of understanding. Nevertheless, she said that she was fine and asked John Wu to stop staring at her like that. The guy was ready to fall through the ground. He felt so ashamed. After apologizing, he turned away. So Yon didn't see it because she had her head buried in her knees to avoid seeing anyone. By the look on his face, one could tell that it was more frightening for Yon Wu than the Min Gael monster. Yon Wu came back to reality. He heard the headman continue to persuade Kim Jubin not to leave the booth. He said it was too dangerous outside. They should all stay inside the booth. Kang Ji-hoon continued that in order for them all to get out of danger, they just need to wait for the rescuers in the booth. A girl behind him named Hannah looked at her hands. They were trembling. The classmate could tell that something was bothering her. She told the starosta to stop telling everyone what to do, that he had no right to speak at all. Kang Ji-hoon did not expect to hear this. No one had ever spoken to him like that before. It seemed he was no longer cool in the eyes of his classmates. Kana continued. She accused the starosta of cowardice. How much longer could he run and hide? He did not help Gale and instead just ran away. She added that everything that happened was because of him. Jihoon was shocked by these words. The headman could not stand it. He stood up and wanted to attack Kana. She had no right to accuse him like that. It was good that Kim Jubin held him back. But this did not stop Hannah. She continued to accuse Jihoon of preventing her from helping Gale. The headman was not spared. The girl turned on Yanva. She accused him of closing the door when he felt afraid, even though the class had not asked him to do so. She looked and sounded crazy, blaming everyone for the situation. Her eyes were crazy. Kang Jihoon was seriously angry. He was outraged by Hannah's accusations, even though she had done nothing to defend them and had remained silent the entire time. Jubin had a hard time holding the headman. Jihoon shouted loudly at Hannah to stop blaming him for everything, because they had been through it together. Hanmi stood up for her friend. She ordered everyone to stop. But the starosta did not stop. He said that if Hannah was so good, she should leave now. She did nothing but talk. Suddenly, Jihoon fell silent. Everyone stopped talking and stared at Hannah. Soyeon asked if the girl was okay, and then a soft whimper was heard. The starosta was outraged because she started the quarrel, and now she's using her girlish ways to make the guy the offender. Suddenly, everyone screamed. They were frightened by the sound coming from the booth. It turned out that it was just a radio. The voice of a rescuer was coming from it, asking if there was anyone in the booth. The connection was poor, and the radio was broadcasting individual words that barely formed a logical sentence. The still frightened teenagers did not immediately realize what was going on. They stayed away from this monstrous machine. The radio again said that the control room was talking to them, and the connection was cut off. Although the class didn't say a word, their screams gave a sign that there were people in the booth. The cable car began to descend back down. The teenagers exhaled a happy sigh. On the way back, Hanmi was chatting in the class group chat. She asked if everyone was safe, but no one answered her. The girl said out loud that no one was answering. She did not know what to do. Yan Wu looked at So Young again. They were not standing too close. The guy noticed that she started crying too, with her hands over her eyes. So Yun muttered Min Gale's name under her breath and said how sorry she was for her friend. She didn't deserve this. Han Mi noticed her friend's condition and threw her arms around her. So Young asked if the others were okay. Yan Wu was watching the scene. Han Mi assured him that everything would be fine and Yan Wu looked down and wished he had been the one to hug So Young. The starosta, watching this picture, 
asked if they really had time to worry about others, thus putting himself in danger of starting another quarrel. Kang Jihoon continued. He said they didn't even know what was happening downstairs. When they came down, Jihoon would go straight home, but his monologue was interrupted by the sound of the cable car. Everyone looked up. Something bad must have happened. The cable car stopped. The cabin was rocking from side to side from the rather abrupt stop. The teenagers were shocked. They did not understand why the cable car stopped, why it did not continue to descend. Kim Jubin and Yanwu grabbed a radio. They shouted into the receiver that the cable car had stopped halfway, but no one answered. Suddenly I heard a noise from above again. The sound was like a squeak, very sharp and piercing. A miracle happened, because the cable car started moving again and seemed to continue descending. The class's life was shortened by such adventures by ten years. Finally, they saw the building. This meant they were almost at the city. Suddenly, my classmates changed their faces again. As they approached, they could see that the entire building literally consisted of white mass. There was so much of it that it was leaking out of the doors and windows. The teenagers no longer knew or wanted to leave the booth. After all, downstairs, right at the exit of the cable car, monsters were waiting for them, chained to the floor and walls. All the corridors and passages were covered with monster bodies. The fear of approaching was exacerbated by the fact that the white mass on the building began to move. The teenagers had nowhere to run. It was a good thing the booth was closed. One of the lying monsters started to get up. Perhaps the frog eggs were acting as eyes, because it is not clear how the blind monster noticed the cable car in the distance. Yonva was the first to notice the monster. Fear seized his body again and shivers ran down his spine. The monster raised its face and screamed as if greeting new victims. There were no eyes on it, only a huge mouth. Yonwu was thinking of a plan in his head to save themselves. Suddenly, he and the rest of the class were shaken in different directions. The booth and the cable car were rocking from side to side. No one understood what was happening. All the teenagers were thrown to the floor screaming. It felt like they were falling and about to break. And then there was an accident, like something snapped. The booth collided with the wall and broke. Now the teenagers were not safe in it. My classmates were lying unconscious on the floor. Unfortunately, no one could withstand the shock. John Wu was the first to recover. His head was buzzing and cracking. He might have suffered a concussion. He was moaning in pain. The other classmates also recovered, and everyone began to cautiously get up. There seemed to be no injuries, and the entire class survived. Kang Ji-hoon said he felt like he was in hell, adventure after adventure, and his neck was in unbearable pain. Soyeon asked what had just happened. Did they get stuck on the cable car? The girl bruised her arm. When she hit, she was thrown against the wall, and the others fell on top of her. She looked up and was shocked. So Young's eyes grew wide and she looked very surprised. Behind the door, the girl saw a white mass. It seemed to be a zombie monster that wanted to get inside. Unfortunately, the glass broke on impact and the teenagers were in real danger. They had to think of something quickly to save themselves. Soyeon shouted to the others that the monster was approaching and clearly did not want to be friends with them. The teenagers turned and screamed in fright, not having had time to fully recover from the accident. And then the zombie monster's hand slammed against the glass. It was like a horror movie. Yan Wu and Kang Ji Hoon screamed at the top of their lungs. The monster screamed back, and now it wasn't just his arm that was hitting the glass. The whole body of the zombie was trying to get inside. The second arm of the zombie monster found a hole in the glass. The teenager's chances of survival were becoming even less with each passing second. The hole was breaking, and the monster's body was penetrating more and more. A white mass fell from the zombie monster to the floor. It looked like a highly heated marshmallow on a fire falling from a stick. The teenagers reacted immediately and ran to the other end of the booth as fast as they could. At the same time, the monster's body was making its way more and more inside the booth, making a very disgusting sound of mucus. As soon as the zombie monster's head got inside, it fell to the floor. It seems that the frog egg virus was eating away at the bones so the monster's body couldn't hold itself up. The headman, Kang Ji Hoon, broke the glass of the booth with his foot in fear. It seems he wanted to escape from the other side of the cable car, but at that time, something happened that scared Yonva even more. He turned toward the sound and screamed very loudly. The monster's entire body was inside the booth, but as before, its body could not hold itself up. 
and just lay flattened on the floor, making strange zombie noises like in horror movies. The teenagers screamed. Yan Wu was in the front again, shielding them all. Kang Jehun continued to break the glass. The monster started to get up and screamed. It was clear that instead of eyes, it had holes. Its spine was clearly visible from under the white mass that was now its skin. Jihoon shouted at the zombie monster to get out of his way and just take off. The headman was very angry and scared. All his aggression was converted into strength, and with one kick he broke all the glass from the booth, making a passage for escape. The teenagers just fell out in a heap on the ground. Everyone was afraid, and most of all wanted to get out and stay alive. No one wanted to be the last to leave the booth. When one of his classmates turned around, he saw something that scared him. He shouted for everyone to run away immediately. What the boy saw was a monster approaching their exit. Its white tentacles were already visible to the teenagers. Without thinking, the class ran as fast as they could. They only had time to turn back and see if the zombie monster was chasing them. Yan Wu screamed as he saw the zombie get out of the booth and approach them. They were lucky that the zombie was quite slow in movement, so the teenagers ran even faster. Unfortunately, Soyeon tripped on the stairs. She was the last to run. It was good that John Wu noticed this and stopped. He could not leave his beloved helpless in danger. He reached out to Soyeon to grab the girl's hand and help her up. It looked like she had hurt her leg. The girl did not expect such a heroic act from the boy. She was even a little scared at first. Yan Wu noticed that the zombie monster was about to catch up with them, so he quickly tugged on the girl's sleeve to keep running. He shouted for the girl to get up quickly, otherwise they would be caught up and then die. The monster was about to catch up with them, but Soyeon stood up and together, hand in hand, they continued to run. Meanwhile, the rest of the class had already entered the building and were heading down the stairs to the exit. If they could get out of this lair, their chances of survival would be much higher. At a bend, the headman, Kang Jihoon, stopped because he saw something that scared him. It was a corridor completely covered with slime mixed with blood. Other zombie monsters seemed to rise from the slime. Others ran up from behind, but the starosta stopped them. They could not go there to face certain death. They needed a plan. But the monsters had already heard them. Some of them began to rise and scream, making themselves heard. A classmate saw this and screamed. Adrenaline mixed with fear and this violent mixture spread through the body, through the blood. At the same time, So Young and Yan Wu were still running down the stairs from the zombie monster by the hand. The girl was very scared and did not want to let go of the boy. Suddenly, she stopped and swallowed loudly. The girl asked Yan Wu to wait a moment. The boy turned and looked at her in puzzlement. He did not understand what could be so important when it was literally a matter of life and death. But when he looked down, he was very surprised. Yan Wu saw that Soyeon's leg was reddening at the knee. She was moaning in pain and could not continue to run at this pace. He asked if she was okay. When he looked closer, he saw that her knee was not only bruised but bleeding. It looked like Soyeon had hurt herself badly when she fell on the stairs. Jan Wu began to apologize to the girl, thinking it was all his fault. The girl tried to calm him down, because in her opinion, it happened when they were running away from the cable car. She said that John Wu shouldn't have worried. She added that she was very grateful for the guy's help. It was really valuable to her. Of course, the guy blushed at these words, because at the time he was just doing what he thought he had to do. Not thinking about what a hero he was in the eyes of the love of his life, Soyeon. Suddenly, their conversation and rather sweet moment was interrupted by the sound of someone climbing the stairs and a loud scream. It was their classmate. He was running like crazy and shouting to his friends to run away too. Behind him, the headman Kang Jihoon was running. He yelled at the guy in front to shut up or he would kill him on the spot. Yan Wu asked why they were coming back. Jihoon explained that they couldn't get down to the first floor. It was hell. Kim Jubin added that there are also monsters there, and there are a lot of them. The class did not stop and kept running. Their plan had failed, and it looked like they would never get out of the building. They went up to the floor where Janwa was burned with soju. The room looked as if it had just been cleaned. For a second, it seemed that the nightmare was a dream. The teenagers stood cautiously at the entrance to the room. From previous experience, they were afraid to go in right away, so they first carefully examined everything. Everything looked very safe. 
which was actually alarming because on the other floors everything was covered with a white mass of zombie monsters. Was this really a chance for salvation? Meanwhile, the monster that had been chasing them out of the booth was crawling down the stairs. It smelled blood and followed the trail. Like that shark, his appetite became animalistic at the smell of blood. Soon, he would reach the teenagers. In the meantime, the class decided to take a breather in a safe room and think about their next plan of action to save them. Hannah managed to get through to her mom. She cried into the phone and said she didn't know what to do. She couldn't reach her teacher either. Kim Jubin was texting the news on his phone and saying that it was all about monsters on the internet. The head man, Kang Ji Hoon, told him to call 119 because he couldn't get through. Jubin's face changed dramatically, as if some new idea had come to his mind, or he heard something strange. Jubin went to the windows. The head man, Kang Ji Hoon, asked where he was going, but the boy abruptly told him to close the window because chaos had started. Outside the window was a parking lot. The cars were covered with a white mass. Apparently, the drivers inside were also turned into zombie monsters. As Kim Jubin got closer, he saw that some of the drivers were trying to get out of the car, but the white eggs were stuck to them. If they were infected, it meant the end and the drivers would turn into monsters. Meanwhile, Yeon Woo also called his worried mother. He said that he was trapped in the cable car building on the second floor and could not get out. His mother said that she and her father had just left and asked him to be careful, to sit quietly and not to go anywhere. But the boy's attention was drawn to Soyeon's cry of pain. Her friends gathered around her. Han Mi had a small first aid kit with her and tried to provide Soyeon with first aid as much as possible in the apocalypse. John Woo watched what was happening from under his cap. He didn't want the girl to notice that he was watching, but he was nevertheless very worried about So Young. The girl's wound was burning and bleeding badly, but she was holding on. She was pleased that her friends were taking care of her. Suddenly, Yan Wu's lovemaking was interrupted by another classmate, who pushed the boy and asked if he had any change or coins. Ju Ben wanted to use the vending machine, but he didn't have any change on him. The guy asked John Wu if he wanted anything, but he was refused. Ju Ben was shaking violently. It was as if he had a fever. Young Wu noticed his friend's condition and asked if he was okay. He got a hysterical response. The guy felt bad. Not everyone could stay calm in such a dangerous situation. Kim Jubin began to curse the day he came on this school field trip. Now he would have stayed at home and watched the live broadcast, and he wished he hadn't agreed to the adventure with the class. The guy continued to monologue about how bad he felt. However, Yan Wu's thoughts were interrupted by the fact that he really thought he was going to die. But instead, the young man was able to save his beloved Soyan. The thought of saving the girl warmed his soul at this difficult moment, especially the fact that Soyon thanked him for what he had done. Suddenly, the boy's attention shifted to the floor again. It seems that he had noticed something strange and dangerous again. Looking closer, Jonu noticed traces of blood on the floor. It was Soyon's blood, and the drops led directly to the second floor where the teenagers were hiding. John Wu followed these traces and concluded that the girl was grieving. Walking further, he realized that Soyon had been bleeding all the way to the shelter, leaving traces behind her. When he went out into the corridor, he saw a white mass of mucus blocking his way. Looking up, the boy turned pale. He saw something terrible in front of him. What the young man saw was a huge white zombie monster standing a few meters away and breathing right into his face. The guy froze in fear, although he had to act immediately and run away. Time was running out. The situation was critically dangerous. At the same second, the monster abruptly attacked the boy with its ugly white body. Meanwhile, on the second floor, the teenagers screamed in fear. They must have seen what happened to John Wu. Fortunately, the boy managed to dodge the monster. The boy reacted quickly enough. But the zombie monster entered the room where the teenagers were hiding and fell to the floor. Turning his head, John Wu screamed in fear. He probably thought he was going to die. But the monster's ugly appearance up close was no less frightening. Without hesitation, the teenagers began to run away, screaming as fast as they could. The monster got up and ran after them, too. The zombie was slowly and very difficult to get to its feet. Its white, sticky mass stuck to the floor, which constrained its movements. This gave the teenagers a bit of a head start, so they had time to escape and find a new shelter. The zombie monster growled, making itself known. It seemed to say that no matter how well they ran and hid from him, he would still find them. The monster put its tentacles into the guy who was running last. 
It seemed to be Yon Wu. His ugly, angry white paws were about to reach the boy's leg. If he grabbed his leg, he would be in trouble. Meanwhile, Kang Jihoon, the headman, and his friend Kang Min almost ran out of the second floor and looked for a way out. The guys were shouting victoriously because they were about to reach the exit and then they would be safe. Soyeon was the last one to run. However, she noticed something that made her pause. She noticed a zombie monster approaching her. He could smell the girl's blood and therefore, she was a tasty morsel for him. Meanwhile, Yan Wu managed to catch up and even overtake the company. He and Kim Jubin were almost at the exit door. Behind them were the boys Kang Jehoon and Kang Min. They shouted after them to keep the door open. When they got to the exit, the boys attacked Yanva and his friend with their fists, even though they did not have time to close the door. However, Kim Jubin did not stop and ran up the stairs. He seemed to be very scared. When he reached the end, he stopped to catch his breath and rest. Just then, he heard someone cursing at him loudly from behind him. He turned around to see who it was and got scared. Before he could turn around, the class head, Kang Jihoon, jumped on him and began to swear and strangle him. Kim Jubin began to make excuses and beg the headman to listen to him, but he did not stop strangling him. Jihoon was very angry, just furious. Kang Jihoon's face turned red. His eyes were bloodshot with anger. He was ready to kill the coward who wanted to leave his classmates to die. Yan Wu and Kang Min tried to break up the fight. Otherwise, Jihoon would have really just killed the boy. The headman had problems controlling his emotions. Kang Min called out to the boys because he saw something. This stopped the fight for a while and they forgot that they wanted to kill each other. On the floor, they saw the cable car they had come down from earlier. They did not expect to see it because it was on a completely different floor. Kang Ming explained that each floor is connected to an entrance and exit for safe exit in case of emergency. So the teenagers just went around the circle. Meanwhile, out of breath, Hannah came running down the stairs. The boys had forgotten that the girls were with them. They were so engrossed in their fight. The girls scared the starosta with her screams. One could feel that she was about to cry. It was obvious that something terrible had happened. Kang Min asked if she was okay, sensing her condition. But Hannah couldn't say a word, just shook her head. They asked where the other girls were. But Hannah didn't seem to know the answer. The teenagers turned to the stairs to wait for the other girls to arrive. Meanwhile, on the second floor where the classroom was located, there was a deathly silence. Soyan stood breathlessly against the wall and breathed nervously but very quietly, trying to calm down somehow. A monster was standing behind her. He did not see her because she hid behind a wall. She realized that she could die now. At this time, Hanmi was calling out to her friend So Young. She was looking for her all over the floor. Turning her head, she finally found her friend. Hanmi asked if So Young was okay because she had an injured leg. The girls were whispering so that the zombie monster wouldn't hear them. They had to figure out how to escape. The others had already escaped, so they had only themselves to rely on. The girls were a few steps away from the door. If they ran quickly, they had a chance of survival because the monster would find them sooner or later. But Soyeon didn't think so. She wanted to stay there. The girl's wound was bringing down her morale. She was afraid she would not make it. Hanmi agreed with her. They thought the monster couldn't see them, so they just had to hide until it left. Soyeon put her hand over her mouth. She wanted to cry, but she couldn't. The girl's leg kept bleeding and hurt a lot. Meanwhile, the zombie monster just stood there and sniffed out its victims. Meanwhile, the boys were already going down to the second floor to see where the girls were and what had happened to them for not running after them. At first, they saw nothing, so they wondered where So Young and Hun Mi had run to. The headman, Kang Jehoon, asked the others where they were because he could not see them. After all, he was the headman and was worried about his classmates. John Wu was the first to notice the girls. He told the others about it. What he saw shocked him. They could only see So Young hiding behind the wall. But Hanmi must have been with her, even though she was not visible. The girl was still covering her mouth with her hands so that the zombie monster wouldn't hear them. John Wu noticed this and realized what was going on. His face changed dramatically because he saw something that scared him. Yan Wu saw a monster standing right behind the girls. It seemed to have smelled So Young's blood, which he had been chasing for so long. The girl put her hands over her mouth even more tightly. Her eyes widened as if she had seen something very terrible, and so it was. Soyeon saw the monster's reflection in the window in front of her. She hoped that the zombie was not so smart and would not look out the window. 
but her hopes were in vain. The girl only had time to look away when she realized what was going to happen. The monster screamed from the corner of the wall. It sounded like a victory cry, as if the zombie monster was proud to have finally found its victim. The girl was numb. Soyan could not move a finger out of fear, although she had to act immediately because it was a matter of life and death. The monster roared again and wanted to attack and bite the girl. Just then, Yan Wu ran into the room and screamed at the zombie monster, distracting its attention from the girls So Young and Han Mi. The monster stopped and analyzed what was happening. Yan Wu ran screaming to the second floor, making more noise so that the zombie monster could hear and switch to the boy. And the young man succeeded because the monster immediately noticed Yanva. The zombie's attention was quite distracted as it easily switched from one victim to another. So the girls didn't bother him anymore. The monster ran after the boy. Now Yanwu had to figure out where to run to keep himself and his classmates safe. The guy ran as fast as he could, not even having time to turn back. It seems that Yanwu was already regretting his actions, but there was no turning back. He had to run away from the zombie monster. Soyan watched what was happening. She saw her rescuer Yanwu appear on the floor, followed by a zombie monster. The girl could not believe what was happening. She was about to say goodbye to her life when Yonwu appeared out of nowhere and saved her and Hanmi. At this time, the guy was running up the stairs, very professionally avoiding the white slime on the floor. Wu decided to turn back. He was very frightened by what he saw, which gave him the strength to run even faster because dying was not in his plans. The monster was exactly half a floor behind him, but he was steadily catching up. It was not that slow. It was as if the boy's fear fueled it. He managed to turn back. The zombie monster was not as agile, which gave the guy a bit of a head start. When he got upstairs, he finally saw an open door. It was the exit. The boy made a circle and ran to the cable car, but from the other side. He had to quickly figure out how to escape and where to hide from the zombie monster. John Wu decides to close the door behind him. He thought it would stop the monster for a while. The guy looks at the closed door and waits to see what will happen. Yanwu had a little time to recover. He thought that the zombie monster had stopped chasing him. The guy began to quietly descend the stairs at a calm pace, as if he hadn't just been chased by a huge white monster. Going down, the guy was thinking about everything that had happened. He could not believe that he had done such a crazy, reckless thing. When he got to the floor where the girls were hiding, he called out to his classmates and broke into a run. But to his surprise, the room was completely empty and no one responded to the boy. It scared Yonwa. The guy stood there in silence in a stupor, not knowing what to expect and where to go next. He saw a broken pot with some kind of plant and a broken window next to it. When he came closer and looked through the window, he saw something. Outside the window, his classmates were running across the roof of the building. They got out but did not wait for him, not even Soyon, whom he had saved from certain death. He watched the teenagers run away with sadness in his eyes. Did they think that Yonwa had been eaten by a monster and had to run away from it too? My classmates took turns descending from the roof of the building's entrance. It was quite high. Soyon was the last to go down. Probably because of her leg injury, she could not run fast. So she was at the end. She noticed Yonwu in the window. The headman, Kang Jihoon, gave the girl his hand and shouted at her to not be distracted and to come down quickly. It is not clear why they are running away. Then, as if out of nowhere, a zombie monster appeared behind her. It turned out that his classmates were running away from him. How could he catch up with them so quickly? Yonwu watched in silence. He would not have time to catch up with his friends. Is this the end and now it's every man for himself? Finally, he called out to his classmates once more. It seems that Yonwu did not see that they were running away from the monster or thought it was another zombie. But the guy did not give up. He ran to the exit. We had to get out of the building. He ran to the hole in the glass that his classmates had made and stopped abruptly. The boy saw a huge zombie monster that was probably chasing his classmates. It seems that Yanwu will not get out of this trap so easily. He had to come up with a plan of action as soon as possible. He looked at the picture outside with horror and did not understand what to do now. His classmates had left him here alone in this damned trap. There was only one question in his mind that remained unanswered. Why did they leave him? With or without them, John Wu had to get out somehow and save his life. He began to crawl out of the hole in the glass that his classmates had made. But something stopped him. It was something he saw outside. There was no one there. His classmates were gone. 
Yan Wu's face changed dramatically from what he saw outside the window. He cried out in sadness. The guy quickly took out his phone and started typing a message to someone. Yan Wu wrote in the class group chat that he was staying in the building, hoping they would come back for him. He found Kang Min in his contacts. He was often holding his phone and checking the news, so he must have heard Yan Wu's call. But then the phone rang sharply. He thought it was Kang Min. John Wu started talking into the phone, calling for help, but no one answered. Suddenly the phone rang again, which scared the guy. He picked up the phone to check what it was. It turned out that it was another danger warning. It said that Seoul Station and several other places where the teenagers were found were declared emergency zones with a special danger. Suddenly, another notification sound came from the toilet. The already frightened boy screamed in fear. He went to the restroom. He opened the door. There were no monsters and he could breathe a sigh of relief. When he opened the door, he could not believe his eyes. From one of the booths, a rather familiar voice could be heard complaining and hardly crying. It turned out that it was his friend Kim Jubin. He was unable to jump out of the window and was left alone in the building. It seems that the guy was scolding himself for his weakness, because now he will most likely die in a building filled with zombie monks. Young Wu knocked on the booth and called Jubin, which scared his friend who was already preparing to die. But Kim Jubin did not answer. So Yan Wu knocked again and called his friend. Now there were two of them, so it would be easier to get out. In the end, Jubin responded to Yan Wu's words because he finally recognized the boy's voice. The friend opened the door of the stall that served as his hiding place and asked Yan Wu what he was doing here. Jubin could not believe his eyes. He looked at his friend and noticed that he was crying. The guy started mocking Yan Wu, saying he was a loser and crying. After all, real men never cry. In response, Yan Wu started yelling at his friend that he was actually dumped too, and who else was a loser? Jubin retaliated and yelled back at Yan Wu that his friend was a snotty little brat and that he had dumped his classmates because they were in his way. But instead, Yan Wu threw his arms around his friend and said he was glad to see him anyway. Jubin was not prepared for such a display of love, but there was not much time for calf tenderness. They had to get out of the building. Yan Wu went to the door to see if it was clear. He called out to his friend Kim Jubin to come out of the booth and they got out together. Watch how the two friends got out of the building full of zombies in this episode. Jubin did not like this idea. He said it was better to just close the door and stay inside. Young Wu suggested another method, just running away. Jubin insisted that his friend go and lock the door, because hell could happen again. Yan Wu obeyed and went to the exit to check that everything was clear. The guy stopped. Something caught his attention. He looked again at the window and the broken pot. The place where his classmates had run away. A frightened Jubin ran up to Yan Wu. He nervously asked what had happened and how his classmates had escaped. It was strange that Jubin did not know how the teenagers had escaped. Yan Wu said he knew how they escaped. He showed me where his classmates ran. Those moments of the classroom escape ran through his mind again. It was very painful for him. He remembered Soyon's last look, though it was surprisingly quite frightened. She saw him in the window, but did not stop and continued to run away, although he saved her life twice. Meanwhile, Kim Jubin continued to complain about his classmates. He said they had abandoned them, as if they were nothing, and that they could no longer call them friends. They could not even go out through them. The monsters outside began to gather and group together, but Yong Wu interrupted his friend's monologue. He asked why Jubin didn't go with them. Couldn't he duck and now pretend that his classmates left him alone? Kim Jubin began to make excuses that it was not like that and that he was right. It was Yan Wu who was the snotty one, not him. The boys sat silently alone in a corner of the second floor. Jubin interrupted the deathly silence. He asked how long they had to stay in the building in this state. The guy asked if Yan Wu was hungry. It is not clear how long they have been waiting here. Yan Wu said they spent about an hour alone abandoned on the second floor, looking down sadly. It turned out that the guy was looking at his phone. It was making a call to 119, but there was no connection. Jubin was surprised that his friend was still calling security. It was obviously not the first call in an hour. However, Yong Wu reassured his friend that his parents were almost there to help them. But this did not calm Jae Bean down a bit. After all, nothing would change if Yong Wu's parents came. There is no way out of the building. Yan Wu stuck to his opinion because there had to be some other way and continued to search for something on his phone. He received a message from his mother on his phone asking him to watch the news. The situation is really scary, 
and it is better for the boys not to go out and stay in the building. The mom also sent a link to a news video. John Woo opened it and started watching the video. It said that in some areas of Seoul, where cells of an unknown virus appeared, the government declared an extremely dangerous disaster zone situation. The guys were in the epicenter of the events. The reporter went on to say that martial law had been declared for the first time in 40 years. Therefore, roads and facilities close to the epicenter are blocked. This meant that the guys could not get out of here. They are locked in and it is not clear when they will be rescued and if they will be rescued at all. Jubin's mood had noticeably deteriorated. Yong Wu noticed this and asked if he was okay. The boy asked him to be quiet, holding his head. Suddenly the boy heard something. He looked up to see what was happening outside the window. They were fire trucks, several of them. Will they finally be rescued and this nightmare will end? Yong Wu asked Jubin if those were fire trucks. The first thing he thought was that there was a fire in the building. Jubin's mood was pessimistic. He said that firefighters did not come to save them. He added that if he could, he would have set the damn place on fire. But Yon Wu's attention was interrupted by a fire in a neighboring building. It looked like no one was going to save them. The guy got up and went somewhere. When Kim Jubin asked him, he said that he needed a trash can, but his friend still didn't understand why he needed it. Yong Wu said it was a good idea and worth a try, but Jubin didn't understand what his friend was talking about or what the idea was. The guy said they should try to create a fire. Maybe then the firemen would come to save them. Jubin did not like this idea. Although he suggested it, he didn't mean it. Burning alive was not part of his plans. Yon Wu began to carefully examine the room in search of a trash can. Finally, the guy found it and started running to find a lighter and set it on fire. Jubin stood behind him and couldn't believe that his friend Yon Wu really wanted to do that. The guy stuck his hand into a disgusting trash can full of all kinds of scraps and scraps in search of a lighter. Yon Wu even turned on the flashlight on his phone to see everything better and make sure he didn't miss what he was looking for. Jubin didn't stop yelling at his friend. He still didn't believe that Yon Wu wanted to set the place on fire, but he was convinced that if there was a fire, they would definitely come to put it out. Suddenly, Kim Jubin's face changed dramatically and turned pale. It looked like he had seen something he didn't want to see. Meanwhile, John Wu reached into another trash can and, surprisingly, found a lighter. The boy shouted with joy. His life had regained hope for salvation. The only thing left to do was to set fire to the bucket and wait for the firefighters. Yan Wu ran to Kim Jubin to share the good news. On the way, he tried to light a lighter, but it seemed to be out of gas, so it didn't work. As soon as Yang Wu approached his friend, Jubin immediately began to cover his mouth. He looked very scared and nervous cautiously peeking out from behind the wall. Yan Wu did not understand his friend's condition and told him to hurry up and move on. But Jubin interrupted him with a strong swear word. It seems that something happened after all. Kim Jubin saw a zombie monster in the doorway, unable to leave. Had they really been in the same room all this time? Yan Wu also leaned over from behind the wall to see what had shocked and frightened his friend so much. The boy's face immediately changed. When they looked closely, they noticed that the zombie monster was still outside the door, but most likely heading toward them. They needed a new plan to save themselves. The events moved to the Seoul Highway. There was a huge traffic jam because the roads were blocked. The news showed this highway and said that the government was focused on preventing the spread of the virus. Thanks to videos shot by some isolated citizens, the whole of Seoul was drowning in the apocalypse of this virus. Everything was covered with its white cells as if a spider was spreading its web. This was the news that John Wu's mother read on her phone on the way to his house. She screamed out in horror and told her husband that it looked like the situation was much worse than they thought. They drove up to the road and stopped because the highway was blocked. Each car was checked by a checkpoint. The boy's mother began to quickly dial her son Yonwa, but he did not answer the phone. The father said that there might be a problem with the connection, but that was impossible, because their son had picked up the phone before. At this time, Yan Wu's pocket was ringing and vibrating loudly. But the boy could not be distracted because the monster could hear. Luckily, the zombie monster was still standing at the door. The guys had time to come up with a plan. But suddenly, Yan Wu's face changed dramatically. He opened his mouth and wanted to scream, but he held back. Something seemed to scare him.
The zombie monster moved, but it didn't seem to be going after the boys. False alarm. John Wu watched the monster from around the corner for a while longer. In the end, the guy said he didn't think the zombie monster was going to come in. Perhaps if they were quiet, it would go away, and the boys would continue their plan to save the day. Indeed, the zombie monster was standing calmly at the entrance. Kim Jubin began to panic and complain about how scared he was when he saw the monster. It appeared very suddenly. Yan Wu supported him in this, but the boy told his friend Jubin that he thought the monster was getting bigger. Yan Wu went on to say that the white things on his face looked like frog eggs. Then the zombie monster roared. Jubin was very frightened and screamed, hoping that the monster did not hear him. Looking closely, the guy really noticed that the blisters that covered 99% of the monster's body, except for the mouth, looked like frog eggs. It was quite disgusting to look at. Jubin swore and started making sounds like vomiting. Yong Wu asked if his friend was okay. My friend shook it off, but he looked very bad. Was his delicate nature really that affected by the frog eggs? Yong Wu asked again if his friend was okay. Jubin assured him not to worry about him. Jubin pulled himself together, looked his friend straight in the eye, and asked him again if he was going to set fire to the building, that the firefighters had noticed them and saved them. He asked Yong Wu to hurry up and finally do something. The guy looked at the almost empty lighter in his hand and began to think about his and Jubin's rescue plan. Yan Wu looked at his friend, out of breath and scared to death, and asked him if he thought everything would be okay. After all, one wrong move, and they would burn in this room. The events moved to the cable car. Everything there was covered with mucus mixed with frog eggs. Suddenly, from behind the booth, Yan Wu jumped out quietly like a ninja. He landed. He looked around the room in the cable car. He also looked to see if the monster was still standing still. Everything was fine. Time to act now. Meanwhile, Kim Jubin stood guard and watched the zombie monster, although he was afraid to even breathe next to it. The boys met and sat down on the stairs. Yon Wu said he was not sure it was a good idea to start a fire because they could die from breathing in the smoke from the fire. Kim Jubin asked what they should do then. Yon Wu suggested going to the third floor. It looked like the guy had a plan. The plan was to have one entrance and one exit on each floor. The guys were on the second floor. So while one of them is distracting the monster at the entrance, the other one will go upstairs and start a fire on the third floor. Since the cable car was located outside, the sprinkler would not be able to extinguish the fire, and that is why the smoke and fire would only spread. Jubin asked who would go upstairs. He thought Yong Wu's plan was quite reliable, so he had no objections. The boys looked at each other and silently agreed on who would go upstairs to start a fire. Kim Jubin stayed behind to distract the Smoby monster. He was already feeling sorry for Yan Wu and cursing him. After all, his friend would definitely brag to the others that he was the one who climbed up, although it was his idea, so he had to do it. You can't envy Jubin either because he was one-on-one -on -one with a huge, voracious monster. Meanwhile, Yan Wu reached the third floor. The lighter surprisingly worked. The boys were lucky. Suddenly, something distracted the rescuer. He heard some strange sounds. He looked up to see what was going on, but there was nothing to see. Jubin was supposed to take care of it so Yong Wu didn't get distracted anymore. He said to himself that he believed in his friend. He had to believe in him and finish his work. There was only a little more to go and salvation was at hand. John Wu takes a piece of paper from his briefcase and sets it on fire. The next in line was a sack. The boy was getting more and more excited. The fact that he was able to do it gave him confidence, but the joy did not last long. The boy was not allowed to finish the job because a monster suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Yan Wu was setting fire to it when he heard the familiar roar of a zombie monster. The giant climbed out of the roof of the booth. Its mouth was open as if it was preparing to bite. The boy, seeing this, immediately ran away as fast as he could. He didn't understand whether it was the same monster that was on the second floor or a different one, and now there were two of them chasing the boys. The monster jumped out of the booth and growled, which scared the boy and gave him even more strength and motivation to escape. However, Yan Wu could not get far from the zombie monster. The giant was literally breathing down his neck, but he didn't let that stop him and kept running. The giant monster let out its white, ugly tentacles from its mouth to catch up with Yonva. The guy screamed. He did not expect to meet the monster because he was hoping for Kim Jubin. His plan was almost perfect. The young man was holding a piece of paper that he had managed to light. Without hesitation, 
he threw it to the monster right into its vile tentacles. This gave the daredevil a little head start, and he was able to break away from the zombie monster. John Wu was a few steps away from the exit. The boy turned around to see how far he was from the monster, but what happened shocked Yonwa very much. He saw that such a huge and strong zombie monster began to burn. He was afraid of fire. He stopped and watched what would happen next. It was a hope for salvation and at least some minimal safety. The monster burned down completely. It turned out to be flammable, even though it was made of wet frog eggs. John Wu did not move. He stood there in silent amazement looking at the picture. He had just found a way to kill this virus. The guy could not believe what was happening. Almost the entire zombie monster burned down, leaving only the bones behind. John Wu did two things at once. He killed the monster and started the fire. Suddenly, the guy's phone rang. Someone was calling him. It was Kim Jubin. Yan Wu immediately began to brag that he had killed the monster and that it had burned alive. But his friend loudly ordered him to come down. Something must have happened. Jubin said that the zombie monster was gone and he thought the giant had gone upstairs. Then who was burned by Yan Wu. But he wasn't sure he could go back down. He also informed his friend Kim Jubin about this. His friend did not understand why. Yonu explained that when he was lighting the fire, the monster attacked him, but he was able to set it on fire. Everything was so hot that the fire blocked Yonwu's exit. He didn't think about this when he was running away from the monster, but there was no other option. It was either him or him. Yonwu ran to the scene of the fire and once again made sure that he would not be able to pass through. The fire was getting worse, and there was nothing to put it out. The guy asked Jubin what he should do. His friend yelled at him, called him an idiot, and ordered him to go downstairs as quickly as possible, because he had little time left. John Wu heard something behind him and turned around. However, the guy saw nothing. Everything was empty, except for some mucus on the floor, ceiling, and walls. Suddenly, another monster came out from around the corner. It seemed to be the one that Jubin had been following. This monster was huge, twice as big as the one Yan Wu had burned. The guy screamed and hung up the phone. It was time to run away, and quickly. If he didn't know how zombie monsters were made, he would never have guessed that there was a person inside that ugly, faceless giant. Perhaps it was Gale. But there was nowhere to run. There was a fire behind him and a giant monster in front of him that wanted to eat him. There were even more monsters on top. Meanwhile, the fire was getting worse. There was even more smoke. John Wu had to choose which danger was safer at that moment. The guy decides to take off his shirt. It looks like he has a new plan. The monster was getting closer and closer, but Yan Wu was not going to run away. The guy set his hoodie on fire. The monster pounced on Yanva. Its mouth is about to reach the boy. The young man took a swing and threw this Molotov cocktail at the zombie monster with all his might. Now we had to run away. The fire became even worse. It was getting harder for the guy to breathe. The guy wanted to escape so badly that he forgot to throw away his hoodie and kept running with it. The monster's face was tortured. It seemed to melt and melt before our eyes. The guy realized that fire was his weakness, so he needed to burn this nasty zombie monster. While the monster was recovering from the last portion of fire, Yan Wu swung with all his might and threw his burning jacket at the beast. The jacket was caught nearby. A little more and the monster would have caught fire. Shocked, Yan Wu stood in a stupor. He had just exhaled a hopeful breath when, through the wind, his life was once again one step away from death. The monster saw that he was safe and growled at the boy. Now the giant zombie giant had a new goal. He had to take revenge on the boy for setting him on fire. Young Wu covered his face with his hands. He realized that he had nowhere to run, so he would at least save Jubin. So he just closed his eyes and prepared to die. And then, out of nowhere, a lit piece of paper came flying in. It was unrealistic luck. The arsonist flew right into the monster. It had not yet had time to attack the boy, so Yonva was saved. The guy stood up. He should have been dead by now, so he hadn't quite recovered and realized what was going on. That was Kim Jubin. He was running into danger, swearing and throwing burning paper to save his friend. The guy made another attempt and threw another arson at the monster. The boy's eyes were filled with hatred and fear. The adrenaline in his blood was going through the roof and gave him the strength to defend his friend Yonva. And this target hit the monster right in the back. The poor thing growled. It is painful to be burned alive. Yonwu watched in a stupor. He still could not believe that he was alive. 
Kim Jubin recovered his friend. He yelled at him and told him to run away immediately. John Wu did just that. After all, this monster was twice as big as the previous one, so two fires did not deprive it of much power. The boys quickly descended the stairs. The main thing was that the monster did not follow them, and the second floor did not start to burn. The boys ran away screaming as fast as they could. Now they faced two dangers, the monster and the fire, which was getting stronger and stronger. Kim Jubin was the first to run. He was not as brave as his friend, so the adrenaline in his blood prevented him from thinking critically and analyzing the situation. Because of this, the boy did not notice the piece of white slime in front of him. If he stepped on it, he would also turn into a monster and most likely burn in this building. Kim Jubin didn't want to die, so he stopped in front of the mucus. But his coordination was impaired, so he just fell face down the stairs. Yon Wu saw this and ran to help his friend. He promised Jubin his life for his salvation. The guy landed surprisingly on his hands. He didn't seem to hurt anything, but there was another pile of white dangerous virus in front of him. Luckily, Kim Jubin landed right in front of this bunch, so he didn't get infected and won't turn into a big ugly monster that wants to eat everyone. Jubin stood up, but lost his coordination and started to fall. Fortunately, Yong Wu ran up to him and caught his friend. However, Jubin's reaction was not friendly. He pushed the guy's hand away and told him to get off him. John Wu did not understand why his friend was so angry. His eyes burned with rage. Jubin was seriously angry. The guy kept yelling. He was calling Yon Wu a snotty brat who thought he was a hero, but couldn't set fire to the place and was sporting everything. If only Yon Wu had listened to Jubin, all this would not have happened. The guy did not stop. It was as if he wanted to unleash all the anger and fear he had accumulated during the day on his friend. Jubin called Yon Wu a bastard. He added that the guy was a snotty little brat and nothing else. Yon Wu was shocked. He did not expect to hear such things from his friend. He understood that Jubin's words were spoken out of emotion, but he would not tolerate such name calling. It was the last straw. Yon Wu shouted back and elbowed the guy. Now the boy spoke. He yelled back at his friend Jubin. Did he really want to die? Yong Wu asked why he was angry with him, because it wasn't the boy's fault that the monster had attacked them all. Yon Wu added that Jubin was like a scared puppy who could do nothing, because he was so scared and couldn't pull himself together in time. Jubin called him a bastard again. His friend's words had really hurt him, so now he was burning with rage. Jubin did not know how to accept his weaknesses. Jonah's mind was blown. The words just kept pouring out of his mouth, stinging his friend like a bee. He said that Jubin was pathetic because he said that he was the one who abandoned his classmates, when in fact, he was afraid to crouch down and follow them. It was very obvious, but Jubin denied it. The friend called Yonva a snotty little boy and asked him if he thought he hadn't been dumped. The guy started making excuses, saying that he was just a little late, that's all. But Yubin didn't believe him. The boys were about to beat each other up. Then John Wu noticed something that changed his expression. Jubin had already returned. They could not believe what they were seeing. Another monster roared at them from the floor below. It was sucked into a pile of slime that was simply spread out on the floor. The boys screamed at what they saw. They immediately forgot about the quarrel. The most important thing now was to run away and save their lives. The monster attacked them, jumping off the ground like a frog. But at that time, the guys were already running away as fast as they could only having time to turn around and see what was happening behind them. Yon Wu was the last to run, so he managed to close the door behind him. The monster remained outside. After clearing his throat, Yon Wu said they were safe now. It was time to clear the air and figure out a plan of action. The door was closed, so the monster definitely could not get inside to see the boys. Suddenly, the guys' faces changed and they screamed in a chorus. The monster's tentacles began to crawl through the door and attack the boys. The two friends started to run away, but they had nowhere to run. They had to come up with a new plan. Jubin again attacked Yanwa, accusing him of saying that the monster could not pass through a closed door. They came back to see how the monster was doing and saw that more and more of it was crawling inside. This process was quite slow, so the boys had a head start to escape and think of a new rescue plan. John Wu ordered his friend to shut his mouth and run. They needed to get to the other side somehow. The boys froze again in puzzlement. They seemed to see something shocking in front of them. 
Behind the door was a bunch of monsters chained to the ground with white, disgusting slime. They couldn't get out. The guys were trapped. John Wu screamed at the top of his lungs. He did not understand what was happening. What kind of apocalypse was happening in this building? White slime was everywhere outside. The entire building was completely covered with a thick carpet of disgusting slime mixed with dead bodies. Suddenly, something squeaked loudly, which scared the boys. Jubin jumped up and down in fear. The guys turned toward the sound. Something from the wall was making a terrible, piercingly loud sound, like an alarm. It turned out that it was a fire alarm. It looks like the guy's plan was working. Realizing that it was just an alarm, the boys calmed down. The fire truck was coming soon, so they would be rescued, and the boys would forget the story like a bad dream. However, something frightened the boys again, and they turned their heads in the other direction. Young Wu and Juben saw black, thick smoke coming from the third floor. It looked like the fire had spread in earnest. It would be easier for the rescuers to find them, because now the burning building was visible from afar. But John Wu took a lighter out of his pocket. He tried to light it. Jubin yelled at his friend. He didn't understand why Yong Wu needed a lighter. Did he really want to start another fire? The boy said he would try his best to rekindle the fire. He told his friend Jubin to find something that could be easily lit as soon as possible. Meanwhile, the body of the zombie monster was almost completely inside. Only its legs remained outside the door. Time was running out. Yonwu nervously tried to light the lighter, but it wouldn't give in. There were only sparks. He yelled at the lighter to make it work. The young man's heart was beating frantically. He had to act quickly to save his life. Yonwu begged the lighter to produce at least a small flash of light, continuing to nervously light it again and again. Kim Jubin ran up to the boy. He asked if they had time for this and brought a piece of paper that looked like a newspaper. Now Yong Wu and Jubin were shouting and cursing at the lighter together because it didn't want to work. Suddenly, Jubin's face changed dramatically, as if he had seen something very terrible. When Yong Wu saw Jubin's appearance, he turned his head and screamed. His friend began to run away. It turned out that behind the boys, there was a hole in the window from which their classmates had escaped. And another zombie monster was crawling out of the hole and into their classroom. Yong Wu fell on his friend Jubin in fear and screamed. There was nowhere to run. They had to figure out what to do quickly. Meanwhile, the monster was slowly but surely climbing up the wall and climbing out through the window. These monsters never ceased to amaze. John Wu screamed even louder. He could not believe that zombie monsters were capable of such things. Just then, Jubin's victorious shout was heard from behind the boy. He was running and obviously headed for the monster. The fearless friend was holding a pot. Yon Wu could not understand what Jubin was trying to do. He swung, screamed, and threw a pot of plants at the monster. The flower pot flew straight to the target, right in the zombie monster's head. The pot broke, making a loud crashing sound. And under the flattened one was a monster. It looked like it was dead. Jubin and Yon Wu screamed. Yon Wu could not yet analyze what had just happened. And Jubin could not believe that he had killed a monster and was not afraid. Under the pot, there was white mucus mixed with the earth, like blood. The boys could not believe that the zombie monster was really dead. Jubin turned to his friend and began to brag. He said that Yong Wu should take back what he said about him. Jubin no longer looked like a scared puppy who was afraid of his own shadow. Yong Wu said that now was not the time to talk about it and looked nervously at the floor. But Jubin was not deterred by the frightened look on his friend's face. He continued to remind him that he had saved Yong Wu's life twice. He realized that he should just agree with his friend and say that he was cool. Letting Jubin have some fun might have given him the self-confidence he clearly lacked. Just then, Yong Wu's face changed dramatically. His mouth opened wide and his eyes looked like two healthy oranges. Something had clearly shocked the young man. Jubin asked why his friend had stopped talking and stopped praising him. However, the boy did not see that behind him, a zombie monster was rising, covered in earth and with a pot on his head, and it seemed that he was not dead. Yan Wu shouted that Jubin had come back. He was so worried about his friend because the zombie monster was just a step away. When Jubin turned his head, the huge monster had already risen and roared. It seemed to be very angry with the boy's actions and wanted to pay back. Unfortunately, Kim Jubin didn't have time to react and the monster managed to attack before the boys started to run away. 
The giant's tentacles were already flying at poor Jubin. Yonwu fell to the ground behind him. He watched the monster eat his friend and couldn't do anything. The boy was as terrified as Jubin. All Jonwu had was a lighter. He nervously tried to light it. It was a matter of life and death, and the lighter was his last hope. The guy was screaming and swearing at the lighter because it didn't work. He looked at his friend, who was almost completely eaten by the monster. He felt so sorry for his friend. If he set fire to the monster, Jubin would burn as well. But it was worth a try. There was no other way out. Yongwu shouted his friend's name, as if to let him know that he was there trying to save Jubin. He couldn't let him be eaten by the monster. Meanwhile, the zombie monster had already reached the boy's face. Was it really the end? The chances of survival were decreasing every second. The giant was very strong. Jongwu nervously lit the lighter again and again. A little more and the boy started to cry, but he held on for the sake of his friend. He had to save him at any cost. Jubin's face began to turn white. Frog eggs appeared like pimples on his face. The last thing Jubin said were words of help. He looked at his friend and begged for Yonwu to think of something. The guy saw it and screamed. He felt so helpless and guilty for what had happened. In his eyes and cry, you could feel the sadness for his friend. Jubin's body began to merge into one with the zombie monster. He couldn't speak anymore, only mumbled. It seemed to be very painful. Jonwu did not give up and continued to light the lighter. It was supposed to produce a flame. It hit water and stone. Suddenly, the lighter finally produced the long-awaited flame. Hope for rescue returned. Jonwu just had to figure out how to save his friend. But the joy did not last long. The boy heard strange, familiar screams. He looked up and could not believe his eyes. A zombie monster entered the room, which Yongwu had forgotten about while he was busy saving his friend Jubin. But the monster did not forget. All this time, it had been crawling through the door a little bit at a time, and now it was heading for Jonwu to eat him. The boy screamed. He didn't know what to do or who to save. Please support the channel, like, and subscribe for new episode. But Yonwu did not give up and began to react and act quickly. He lit a pot of plants that was lying nearby, hoping that the monster would also catch fire in this way. Fortunately, it did, and the monster caught fire. Yong Wu's chances of saving his friend Jubin increased. Now he had to deal with his monster. The earth monster quickly caught fire. It screamed in pain, its huge mouth finally unhooked from Jubin. Meanwhile, the boy was hanging on the tentacles of the burning zombie monster. It looked like it was starting to stick off a little bit, and it was unknown whether Jubin would be infected. At this time, Yan Wu attacked his zombie monster with screams. The boy yelled at him to get out because he didn't belong here. Yan Wu took a swing at him with a piece of newspaper that Jubin had given him. The monster managed to jump out at the boy. He had to deal with this monster first, and then he would help Jubin not to burn alive. Jan Wu swung again, shouting death wishes to the monster. This gave him confidence in what was happening. The boy ran up to the monster. He was about to make the decisive blow that would set the monster on fire and kill it. With the words, go to hell, Yan Wu attacked the giant. The zombie monster was flying at the boy. Its left side was already a little hot from the fire that was about to reach the giant. But this did not stop the monster. It attacked further. Its big, ugly jaws were about to bite into the poor but brave Yonva. The guy was very surprised. He thought that zombie monsters were afraid of fire. Yonwu expected the giant to get scared and leave the boy behind, but he did not stop. The boy's attempted shot burned the zombie giant. It seems that Yonwu did not want to waste all the fire on this nasty, disgusting monster. The giant's cheek was burned. It was blackened and smelled like fried food. However, it was still more pleasant than what those vile monsters actually smelled like. Yonwu looked at the monster and burned with hatred and rage. It seems that the monster was not burning enough. It needed a bigger fire. The guy took a swing and threw a piece of flower pot foliage on fire at the zombie monster lying on the ground. The giant monster had just opened its ugly mouth. The leaves of the plant were flying right at him. He was about to taste something from hell. But Yonwu himself was frightened by what was happening. The situation was out of control. The zombie monster that was attacking the boy caught fire. Black as its soul, the smoke rose up. It looked like the fire was going to spread. Yonwu did not expect this to happen. 
Meanwhile, his friend Jubin was still lying unconscious near the burning zombie monster. Yanwu immediately thought of him and figured out how to help him. He had to carefully get Jubin away from the flames without getting infected with the white frog egg virus himself. When he looked closer, he saw that Jubin was wounded and covered in frog eggs in places. He was not breathing. Jonwu fell to the floor and screamed. It looked like there was no saving his friend. The guy started to cry. Youngwu looked at this terrible picture and kept apologizing, hoping that Juben heard him and that it would make his death a little easier. Yonwu was hysterical. Tears streamed down from his eyes. He felt so sorry for his friend. He felt so helpless at that moment. Juben had saved his life, but Yonwu could not. The body of his friend was engulfed in flames. No one had ever managed to escape the monster's jaws. Yong Wu sat shaking and looking at Jubin in his last moments. His soul was devastated, but he did not have to be sad for long. Suddenly, behind him, John Wu heard something very loud. Several more giant monsters stuck to the glass where he was sitting. Yong Wu was left completely alone and defeated. He did not know how to cope with such an army alone. The guy got up and started to run away with his back. He looked at this picture and did not believe that things could get any worse. Hadn't John Wu suffered enough? From behind the glass, one of the monsters screamed, making himself known. He saw Yonva and now his goal was to grab the boy and kill him. The guy turned to the side at a strange sound and was terrified. A whole army of huge, ugly zombie monsters was approaching him. He wasn't sure he could handle them alone, but he had to. He had to act quickly and smartly. He had almost no options for escape because two floors were on fire and emitting black smoke and a new batch of monsters was waiting outside. The zombie monsters were approaching the boy. It seems that the previous one had opened the door when he was crawling through it, and other well-wishers came running to hear Yanwu's cries. Meanwhile, the whole of Seoul was covered in white slime and frog eggs. It felt like a spider's lair during the mating season. The events shifted to the bus that took the teenagers on this ill-fated excursion, which turned into hell for everyone. Hanmi sat on one of the seats and greeted everyone. It turned out that the girl had turned on her camera and started her video blog. Hanmi asked how the others were feeling and if they had seen what was happening on the streets of Seoul on the news. She continued that they barely escaped and are now hiding in a bus. There were many of them near the cable car. Kung Jehoon, the headman, came up behind her and yelled at her. He asked why Homi had turned on the live broadcast and asked her to turn it off. The girl replied that she would follow him to the end. Zhang Zhongyi wrote in the live chat. He said he was glad the teens were safe and added that he was worried about them. He added that it was no time for jokes in his neighborhood either. The observer then asked if it was normal that Hanmi was now on the live stream. The girl told him that it was perfectly normal, as she thought there were no monsters around. However, Jihoon shouted out that it was not normal, but did not have time to finish the sentence. Hanmi continued to tell me that it was a normal school trip to Seoul. At first, all the students were in the classroom. Unfortunately, only a small number of them managed to survive. In the back, So Young sat alone. She didn't want to talk to anyone or do a live broadcast with Han Wee. The girl was looking at the floor. Her gaze betrayed that she was heavily burdened with something. Meanwhile, Han Mi was going to tell us something interesting in the chat room. Zhong Zhong's follower said that if you look at the cells, you can see the nucleus. Han Mi was very surprised by this information. She didn't know or even notice it before. The subscriber added that he had seen it on YouTube. He said that the video conveyed the message that we need to be more careful. Another anonymous subscriber asked if the teens were near the Namsan cable car. He added that it was near Seoul Station. Hanmi confirmed this information and asked what he was getting at. The subscriber said that he did not live in Seoul, but the news had just told him to come to a temporary shelter near the affected areas of the station. Zhang confirmed this information and told them to go there. Kang Ji Hoon, the headman, joined the conversation. They could not believe that there was a temporary shelter at Seoul Station. The subscribers added that teenagers should watch the news. Seoul is on lockdown. They thought the class would be able to leave Seoul by train. The teens had to hurry and escape. Three classmates have already gathered around blogger Hong Mi. Kang Min joined them. He was interested in the information that Seoul was blockaded. He didn't understand what they were supposed to do. Hong Mi thanked her friends for the information and said they were the best. 
Kang Jehun added that they needed to go to Seoul Station, and Kang Min found the way to it. It was really close. Suddenly, Ji Hun heard something outside. He felt some kind of danger. He ordered everyone to duck. Chief Kang looked out the window and expected to see the cause of his concern. The teenagers must not forget what was happening around them and that they were not safe anywhere. And then a monster appeared in the window. He was very thin, with a thin neck and a hump. On his head was something strange, like a bird, or rather a pigeon. Hearing the sounds on the bus, the zombie monster turned to see if there were any new victims for him. Up close, he looked even worse. His skin was covered in feathers mixed with white frog eggs and slime. The monster screamed and hissed. He stopped and waited to make sure no one was on the bus. The teenagers quickly all hid under their chairs and sat quietly, waiting for the monster to calm down and leave. However, it seemed that the monster was not going to leave. He could smell their fear and scent, but he was not smart enough to enter the bus and verify his hunch. He just stood there and growled, instilling fear in the potential victims. The headman, Kang Jehun, sat next to Honmi. The girl put her hands over her mouth to keep from making a sound. Jihoon was angry and cursed at the zombie monster for not leaving. Suddenly, an innocent cat walked by the nasty soulless monster. The giant reacted sharply to him and returned. It seems that the monster has found a new victim. The cat turned to the zombie's growl. He was not afraid of it because he did not know what it was capable of. However, the monster made its victory cry, which meant that the zombie had spotted a new victim and intended to kill and eat it. The poor animal felt the danger and started running. Cats are very fast creatures, so he will most likely be able to escape from the zombie monster. The giant chased him. The monster's attention quickly switched from one victim to another. The teenagers were saved this time. The teenagers breathed a sigh of relief. The danger was over. Finally, they could open their mouths and express the fear that had been in their veins for five minutes. Kang Min said he looked at a map and found out that Seoul Station is 1.4 kilometers away. That's about a 30-minute walk. Jehoon said it was too dangerous to walk outside, so they needed another plan. Just then, a woman's voice came from the back seat and called out Yeonwoo's name. It was Soyeon. It turned out that she was still thinking and remembering the boy. She asked what they were going to do with him, because he was left there alone. She added that Jeonwoo had stayed there to wait for them. So Young felt a storm of emotions inside. She felt very sorry for the boy and also blamed herself for not being able to save him. The faces of his classmates were shocked. They no longer remembered the boy. Everyone was thinking about something else. However, the girl continued to speak and added that she had seen Yonwa when they were running away, and that he was on the second floor. The last thing the girl said in her monologue was that she was sure that Yonwu was waiting for them, and that she could help him even now. Chief Kang Jihoon remained silent and thought about the girl's words. It was clear that he was angry that Seo Young was so worried about some sucker named Yeonwu. Perhaps Kang Jihoon also felt something for the girl. In the end, the guy said that Seo Young could try to go there by herself if she wanted to. He said this on purpose, so that she would be scared and not do it. It seems that Yeonwu had displeased Jihoon with something, and that's why he was pointing knives at him. To make it worse, he added that she should think twice because the situation was not good and just stood up. He never even looked at the girl. All the other classmates watched the situation and could not believe that Kang Ji-hoon could be so ruthless. The starosta added that they were going to the Seoul train station. He put himself in charge and told them to trust him. It's a pity he didn't act like he was in charge when they were all rescued by Yeon Wu on the cable car. Kang Ji-hoon said that he sympathized with Yeon Wu, but it was too late to go back there. It was suicide. These words did not feel sincere. He said them so that his classmates wouldn't realize how selfish he really was. The last thing he said was that So Yeon should have realized it was too late. In such a place, Yeon Wu could not survive. With this phrase, Kang Ji Hoon wanted to demotivate Seo Young and everyone else who felt sorry for Yeon Wu. Meanwhile, everything in Yeon Wu was on fire. The fire broke out in earnest because everything in the cable car building was covered with a white sticky slime virus. As here, fortunately, the fire detectors worked and turned on the water. This should have dampened the flames a bit. Yeonwoo was holding on to the wall because he could no longer stand on his own and orient himself in space. He was feeling very bad. 
There was more and more black smoke. John Wu was choking and barely breathing. He had to live. The fire department was about to arrive and save him. On the floor of the building were the corpses of hideous zombie monsters. Everything was on fire. The room was almost invisible because of the black smoke. Unfortunately, the guy did not make it. He held on to the last, but there was too much smoke and Yon Wu fainted and fell to the ground. If someone did not save him immediately, he would suffocate and burn alive. For a second, the guy woke up and came to his senses. His body was struggling. He didn't want to give up. Not today. Drops of water from the ceiling fell on him. He was not fully aware of what was happening around him. He seemed to be fainting again. Suddenly, from somewhere across the room, I heard the familiar scream of a zombie monster. Now it was a scream of pain. The big, ugly monster was burning alive. Yon Wu had defeated him, but at what cost? The boy stretched to stand up and defend himself. He probably thought that the monster was not yet defeated. Then he noticed something very strange on his hand. He lowered it to take a closer look. The guy thought he was hallucinating. It couldn't be possible. Yon Wu put his hand right to his face to assure himself that he was imagining it and that it was all the effects of breathing black smoke. But unfortunately, no. There were frog eggs on the boy's hand. He did not understand how he could have contracted this virus because Yon Wu was very careful and cautious with monsters. It seemed to be the end. No one survived the frog egg virus infection. John Wu realized that it was the end. He would die before he could turn into a bloodthirsty, disgusting, miserable monster and not feel the pain of transformation. He looked at his hand and fainted. At this time, the virus on his arm was growing more and more. The process was irreversible. The infection entered his body and spread through his blood and skin. The boy was lying helplessly on the floor of the burning building, inhaling the harmful black smoke. His whole life flashed before his eyes. He caught himself thinking that he had lived very little. His body will most likely not even be recognized, because by then it will have turned into a virus and become overgrown with white frog eggs, so he will not be buried. A miserable death. Now, the whole building was burning with bright flames. Everyone who was there and turned into monsters would die. They won't be remembered, won't be written about in the newspapers, because these people will not be found and recognized. Unconscious, John Wu was lying on the floor when he suddenly heard some sounds that made him regain consciousness, how he wanted to live. He opened his eyes because the sound seemed quite familiar and expected. It turned out that they were fire trucks. They came to extinguish the fire, but it was unknown whether they would find a semi-conscious Yanva. And the guy was already infected with the virus. If only they had arrived a few minutes earlier. Meanwhile, the events moved to the bus stop where the teenagers were hiding. Headmaster Kang Jehoon emerged from behind one of the vehicles. It seems that the class decided to flee to Seoul Station despite the danger on the street. The boy was looking around the area so that the teenagers could get there safely and avoid monsters. It was clear in front of them. Chief Kang Jihoon looked the other way. He did not want any unexpected trouble in the form of zombie monsters attacking from around the corner. On the other hand, everything was also clean. The previously lively and crowded capital was now so empty and gray. It was completely saturated with fear and pain. After checking that everything was clear, Kang Jihoon ran to another bus and hid behind it. He approached the front door of the vehicle. It looked like he had a plan. Finally, Kang Jihoon began to fulfill his role as headman, instead of hiding behind the girls' backs. He opened the door handle, probably wanting to get inside, but the cautious boy did not check whether there was anyone in the unknown bus. Suddenly, the starosta shouted to someone, opening the car door. It turned out that he was addressing his classmates, who were hiding behind their bus and waiting for instructions from the miraculous starosta in charge. He told them to hurry up because the door was unlocked. And the class, like soldiers, moved on command and ran to the bus, which was to serve as a new shelter and safe place. As soon as the teenagers ran inside, the headman, Kang Ji-hoon, pounced on them with questions. He asked a rhetorical question about whether Hannah could run faster. The girl was lagging behind everyone else. She was not yet on the bus. Kang Jihoon was looking for the key and asked if his classmates had seen him. They started looking for the bus keys together. Hanmi asked the elder if he was sure he could drive the whole bus. Kang Jihoon 
replied that he had 120 hours of driving experience in the game, so he was confident in his abilities and skills. Meanwhile, a very out of breath, Hannah came running. She looked at the floor and barely ran inside the bus. Her classmates were alarmed to see her in such a state. Kana's legs and arms were shaking violently, like those of an elderly woman. She was breathing heavily and could not say a word. Her friend Hanmi ran up to the girl. She was worried about her classmate and asked if she was okay. Suddenly, Hannah started screaming a lot. She said she couldn't take it anymore. She had a hard time finding the words. She added that she wanted to stay here because she couldn't run anymore. Hanmi told her friend to calm down. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon joined their conversation. He told Hannah to think twice. Did she really want to give up? Hanmi was shocked by her classmate's words. The headman added that he was sick of Hannah and her antics. The girl's face changed dramatically. She did not expect to hear this from the man who had taken responsibility for the class. Kang Ji-hoon's face was very serious. There was not an ounce of pity in it. His words were like knives. The last thing he said was that they couldn't stay here and that whining alone wouldn't help. Hanmi stood up for her friend. She criticized the words of the headman, Kang Ji-hoon, and said that he could have said it differently. But her classmate did not hear her and did not want to accept his guilt. Xiao Yong was watching the scene. Hanmi said that Ji-hoon wasn't being an asshole. The headman replied that he was just doing and saying what he had to do and the girl should leave him alone because he was the boss. So Young was about to say something. She was outraged by the headman's behavior, and she began to see how callous and cruel their classmate, Ji-hun, was. But instead of words of reconciliation, she could only let out a cry of pain. Her face twisted. Something had happened to the girl. It turned out that it was her knee. It was aching terribly, and the wound was still not healed and bleeding. Kang Min came up behind her. He saw that the girl was worried about her injured leg and asked how she was doing. The classmate was sincerely worried about his friend. So Young turned her head and was a little surprised. Never before had her classmate Kang Min been so attentive and caring. He told her to sit down because she didn't look good. Before it was Yong Wu who was so attentive to her. The girl fussed. She replied briefly that she didn't want to sit down because she was fine. So Young didn't want to show any weakness, because she didn't know if they would attack her and leave her alone, like they did with Yan Wu and Kim Jubin. Kang Min remained silent. In turn, Seo Young asked what the boy was doing. He was doing something inside the bus. Min answered with a question. He asked if So Young knew what the thing was that he had just taken out of the bus and was holding in his hands. He added that he had noticed it recently. Every bus had one of these things. Kang Min held out his hand to hand this mysterious thing to So Young. The girl was in a stupor. She understood what it was, but she didn't expect such signs of attention from a guy who had been completely indifferent to her before. It was a red little emergency hammer. It could break glass in case of danger without harming the owner. Kang Min continued and said that such things should be collected. After all, no one knows when they will be useful, perhaps on a cable car. The guy was talking and smiling at the girl. He really liked her. He was a little nervous. It was noticeable. The last thing he said was that he would give the hammer to Soyeon. If they were attacked by monsters, she would be able to break the glass and save herself. The girl was even more embarrassed, even blushing a little. She was pleased with the signs of attention. It was a pity that Soyoung did not see the care in Yeonwoo's actions or did not want to notice it. Their sweet moment was interrupted by the headman, Kang Ji-hoon. He shouted that he hadn't found anything, so he couldn't start the bus. He added that there was no time to waste and ordered everyone to follow him. The starosta behaved like a real dictator. He never even looked at his friends. His true face was beginning to show. Kang Ji-hoon ran first between the next two buses. The cars were parked in the middle of the Seoul Road, which was blocked. After examining the area again, the boy ran on. He did not look back at his friends and did not give them signs to follow him. Jehoon was on his own. There was an inconspicuous shop with a bus stop between the two buses that the boy had just run between. And Kang Jehoon didn't even notice it or pay attention. In the reflection of that shop, a figure could be seen watching the teenagers run. She was an elderly woman. She looked silently at her classmates. Her face was not the most pleasant. The last bus was in front of the class. I had to act as cautiously as possible because there was nothing left to hide behind. 
Kang Ming asked what to do if they didn't find the keys on the last bus. The headman, Kang Jihoon, commanded that they would walk to the Seoul train station. The teenagers had already walked some of the way. Kang Jihoon looked out from behind the bus, saw that the area was clear, and commanded them to run now. The first to run was the self-elected leader, Kang Jihoon. He shouted for the others to keep up and run after him. Most likely, this was addressed more to Hannah, who was a problem in their team. Kang Jihoon saw a target in front of him, the door. He ran toward it and did not look back. The boy started pulling the handle to get inside the bus and fulfill his plan. He had to prove to everyone that he could save his classmates. Suddenly, from behind him, he heard an old, unfamiliar voice shouting at him not to open the bus. The fearless leader, Kang Jihoon, was scared to death and screamed as he turned toward the sound of the voice. In front of him, inside the bus, the boy saw a monster. This also scared him, because the door handle was about to open. The monster growled at Kang Jihoon, making itself known. His scream frightened the starosta so much that he dropped the mat and began to fall to the ground, covering his face with his hands. Kang Min stood with the rest of the teenagers behind the previous bus and shouted to his friend to run away immediately. Everyone was terrified. Suddenly, an old woman who had been watching what was happening came out of the shop and shouted for the teenagers to run to her. My classmates were shocked. They didn't expect anyone else to be there but them. The teenagers were not going to run away and just stood there. The old lady noticed her classmates' concern and called out to them again, telling them to hurry up because the monster could get out of the bus or the noise would call other zombies. The woman was very worried and anxious, and she called the children for the third time. The old woman began to order them to run away immediately, but this scared the teenagers even more. Some unknown elderly woman shouted and ordered them to run to her. The faces of their classmates showed distrust. Suddenly, a seemingly crazy old lady shouted that the bus was full of monsters. The teenagers had to run away from it immediately. This proof was decisive, and the classmates jumped up and ran as fast as they could to the old woman. Now she didn't seem so crazy. The headman, Kang Jihoon, also managed to escape. And all the teenagers ran into the store falling down in front of the entrance. It seems that the bus full of monsters scared them a lot. The children's hearts were pounding so hard that even the woman could hear it. The teenagers slammed the door behind them. Some of them fell to the floor, and everyone was laughing together. Hanmi said that her heart was jumping out of her chest. She was running so hard. Suddenly, someone called out to the teenagers. It was not an old woman's voice because it sounded young and painfully familiar. So Yon recognized him and turned to have her words confirmed. She could not believe her ears and eyes. Two other teenagers ran up to the girl. They seemed to be their classmates. The girls could not believe that Soyeon was alive. They were very happy to see her again. Meanwhile, Yonwu was not doing as well as the rest of his classmates. The guy was in a dark room alone. He wondered if he had died and gone to hell. According to the boy, hell looked like this. Suddenly, the young man heard something. He still felt very unsafe and listened to every rustle. He did not understand where he was or how he got there. The last thing he remembered was that he was lying on the floor in a burning building. It turned out that it was a huge, ugly zombie monster with three legs, similar to the one that killed his friend Jubin. The boy was holding a burning flower pot trunk. He swung it at the monster. The fire was to save Yonva. The guy took a swing at the zombie monster and was about to strike. Suddenly, someone's disgusting hand, covered in frog eggs and mucus, cold as a dead hand, touched Jonwu. This course of events scared the guy a lot. He did not expect to see what he saw. The owner of the arm spoke to Jonwu. He asked why the guy didn't help him, even though the stranger had asked him to. It turned out that it was his friend Kim Jubin. The guy's mouth was covered with frog eggs, his voice was very nasty, piercing to the bone. It gave me goosebumps. Jubin said that he begged for help, but Yonwu did not help. The guy was very scared. He didn't expect to see his friend here, but Jubin didn't look like his friend. It was like he was some kind of demon in front of him. Still, Yonwu began to nervously apologize to his friend. The boy took his hand away from Kim Jubin's infected paws, but Yonwu's hand had already become covered with blisters from the frog's paws. The boy recalled that his hand was already infected before he died. But Yon Wu was still afraid and screamed. His eyes widened. 
He did not understand why his friend Kim Jubin had done this to him. The guy looked at his hand. It was increasingly covered with frog egg blisters. Jubin noticed this and told Yong Wu not to worry. Jubin's mouth was being eaten away by the frog egg virus. His lips were almost invisible, and almost all of his gums were exposed. His friend told him that Yong Wu should become like him. Kim Jubin's gaze was glassy, making him look crazy. Yong Wu's friend added that then they could be friends again, like before. Meanwhile, the frog egg virus blisters were getting bigger. These words made John Wu's blood run cold. The boy's face changed dramatically. Those were the words of a madman. He turned to look at his friend Kim Jubin. Suddenly, the guy screamed loudly. He jumped out of bed. John Wu could not understand where he was and what was happening. He felt as if he was waking up the morning after a night out at the club. He shook it off as if he had just run a marathon. It seems that it was just a nightmare and nothing really happened. He looked around to see what was in front of him to figure out where he was. The last thing he remembered was the fire, the floor, and the Namsan cable car building. In front of him, John Wu saw a few more beds, white walls, lots of folders, and wardrobes. The boy still had a hard time understanding and analyzing. Just then, John Wu noticed something. He felt a sharp pain in his arm, as if his consciousness had only just come back and his senses had returned. The guy looked at his right hand. It was all wrapped and bandaged. Only three fingers were visible. The pain in his hand began to grow worse. He was interrupted by two adults who entered the room. Both had masks on their faces. One of them, wearing a yellow shirt, seemed to be a doctor. The adults were talking about a manager named Lim, who was supposed to come. Up close, I could see that the other one was an officer. He was asked to take care of this manager tomorrow. They didn't realize that Yonwu was already awake and waiting for an explanation. Like here, the officer told the doctor to take a look at the ward. Surprisingly, the doctor was quite surprised. Did he really not expect Yonwu to regain consciousness so quickly? Or maybe the doctor didn't expect him to wake up at all, but Yonwu was as surprised as the doctor when he saw him. As if nothing had happened, the doctor asked how the patient's arm was and congratulated him on the fact that the guy had regained consciousness. Jean Wu was silent. He was in a stupor. The man in the yellow shirt told him to make himself at home. But he had to fill out some paperwork. And then one of their employees had to show Jean Wu a tour of the facility where the boy was being held. But the young man was still not analyzing the information very quickly. So he just stared open-mouthed and silent at the two men who had probably come to visit him. He was given a pen and paper. John Wu started filling them out. It seems that the boy was left-handed because he held the pen skillfully. It was strange that his right hand was infected. In a way, Yon Wu was lucky. The officer controlled the boy. Yon Wu asked him where to write his address, and the uniformed man told him to just write his contact information. Yon Wu politely followed the orders of the adults without asking any questions. The officer was very surprised by this. It seems that other patients were not so polite and immediately attacked the workers with a lot of questions. But Yon Wu just silently followed all the orders. Perhaps he just hadn't fully recovered yet. The man in uniform could not stand it and started talking to John Wu. He said that the boy was lucky. The young man remained silent, digesting the information the officer said. So the officer continued. He said it was really hard to survive now. He added that in Namsan, where the cable car was, there is a fire station, and his friend who worked there found the guy unconscious. In fact, he saved Yonwa. However, the boy was not surprised at all. He just nodded to the officer and continued writing. The man in uniform stalled. Wasn't Jonah curious about how he was saved? He had been one step away from death, and now he showed no reaction or words of gratitude for being saved. But Yonwa's answer struck him. He asked what kind of city it was. His face looked so calm that it was scary at times. The officer's face changed dramatically. He was very surprised by Yon Wu's question. Did the boy not remember how he almost died? Instead, the officer took him on a tour of the room. It looked like a big gym with high walls and lots of windows, so it was bright. Surprisingly, there were quite a few people in the building. The officer said that it used to be a gym for local residents but they received an official letter from the Disaster Relief Headquarters. 
The man in uniform continued that they were ordered to make this place a quarantine zone for survivors and to serve as an emergency shelter. He clarified that everyone who was rescued in the area was here. Meanwhile, a man came up to a group of people and shook his hand and asked how the company was doing. He and his colleagues were wearing yellow shirts. A young man from that company asked the employee if all the roads were really blocked, asked what time it was, and whether there was any point in blocking the roads. Yonwu was watching. He and the officer were still standing there watching the scene. Just then, Yonwu heard one of the patients asking if he could go back to Bundanga. He also wanted to return to Seoul, so he asked the officer about it. Yonwu asked strange questions, as if he didn't remember what was happening in Seoul. The officer was a little confused by this question, but he put it down to the fact that the guy hadn't fully recovered yet. Perhaps he had partially lost his memory due to shock. The human body often erases memories that cause pain. The man in uniform told the boy that Seoul was now completely closed to prevent the virus from spreading to other regions. It was clear from Yan Wu's reaction that he was genuinely surprised by what he heard. He quickly started looking in his pockets for something, even though he was wearing someone else's clothes. He didn't seem to remember that either. He just said that it was bad that the capital was blocked. In the end, Yan Wu found nothing and told the officer that he needed to call his parents. He asked if the uniformed man knew where his phone was, which he could not find in his pockets. The officer quickly ran to the door and said that John Wu needed to wait, and that a man would find his things and bring them to him. John Wu stayed waiting a little worried. Everyone was acting very strangely around him. He couldn't remember what happened, why the roads of Seoul were blocked, and why the officer ran away so scared. Suddenly, the guy's arm became very sore, making itself felt. The pain was sharp. It felt like something was cut out of it, some part of it. John Wu held it up to his face to examine it. He still didn't understand what had happened to it and why it was twisted and hurting. The guy looked at his arm for a minute and tried to remember. He felt that he was about to remember, because the pain seemed to bring his consciousness back. Suddenly, he began to remember. His memories began to appear in his mind from the end, starting with the most recent ones. He remembered hearing a fire siren. I remembered that I was lying on the floor of a burning building. He wondered who had set it on fire. He remembered that he was waiting for a group of rescuers. But in his mind, he was preparing for death. So he miraculously survived and has to thank this officer friend for saving him and taking him out of the flames. Finally, the guy recalled that his hand was covered with white blisters, as if he had been stung by nettles or several nettles so the size of the blisters was too large. However, the guy could not remember what exactly happened to his arm and why he was lying on the floor of the burning building alone. He could not remember anyone else inside. He still stood motionless like a statue and looked at his wounded arm, trying to remember what happened on that fateful day. Suddenly, someone called him by name, interrupting his session of digging through the memory gaps, which scared him quite a bit. It seems that his body was still tense due to stress or fear. John Wu turned toward the sound and his face changed dramatically. He could not believe his eyes. It was some guy. He was smiling broadly and asking John Wu where the others were and why he was alone. Please support the channel, like and subscribe for new episode. Two of his classmates noticed his condition and realized everything. Their faces also changed dramatically, but they were waiting for John Wu's comments. He held his head and screamed. His body began to tremble. He was about to cry. Yonwu began to blame his death on the zombie monsters that his friends had fled from in the burning cable car building. The events moved to the school's classroom. The teacher stood in the center of the classroom and told them what she thought about their group flow. She told the children to conduct the experiment in pairs. And then she would check everything after work. The children were indignant. They did not like this idea from the teacher. The class teacher said that if they didn't like it, she could replace the experiment with an English test. John Wu sat in the back and listened silently to what the teacher was saying. Unlike the other children, he did not resent it at all. All the teenagers got up and sat down at their desks when the teacher left the classroom. They were discussing who would do the experiment with whom and just talking about their own business. Suddenly, a single camera guy came up behind him he started talking to Yonwu about the experiment. He seemed to want to be paired with him. It turned out that it was Kim Jubin, his friend. He said that the experiment the class teacher had given them was easy, 
and added that school sucked. Jubin checked his phone and asked what ideas Yan Wu had. If there were none, then the boy would be in charge of their pair. Yan Wu said that he had no ideas and would like to hear what his classmate had to say. He also added that if Kim Jubin watched another animated movie, he would kill him. To which Jubin smiled and called Yan Wu a snot. It seems that this name was given to him by his class. Kim Jubin said he had a brilliant idea. He was saying something about a cosplay event in Seoul. The guy kept looking at his phone, which may be why Jubin had poor eyesight and wore glasses. Yong Wu called his friend a sick bastard. Jubin was amused, as was his friend. He asked who Yan Wu was going to work with then, and the guy told him that he wasn't going to work with anyone. He planned to do nothing. The scene shifted back to the frog egg storage facility. Yan Wu sat with his head bowed. One of his classmates asked if the rest of the class had left him and Kim Jubin there. They were outraged by what John Wu had told them. Another classmate echoed the question and added that they had acted like real bastards. Yan Wu recalled the picture of the rest of the class running out of the room and fleeing by jumping off the roof. It was the last time he saw them. The guy did not answer, was silent, and thought about his own. Anger gripped his body and mind. He also remembered Soyeon. She had seen him in the window of the building. Didn't the girl say anything to her classmate and not want to go back for him? He couldn't be angry with her. His feelings of sympathy took over, but he was still very disappointed in this girl. Classmates began to ridicule the rest of the class that had left Kim Jubin and Lee Yong Wu in the cable car building. They humiliated them in every possible way, hoping that it would cheer the boy up at least a little. After all, he had lost his best friend. It seems that these classmates had a warm feeling for the young man. Somewhere inside, Yan Wu was pleased, but he was not in the mood for that right now. He was even a little bit amused by the whole situation. He kept his head down, looking at the floor. It turned out that it was the same classmates who had used Soju on him. It was Park Min and Han Song Yu. They were being very nice to him now. This amused Yan Wu. He decided not to trust these guys, but he didn't want to show it. Parkman was looking at something on his phone the whole time. He said he was going to teach those bastards a lesson. Han Xiong Yun supported his friend, but unfortunately, there was no connection to write on Kakako talk. Meanwhile, John Wu had managed to tell his classmates how he had survived that hell. Isuri was sitting at the back and was also listening to John Wu's story. She asked if he was sure about what he was saying. She asked if it was true that Kang Min had dumped him. For some reason, she did not mention the names of the other classmates who were also there on the cable car. The girl still didn't look up. Just then, two friends interrupted the conversation. Park Min attacked Isuri for insinuating that Yan Wu was cheating. Han Xiong Yun supported his friend and added that it was disgusting that bookworms were protecting each other. He told the girl to go study for her exams, since all she ever did was read books. Isuri did not react in any way to the provocations of her classmates. She just apologized and added that she didn't know they were young. She didn't change her posture or even look up. Park Min was furious. No one could be rude to him. He was the authority in the school. He snapped at Isuri and told her to watch her mouth. It sounded like a threat. John Wu interrupted their quarrel. He said they didn't know about something. He spoke to the floor without looking up. The boys were surprised at John Wu's sincerity. It seemed that the story of how he was saved was about to begin. John Wu continued without looking up. He said they did not know how everyone else died. They didn't know anything, and they were small. He paused and added that they did not know how and at what cost Yan Wu had survived. It seems that the guy himself could not believe that it was not a nightmare, and he really fought zombie monsters saw his friends die, and almost did not burn in a fire. The two boys stood silently and looked at Yonwa. They didn't understand what he was getting at, and probably didn't really want to know about his adventures on the Namsan cable car. John Wu sensed this and did not continue the conversation. He didn't want to trust the boys to set him up again. Instead, he asked what had happened to the boys, and if they had met any monsters. He raised his head at this point. His eyes looked quite alert at this point. Yan Wu was no longer just a teenager. After everything he had been through in the past few days, Parkman's face hardly changed. He was very calm and cunning. Yan Wu remembered that face. 
It was exactly how he had spoken to him when he had set him up with the soju. The guy had briefly said that he was just lucky. He added that it wasn't the first time he had been in trouble, as if this was an argument for Park Min's survival under strange circumstances. The guy put his hand on Yun Wu's shoulder and asked him something to quickly change the conversation. He hugged his classmate, just like he did with Soja on the cable car. John Wu looked at his hand. He didn't like it. Park Min continued to ask. He wanted to know who else was on the cable car besides those bastards. He did not have time to finish his question. He just looked into Yan Wu's eyes for a few seconds, and the boy answered him in kind. There was a short pause. Eventually, the boy stood up and Park Min said it didn't matter. Yan Wu realized that this trick was a distraction. His classmate's face was just as sly again. But the boy decided to play along and ask Park Min why he stopped. His classmate replied that it didn't matter anymore. And he added that he had been through a lot too, and it was hard for him. But at the same time, he had a smile on his face. While hugging Yan Wu, Park Min noticed that the boy's arm was rewound. He decided to ask his classmate what had happened to him. He still had a smile on his face. He threw Yonwa off his game a bit with this question. The boy mumbled that it was a burn. Min supported him and said that he should have been more careful. Suddenly, the friend said that Yonwu's parents would be upset if they knew. He also asked if the boy had called them. John Wu was stunned to realize that he hadn't really called his parents yet. He became animated and told Park Min that he really hadn't called his parents yet. But the officer never brought his phone back. So Yan Wu asked to borrow a classmate's phone. The first thing he did was call his mom. He walked away from the company. This fake conversation was already in the middle of his throat. His mother immediately picked up the phone. She seemed to be waiting for his call and did not let go of the phone. She asked him excitedly if it was John Wu, even though she recognized him from the first seconds, but she wanted to be sure. There was a lot of noise in the background. The rescuers in protective suits were telling Yan Wu's father that if he didn't move away, they would have to use force. It seems that the parents wanted to go to the Namsan cable car. The mother nervously repeated her son's name twice, thinking that he couldn't hear because of the noise outside. She also wanted the father to hear and come to listen to his son. John Wu said he had lost his phone somewhere and that it was his friend's number. As soon as the boy's mother heard her son's voice, she immediately cried. The father came over and began to calm her down. The mother was constantly apologizing to John Wu. She continued that when the highway near Seoul was closed, they left the car and walked to Young Jae Dong. But because the virus was spreading too fast, many areas of Seoul were blocked off. So my parents couldn't get into the city. And when there was no connection, her mother didn't sleep at all because of her worries and stress. That's why she burst into tears when she heard her son's voice. This conversation calmed her down a bit. John Wu's father was also worried. He asked the boy if he was okay and got a positive answer. But the boy could not tell them about his arm. He did not fully understand what was under the bandage. The events moved to the first aid post. The room was not designed for a first aid post, but we had to come up with something for the apocalypse. The doctor sat in front of John Wu and said that tissue necrosis had begun. He said it as if it was something bad. He was indignant that the burn was only on his arm, even though it was a third-degree burn. A doctor in a blue coat and mask asked Yonva more questions. He was interested in how exactly the fire started in the cable car building. It was all quite strange. John Wu was in no hurry to answer. First, he had to think over his words to make the lie sound believable. He didn't want to say that he started the fire, even if it was to save his life. Setting fire to a building was heavily punished. John Wu decided to change the subject and leave the doctor's question rhetorical. He asked if his arm was okay, because the doctor's diagnosis was not clear to him. The doctor sensed the patient's somewhat anxious mood and said reassuringly that his arm would be fine and it would be over in a day or two. They had treated such burns before. The doctor added that everything would soon get better and that John Wu should not worry. I felt that the doctor was talking not only about his arm, but about the situation in the country in general. It is not clear who he wanted to reassure. He finally said that all the trouble was over and John Wu could relax. He was in a quarantine zone. Outside the window, he could see a big pile of fire trucks and rescuers. Yan Wu thought about the doctor's words that it was safe here. 
and that he should not worry or be concerned, because there were many soldiers in the room, and they were not in danger. The doctor began to complain to Yonwu in a worried manner. He said that the news said that there were many people who had sought shelter here, but there were many of John Wu's friends. He criticized that the government was calling on citizens to die, adding that they were behaving like rats. Suddenly the doctor came to his senses and realized that he had said too much. He apologized to Yon Wu, saying that it was all just a joke and offered to end the conversation. As Yon Wu was leaving, the doctor told him to hold on anyway. He added that the patient would soon return home, and it was safe here. The doctor told Yon Wu once again not to worry, but the boy had already realized that the whole speech was not addressed to him, but to the doctor himself. He came out, bowed, and the nurses in blue coats called for the next patient. John Wu walked down the hall and looked at his hand. He looked at it for an indecently long time. If someone saw him, they would think something was wrong. He looked at her and thought that he had survived. He still could not believe it. His hand was a memento and a constant reminder of the nightmare he had experienced. Yon Wu thought about how he had risked his life but managed to survive. But suddenly his thoughts turned from heroic to anger and even rage. He asked himself the same question all the time. Why did his classmates do this to him? He didn't care about the others, but she did. John Wu was thinking about So Young. He knew that the girl had understood him correctly, but she hadn't helped the boy. He could have died. The young man survived not because of her, but in spite of her. The events moved back to the cafe where the rest of the class was hiding. At the table were Kang Min, Seo Young, and two new classmates who had recently joined. Even though the company was talking about something, the girl was absorbed in her thoughts. Kang Min and Kim Min Ju were discussing the path on the map to Seoul Station. The boy found the way between Myeong Dong Station and the train station. Meanwhile, Soyeon sat on her phone and thought. She didn't even blink. It turned out that she was looking at a locked phone. Its screen was so black that even the girl's reflection was visible. Soyeon looked like a zombie from an American movie. Meanwhile, the events are returning to the hideout again. Yonwoo was returning from the doctor's office to the hall where the crowd was gathered. He was watched by Asuri, who noticed that he was staring at his hand and was very interested in why. Please support the channel, like, and subscribe for new episode. Suddenly, the events moved to an apartment. There were traces of a zombie monster on the window, and no one was visible inside the room. Things were in their places, as if people had just been going about their business when they had to flee. The family hugged each other as if it were the last time. The mother clutched her son tightly to her chest so that she could not hear him crying so much. It seems that the family was hiding from the monster, but they failed and said goodbye, spending the last moments of their lives in love. Outside the window, they could see a whole army of zombie monsters. They were crawling either upstairs or into their apartment. The situation was tense. Even the flower pots seemed to be afraid and trembling with fear. The boy opened his eyes to see what was happening or to check that he was still alive. His eyes were filled with mucus. Suddenly, my mother opened her eyes in fright. She must have seen or heard something outside the window that shocked her. The monster outside the window opened its mouth and looked directly at the family, as if imagining how it would eat them. And immediately, the giant, hideous, giant zombie roared, letting them know that it had found its new victims. The events moved to a live news broadcast. A man in a suit was about to give his comments and warnings about the situation in Korea. He introduced himself as the President of the Republic of Korea. He said that at the time of filming, the capital of South Korea, Seoul, was facing the most serious surprise in the history of emergencies. After all, a virus unknown to the population had dealt a colossal blow to the country. However, the state is mobilizing all available and possible forces and resources to support isolationist events. They are also confident that after three weeks of quarantine, the cleanup of Seoul will be complete. The screen showed videos of special people burning all the monsters and their slime in the city. Among them could be infected people who have not yet had time to transform. It turned out that a classmate was watching the whole thing in a cafe. The president also added that this is all for the safety of citizens and the country as a whole. 
He went on to say that the infected areas are categorized by impact level from 1 to 4, with 4 being the highest degree of infection. The government also took care of unfounded rumors that frightened citizens and created additional panic in the country. Meanwhile, my classmate began typing something quickly on the keyboard of her laptop. The president sincerely called on all the listeners to cooperate. It turned out that the same table with the teenagers was watching the news, and the whole cafe was watching along with them. The live broadcast went on to say that she asked citizens who were in the danger zones to refrain from risky, rash actions that would have consequences. The president's last words were that he recommended that everyone who was at the epicenter of the events go to the nearest shelter. Meanwhile, Hannah listened to the news and could hardly stop herself from falling asleep. Over the next few days, the teenagers did not manage to sleep. Suddenly, the woman who let the teenagers in, who turned out to be the owner of the cafe, was carrying a drink to someone and told him to drink it. She scolded a man and put a can of Coke on his table. The woman asked him how long he was going to behave like this. The man simply thanked her for the drink. The cafe owner noticed that she was being stared at and turned to the perpetrators. She turned to the teenagers and asked if they wanted anything. The classmates were silent in a stupor. They did not expect the woman to talk to them. She brought the teenagers different sodas. They thanked her and started drinking quickly. The classmates had hardly eaten anything in those few days. The woman allowed the other teenagers who were not sitting at the table to take something from the refrigerator with drinks. The class was happy about this and sincerely thanked the kind woman. Suddenly, the cafe owner asked if the children were on a school trip. They answered yes and the woman asked where the rest of the class was. But the owner did not wait for an answer, and commented on the words of some old man, saying that he was talking nonsense again. She commented on her visitors further, saying that a man was talking loudly and emotionally on the phone, that he was always talking only about problems with his girlfriend. It turned out that he was a bus driver. The owner of the cafe left the teenagers to scold the man with the phone to be quieter. The woman was kind, but a little grumpy. Meanwhile, Kong Ming shared with his classmates that he had installed a mobile app that reported emergencies. He added that the program showed that the area where the teenagers were located was in the second of the four levels of danger that the president had talked about on the news. Only Kong Min and Kim Min Ju were really included in the conversation. The girl asked where the third and fourth levels of danger were. Soyeon stared at the wall with a glassy gaze, floating somewhere in the clouds. Suddenly. Her classmates who were sitting at the table with her began to call out to her. They noticed that she was not engaged in the conversation, as if her head was full of other serious thoughts. The classmate called Soyan again, this time louder, which scared the girl quite a bit. She screamed, but returned to the real world, where a dangerous virus reigns and they have to save their lives. Kim Minju asked if Seo Young had heard what Kang Min had said. She added that they were in a second-level security area. The girl didn't really know what to do with this information or how to react, so she just smiled a little in response. She seemed to find the information comforting. Kang Min asked Kim Min Ju if it would be better for them to go to Seoul Station. The girl countered with a question about whether the news had said anything about help and whether it would be better for them to wait here in the cafe. Kang Min replied that it was just empty words. He asked when she thought they would come to rescue them. Kim Minju started to say that the news had said so, but she was interrupted. It was Jisun. She was lying with her head on the table, holding her phone. She told her classmates that she could not reach her parents. She sounded sad and scared, worried about what might have happened to her parents. Kim Minju quickly began to support her friend, saying that everything would be fine. It was just that there was no connection. Jisun said she hoped her parents were okay. Meanwhile, Soyeon was still holding the phone in her hands and staring at it. It was as if she couldn't decide to do anything. Her heart started beating faster and her blood pressure rose. She was breathing loudly and still looking at her phone. Suddenly, she abruptly put the phone down on the table with the screen facing up. Soyoung had been wanting to call Yeon Woo all along to see if he was okay, but she couldn't. She didn't have the courage. She looked at Kang Min and Kim Min Jae and thought that Yeon Woo probably wouldn't have taken her call. He probably hated her. Soyeon was feeling very heavy at heart. After all, John Woo had saved her more than once. She hated herself a lot for not doing anything, and they left John Woo.
So Young thought that Yeonwu could be dead by now and cried. But even if her classmate had survived, she was still the only one who had abandoned him. Meanwhile, blogger Honmi decided to broadcast live for her channel. She greeted her subscribers and happily began to talk about the latest news from her life. Kang Min explained to Mingju that Honmi had created a survivor's blog yesterday and her viewership had skyrocketed. Her followers wrote words of support in the live chat and asked how she survived the bus. Han Mi said that the audience guessed where the girl was now. She had a smile on her face. She could professionally put her real emotions on the back burner when the camera was on. Someone in the chat room started writing that they had seen the menu. And after that, there was speculation that the girl was in a restaurant or cafe with her class. Han Mi confirmed her viewers' guesses and said that the owner of the restaurant had saved them and that she was the reason they survived. She then pointed the camera at the next table. There was a bus driver and a serious man holding his head with his hands. The blogger said that these two also survived. Someone from the live stream asked if Hanmi could say hello to them, and the girl replied that it was impossible because the atmosphere in the establishment was not good. The man behind her covered his arms even more. Meanwhile, Hanmi thanked him for the 10,001 donation. The man looked at the blogger. He seemed to be very annoyed by what was happening. He didn't look very friendly himself. You could see a ring on his hand. The subscribers noticed the headman Kang Jihoon. He was looking out the window. The viewers asked Han Mi to send him greetings. She asked Jihoon to look at the camera and said that if he made a heart with his hands, she would get another 10,001, to which the friendly starosta pointed his middle finger at the camera. This gesture angered Han Mi because she could have been banned from the live broadcast for doing so, and she valued her channel and reputation. An old woman who owned a restaurant walked by the blogger's girlfriend. Unfortunately for her, Hanmi noticed the woman and wanted to film her for her channel to show her subscribers her savior. She started pestering my grandmother to do an interview with her, but the woman didn't even know the word. She was just trying to do her job. Eventually, Hanmi filmed the restaurant owner for her blog, the girl began to tell her that she had saved them and asked her grandmother to say hello to her subscribers. She said hello but didn't understand who she was talking to. Hanmi began to rush her grandmother a bit and asked her to introduce herself, as her classmates had done during the tour. The restaurant owner told her that she couldn't do that. Hanmi kept up with her. Suddenly someone called out to her in a not-so-friendly voice. Hanmi turned toward the sound. That was the serious man who had his hands over his face. Now he was sitting openly and said rudely that Hanmi should immediately turn off her live broadcast and swore. He added that they were not here for fun and games. The man's tone was quite serious. But Hanmi reacted in her own way. She said on camera that there was something wrong with this man. She was outraged that he was telling the girl what to do. She mocked the man, but he could not stand this attitude. He began to get up from the table and call the girl in an even ruder and more serious tone. He made a lot of noise and sounds as he got up from the table, which attracted the attention of the other diners. Everyone turned around and watched what was happening. He came close to Hanmi. It scared the girl. Didn't this man know about personal boundaries? He asked her in a rude tone if she didn't understand what he was saying. His face was as relaxed as possible and his voice was very dictatorial, as if he was speaking to his subordinate from his mouth. The man added that when he asked Hanmi to stop doing something, Hanmi had to fulfill his request, or rather an order. But the girl was silent. She just looked at the man with wide eyes. It seems that this silence irritated him, and he switched to Matt and shouting. His face immediately changed and became angry. It seems that the man was very hot-tempered. This scared Hanmi even more. All she could say was a scream. Her eyes widened even more and she stood in a stupor looking into the man's evil eyes. Suddenly, someone appeared in front of the girl and began to cover her with his hands, pulling her away. This shocked the man, because it was his conversation with Hanmi and no one was supposed to interfere between them. He clearly did not like this course of events. It turned out that it was the headmaster, Kang Jihoon. Surprisingly, he behaved like a true gentleman and the head of the class defending his classmate. He looked the man in the eye and asked Han Mi what had happened here. Jihoon did not speak to the man. Han Mi began to complain that the man had threatened her. The man replied in a sweary tone that this had not happened and that he was just asking that the girl turn off the broadcast. To which the headman, 
Kang Jehun said that they would turn it off. His answer was exhaustive. He continued that he would turn off the broadcast himself and that the man had nothing to worry about. Han Mi, on the other hand, had already completely hid behind the elder Jehun. The man responded to the boy's boldness by saying that they were just stupid, ill-mannered children. However, the man's tone and expression changed and became calmer. He realized that he was no longer facing a defenseless girl who could be attacked. Suddenly, the grandmother, the owner of the restaurant, intervened in their fight. She was screaming and swinging at the man, asking what was wrong with him and why he was taking it out on these innocent children. The man sincerely did not understand what was wrong. He asked why he should be polite to such rude children as these and why the restaurant owner was defending these teenagers. The woman began to lead her husband away from his classmates to the table where he was sitting. A frightened Kim Minju ran to Hanmi and asked if her friend was okay. From behind the headman, Kang Jihoon, Hanmi was shouting with tears in her eyes. She asked why this man was so aggressive toward her. Instead, Jihoon was not polite to her, even though she had just been yelled at. He abruptly snatched the live selfie stick from the blogger's hands and ordered her to turn it off. He scolded Hanmi for doing this, even though everyone was already on edge. He looked at his classmate. Hanmi was silent when she suddenly began to make the sound of crying. She couldn't hold it in any longer. She was uncomfortable with everyone yelling at her. Hanmi began to cry bitterly, wiping her tears with her hands. She explained that she only wanted to make things better because everyone looked so sad and down, so she tried to cheer them up. Kang Jihoon, the headman, just looked on in silence as his classmate cried. Hanmi added that if something had gone wrong, she could have at least filmed it. Finally, Kang Jihoon couldn't take it anymore. He asked why Hong Mi was crying in the first place, and he reached out to hug her, but he didn't have time because Kim Min Ju had already thrown her arms around her friend. Jisun joined her and they all hugged the girl and calmed her down. The headman, Kang Ji Hoon, just watched the scene in silence. He was a little sad that he didn't have time to hug Hon Mi. He seemed to like the girl. There was no other way to explain why such a rather rude boy was so brave and stood up for Hon Mi. In the end, he didn't bother to stand and walked away from them, snorting loudly so that no one would think that he sympathized with Hanma and wanted to be in her friend's shoes. He went to the window, where he stood until the fight with the rude man. He said to himself that they were all a bunch of assholes. Kang Jihoon was not supposed to get out of the image of a rude classmate who doesn't care about anyone. Suddenly, the headman, Jihoon, heard a sound like something crunching. His expression changed dramatically. His eyes grew big and his heart beat faster. Even if he wasn't pretending, the boy was still afraid maybe more so than the girls. He abruptly jumped away from the window and began to fall to the floor, shouting all the swear words he knew. By doing so, he frightened and panicked the other patrons of the restaurant. They screamed and started asking what Kang Jihoon had seen outside the window. Suddenly, something started to appear around the corner. Its eyes glowed yellow. It had ears, and it was small. In the window of the cafe, visitors noticed a piece of someone's red tail. When the teenagers realized that it was just a very brave cat, their faces changed and relaxed. The danger was over. A cheeky red cat was sitting outside the window in front of them, looking well-groomed. The animal started looking at the visitors and meowing to be opened and fed. Suddenly, the owner of the restaurant rushed to the door and shouted the cat's name, Sundok. It seemed to be her pet. The grandmother fed her pet and the cat purred gratefully in response. The owner of the restaurant spoke to the cat as if it were a real person. Her voice sounded very sweet. She wished him a good meal. The old lady seemed to have problems with her children. Suddenly, the bus driver began to get indignant, shouting words from behind my grandmother. He was saying that it was not worth it for all kinds of vagrants to come inside and roam around the restaurant. He said it could be a big problem, to which the owner of this establishment told him to close it. After all, it was her restaurant, and she decided who to let in and who not. The grandmother's cat seemed to understand what the bus driver was saying and hissed at the man. The owner of the restaurant liked her pet's response, so she rewarded him by petting him. The cat responded by purring happily. The teenagers joined in. Hanmi started filming it, 
The cat turned out to be a real thief of women's hearts because no one could resist his mercy. But my grandmother went to the window. It was as if she was waiting for someone else and looking out. Jasoon asked the restaurant owner what had happened and why her grandmother was looking out the window. She replied that she did not see Gimson, because the two cats always walked together, and this time Sundok came alone. Perhaps something happened to the other cat. The events moved to the roof of a building, where a red cat, most likely Gimson, was sitting and licking himself so that he could come to lunch clean. Suddenly the cat heard something that caught his attention. It was a pigeon that got caught in the white mucus of the frog eggs and couldn't get out of the trap, so it kept flapping its wings and making a lot of noise. It was this noise that attracted the cat's attention. Gimson went to the pigeon, perhaps to make it his dinner. Meanwhile, the bird is completely covered in frog eggs. The cat saw its prey, and its animal instincts did not allow it to simply pass by the victim in distress. The events are again transferred to the restaurant, which was a temporary shelter. Grandma asked about Soul Station. She looked quite surprised. The teenagers stood next to her, and Kim Minju told them that they had to get to a shelter near this Soul Station, adding that the news was all about it. Kang Min looked at his phone and said that it was no longer safe for them to stay at the restaurant. He also said that according to the map, it would only take 20 minutes to walk to the station, which wasn't that far. The grandmother tried to convince the teenagers that her restaurant was quite safe, even though it was on the ground floor and had many windows, and the roads were littered with zombie monsters and the frog egg virus. It was much more dangerous. Kang Min agreed with the owner of the establishment. The problem was how they were going to get to the station. Walking was too dangerous. Even a minute on the street could cause irreparable damage. Suddenly, another man spoke up and called the teenagers stupid kids. He caught their attention and asked why they were so timid. So far, the teenagers did not understand the pathos of the man's speech and just looked at him in silence, waiting for him to make a speech. He added that the bus driver stood right in front of him and smiled with all 32 of his teeth. The man really looked like a bus driver because he was wearing a suit. They all looked out the window now. The driver told them that there was a road in front of them along which the teenagers had come. He said there was a bus parked about 50 meters away. It turned out that it was his bus. He thought aloud further. Perhaps his bus was still clean, with no surprises in the form of ugly monsters inside. He said Mount Namsan was the destination, but none of the passengers had returned. The problem was that the virus was raging everywhere, and if the bus driver's memory was correct, there were several monsters in the neighborhood. So getting to the bus was a bit of a challenge. A rude man approached the group. He was listening to their conversation and seemed to want to intervene. He turned to the restaurant owner and asked if she was selling alcohol. His voice was as calm as ever. This question threw the old woman into a stupor. Was this man an alcoholic and was he going to get drunk and start raging? How could he think about drinking when they were all in this situation? My grandmother brought alcohol to her husband and he started stuffing a piece of paper into the neck of the bottle. The restaurant owner was frightened and shouted at the man, asking him what he was doing. The man calmly replied that it was a Molotov cocktail. It turned out that he was a soldier in the avant-garde. That's why he had this kind of knowledge. He added that according to the news, his weakness is fire, so they had to at least try. The bus driver supported the military man's idea. After all, the Molotov cocktail could be thrown from a distance, which was quite safe. He praised the man. The action moved to a storage room where there was a warehouse of all kinds of things. The man was pouring gasoline into his cocktails. Han Mi quietly approached him. It was clear that she wanted to tell him something. She addressed him in a polite and friendly manner in the Han Mi style. She asked him if he had a hard time putting it together and offered to help. Such an unusual request from a young girl shocked the man a bit, given the fact that they had recently had a fight. He replied that he did not need help. After all, children should not have to deal with such things. Hanmi replied that she was quite good at collecting such things. She added that she could actually be useful to him. The man asked what she was trying to say. Hanmi was silent. There was a pause of silence for a minute. It was clear that the girl was gathering her thoughts to say something. Suddenly, she apologized to her husband and said uncertainly that she was wrong. She repeated that she had heard his story and said again that she was wrong. In fact, she was very sorry. The man replied that it was nothing. After all, she was only a child. He also apologized and admitted that he had been quite rude to her, 
But in fact, Hanmi realized that it was the consequences of his profession. The girl was happy that the conflict was over, and they could now go to Seoul Station in peace. It seems that Hanmi was very friendly and did not like quarrels. But the girl was also quite annoying. She asked if the man had forgiven her, and then she offered her help again. The girl has already started working. Hanmi said she had heard that the soldier was in the cable car and asked if they had met before. The man's face became quite surprised. Hanmi asked what had happened to him, but he said nothing. She continued to pester me with this topic. She said she was live streaming during the trip when they were on the tour. Hanmi started asking that if the man was on a date with his girlfriend on the cable car, the man would have closed the door. The soldier's face changed dramatically. I could feel that he was angry and very upset inside. Hanmi couldn't see the man's face and he didn't answer. He was silent, so she asked again, letting him know that she was waiting for an answer. But the soldier seemed to be flying somewhere in his thoughts, so he continued to be silent. Then Hanmi apologized and said she was talking nonsense again. But suddenly the man answered her. He said that it was not a girl with him, but his fiance. The soldier was talking to Hanmi, but he was looking at the wall. His face was clenched. It was clear that he did not want to show his emotions and what was in his heart. Hanmi's face changed dramatically. She was sorry that she had raised such a sensitive and painful topic for the soldier, but at the same time she was happy because she realized that the man was not so bad. He just had a grief in his life. She asked if this meant that he had lost his fiance. Han Mi also apologized for the situation because she had no idea. The girl abruptly stopped talking and thought. Her face became so sad, as if she was about to cry. Suddenly tears flowed from her eyes. Han Mi began to tell her that they had also lost many of their friends there. She remembered her friend Gail. She missed her very much and still blamed herself for her death. Han Mi covered her eyes with her hands and her crying turned into hysteria. She said that she didn't think something like this could have happened during their trip. She began to say her friend's name. The man's face looked shocked. He definitely did not expect Hanmi to start crying. Suddenly, the headman, Kang Jinu, approached them. He asked my classmate what she was doing there with this man who was rude to her. Then he noticed that Hanmi was crying and asked about that too, making a mate that meant he was annoyed that the girl cried so often. The classmate turned around and told Kang Jihoon to get out of her way. She said that she had reconciled with her husband and that the headman should also apologize to him, wiping tears from her face. Kang Jihoon looked at the man. He hadn't expected such a statement from Han Mi. If she wanted to put up with this rude man, that was her right, but she shouldn't have dragged Jihoon into it. The man was also surprised and turned his head sharply at the boy. He didn't think Kang Jihoon would apologize. The soldier knew guys like this and realized that his ego was too big to accept his mistakes. The man's thoughts were confirmed because Kang Ji-hoon turned around and silently walked away from them, holding his head high. But Hon Mi didn't let it go and commented on her classmate's actions. She called him an arrogant kid, and she explained to her new friend that Kang Ji-hoon was not bad, but he was too arrogant. The headman heard this and cursed. The man asked if they were close to this guy, Kang Ji-hoon. This question puzzled the girl a bit. It seems that the military man knew something about Amrun affairs. She looked at the man and then down to the floor and thought about what to say to him. The girl turned her gaze to Kang Jihoon's back, who was walking away from them like in a movie into the sunset. She said that they were close until middle school, but it seems that something happened between them. Meanwhile, the bus driver was calling his daughter Jinyo. He told her he would be back soon. The man spoke very sweetly to his daughter so that she would not worry. The driver seemed to have very warm emotions for his family. They overheard the conversation and asked if the bus driver was talking to his daughter. He turned to the sound. His face was very smiling. It turned out to be the owner of the restaurant. She noticed that the man was very excited and happy. He was amused by these words and asked if it was so noticeable. He ended the conversation and said that his daughter was like an angel to him. He would do anything and everything possible to see her again and play with her. Meanwhile, the soldier and Hanmi were walking away with a full box of Molotov cocktails in their hands. The man told everyone to gather for a while. He seemed to want to have some kind of motivational talk. The man said that they should all stick together until they got to the shelter. He was really a professional and knew how to rally the crowd. The soldier picked up one bottle and held it up for everyone to see. 
He started talking about the Molotov cocktail. He said that they were actually illegal, but in the situation they were in, it was a good solution. The man said that it was quite dangerous to leave them, so he said he would do it himself. But then the headman, Kang Jehun, spoke up. He said that he would also throw the cocktails. The guy started talking about how he did not trust people easily. He asked if they should have just set them on fire and thrown them at the monsters, ignoring the military's words that it was dangerous. The man didn't look at Kang Jihoon to avoid being annoyed, but he was very angry at the boy's behavior. Meanwhile, the headman was checking to see if it would really burn the monsters to ashes. The soldier exhaled and said that the fire might stop and the fuel might run out. It was too dangerous. His face betrayed the stupidity of Kang Jihoon's actions. The guy told him that this was not the main problem. After all, there are a lot of annoying, ugly, and dangerous zombie monsters around. He began to prove to the man that they were not small children, and therefore everyone would throw Molotov cocktails. And if not, he would throw them for everyone. Kang Ji-hoon's actions proved the opposite. He was still a child and behaved recklessly. The soldier took another big breath and yelled at Kang Ji-hoon, calling him an asshole. Still, he couldn't stand this showmanship from the boy. Eventually, the man agreed and said that they would share all the Molotov cocktails. But for the restaurant owner, it was really too dangerous, so the man refused to give her the cocktails. However, she did not object and said that everything was fine looking out the window. She did not turn to face them and added that they had to go without her. Hanmi immediately threw herself at her grandmother with hugs and her sincerity. She tried to persuade the restaurant owner to let her go with them, but her grandmother said that was not necessary and that she would only be a burden to them. A military man joined the conversation. He asked if the owner was going to be okay and added that it would really be better for her to go with them because the restaurant was quite dangerous, given that it was on the ground floor. But the man did not have time to finish his sentence. The old woman interrupted him and said that everything would be fine. They all needed to get to the shelter as soon as possible. Hanmi hugged her even tighter and asked her in a sad voice why she didn't want to go with them, assuring her that her grandmother would not be a burden to them. She replied that this place had been her home for 30 years. The owner of the restaurant added that the prostitutes shouldn't worry. They should leave quickly. Everyone approached the kind woman and thanked her for everything she had done for them. The soldier promised to send a rescue team to her. Everyone gathered. It was time to leave. A soldier stood at the door with a Molotov cocktail in his hands and said he had to check everything first before they left the restaurant. Suddenly, he noticed a monster in the window, walking and growling. He was a potential danger and would most likely attack them if they left the restaurant even after a while. So the soldier threw two Molotov cocktails at him. The zombie monster caught fire. The ammunition hit the target. Everyone else stood outside the door and watched the monster burn. Hanmi hid behind her husband's back. He turned to the others and said with a serious face that everything was now clear and gave the command to move. It was clear that the soldier was at ease. He continued to command them to prepare everything they wanted to take with them in advance. He wanted everyone to run out at the same time and quickly get to the bus. Kang Jehun was clearly unhappy. He did not like the fact that a man was in charge. After all, it used to be the head man who was in charge. Meanwhile, the soldier asked who would carry the Molotov cocktails in the box. Suddenly, Soyon spoke up. She started asking if everyone remembered what she had said to her classmates earlier. She wanted to settle the matter before they left the room. Jihoon immediately understood what she was talking about and turned to the girl. He abruptly closed her mouth and rudely told her that he did not want to listen to anyone's whining. He was addressing So Young, adding that she should not be a hindrance to them although he added in his words that he was not addressing anyone in particular. Kim Min Ju attacked him. She yelled at her classmate and said that he was being too defiant. Even his friend Kang Min defended Seo Young and said that Kang Ji Hoon had crossed all the boundaries. The girl was just silent, shocked by the boy's reaction. In response, the headman Kang Ji Hoon told Kim Min Ju that she did not know what she was talking about because she was not with them on the Namsan cable car. Soyeon looked at the floor in fright, thinking about how stupid they were. Her eyes widened and she was afraid for her friend Yeonwoo. She wondered if Kang Jehoon's words were about Yeonwoo or herself. 
she began to worry. After all, her leg was still injured. Did he think she was a weak excuse because of that? After all, the girl never lagged behind and never complained about her leg. She tried to be on a par with everyone, no matter how hard it was for her. The bus driver noticed the girl's condition and turned to her. But it seems that the man noticed not only her condition, but also Soyun's leg. So he asked what happened to it. He looked at the leg again to get a better look at it. The wound was quite fresh and deep. Because it was a knee, it was constantly bending and straightening, so the wound could not heal properly. The bus driver looked at Soyon sympathetically and suggested that she must have been in pain. He was worried about the girl. He said that even if her leg was fine now, she still had to be careful. She didn't know how to react to this, so she just nodded. It was strange to her that her friends were not worried about the girl at all, and some of them hinted at her weakness, while strangers showed sympathy and care. Meanwhile, the soldier had already given the command to flee. He was immediately followed by Hanmi and Kang Min with a box of Molotov cocktails. The restaurant owner even came out of the restaurant and said that they were careful and took care of themselves. She was an amazingly sweet and kind woman. They ran and thanked her for everything again. The soldier again ordered everyone to run after him as fast as possible. The last to go were Seo Young and Kim Min Ju. The man continued to give instructions. He told them not to run close to buildings, but to stay in the center of the road. And if zombie monsters appeared, they had Molotov cocktails for that. He went on to say that the Molotov had to be thrown so close to the ground that the bottle would break, and that you had to watch out for pigeons and stay away from them as much as possible. The people in the back had to cover the rear, and each person had to look at all four sides. Suddenly, the bus driver started stopping the soldier and reaching out to him. It seems that he saw a zombie monster ahead of them, which was eating the unfortunate cat on the ground. Suddenly, the ugly giant saw the crowd running toward him and growled, trying to intimidate people. The monster felt that he could not cope with so many people. As here, the headman Kang Jehun and a soldier swing their cocktails at a zombie monster. They flew straight to the target, and the ugly giant caught fire. They dealt with it quickly enough, and the monster no longer posed any danger. The man looked at Kang Jehun strangely. The teenager's eyes were full of anger and rage. Chief Jihoon said lightly that it turned out that the zombie monsters were nothing. It seems that he concluded from one blow of a Molotov cocktail that these nasty giant creatures are weak opponents. So the guy ran forward, carrying another cocktail in his hands. A soldier shouted at him in the back to come to his senses and not to do anything stupid. The restaurant owner was watching them closely through the window. Suddenly, she saw something that made her eyes widen and her mouth drop open. She noticed her ginger cat, Gimson. He was walking calmly between the houses. Without hesitation, my grandmother immediately ran to her Gimson and pounced on him asking where he was. But she stopped for a second. Something about her furry pet seemed rather strange. Gimson the cat did not respond to his owner at all, although he used to run to her immediately to be fed and petted by the old lady. The restaurant owner's eyes widened dramatically and for some reason she began to feel threatened by her cute pet cat, who had never heard a fly before. But then the cat answered his caring owner and meowed politely, and then the grandmother calmed down and her anxiety subsided. She affectionately called her furry pet to her to have a delicious meal with her. For some reason, the cat started scratching his paw hard. This scared my grandmother again, as if she had noticed something very strange. It was natural for cats to scratch themselves with their paws, especially if they were walking outside. But suddenly, the cat started coughing heavily, as if something was stuck in his mouth and making strange sounds that he hadn't made before. The grandmother watched her pet with anxiety and shock. She could not believe her eyes. A pigeon, or rather the remains of a pigeon, began to come out of the mouth of her previously cute fluffy pet. The restaurant owner's eyes widened to the size of oranges. She screamed the cat's name, not believing what she was seeing. Her cat's eyes darkened, and it began to make strange noises like zombie monsters. The old woman began to realize that her poor, innocent cat had probably eaten an infected pigeon and was now turning into a hideous zombie monster. The pet's face was covered with the frog egg virus. The animal's gaze showed that it looked at its owner not as a friend, but as prey. It was no longer her cute cat, but a zombie monster that wanted to eat her. Meanwhile, the fugitives had almost reached the bus, with the headman, Kang Jihun, running ahead because he considered himself independent. Suddenly he screamed and swung a Molotov cocktail. 
It turned out that he was throwing it at a zombie monster that was on their way. The guy hit the mark, so the ugly giant caught fire and posed no threat to life. Several hideous zombie monsters were burning right in front of the bus. The fugitives stopped to analyze their plan of action, even though Kang Ji-hoon was rushing forward. So the headman approached Kang Min and asked him to give him more Molotov cocktails, boasting that after the fourth kill, these zombie monsters did not look so scary and strong anymore. To which his friend replied that he was an idiot and had to concentrate, because they were not playing games. But the headman, Kang Ji-hoon, did not listen to him. He ran screaming with another Molotov cocktail toward the monsters, which were not even visible on the horizon. Everything near them was on fire. Others called him a psycho and said that he could have just as easily burned everything here and not wasted supplies. Suddenly the bus driver shouted loudly. It turned out that he had found his bus, which had not yet caught fire from Kang Jihoon's war games. The vehicle was the last in line. The driver ran first, breaking away from the crowd. He shouted that his father would be back soon and called out the name of his daughter, Jin Yo. But the man was so blinded by the feeling of victory that was about to come that he did not notice something on the side. He turned toward the monster's scream. Suddenly, a huge zombie monster attacked him from the window of another bus. He was quite cunning and waited for the victim, sitting in ambush. The bus driver's eyes widened dramatically. He screamed and began to act sharply. The man could not let his daughter down. He had to survive and get to her. The bus driver jumped away from the zombies, not noticing Soyeon running behind him. He pushed the girl. The chain was set in motion. So Young pushed Kang Min back and now everyone was in danger. The guy was carrying Molotov cocktails, but because of the collision, he dropped them. They could have broken and caught fire. People running ahead turned around at the sound of the falling box. The headman, Kang Ji-hoon, even stopped when he saw a zombie monster attacking his friends. Without hesitation, the guy threw his burning Molotov cocktail at the hideous giant. Kang Ji-hoon's aim was really good. And this time, he hit the monster squarely, and it caught fire. So the people who clashed could stop to analyze what had just happened. Soyeon was very angry with the bus driver because he had caused her to become a problem for the headman, Kang Ji-hoon. As the girl expected, the guy came up to them and started scolding them, calling them idiots. The Molotov cocktails were on the floor. The box was overturned. But everything seemed to be intact. Just like that. Kang Ji-hoon started screaming like a madman. He was scolding Kang Min, calling him all kinds of names. He said that he couldn't have just carried the bottles quietly. It turned out that, after all, all the Molotov cocktails were broken. So Kang Ji-hoon kicked the box in anger, calling Kang Min an idiot and asking what they should do now. The guy was obviously out of control. But Kang Ji-hoon didn't manage to kick the box of bottles because a soldier pushed him away. He told the boy to calm down and explain that they had already burned all the monsters alive, so there was no danger. Suddenly, someone started calling out to the headman, Kang Ji-hoon. His disgruntled face from being seated did not even want to turn toward the sound. It turned out to be a bus driver. He was furious at what some teenager who was three times his size was saying to him. The soldier held the man to prevent a fight, but the driver was too angry. The man yelled at Kang Ji-hoon and called him a little shit. He demanded that the boy answer for his words. It was good that the soldier was holding the bus driver, otherwise there would have been a fight. But Kang Ji-hoon was also not easy. He was yelling at the driver that the fact that he was an adult and older than him didn't matter. Now Kang Min was holding his friend as well. Suddenly the bus driver shouted something that caused Kang Ji-hoon's face to change dramatically. The man asked if the boy had a father who could teach him how to behave with adults. But the bus driver did not stop. He continued to yell at the teenager. The man was very angry and said that they were not friends to be treated like that, threatening Kang Ji-hoon. The girls Hong Mi and Kim Min-ju began to stand up for their classmates. They told the man to calm down and asked why the bus driver was so harsh on Kang Ji-hoon when everyone could see that the bottles had fallen through his fault and recklessness. But it seems that the man did not know how to admit his mistakes, just like the starosta. So he got even more angry at the teenagers. His face looked very angry, as if he had just been betrayed by everyone. He said that it looked like they didn't really need the bus that much. After this phrase, everyone's faces changed dramatically. 
They did not expect the bus driver to behave like a small child and use cheap blackmail. It looks like he's betting he almost died because of his stupidity. The man began to make excuses that he had fallen because someone had pushed him from behind, although everyone could see that it was the other way around. Soyon could confirm this, but the girl was silent. The bus driver did not stop. He accused everyone of wanting to imprison him. Soyon just listened to him and wondered if he should tell the truth. The man continued to threaten, this time looking at Kang Jehoon. He asked if the teenagers wanted to walk to the shelter. Although if it were not for these teenagers, he would never have dared to go to the shelter himself. He continued to stare at Kang Jehoon and called him a little shit. The boy stared back at the driver, which provoked the crazy driver even more. And he asked why the teenager was staring at him like that. Did he really want to fight? Suddenly I heard someone apologize from behind the bus driver. It was Soyeon. She said that the bus driver fell because of her, because she fell first and most likely pushed the others. The girl with a very tired face, looking at the floor, apologized to everyone and took the blame. It seems that in this way, Soyeon wanted to resolve the quarrel so that everyone could get to the shelter. Her head dropped even lower. She apologized one last time and asked them to forgive her at least once. The bus driver, meanwhile, listened in silence as the girl covered for him and did not have the courage to admit his guilt. He looked at poor Soyon, who was so brave and smart that she was able to take the blame and end the quarrel. The girl just stood there looking at the floor, pretending to be guilty so that everyone would believe her. Suddenly, the bus driver just turned around and left. This was a real man's act. Hiding under the skirt of a little girl whom he had most likely injured and not even apologizing. Passing by the headman Kang Jehoon, he pushed him with his elbow, even though there was enough space, and told him to watch his step. This provocation was done on purpose and further demonstrated the level of maturity of such an adult man. Surprisingly, Kang Jehoon remained silent. Suddenly, he had a brain that was finally giving him the right commands to act. Hanmi approached the headman. The girl turned to her classmate, which surprised him. He did not expect to receive support from his friends. A classmate looked directly into Kang Jihoon's eyes and asked if he was okay. But instead, she received rudeness in her direction. Kang Jihoon pushed her away and told her to get behind him and not to bother him. A soldier was watching the whole thing. Soyeon stood there adjusting her clothes. Suddenly, someone asked her if she was hurt. The girl finally looked up to look at the person. It was a military man. He looked at the girl with sympathy. Soyeon said she was fine. She didn't want to complain, even though she had actually been hit pretty hard and her leg was still hurting. The man wanted to reassure her, saying that Molotov cocktails could still be made, so she didn't have to worry about it. She just thanked him briefly, not looking him in the eye. Suddenly, their conversation was interrupted by the sounds of running and screaming. The crowd saw the same old lady, the owner of the restaurant, running toward them. She was shouting for help. Holding her hand, the woman turned back and screamed. It seems she saw something she didn't want to see. Everyone's mouths dropped open in surprise. Only Hanmi started waving and greeting her grandmother. She thought that the restaurant owner had decided to go with them after all. Suddenly, her joy turned to fear. Her grandmother shouted for them all to run away immediately. She was running and screaming as hard as she could to make them all run away as fast as they could. And as fast as they could. Her face looked very scared. Meanwhile, the bus driver had already started running first. While others did not fully understand what was happening, they also began to run away. Suddenly, the man saw something that made his eyes widen. They showed great surprise. It turned out that the old woman was being chased by her cat. The people could not see much, but it was clear that it was carrying something in its mouth. The grandmother noticed that they did not react much to her words about running, so she switched to the mat and still ordered them to run. Meanwhile, the cat was almost catching up. Suddenly, he ducked down to pounce on the restaurant owner. His face was almost completely covered with frog eggs. It released its white tentacles and they reached the woman's head. It was the end. There was no saving the good old lady. The people saw the little cat throwing its owner to the floor and immediately began to run away as fast as they could. Now they saw and felt the danger of what was happening. Meanwhile, the restaurant owner still thought it was her fluffy, kind pet, Gimson. She tried to call out to him to get him to wake up. But unfortunately, it was not her cat, but a zombie monster. It looked down at her, 
let out its white tentacles and growled. Suddenly, my grandmother screamed even louder. They heard the sounds of being eaten. Now the fugitives had two new threats. It was my grandmother's cat who was eating his owner's face. The old lady was screaming a lot. She was in pain. The soldier ran behind Soyon and ordered everyone to run to the bus. They would be safe there. The crowd began to jump on the bus one by one. The first to board were teenagers Hong Mi, Jisun, and Kim Minju. Meanwhile, the bus driver was already starting the vehicle. Everyone was in a hurry and pushing those who were getting on the bus first. Suddenly, the bus driver looked at the people who were getting on. Did he really expect to leave alone? The sounds of zombie monsters could be heard from behind the vehicle. They were approaching. The bus driver began to panic. His heart beat faster and his blood pressure spiked. He glanced at the photo next to the steering wheel of him and his daughter Jin Yo. Meanwhile, the rest of the crowd fled. Kang Ji Hoon, the headman, picked up the Molotov cocktail bottles that were left behind. He was immediately yelled at by a soldier that he should have been running away, not thinking about weapons. But Kang Ji Hoon did not listen and kept collecting ammunition anyway. Then Kang Min and the soldier took him under their arms and started dragging him by force. The man shouted at him to forget about it because it would be very strange to bring Molotov cocktails to the shelter. The rest of the fugitives were about to reach the bus. They ran as fast as they could. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon noticed that the bus doors were closing. The guy ran to the door and started banging on it. He was shouting at the driver to open it because not everyone had come in yet. But the bus driver didn't even look at him. It was clear that he did it deliberately. Ji Hoon kept knocking on the door and shouting. The man said he could not risk it anymore for these assholes. He kept looking at the photo with his daughter. And then the man shifted the gear and the vehicle moved. He forgot that it was because of these assholes that his daughter might never have seen her dad again if Kang Ji Hoon hadn't saved him by throwing a Molotov cocktail at the zombie monster and that Seo Young was left behind to take the fall for him. Kang Ji Hoon was furious. He was yelling at the driver and banging on the door. The others ran up to him, but the bus had already started to move. Everyone was shocked by the bus driver's vile act because the monsters were not even close to them. Everyone could have easily gotten on and left. Hanmi noticed that the driver had started to drive away, but the others hadn't gone inside yet. She started to stop her husband and said that they could not leave them there. They could die. Kang Ji Hoon was watching through the glass of the door. The girl was shouting at the bus driver, saying that her friends had not yet gotten inside and asking him to wait. But the driver was very angry. He could barely contain his anger. Hanmi was still yelling at him to stop the bus. All of a sudden, this crazy man swung at a poor girl who was trying to protect her friends, hit her, and told her to get the fuck off him. The head man, Kang Ji Hoon, saw it all. He was shocked and shouted to the girl. She fell to the ground. The man sat down at his seat, as if nothing had happened, and justified his action by saying that his daughter was waiting for him, probably as ugly as her father. Kang Ji Hoon saw the girl holding her cheek. He shouted and asked if she was okay. How could this grown man, who was supposed to be respected, take a swing at an innocent girl who he said was just a child? The boy ran as fast as he could. He wanted to help his classmate, but the bus was speeding up. The girl looked at her friend and cried. Her cheek was red and her lip was about to bleed. Kang Ji Hoon's face was almost invisible. The bus was going too fast. It was the end. The bus driver watched the teenagers say goodbye and just kept pressing the gas pedal, speeding up the bus. Kang Ji Hoon saw the face of this bastard. He screamed at him and threatened to kill him. But the vehicle was already too far away, and the starosta could only see his ass, shouting for his mother. The bus driver looked in the rearview mirror and saw that the others had stopped running. He was amused. He was a completely evil person with nothing light inside him. Kang Ji Hoon stood and caught his breath. Now he could feel how Yan Wu felt when they left him on the Nam San cable car. The others had already run up to him. Kang Min was screaming and couldn't believe they had just left them. They didn't know what to do now. Walking to the shelter was too dangerous. Kang Ji Hoon stood there silently. His body was filled with anger. He wanted revenge. If it weren't for the teenagers, this worthless bus driver would never have made it to the shelter and his vehicle. He stood up and shouted at the top of his lungs how much he hated this man and his entire family. Suddenly, a cat began to approach the group, which was loudly discussing something. The cat screamed, so So Young and Kang Min heard it and came back. 
Immediately after them, the others came back, because there was more growling, because there were more cats. As many as four felines were approaching the group. Their mood was not friendly. One of the cats, which was closer, mewed as if to greet the company. As you got closer, you could see some frog eggs on it. It looked like these cats were infected with the virus. The company didn't notice this, so they stood silently and watched what would happen next. Suddenly, the cat screamed again, but this time half of its face was covered with frog eggs. That's what the company noticed. Their faces changed dramatically, and they realized that they were in trouble and had to run away from these seemingly innocent cats. The boys and girls noticed that all four cats were already infected with this frog egg virus, and they were heading straight for them. The company screamed and began to retreat. We had to think fast and come up with a plan of action. Suddenly, Kang Ming lit his Molotov cocktail from behind and shouted for everyone to stand back, and he would throw the weapon at the cats. But the headman, Kang Ji Hoon, did not allow him to do so, and said that a classmate had given him a hammer and he would throw it himself. Soyeon covered her mouth with her hands at this time. She was very afraid and was the only girl among them with an injured leg. A soldier noticed her. He ordered everyone, including Soyeon, to get behind him. He felt responsible for these children. Meanwhile, the once pet animals were getting closer to the company and growling, reminding them that they were no longer cute cats, but bloodthirsty zombie monsters. The soldier picked up a Molotov cocktail, stood in front of everyone and swung at the cats, who were about to hit them. The cats sensed the danger and stood in an attack posture and growled. The soldier slowed down. He said it was the last Molotov cocktail, so he had to use it perfectly. The man prepared to throw it and commanded that when he gave the signal, everyone else should run away quickly. Suddenly, the cats simultaneously stopped talking and looked at their victim. They began to release their white tentacles on the military. The man signaled. His eyes widened. He might not make it. The cats grouped together into one huge zombie monster and this noisy mixture attacked the soldier. His eyes widened even more. The chances of survival were slim, but this way he could delay the zombie monster and the teens would have more time to escape. A man threw a Molotov cocktail at a large zombie boss made of four cats and shouted at the others to run away immediately. The soldier managed to escape and ran away with the teenagers. The events moved to the shelter. John Woo sat in the corner with his hand over his face, looking at the floor near a mountain of boxes. Employees distributed supplies to everyone. A large crowd gathered and everyone tried to grab as much as they could. It turned out that the guy had fallen asleep. His body was still exhausted. He still could not come to his senses. But the screams of the people around them were too loud. So Yan Wu woke up and began to open his eyes. Suddenly, in front of his eyes was a huge zombie monster that was about to attack him. It had already opened its huge mouth and was preparing to bite him. The guy's eyes opened sharply. He instantly woke up. John Wu jumped up and down and screamed, but he couldn't keep his feet on the ground. So he fell to the floor, realizing that it was just a nightmare and that he was now completely safe. But the guy landed on his arm, so it hurt. The boy groaned in pain. He looked at his hand. He was surprised that it still hurt, and this pain was very strange, not like a burn. Suddenly, someone came up behind him. The guy was shaking and whimpering in pain. Someone's hand tried to touch the boy. But Yan Wu reacted too sharply. He attacked the hand with his fists. However, it turned out that it was just his classmates Park Min and Ham Xiong Yu who scared him. He looked at them with his frightened eyes and shook his head. Probably in the eyes of his classmates, Yan Wu looked like a crazy person. She stared at him in silence, not understanding his reaction. Ham Xiong Yu continued to chew. When Yon Wu finally realized that he was not in danger, he apologized to his classmates, still loudly coughing. Park Min kept looking at him. It was unclear from his gaze how he felt about Yon Wu, as well as by his actions. But this time, he pleasantly surprised me by taking out some food and handing it to the boy. Yon Wu asked what it was. Park Min told him that it was bread that was being distributed to everyone. It was nice of them to bring food to Yon Wu. The guy opened it right away. He couldn't remember the last time he had a proper meal. Like here, they heard someone having a big fight. The quarrel was about someone's patience running out and that someone had heard enough. A man demanded that the employees call the manager. The quarrel was escalating. A man in a red sweatshirt with a cap on his head was scolding someone, and the staff tried to calm the scandal. Park Min sat on the phone and asked his friend Ham Xiong Yun if he knew what was wrong with the man. They were both smiling. 
as if the situation made them laugh. Xiong Yun replied that he had heard that they were angry because the staff wanted to help the homeless. Park Min was outraged at this information, saying that they had gone crazy. Meanwhile, Yan Wu seemed to be hovering and parallel listening to what the guys were discussing. He looked at the homeless people sitting in a circle nearby. A couple walked by and the girl did not hesitate to say loudly that she smelled bad. Meanwhile, the homeless turned to the staff in yellow shirts and asked if they had any cigarettes. They were told that there were none. Then the company asked if there was soja, and they also received a negative answer. His classmates watched, and Park Min made a joke about how the virus seemed to be spreading faster. Ham Xiong Yu asked what his friend was watching, if it was funny. He turned to his phone and looked at it, to which Park Min reacted a little surprised. It turned out that the classmate was just watching some YouTube video about the frog egg virus, but it was unclear why he was smiling all the time. Park Min turned to Yong Wu. He asked if the boy had noticed that if you looked closely, some viruses had cells and others did not. Yan Wu did not react emotionally to this interesting observation, but Park Min continued anyway. He said that the funny thing was that a virus that had no cells could completely merge with the host. He added that this is how the monsters were called merged on the internet. Ham Xiong Yu laughed at the name. They both seemed to be laughing at what was happening in the world, but this information alarmed Yan Wu. Suddenly, someone interrupted his thoughts. It seems that someone was looking for them. It turned out that it was an officer, and he was looking only for Jonwa. The man in uniform brought the boy's personal belongings, as promised. However, the young man had already forgotten about it. He brought Yonva to a cell. He said that he could take his things only after he signed for them. Jonwu did everything and thanked the officer. Finally, the guy could see what was on his phone during his absence. John Wu started to turn on his device, but it did not respond. There was only a black screen where he saw himself. The officer noticed this and asked Yan Wu to bring a charger. He thanked him for his concern and left. Suddenly he heard a sound that sounded like nausea. He turned and asked if the officer was okay, but it turned out that it was not an officer, but a woman burping in the middle of the corridor. She was obviously sick. Workers in sanitary gowns, gloves, and masks approached the woman. The victim fell to the ground, still vomiting. Yan Wu was slowly withdrawing from the situation, but he watched. The woman was saying how sick she was. She was vomiting all the time. It was not a pretty picture. Suddenly, he felt a sharp pain in his bandaged arm. It was as if thousands of needles were simultaneously entering his arm in the palm of his hand. Yan Wu yelped and raised his hand to see what was wrong with it. He said out loud that he had almost forgotten about the burn, but it hurt again. Meanwhile, the woman was still sitting on the floor. The guy sat down somewhere in the corridor. He was burdened with thoughts in his head. He recalled Park Min's words that a virus without cells completely merged with the host. Yan Wu was afraid to even think about it. If he had contracted the frog egg virus in the burning cable car building, he would have turned into a zombie monster. But that didn't happen. The guy decided to move on so as not to arouse suspicion. He had to charge his phone and check it and at the same time watched the video that Park Min was talking about. As he walked away, he recalled what kind of frog egg virus had fallen into their Namsan cable car booth. He clearly remembered that it was a cellular virus. But the zombie monsters, they were all fighting. They looked fused, just like they did in the YouTube video that Park Min watched. They didn't look like they had cells. John Wu looked at his hand again. He didn't want to admit it, but the guy had to be honest with himself at least. Eventually, the guy realized that the frog egg virus he had contracted was on his arm. It had no cells. These thoughts made Yan Wu's heart beat fast. He had to be alone and think about this information so as not to arouse suspicion. Meanwhile, while the guy was looking at his hand, he did not notice Isuri walking behind him. Suddenly, the girl noticed that John Wu was staring at his hand and could no longer pass by his classmate. He had seemed strange to her for a long time as if he hadn't fully told her everything that had happened to them on the cable car. Isuri called out to the boy to find out what was wrong with him. John Wu was a little scared when he heard a familiar voice. He had to pull himself together and behave normally. His classmate started by asking him what he was doing here, to which I received a comprehensive answer of nothing. Isuri spoke with a stony face, even a little tired. She said that it seemed like Yon Wu had wandered in by accident. She asked if her classmate had done it on purpose. 
She continued to ask if it was because of his hand. Yonwu immediately grabbed at it. His body language betrayed that Isuri's words had hit the mark and hurt him deeply. But Yonwu calmed himself down and said he was just getting his things. He said a quick goodbye, turned around, and left to get this incriminating conversation over with. But Isuri was not easy. She could read Yonwa like an x-ray, so she ignored her classmate's answer and continued to ask. She started talking about the burn on his hand. She asked if John Wu got this wound because of a fire on the Namsan cable car. But her classmate also said that he was the only one there, so she asked who could have started such a big fire. John Wu stopped and asked why Isuri was interested in this. He did not want to answer these questions from his classmate, so he changed the subject as best he could. Her face was still stony. She asked if she was not allowed to ask about it. Her classmate's answer gave away the boy. So Isuri realized that he had started the fire, but he didn't want to admit it. John Wu started shouting. It was clear that the guy was very nervous. He said he didn't know anything about the fire. Maybe it was a short circuit. Isuri, with the same stony expression, hypothesized that someone might have set the fire on purpose. John Wu looked at her as an enemy. He did not know what to expect from his classmate and what she wanted to do with this information. But surprisingly, she said she would have done the same to survive and save her life. But this did not calm Jonah down. He turned around and yelled at Isuri. He was angry at the girl's indifference. He cursed and asked what his classmate meant by that. But Isuri's answer surprised him. She said she wanted to know. She added that she wanted to know if she could trust John Wu. This time she looked him directly in the eye. Her face looked more alive. This phrase shocked the guy. He opened his eyes and mouth wide but remained silent. He was searching for the right words and simultaneously thinking about what he had just heard. He decided not to blindly trust Isura. The trauma of the betrayal had affected him, so now he distrusted all his classmates. He replied rather rudely that he would not want to get involved with her. But Yonwu couldn't finish his sentence. His eyes widened sharply and his teeth were numb. The guy looked bad. He fell to the ground, holding his arm. It seemed to hurt again, but this time even more. It was as if someone was controlling the pain. Isuri was shocked, but she didn't show it and just asked what was wrong. Still, the girl was worried about her classmate and changed her stone face. She ran up to Yonwu and asked if he was okay. Meanwhile, the medics were still dealing with the woman who was vomiting. It was as if John Wu had been transported to another world. During the pain, he was thrown out of reality and did not realize where he was. But the only thing he clearly understood was that the pain was not from the burn. He held onto his arm. He felt again that thousands of needles were poking into his arm at the same time. Suddenly, a familiar sound brought him back to reality. It made him panic because with the sound came memories. He and Isuri turned toward the noise to see what was happening. John Wu understood immediately, and so did I. But he could not believe his eyes. They were in a safe place. How could this have happened? When the teenagers turned around, they saw the woman start to turn into a zombie monster. The medics ran away from her in terror. Yan Wu and Isuri stood in a stupor and did not understand what to do. The boy thought he would never encounter those ugly zombie monsters again. Please support the channel, like, and subscribe for new episode. Meanwhile, someone was watching the news again. They were talking about how the people of Seoul were no longer using taps. Suddenly, a man wearing glasses and a mask started swearing at everyone. It turned out that it was a live broadcast. As it turned out, it was Park Min. He was watching this humorous news and laughing at what was happening. Ham Shang Yu was also on his phone. The announcer in the video swore that he was absolutely serious. It was not clear whether he was joking or not. He continued to swear and call everyone fools who watched the news on TV. He urged everyone to listen to his channel instead of the news. Suddenly, the mockery of this fake news was interrupted by a sharp, loud sound. The classmates turned to the sound of the noise. The two boys saw the medics running out of another part of the shelter one by one and shouting for everyone to run away. However, Park Min and Ham Xiong Yu just watched in silence and did not understand what was happening. Meanwhile, Isura and Yonwu were in real danger. A new zombie monster had just turned into a zombie near them, and all the employees had fled. They had to do something immediately. The woman, who was transforming into a hideous zombie monster, began to rise and growl, which meant that the transformation was about to end. 
Yan Wu looked at him in horror, and a clear understanding flashed through his mind that the pain in his arm was not for nothing. The guy had a bad feeling that the pain in his arm had done something to that woman, and that it was because of him that she had turned into a zombie monster. His heart was beating fast, his blood pressure was rising, and his breathing was becoming more labored. Suddenly, an officer came out of the room right next to the injured woman. He was holding a charger for Yon Wu. The man in uniform shivered when he saw what was happening to the poor woman. He stood in a stupor and did not move. Meanwhile, the woman was already getting up. The officer was obviously in danger, but he could not move out of fear. He looked through the crack of the door at what was happening. Suddenly, his eyes widened. He heard a scream and saw something he didn't want to see. The woman raised her head and looked at the man in uniform. She screamed at him. Half of her face was covered with the frog egg virus, but all of it was covered with cells. The officer started to close the door and asked if she was okay. But suddenly, the zombie monster's hands grabbed onto the door, preventing the uniformed man from closing it. The woman opened the door harder, and the officer's face looked even more shocked and scared. He did not know what to do, but he expected that it was the end, and that something bad was about to happen. However, the man did not give up. He tried to close the door back, even though it was already covered with frog eggs. Suddenly, the woman started screaming for help. It was a really sincere voice, begging for salvation. The officer looked at the woman with distrust and did not dare to come out. She started screaming that her stomach felt like it was on fire. Her voice was getting harsher and no longer sounded like a helpless person asking for help. Suddenly, the zombie monster became violent. She started screaming and swearing and asked if the officer had even heard what she had just said. She screamed in a non-human cry for him to just help her. Meanwhile, Yanwu and Isuri watched what was happening. The girl ran away without hesitation. The boy stood there and continued to look at the painting. Suddenly, Wu shouted to the officer to wait. Isuri heard this and stopped. She thought that her classmate would also run. But Wu ran away in the other direction and shouted to the officer that he would come running to him. But Isuri called out to her classmate. She did not understand what he was going to do and why he was not running away from the danger but rather going to the epicenter of the events. The girl shouted at Yonwu to stop. But his classmate shouted back that Isuri should find someone who could help him and as soon as possible. The boy sincerely felt that it was all his fault and he could not just leave his officer friend behind. He told his classmate Asura that they had to help him immediately. But the girl did not understand her classmate's heroism. She stood in a stupor for a few seconds and could not believe that Wu was really going to risk his life. Finally, Yonwu shouted that he was in a hurry and left the girl alone with her thoughts. Isuri yelled at his back that he was an idiot and had lost his mind. But Wu did not listen to her and kept running. He had to save the officer. The girl turned around and noticed an emergency exit plan and a map of the room behind her. Meanwhile, Wu ran as fast as he could. He had no plan, only a goal, to save the officer. Suddenly, he saw something as he was running to save himself. This made him slow down a bit and slow down. It turned out to be a fire extinguisher. John Wu took it. It was the only weapon he had. Perhaps it was completely illogical to use a fire extinguisher as a weapon, but he felt safer with it. In my head, I was thinking that the guy was too reckless, but he couldn't help himself. So he just ran at the zombie monster with that fire extinguisher. At the very least, it was supposed to take his attention away from the officer. He watched the zombie monster about to touch the officer. If that happened, there would be no one left to save. Suddenly, Yonwu was again detached from reality. His hand holding the fire extinguisher suddenly hurt again. It was as if it sensed its owner approaching a zombie monster. It was as if the woman who was turning into a hideous monster also suddenly felt Yonwa. She turned back to the boy and distracted herself from her victim. Yonwu ran to her and stopped, loudly recoiling. He told her to calm down and breathe deeply. The monster just looked at him in shock. John Wu continued to reassure the woman. He said that the man at the door was not a doctor. He added that he would bring medical workers to her to help her, so she could calm down. But the woman was shocked by the guy's speech. She was outraged that he told her to calm down. How could she be calm when her stomach was literally burning from the inside? The zombie monster started calling John Wu a little shit. She said he had no idea how she felt, but he asked her to calm down. It seems that the guy's words did not calm her down,
but rather made her very angry. Yan Wu was clearly not expecting to hear that. The woman asked if the boy were in her place. Could he be calm then? It seemed that the zombie monster's patience was about to run out. Suddenly, a crazy woman attacked the guy screaming. John Wu was shocked by this behavior. It turned out that the zombie monster could not be calmed by words. He reacted quickly. It was clear that the guy had almost no fear. He pointed a fire extinguisher at the zombie monster and foam poured out on the woman. Yonwu did not fully understand what was happening. He stared at the zombie monster and screamed, pressing harder on the fire extinguisher handle. Meanwhile, almost everything was covered in white foam. It seemed that the fire extinguisher hadn't helped much. And John Wu was beginning to realize this. Even such a strong pressure coming from the foam did not stop the zombie monster much. It attacked Jonah and screamed for him to die. The woman looked very crazy and wished the guy dead, as if she blamed him for what happened to her. Yon Wu was frozen. He could neither say anything nor retreat. He just watched as the zombie monster flew at him. Suddenly, someone shouted at him to move the idiot. This someone was holding a hose. It turned out that it was Isuri. She brought a water hose and directed the stream directly into the face of the zombie monster. The girl yelled at her classmate that his idea was very stupid and stupid. She didn't understand how he could have guessed to use a fire extinguisher, since John Wu hadn't put out the fire. Such a strong water pressure threw the zombie monster backwards, and the woman fell on her back on the floor. John Wu watched with great surprise as Isuri rescued him. His classmate was smarter than he thought. Suddenly, a frightened officer came out of the room. He was shaking with fear. Suddenly, Yan Wu noticed that the man in uniform was holding his arm. He noticed that the officer's hand was covered with the frog egg virus. That's why the man was shaking. His body was turning into a zombie monster. The officer shouted that this was impossible. The virus was spreading too fast. Yan Wu looked at this with horror. He could not believe that he had not been able to save his friend from death. The man in uniform started scratching himself, thus helping the virus to spread through his body. The officer looked at Yonva. His eyes were tearing up. The man begged to call someone for help, but they didn't have to wait long. Officers with guns in hand and yellow suits were already running toward them. They shouted for everyone to put their hands up. The rescuers pointed their weapons at Yonva and Isuri. But the girl put her hands up and said they were not infected. A zombie monster roared from behind, so it was easier for people in uniform to recognize the real danger. Suddenly, one of the rescuers in yellow suits shouted that they had found an infected person and added that his approximate level was C. Meanwhile, a real zombie monster was already standing in front of them, about to attack its victims. The men in uniform pushed Isuri and Jonwa apart to get to the danger. They were carrying hoses with some kind of weapon in their hands. An officer also came out of the door. The rescuers said they had found another infected person. The officer shouted with tears in his eyes for them to save him. He was begging for help. Suddenly he heard the phrase, destroy. The officer's last words were for help. His eyes widened greatly. He realized what was about to happen. Suddenly, fire poured out of the rescuers' weapons. They were ruthless and not at all afraid to burn down the building. Yon Wu watched what was happening and was incredibly hurt. He could not save his officer friend. Suddenly, the guy started screaming at the rescuers. He shouted that they shouldn't have done that. One of them stopped Yonva so that he wouldn't burn himself along with the zombie monsters. Suddenly, a gun was pointed at his face. John Wu did not expect this development. A man in uniform, apparently a military man, ordered two classmates to follow them. Another rescuer also pointed his weapon at Isuri. Yon Wu's face changed dramatically. He was afraid that the military would blame them for what had happened, and then they would burn him alive. Isuri and Yonva were taken out of the room and into a tent. The boy was sitting on a chair, and the girl was walking around in circles, unable to find a place. Both were very worried about their future. The girl could not cope with her emotions, so she decided to speak first. She said it couldn't be true. What happened? Isuri could not believe that people in suits, military men, they burned innocent people alive. The girl continued that even if they were infected, it did not give the officer the right to burn those people alive. Isuri was shaking from the injustice and cruelty she felt and saw. Yonwu was just silent. He covered his face with his hands. He was upset, 
because he could not save the officer who had become his friend. Suddenly, the guy apologized. He said it was all his fault. But Asuri is now angry with the military because of him as well. He added that if it weren't for him, the girl wouldn't have seen it all and wouldn't have gotten involved in the problem at all. But Isura was outraged by these words. She was angry with Yonwa for thinking that he was to blame for everything. She shouted that she did not understand the boy at all. Isuri started scolding Yonwa for acting completely recklessly by going there. The boy had simply lost his common sense and sense of fear if he acted so irresponsibly. But suddenly, Yonwu's arm hurt again, and his face twisted in pain. John Wu seemed to burst and began to express everything that had been pent up inside him. He said he went there because the officer was supposed to bring him a charger. If not for John Wu, the man in uniform would never have gone there and would not have died from being burned alive. That is why the young man felt that he had to save him. But Isuri replied briefly that everything Yan Wu said was nonsense. But the boy added that he was very grateful to his classmate. The girl even turned around in surprise. She did not expect such gratitude. John Wu continued that he himself did not expect Isuri to come back and save the boy. He raised his head and looked his classmate straight in the eye and thanked her again very sincerely. It hurt him so much that no one had ever thanked him for saving him on the Namsan cable car, so he knew how important it was to tell others. Isuri seemed to be trying to say something. She was picking up words in her head, although she did not understand why she was doing it. She just felt that she had to help. That's all. Suddenly, people in white suits entered the tent. They were completely covered. Their faces were not visible. A man with a tablet in his hand said the names of the teenagers. He said he apologized for keeping them waiting so long and thanked them for their cooperation. Isuri immediately made her stony face and asked defiantly if they could be free now. Yonwu, meanwhile, was wiping tears from his face without his classmate seeing it. But the girl received a negative answer to what she thought was a rhetorical question. The masked man replied that the two of them had to go to quarantine first. Yonwu and Isuri agreed to quarantine, although they realized that the issue was more formal and they had no choice not to go. The workers in white suits said that the teenagers could leave with their belongings. A man with a tablet kept writing something down on a piece of paper. Isuri jokingly told Yanwu not to come close to her and moved away from her classmate. The boy put on his shoulder bag and thus showed the workers his bandaged arm. One of the workers noticed this and called out to Yonwa. He said to him behind his back that he just wanted to thank the guy because he was really good at his job. But for some reason, Yanwu did not stop. In fact, he wanted to get away from them as soon as possible. The masked man ordered him to stop. John Wu turned to him. It turned out that the guy was being called out by the one with the tablet in his hands, who was writing something down all the time. As it turned out, this man wanted to examine Yon Wu's arm, which was supposed to have burns due to the fire on the Namsan cable car. The doctor asked if his arm was being treated, but John Wu could not say a word. His heart was beating frantically, and his blood pressure rose so high that his head began to hurt from the influx of blood. He was very worried about what was under the bandages. After a short pause, the man said that his arm was being treated. John Wu watched very closely as the masked man cut the bandage on his arm. The doctor thought that the boy was uncomfortable or in pain, and that was why he was acting so strangely. So the man apologized for the inconvenience and said that it was all in accordance with the protocol. Yan Wu didn't even listen to him much, just nodded. His mouth fell open and drops of sweat trickled down his face. They were about to see what was on his hand and would probably burn him on the spot. He imagined that the frog egg virus was on his arm right now, like when he came to and saw his hand covered with white blisters without cells. But the doctor told Jean Vu that he and his arm were fine. This was the most important thing for him. Despite the specialist's words, he still felt very anxious inside. The man in the white mask looked at Yanva with a surprised face. The employee called the guy by name, but in response, he received silence. Then the man in the white mask called the boy's name again. John Wu finally came back to reality. The masked man's scream scared him. The staff member said and pointed to the guy's bandaged arm. Yan Wu took his hand to his side, and the masked man asked if he could look at the patient's hand. Meanwhile, the events moved to the gym, where other patients and victims of the frog egg virus were located. The room was in complete chaos, 
Everyone was running and screaming and pushing each other. Suddenly, a man wearing a mask and a yellow shirt entered the room and the frantic, frightened people. He told everyone to immediately calm down and stop running. It turned out that everyone was running to the door leading to the street. But a man stood in front of the door and asked everyone to listen to him and calm down. He said that the door was not even open, but the crowd still didn't listen to him. The man who ran first called the worker in the yellow shirt an idiot and told him to get out of his way because they all wanted to live. Suddenly the door, guarded by a man in a yellow shirt, opened. The crowd pushed the worker out and opened the door. When people were running away, they shouted at the worker and called him an asshole for deceiving them and not letting them leave the room. All this was observed by people who were trying to get into the building. After all, it was a safe haven for all Seoul citizens. There were soldiers with weapons standing near them. The man who ran first got to the exit. There was a soldier with a gun waiting for him. The madman was shouting at him to get out of his way. But the soldiers stopped the fugitives and told them to listen carefully and stop. They said that the crowd had to cooperate with them, as no one could leave the premises. Meanwhile, Park Min and Ham Xiong Yu were running out of the room following the crowd. But Min turned back and slowed down, distracted by something. His classmate noticed and asked if he wanted to die. Park Min had to run faster and not be distracted by anything. The guy looked at the gymnasium that had been their shelter. There was not a soul there. Everyone had fled and left their belongings behind. Suddenly, Park Min stopped Ham Xiong Yun by the arm. He told his friend to stop, but this made his classmate angry because he had to run away if everyone was running away. But it seems that Park Min was not so stupid. He told his classmates to take a closer look because there were no monsters in the room, so there was no point in running away. Ham Sung Yu believed his friend and took a closer look. He was surprised, and it was clear that he was beginning to understand what was going on. Park Min looked at his friend sternly and asked if he wanted to put himself in danger like he did in Namsan. He added that if they ran away, they would probably die like those people. Suddenly, men in uniform, probably military, burst into the room. One of them shouted at the man who ran first and managed to get out of the room. The soldier thanked him for his cooperation, and the man responded by calling him a bastard and asking if he would let him leave. But people in uniform lined up and said they could not let them pass. The chief military officer added that they had to undergo a security check in order to leave, according to the security protocol. At this point, a man in uniform next to him elbowed him. It seems that the soldier was not telling the truth. But the crowd did not like this idea. They did not understand that it was clearly more dangerous outside than inside the shelter. People were shouting and saying that there was an infected person here, so the military had to make way for them. Suddenly, a man in uniform said something that made them all very scared and scream. The soldier said that outside they would all die. He went on to say that the danger level for Namsan and the entire county had risen to level 3. It seems that this was because the number of infected monster people was increasing. The soldier added that, in comparison, the level of danger here is equal to that of the district around the Hangen River, which was the most dangerous place of all that was infected. The faces of the people were even more surprised. The words of the man in uniform gave me goosebumps. He added that the infected man whom everyone was so afraid of was now just embers because he had been burned alive. In the meantime, the premises were being sterilized, so the crowd did not have to worry. The authorities took good care of them and their safety. Finally, the military officer said that while they were doing this, he asked that people cooperate with the security personnel for the common cause of minimizing the level of danger and risk. Other soldiers told the crowd to disperse and trust them. You could see the dissatisfaction on people's faces, but at the time they did not know where they would be safer so it was probably better to stay in the shelter. Suddenly, a wealthy-looking woman apologized to the man standing behind her. She seemed to have stepped on his foot. The man turned out to be homeless and looked like it. He politely replied that everything was fine, but the woman should have been more careful. But the lady's reaction changed dramatically. She was about to scream. The woman screamed and abruptly pulled away from the homeless man. She was behaving very manners and holding a bag of an expensive, well-known brand. The woman showed with her whole appearance that this man was no match for her. Next to the homeless man stood his friend, who also had no home. They both stood in complete disbelief at what was happening and what the woman was doing. 
Suddenly, the woman screamed as if she had seen zombie monsters. She was screaming and cursing, asking who let the homeless into the room. Her behavior did not match the image that the lady was trying to create. Meanwhile, the men still did not understand the woman's behavior. It was clear that it was unusual for them to hear and see such a reaction to their presence. The woman continued to scream and behave abnormally. She was asking for someone to do something and shouting that the homeless men should not approach her, waving her bag like a broom. But the rich woman was attacked in return. She tried to approach the crowd, but people pulled away and told her to stay away from them because she had touched the homeless and was therefore dangerous to others. A man of no fixed abode watched this circus as two women who decided they were better than the others argued about who shouldn't approach whom. He was genuinely surprised by this behavior. Suddenly the homeless man could not stand it and screamed at the top of his lungs and took off his cap, throwing it to the floor. It was clear that he was very angry. The man began to take off his outerwear and sent people away, calling them bastards. The crowd, meanwhile, gathered in a pile and watched what was happening from a distance. Their faces were very surprised. The homeless man took off his t-shirt and called everyone else freaks. The man wanted to show that he did not look like an infected person. He hoped that this act would make them feel ashamed of their behavior. The homeless man defiantly threw his t-shirt on the floor and asked the voice if he looked like an asshole. The man was very angry. Even if he did not have a permanent place to live and expensive things, it did not make him worse than others and did not give people the right to treat him like that. He yelled at the rich woman and called her a bitch. She was screaming and covering her face with her hand, obviously afraid that the homeless man might hit her or do something like that. But the man was shouting at the woman and asking everyone to take off their clothes to prove that there were no infected people here. He ordered the lady to take off her clothes. Meanwhile, the woman tried to run away from the angry homeless man. Then the military joined the fight. The woman pretended to be a victim and threw herself behind the workers, shouting that the man was crazy. The homeless man wanted to get to the woman and asked if she wanted him to get completely naked. The soldier tried to calm the man down, but the homeless man lost his mind. He was very offended by the fact that they were looking down on him. So the soldiers had to twist him up and take him away to calm him down. Meanwhile, the man was shouting to be let in and calling the others animals. Meanwhile, Park Min and Ham Song Yu passed by and demonstratively covered their noses. Suddenly, Park Min looked off to the side. Something caught his attention. While the homeless man was shouting to be released, Yon Wu and Isuri entered the room, accompanied by other soldiers with machine guns. My classmates didn't notice the chaos going on around them. They walked with their heads down. Suddenly, John Wu heard someone calling his name. His mind was elsewhere, so he was surprised to hear his name. He looked up at the shout and saw Park Min waving and smiling at him. He was asking where Yon Wu was, but the boy didn't want to answer, let alone meet Park Min. Yon Wu's face looked quite frightened and a drop of sweat was running down his cheek. John Wu told the military man who accompanied them and Isura that he needed to go to the restroom for a second. The boy completely ignored his classmate's question. Park Min and Ham Xiong Yu just opened their mouths in surprise. They clearly hadn't expected Yan Wu to behave this way. Meanwhile, Isuri sensed something strange in her classmate's behavior and stopped when she heard Yan Wu going to the restroom. She put on her stone face again and thought about a plan of action. Meanwhile, John Wu was walking down the stairs. They reminded him of the stairs on the Namsan cable car, but he tried to push those thoughts aside because he was worried about something else. He went to the light to get a better look at his hand. The guy was looking at it very carefully. Yon Wu's face was frightened. His heart was beating fast and his blood pressure rose. He could not believe what he was seeing and what had happened. It seemed that John Wu was about to lose his mind. The guy looked at his hand for a very long time. It seemed to him that an eternity had passed. All the emotions of worry and fear that had turned into internal anxiety finally came out. But John Wu could not come to his senses and believe what he was seeing. It seemed like a dream to him. He recalled what the doctor had said when he removed the bandage. The worker then asked Yonwa if he was right and there was definitely a burn on his arm because there was no trace of it. From the outside, it might have seemed that the guy was crazy. After all, John Wu was just standing by the light and silently staring at his hand, not even moving. He should have been more careful not to let anyone notice. 
There was only one question in the young man's mind. How did this happen? He clearly remembered and felt a severe burn on his hand. Even though John Wu was not good at biology, he knew for sure that the burn could not have healed so quickly and without a trace. There had to be something left. But instead his hand was completely clean. What did John Wu feel then? Why did the intense and sharp pain come back every time, clouding his mind? These questions were driving John Wu crazy. He had one obsessive thought in his head. John Wu didn't want to admit it, so he kept dismissing the idea. But it seemed to be true. There was still a monster in John Wu's hand. Suddenly, the guy fell down and threw up a lot. This hypothesis was so frightening that even the thought of it did not give him peace of mind. He was panting heavily, as if he had run a marathon. His heart was beating fast and his blood pressure was rising. Yan Wu thought that he had burned the virus before it reached the brain, so it did not infect the boy's body. Moreover, the boy did not turn into a zombie monster. It was all very strange. The guy had been in the restroom for too long, so he started to go back down, holding onto the railing because his coordination was disturbed by the shock. As he walked away, he thought that he first needed to learn more about his condition and avoid any physical contact, even though everyone who touched John Wu was not infected. But what bothered him the most was the annoying pain. He had to check again whether it was really a reaction to the virus. Meanwhile, Yon Wu was already walking back into the room and trying to keep his cool. Suddenly, Asuri stood around the corner, leaning against the wall. She immediately asked where Yon Wu was and did not even turn in his direction. She was waiting for her classmate and had many questions for him. Yon Wu was frightened by this attack. He was annoyed that his classmate understood too much and was looking for some pitfalls in him. But he had to keep his voice down and not let on that something was wrong. Isuri asked sarcastically if John Wu had urinated on the stairs in the hallway, since the toilet was not there. Her face was stony as usual, with a tinge of displeasure. The boy thought about how to answer this question, but the girl did not let him answer and kept asking. Isuri asked why Yon Wu had deceived her. She finally looked at him to kill him with her piercing gaze and to better discern her classmate's reaction to this interrogation. But Yon Wu held himself well. He simply asked her calmly what he had deceived her about, without even looking into Isuri's eyes. He didn't want to give himself away. The girl was irritated by this answer. She turned on Jonah and repeated his question in an angry manner. Her voice was full of anger, but Isuri did not give up easily. She followed Yonwu, because he was clearly running away from her, and did not want to continue the conversation. She told her classmate not to make a fool of himself, because he told her, and all the workers that his hand was burned. Yon Wu did not let her finish and interrupted her, saying that Isuri had to see that his hand had just healed. He pulled his cap down a little lower and looked at the floor as he walked so that his eyes were not visible. You could always tell by the eyes that a person was lying. Meanwhile, John Wu thought that the throbbing pain was not from the burn. It seemed to be felt somewhere in his nerves inside. Isuri responded to the boy's words by asking if Yon Wu thought she was stupid. After all, there was such a big bandage on the boy's arm, as if it were a huge wound. It could not have healed so quickly. Meanwhile, the teenagers approached the angry crowd. They could hear people indignant at having to share a room with a monster. Meanwhile, John Wu told Isura that he had no reason to deceive her, although he knew inside that there was no reason to trust him. The girl picked up on this idea and asked him why he lied if there was no reason to do so. Suddenly, the guy felt the pain go away. This meant that there were no infected inside. But he was not sure. This theory was worth testing. Meanwhile, the military continued to deal with the violent homeless. His other friends stood up for the man. The situation was not resolved. Suddenly, Asuri touched her classmate's shoulder to show support and tell her that she could be trusted. Physical contact brought people closer together. But Yan Wu's reaction to this was somewhat strange and only further confirmed the girl's theory that the boy was deceiving her and something was wrong. The teenager jumped up and pulled away from Isuri, shouting loudly for her not to touch him. Yan Wu's hand even curled into a fist involuntarily. The girl could not stand this acting any longer and asked him directly what the guy was trying to hide from her and from everyone else. Yon Wu was a very bad actor, so it was written all over his face that this question was right on target. 
He looked up with frightened eyes. Izuri's tone changed. She said that Yonwu himself understood that she could not and would not stand aside when she was so interested in something. Her stone face showed no emotion. Only her mouth moved. Izuri threatened that if Yonwu deceived her again, she would kill him. She asked him again, clearly minting each word, why he had lied about his arm then. Her gaze pierced to the bone. John Wu was stunned and did not know what to say. He just opened his mouth to avoid looking suspicious, but he had no idea what to say to Isura. The boy had already started a sentence. Suddenly, something made him stop. He again felt a humiliating sharp pain in his arm. It interrupted him, and the guy's eyes widened and his pupils narrowed. Meanwhile, the military abruptly entered the building. They seemed to burst in, with a crowd following them. One of the men in uniform loudly ordered everyone to disperse and move aside. This distracted both Yanwa and Isuri. The boy could breathe a sigh of relief, but the girl realized that their conversation had been interrupted and was not happy about it. The young man looked carefully at the crowd. He realized that the pain was caused by someone who had come with the crowd. Hit like for the next episode. Meanwhile, everyone was gathered in the hall near the stage to make an important announcement. People sat down below the stage and listened intently. Two men wearing masks and yellow shirts said that new quarantine protocols had been issued and wanted to explain the details. He went on to instruct everyone present to keep their distance and avoid physical contact in order to avoid being infected by those whose symptoms of the frog egg virus had not yet manifested. Park Min and Ham Sung Yu were among the first to sit down, but they couldn't stop looking at their phones. But the phrase about keeping a distance outraged them. They began to be indignant in one voice and said that it was impossible because the room was packed with people. Suddenly something distracted Park Min. He heard a notification from his phone and looked at it. He was followed by others. Everyone started receiving notifications on their phones and they took turns pinging. It looked like the connection was back. Ham Sung Yu shouted to his friend about the class group chat. There were to be many messages from classmates. They had the opportunity to contact their friends and adjust their course of action toward the shelter. Park Min opened the app and entered the group chat. There were quite a few unread messages, and all of them were negative. Someone said that they were all going to die, and another student asked about not being able to find anyone and called him. Someone also sent a rather scary video. Park Min was horrified by what he read. Shivers ran down his spine. Ham Xiong Yu read that Seo Young and Cha Hyunju were safe because they were on top of Mount Namsan. The guy was sincerely surprised by the girl's action and commented that it was quite smart to go up instead of down. Meanwhile, behind them, Yan Wu was quietly sitting and listening to the conversation. Ham Xiong Yu was talking about his classmate, Tai In. It seemed that he had also been infected. This information saddened and angered Xiong Yu at the same time. He went on to comment on his death. Thane was a good guy, even though he had a lot of dandruff in his hair. Meanwhile, John Wu's ears perked up. He couldn't miss any information about Soyeon and wanted to make sure she was okay and safe. But other thoughts also weighed on his mind. He could not forget that most likely someone among them was infected. His arm hurt for a reason. Someone had caused his pain. Park Min suggested counting all the surviving classmates. He wrote in a group chat to ask everyone to send in their location. But some of them didn't have cell phones. Suddenly, someone in the crowd wearing a blue t-shirt stood up and shouted at the workers in yellow shirts that the quarantine was useless. He said that someone was infected and they could not be calm in such conditions. He was supported by another man in a hoodie. He stood up and shouted that there were children here as well. He went on to threaten that if the workers did not take them to a safe place, the crowd would complain about them. But the man in the yellow shirt wasn't afraid. He said in a calm tone that he apologized for all the staff for the temporary inconvenience caused. He went on to say that the quarantine zone was already investigating the accident, so the audience had nothing to worry about. They were safe, as far as the situation allowed. The man in uniform continued that, based on an epidemiological study, an infected rat had entered the room. These words caught John Wu's attention. He perked up his ears and listened intently. Meanwhile, his classmates were still on their phones. Yon Wu ran the word rat over and over in his head. 
He found it quite strange and could not believe what he was hearing. Meanwhile, the worker continued to calm the crowd and said that the cause had already been identified, so they would try to make everything safer. Suddenly, Yon Wu poked Isuri, who was sitting in front of him. The boy was very scared and asked if his classmate had heard what the man in the yellow shirt had said. He was panicking, you could hear it in his voice. Yon Wu said that there were no rats in the corridor at the time. He asked if Isuri had noticed anything, but the girl behaved calmly did not even turn to her classmate and said that they would never say that they let an infected person into the shelter, so they made up another reason. But Yonwu panicked further. He asked if Isuri had also seen a person who had absolutely no contact with the virus suddenly turn into a zombie monster. Wu continued, his eyes wide. He hypothesized that perhaps some people did not convert immediately. It was something like an incubation period. Isuri had not yet returned to her classmate. She asked him calmly if he wanted to tell everyone present about it. There was a touch of irony in her words and voice. It seemed that she did not take John Wu's experience as something significant. She went on to say that there was no point in doing so, because the workers would dismiss it as something that was ridiculous. She added that a dumb guy like John Wu would say something like that. These words really hurt my classmate. His expression changed dramatically. He had trusted Asura in vain. Yonwu turned away from the girl and said there was no point in explaining anything to her, adding that he shouldn't have spoken to Isuri at all. She had just lost his trust. She was beginning to realize that she should have been more careful what she said. The situation had to be rectified if she wanted Wu to tell her about his hand. Suddenly she called out to a classmate. Her voice sounded more friendly. Wu turned toward the sound. Suddenly Isuri stood up and looked at Yonwa menacingly. The boy did not know what to expect from his classmate. Then the girl threw her charger to Jean Vu. She briefly and exhaustively told him to take it. It scared him a little and surprised him at the same time. He could not have expected this from his classmate, Isuri. The guy looked up at the girl and asked if she would lend him her charger. His expression was quite surprised. He still did not understand what was happening. Suddenly, Yan Wu thanked Isura for the charger but the girl gave him her middle finger and turned around and left in silence. Ham Xiong Yu overheard their conversation and shouted after Isuri, asking if he could also borrow her charger for himself. But the girl did not respond to her classmate, so he continued to shout at her and asked if she could hear him. Meanwhile, Yan Wu was silently watching this situation with his mouth open. He looked quite surprised. He quickly reached the nearest power outlet and plugged his cell phone into the charger. John Wu couldn't remember the last time he had used his phone. Ever since he had been in the vault, his cell phone had been dormant. Finally, he saw his phone turn on and light up to show that it was charging. Now he could contact his parents and see what was going on in the classroom group chat. The guy looked at the black screen of his smartphone and saw his reflection. For a second, he caught himself thinking that he could live without his phone all day and not feel lonely. Yon Wu stared at his locked phone screen and thought about what Isuri had done. The girl's behavior was quite unusual for him. The guy started to remember school. He realized that he had never talked to her in class. The girl always sat alone, on the first desk, like any excellent student. Yan Wu recalled a school project. He was paired with his best friend Kim Jubin, and Isuri was in a group with two other girls, and they had to work on a joint project. Even then, the girl was always stone-faced and did not reveal her emotions except for excess and pride. When her classmates told her that the teacher had put them together to work on a project, Isuri simply said a curse word and added that she was in pain. She was not exactly friendly. Back then, Yan Wu noticed that his classmates' behavior was not very pleasant. He remembered overhearing a conversation about Isuri being a wild queen. And he wasn't the only one who thought she was unfriendly in the classroom at the time. When he remembered this, he thought to himself that he knew that his classmates were saying all sorts of unpleasant things about Isuri behind her back. Finally, Yonwu returned to reality and thought about everything he remembered about his school days. He was quite upset by these memories, but he began to better understand the behavior of his classmate Isuri. Suddenly, Wu thought that maybe the girl wasn't as bad as he thought she was. Then women came into the room and the guy overheard their conversation because she caught him from the first phrase. John Wu turned toward the sound. It was a group of three women discussing something, probably some gossip about the vault and the people in it. The women discussed what they had heard quite loudly and emotionally. 
One of them called the lady in the blue t-shirt too naive after what she had told them. The lady in the center with the hat on her head told the woman in the blue t-shirt to repeat what she had just told them. She reiterated that the people who came with her to the shelter said that there was already someone here who was immune to the frog egg virus. At this point, Yon Wu perked up his ears and listened intently to the women. Then they began to discuss the people they had come to the shelter with. The woman in the blue t-shirt continued that the person who told her the rumor was good at catching monsters and loved to help people. At first, she didn't believe it either and thought it was nonsense. But they, the people who came with them, said that they saw a person who was immune to the frog egg virus. John Wu listened to the conversation very carefully. His heart was beating faster and faster as what he was hearing caused him to panic. The women said that the infected boy was fine, even though he had touched the frog egg virus. The lady in the blue t-shirt went on to say that the infected man took her hand firmly and said something to her. All the other listeners were shocked by the story. But, unfortunately, she didn't have time to finish. Some guy interrupted her at the most interesting part. A young man with dark hair and a frightening smile interrupted and said that if he was in danger, God would tell him. His words sounded rather strange and alarming. John Wu watched what was happening closely. The women began to speak in favor of religion, and someone recommended that they go to church more often. The conversation stopped making sense. Meanwhile, the man continued to charge his phone and waited for it to turn on. The women went back to talking about the man who was immune to the frog egg virus. One of them offered to go to him, as he was a volunteer in the aid department. Yon Wu could not come to his senses. The phrase immunity kept running through his head. He could not believe what he had just heard. This conversation was making him panic and feel anxious in the background. He had to find out more about this man. Suddenly, John Wu didn't notice anyone approaching him because his thoughts and mind were elsewhere. It seemed to be the pious man who had recommended that he go to church more often. The teenager was a little scared because of what he heard, because he was flying in his mind. The man called out to him, and John Wu turned toward the sound. It turned out that it was the bus driver who had abandoned the boy's classmates to their fate. If he was here, then Han Mi and the other girls who had managed to get on the bus must have been in the shelter. The man turned to Yong Wu and asked for help. He asked the guy to borrow a charger. He probably wanted to call his daughter Jinyo. The man sounded very friendly, but something in his voice didn't sound right. However, John Wu was in no hurry to give him the charger and asked him again what the man needed. The guy started shaking his head to the side and saying that she was not here. He seemed to be looking for Isuri. Meanwhile, Yong Wu called his mom. His phone was finally charged. The guy still lent the charger to the bus driver and decided to call everyone at that time so that they would not worry about him. He told his mother that he was still in the shelter. He added that it would take some time before he could get out of Seoul. Yon Wu said that his parents should return to Chonin if possible, because there was no point in waiting for their son. Moreover, it was dangerous. With that, he said goodbye to his parents. The bus driver overheard his conversation. He asked if he was right to think that John Wu's parents were far away, but the boy did not answer. He silently turned to the man and looked at him with a slightly surprised look that expressed slight dissatisfaction. The bus driver noticed this and said that he overheard him talking and added an apology at the end. It seems that he had manners after all. Yon Wu was a friendly teenager, so he said it was no big deal. He explained that he was stuck here because of a field trip, and his parents were visiting, so they were worried sick. The man sympathized with the boy and suggested that it must have been difficult for them to get to this place. The bus driver added that Yon Wu must have been worried about his parents, just as they were worried about their son. The man's voice was completely sad. He looked like he was about to start a sob story about his daughter and how he wanted to play with her. And so it happened. The bus driver said that he also has a daughter, and if he were in the same situation as Yon Wu's parents, he would have immediately gone to Seoul to save her. It is a pity that he did not want to save other children. Yon Wu did not understand the sad and more depressing motive in the man's voice, so he just nodded in response. But the bus driver did not stop. He continued to tell poor Yong Wu about his problems. He said that his daughter had been sick since she was a little girl. John Wu stood there silently, not knowing how to react or what to say. But fortunately or unfortunately, the bus driver was not about to let him speak. 
He told him that his daughter Jinyo had been hospitalized, even though she was only nine years old. The man wanted to hear support from a teenager he didn't know. He seemed to be very lonely. Suddenly, the bus driver came to his senses and realized that he had been playing too much. So he apologized to John Woo and closed the subject. But suddenly, the teenager also opened up to him. He told him that he had also been very sick when he was little. The bus driver's eyes widened at what he heard. John Woo continued to tell me that he waited every day for his mother to return from work in the hospital room. His gaze was downward. It looked like he was sad to remember this. Suddenly, he turned to the man and looked directly into his eyes. John Woo supported the driver and said that his daughter would definitely get better. The man laughed merrily after saying that and said that the guy not only lent him the charger, but also encouraged him and gave him hope. Suddenly, the bus driver changed the subject to the excursion Yon Wu was talking about. The man said he had heard about it from children who had fled Namsan. He asked again if Yon Wu had come to Seoul. Suddenly, the boy's heart beat fast. He heard familiar words. It could not be a coincidence. The children the bus driver was talking about were his classmates. But the man did not continue this topic. His attention turned to the call from his phone. The driver's face changed dramatically. A wide smile appeared on his face, and his eyes widened with joy. He told Yon Wu that it was his daughter who called him. The bus driver thanked the boy and said that he would return the favor. But he didn't specify what kind of kindness. The man abruptly stood up and walked away, happily talking on the phone with his Jin Yo, leaving Yon Wu alone with his thoughts. The boy looked at the man and was in a stupor. Later, he had to find him and ask him about these children who were going on a field trip to Namsan. John Wu headed into the crowd to find his classmates, including Isuri, to return her charger. The boy's mind was still filled with thoughts of the man who was immune. Yon Wu thought that he might have been able to get a better idea of the pain in his arm if he had met the man. He remembered that he had to look for the emergency room. Suddenly, when the teenager looked up, he saw his classmate Isuri sitting on her phone. John Wu went to her. The guy thanked her for the charger a little uncertainly and stammering and handed it to her. The girl didn't even turn to him. Suddenly, Isuri ignored John Wu's words and asked him if he had seen anything. The boy's face was frightened because he expected aggression from his classmate, as he had after their last conversation. Instead, the girl turned to him and said that someone had sent him a message in their class group chat. She showed it to Yan Wu. It was written by Kang Jehoon, the headman. He wrote that their company, which consisted of Seo Young, Kang Min, and a soldier, was near Namsun and hiding from a monster that was chasing them. He asked if anyone could help them. John Wu read it and could not believe his eyes. His heart was beating wildly at the thought that So Young was alive. Although he was very angry with her, his feelings were stronger than anger. The boy's eyes widened greatly. He was overwhelmed with hope to see his beloved again because she was next to Namsan. It was close enough. The story switched to the company that the bus driver had betrayed and left on the road. Kang Ji-hoon shouted out happily that he finally had a connection and could contact his classmates. Kang Min was also excited about this and started to pull out his phone to contact the others. But in any case, they had no idea what to do next. The company was hiding at a gas station. Behind the glass was a huge zombie monster that looked like a giant spider. It turned out that it was Gimson the cat. He was stalking the company and sensing his victims. They were looking through the glass at what was happening outside. The company had no idea what to do next or how to escape. The events shifted back a few hours when they were running away from the cats that attacked them after the bus driver betrayed the company and drove away. They ran away as fast as they could. Fortunately, the zombie cats did not have time to infect anyone. The first thing they saw on their way to take cover was a mini market. So without hesitation, the company decided to hide in it. The headman, Kang Jehoon, ran up first and started opening the door to go inside, while the soldier made sure that no monster followed him. Seo Young and Kang Min just looked away, but unfortunately the door was locked. It looked like no one was inside. So the company had to quickly find another shelter before the zombie monsters caught up with them. Although Kang Jihoon wanted to break down the door. Meanwhile, Kang Min spotted a gas station nearby where they could hide. It was very close, so the company had time. 
The boy told his classmate Kang Ji-hoon that if he broke the door, they would not be able to hide in the mini-market from the monsters. He suggested that they should hide in a gas station instead. The company had already started to leave, but Kang Ji-hoon offered to break down the door anyway and just take the food. But they talked him out of it. They left and didn't notice that someone was still inside the mini-market. Suddenly, the starosta turned around and noticed something strange that caught his attention. He carefully examined the floor of the convenience store. Something on it seemed rather strange to him. Some food was scattered on the floor. So, someone was inside and most likely covered themselves with chairs to prevent the monsters from getting inside. But Kong Jehoon ran after the others and didn't bother to find out what was in that strange mini-market. Kong Min ran first and said that they needed to get to the building as soon as possible. The events moved forward a few hours again, where Kang Min and Kang Ji-hoon were looking out for zombie monsters outside. They saw a cat that looked more like a giant spider. Luckily, the zombie monster didn't notice them and just walked around. The company also recognized the monster as Gimson the Cat, who was the favorite of their rescuer, their grandmother. The soldier started telling me terrible things. He said that when they were running away, the man clearly saw that one of the cats that had been set on fire had survived. It seemed to be him. The cat was at the end of the gang, so the fire did not reach him. He looked so powerful and invincible then. It inspired fear in the military. Suddenly, something worse happened. The cat reached the corpses of other cats and stopped. The man felt that something very strange was about to happen. What he saw made his blood run cold. The cat started to release its white tentacles and merged with the corpses of other cats, turning into one big zombie monster. Everyone was scared when they heard this information. After all, when a cat merges with other corpses, it is not so scary. But a human monster could do it, and it would be much more dangerous. The cat seemed to sense that they were talking about him and looked at the gas station door and growled. The military man saw this and said that the zombie monsters were stronger than they had imagined and thought. Suddenly, the zombie cat opened its big, ugly jaw and growled. It seemed to notice the company behind the glass. Luckily. It was over. The cat turned away from the glass door and walked on. Kang Jihoon asked what it was and why the zombie monster was looking back like that. Suddenly, the soldier's expression changed dramatically. He began to understand the behavior of the zombie cat. The man came up with the hypothesis that the cat was trying to find them in this way. The zombie monster was indeed constantly looking around, as if searching for victims. He felt that they were somewhere nearby because he was no longer chasing anyone. The military man said that if the cat followed them to the gas station and stopped, it meant that this zombie monster had a pretty strong sense of smell. Apparently, the zombie had skills from the victim it inhabited. But fortunately, the room was completely saturated with gasoline and various oils that had a pungent odor. So the soldier offered to wait inside until the zombie monster left them alone. Kang Jihoon and the soldier sat in the corners, Kang Min looked out the window and kept an eye on the situation. The starosta was obsessively trying to do something on his phone. It turned out that he was calling Hanma. The guy was very worried about what happened to her after that vile bus driver hit her in the face. But instead of the familiar voice of his classmate, Kang Ji-hoon heard an answering machine saying that the phone number he was calling was temporarily out of service. Kang Ji-hoon was unable to contain his emotions and swore out loud. The boy told his friend Kang Min that she did not pick up the phone. His classmate asked him who he was talking about. Kang Jehoon was very upset and scared. He had no choice but to write to the class chat to ask if someone could contact Hong Mi or call Hannah and Min Ju, as they were also on the bus. Suddenly, the guy could not stand it and screamed loudly in a mat, holding his head with his hands. His shouting attracted Kang Min's attention. Even a friend would not have expected such behavior from the elder Kang Jehoon. He swore that he would kill the damn bus driver if he caught him. The guy wanted revenge for Han Mi. It seems that he really cared about the girl. Kang Ming looked at his friend who was shouting at the top of his voice how angry he was and thought of something to say to support him. The boy recalled that Kang Jihoon himself had told him that even if the bus left, everything would still be fine. He ironically added that he was angry now, and it turns out that he didn't believe his own words. Kang Min had a smile on his face. But Kang Ji-hoon looked down at his friend and said in an angry voice that he was angry for the wrong reason. His gaze was very confident. But Kang Min didn't believe him and laughed right in his face. 
He said that when the bus left, Kang Ji-hoon's mind was blown. It seems that his friend was hinting that someone was very much in love. Suddenly, Headmaster Kang Ji-hoon stood up abruptly and walked toward the door, shouting angrily from behind him for his friend Kang Min to leave him alone. But his classmate ignored his fake anger and added that Kang Ji-hoon's behavior only proved Kang Min's truthfulness. The headman opened the door and left the room where they were all sitting. Kang Min asked him where he was going. Did he really want to escape the conversation so badly? Kang Jehoon told him to go to hell and said that he wanted to look for some food because he was very hungry. The guy walked into the other room slowly, looking around. The chairs were upside down and the table was a mess. Kang Jehoon reached out to open one of the top drawers. He hoped that there would be some food in there, but instead, he just swore loudly that there was no food in it again. It seemed that this was not the first drawer. Had the people who worked here left no crumbs behind? Kang Jehoon thought for a second. A situation was running through his mind. He couldn't control his emotions and keep from thinking about it. The guy remembered the moment when a lousy, disgusting bus driver beat his beautiful and innocent Han Mi. How she screamed and cried in pain. That raghead was hitting the teenager with all his might. Kang Jehoon's eyes were filled with anger. He couldn't contain his emotions. He wanted revenge right here and now. He had to get to the vault to find that bastard and pay him back. The guy remembered his girlfriend's crying face and busted lip again, and with the anger that had been building up inside him all this time, he slammed the closet door. Suddenly, he heard the voice of a soldier from behind him, so he turned to the sound. The man was telling Kang Ji-hoon to break down all the doors. He was obviously saying it with irony. After that, he added instructively that if the guy was angry, he should go to the corner and get angry there. The soldier continued and asked if Kang Ji-hoon had forgotten about the monster that was looking for them outside. Surprisingly, the starosta didn't say anything, although he could have and wanted to start a fight. Perhaps then he would have released all his aggression, but the boy remained silent. Kang Ji-hoon simply turned around and wanted to leave the room, as he realized that the soldier was not going to leave. Suddenly, he was stopped by a man's question. He asked if all this behavior and aggression was because of that girl. Although the soldier did not mention her name, they both understood who he was talking about. Kang Ji-hoon turned sharply to the man and looked at him with an angry look in his eyes. The soldier was invading his privacy, even though Kang Ji-hoon didn't look like a person who liked to share anything personal. But the man wasn't afraid of him, so he asked if they had been close before, including in middle school. He remembered Han Mi telling him this. Kang Ji-hoon guessed that such precise facts could not be a hypothesis through observation. So he asked the soldier if it was Hong Mi who told him that they had been close. But the man was silent. He stood with his back to the boy and said nothing. So Kang Ji-hoon wanted to justify himself somehow and said that everyone was close to her, hinting that she was just that kind of person and had good communication with everyone. The guy continued to justify himself, but was unable to finish. The soldier interrupted him because he did not want to listen to this deception. He asked directly if the two of them had met before. This question caused Kang Ji-hoon's face to change dramatically. And without his answer, it was clear that the soldier had hit the nail on the head with his question. The man casually opened the door of a cabinet and wanted to take something out, making a rather long pause in their conversation, making it clear that Kang Ji-hoon would have to answer his questions. But the guy was silent. So the soldier bluffed and said that Han Mi had told him when they were making Molotov cocktails together. The man suddenly imagined these memories. He just asked if they were close. The girl was very nervous and answered yes, but then added that she had dated Kang Jehoon until middle school. The guy turned pale from this information, and drops of sweat ran down his face. It was obvious that he was embarrassed that the military man knew about it. Kang Jehoon replied that it didn't mean anything and it wasn't his business anyway. The guy was acting quite stupid, but that was because he had nothing to say. He was cornered. But the soldier's response surprised him. He said that he only wanted to help him. At this phrase, Kang Ji-hoon's pupils dilated and his eyebrows rose to his forehead. The man turned to look at his friend and added that he would help him find his so-called girlfriend or girlfriend. Meanwhile, so Yon sat in the room and watched through the glass what was happening outside. Suddenly, someone handed her a hot drink in a paper cup from a vending machine. He offered Soyeon a drink. That someone was Kang Min. 
He scared the girl a little. She still couldn't get used to what had been happening to her all these days. The guy said that there was instant coffee. This gesture of kindness made the girl happy. She hadn't eaten for a long time and a hot drink was perfect at that moment. A smile appeared on her face. Kang Min wanted to talk to his classmate. He asked her what she saw through the glass and then added whether she was afraid of the cats. The question was quite strange, but Seo Young realized that the boy was just looking for an excuse to talk. But the girl's mood was quite pessimistic. She was looking down. Her gaze was very sad, as if something had been weighing her down all this time. Some obsessive thought. She started talking about something she wanted to do. It was clear from her voice that Soyeon was up to no good. She said that she was a burden to her friends, especially since she was wounded. But the guy didn't let her finish and interrupted her. He said it was enough that they were already together. Kang Min asked if her thought was because of Kang Jihoon. He told Seo Young not to listen to the headman. The girl was silent. It was obvious that her classmates' words did not encourage her much, and she kept thinking about her stupid idea. Kang Ming noticed this mood and had to quickly think of something else to cheer up. He said that any time she was in a fight, she had a hammer with her. But Seo Young didn't understand what Kang Min was talking about, so he smiled and reminded her of the hammer he had given her on the bus. This brought a smile to the girl's face. It seems that Kang Min managed to cheer the girl up and improve her mood. The girl abruptly opened her purse and quickly started looking for something in it. And then she took out a small red hammer and showed it to Kang Min. Seo Young's expression became kinder and gentler. He was like that in school. She laughed and said that fighting with that hammer was like committing suicide. Kang Min was also amused by this phrase and said that Seo Young was holding it wrong. Meanwhile, Kang Jihoon came up to them and silently watched what was happening. He interrupted the fun of his classmates and said that he thought Kang Min was watching over their safety from the outside, but it turned out that he was talking nonsense. Seo Young's face changed dramatically, and it was clear that she didn't like the headmaster. Kang Min sensed this and realized that he had to support his friend, because she was already suffering from what Kang Jihoon had said to her earlier. He whispered to Seo Young to remember that if she listened to the headman, she would become a failure like him. Jihoon heard this and was outraged. But Kang Min abruptly changed the subject and said that he recalled that Kang Jihoon had written to the group's chat room and asked if anyone had replied to his message. But by the look on Kang Jihoon's face, he realized that something was wrong with the group. There was an air of anger about him. Park Min answered the boy and called him a freak. He was indignant that the chief had left Yan Wu alone on the cable car. He called Jihoon an asshole and said that the boy shouldn't have done that. Park Min also added that Kim Jubin had sacrificed himself and died to save Yan Wu. Kang Jihoon shouted to the others and told them to read the message from Park Min. So Young and Kang Min quickly pulled out their phones and opened a group chat. So Yan's face changed dramatically. Her heart beat faster. She was overjoyed to hear the news because it meant that Yan Wu had survived and she didn't have to blame herself so much for running away. Ham Song Yu added that he and Yang Wu were in hiding. He asked if their company was now in Namsan and asked if it was revenge. Headmaster Kang Jihoon asked out loud if Ham Xiong Yu wanted to die. He was very angry and did not understand what the two classmates were talking about, although Seo Young had repeatedly reminded him that they had indeed betrayed Yan Wu and left him for dead. The boy almost miraculously survived. Suddenly, they heard a sound from outside. All three of them looked up to see what had happened. They heard someone screaming. The scream seemed to be coming from a convenience store. Kang Min was the first to ask what was going on. Kang Jihoon mentioned that he heard strange sounds of a box falling as they tried to get inside. The teenagers saw people running out of the mini market. There were a lot of them. They were running and screaming as if someone was inside. Maybe it was a zombie monster. So Yon was very scared because she didn't want to run away from anyone again. And these people could run to them and bring a monster with them. Suddenly, a large zombie monster ran out of the convenience store, breaking the glass. It seems that one of those people was infected and became a monster. The teenagers saw people running straight to their gas station. Kang Jihoon was unhappy that the crowd was running straight to them. A guy was the first to arrive at the gas station door. He began to break down the door and apologize. So they hadn't opened the company's door on purpose, 
and now they wanted to take shelter of them themselves. The man was screaming like crazy and apologizing. He swore that they were going to open the door for them, but the company had already left. He begged them to let the teenagers open the door for them, but their classmates were not going to open the door to them right away. Kang Jihoon told them not to, because the monsters were coming from the mini market, so some of them could be infected. On the other hand, if a zombie monster caught them now, the teenagers would have several times more enemies. The man who was running last realized they weren't going to open the door, so he took a chair that was standing at the entrance. He shouted that the teenagers had decided they were the owners of the store. He did not like the behavior of the company, because he had behaved like this a few hours earlier towards these teenagers. The man swung a blue chair and was about to break down the door. He was being very selfish. After all, breaking the door would not have saved them from the zombie monsters. But then everyone would be in danger. Suddenly, a soldier ran to the teenagers. He ordered everyone to run away from the window quickly because the glass could hurt them. But the man still did not understand what was happening. When he ran closer, he saw this horrible picture. His eyes were filled with incomprehension. He did not know who those people were and why they wanted to break down the door. Suddenly, the soldier saw something that scared him. A zombie cat stood behind the gang, intent on kicking in the door. The man with the blue chair didn't notice the monster and continued to threaten to kick in the door if they didn't open it. Suddenly, he heard growling sounds behind him. This made him abandon the idea of breaking the glass. The robber turned to see who was growling. He already knew in his head that he was in danger. Like this, the zombie monster opened its huge mouth. It was about to attack the man and their entire company. It seems that they had never encountered monsters before, because the zombie cat immediately attacked him and let loose its white tentacles, knocking the robber to the ground. The events moved to the room where Kang Jihoon and the soldier were talking about Han Mi. After the man offered to help the boy find his girlfriend, he said that in return, Kang Jihoon had to promise him something. He didn't look at the guy. He looked at what was happening outside. He said that the boy had to promise that from now on he would not lose his temper so easily and would keep himself in check better. He also added that the headman, Kang Jihoon, should think about who could be a threat to his friends. The man spoke calmly and confidently. It was like talking to a father who was giving valuable advice. The boy did not answer. His hormones and adolescent maximalism did not allow him to react calmly and simply accept the words of a man who apparently wished him well. So Kang Jihoon just left, although he promised himself to think about what the soldier said. He wanted to find his beloved Hon Mi. He still had strong feelings for her. The man realized that the boy had left. He felt different emotions now, but sadness prevailed the most. The soldier saw in Kang Jihoon himself and his beloved whom he had unfortunately lost. The man looked at his ring. His heart was squeezing inside. He was in so much pain. Suddenly, he heard the voice of his beloved Jisun. She said that this behavior was unusual for her because he had never worried about anyone before. The man said out loud that if his beloved Jisun was here now, she was probably laughing at him for being a soldier in such a situation with teenagers. Suddenly, the man regained consciousness and heard someone yelling from the street to open the door. The voice was threatening and very angry. The soldier turned toward the sound and realized he had to run to help. The events again shifted to the moment when the robbers were attacked by a zombie cat and the teenagers began to run away from the door. The soldier shouted that his classmates were running to him. He quickly realized what was happening. The teenagers ran after him. The man seemed to know where the other exit was. They had to leave the room, because now there were at least five monsters around them who knew they existed. When the children ran into the room where the man was, the soldier was carefully examining what had happened outside and assessing the criticality of the situation. The girl hid behind a man in a striped sweatshirt. They watched their friend being eaten by a zombie cat. The woman asked what they should have done. Suddenly, they heard a soldier speaking to them. He was shouting for the two of them to run to him. The man could not leave them to die and shouted for them to run to him as quickly as possible, as it was very dangerous outside. But the couple stood in a stupor and did not move. The soldier was waiting for them and kept calling them over. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon stopped the man and said that if he let the two in, they would all be in danger. But the soldier told him that they would have been dead too, if not for that old lady from the restaurant.
He shouted at the guy that they shouldn't have helped these people then. Goodness must be repaid. Kang Jihoon looked at him with a serious look. His face showed an understanding of how selfish he had been. But the couple continued to stand there. The woman put her hand over her mouth in amazement. She could not believe what was happening. But the man seemed to be slowly moving toward the entrance. He had to save himself. Finally, he yelled to his friend Miju to run after him. Then the pair began to run. But a zombie cat noticed this. He didn't want to kill his victims. Suddenly, the monster opened its mouth again and screamed at the steam. It released its tentacles on the fugitives. The woman covered her face with her hands to avoid seeing what was happening. They were not as fast as teenagers. Kang Jihoon noticed a fan on his wall. Without hesitation, the guy grabbed it and threw it at the zombie monster. Thus, he saved the couple from certain death. The soldier was shocked by this act of his new friend. Kang Ji-hoon was silently shaking his head. The guy was really a good shot, because he hit the target and saved the couple. He noticed that the man was staring at him. So he asked what the problem was. And then he said that the soldier himself said that they were supposed to help these people. But they didn't have time to finish the conversation because the couple had already run into the room, lying on the floor. The soldier peered through the crack in the door to see what had happened to the zombie monster. Perhaps it had died, and then they could all stay in the room. The man saw that the fan was stuck in the cat. It was not spinning because its paws were stuck in the frog egg virus and mucous membranes. The cat showed no signs of life. Suddenly, the zombie monster raised its head and perked its ears. The cat growled as if to let them know that they would not get rid of him so easily. Then, the soldier slammed the door shut and held it tight. He realized that the zombie monster knew about them and would soon get there. They had to quickly come up with an escape plan. For now, the soldier simply locked the door. The whole company looked at the newcomers in shock. The man, meanwhile, was laughing loudly and collecting his thoughts, replaying what had just happened. Suddenly, he started crying and thanked his rescuers a lot. He was ashamed of them for not helping them when the company wanted to get into the mini-market. But suddenly, the man's tearful speech was interrupted. Everyone turned to the door because they heard some sounds from the other side. Someone tried to open the handle. It seems that the zombie monster got to them faster than they could have imagined. The soldier reacted quickly, so he propped the door up with himself, holding it securely. The man loudly commanded them all to bring something heavy to him quickly. Then the soldier would be able to block the door. After all, if he let them go, the zombie monster would most likely get inside. But the teenagers were a little stuck, because they could not get over the previous incident. Then the soldier once again told them to think faster. Still, the man was very professional, and this helped him to react quickly in such extreme situations. Thanks to him, the company was still alive. The teenagers quickly came to their senses and ran to find something heavy to prop up the door with. Kang Ji-hoon immediately grabbed the refrigerator and shouted to Kang Min to help him. But he said that he had his hands full because he had grabbed the water boiler. These were probably the heaviest objects in the room. Everyone wanted to escape so badly and not let the soldier down. A few minutes later, there was already a pile of heavy objects under the door, and loud gasps were heard. Everyone present did a good job. They propped up the door with a refrigerator, a heater, a water boiler, a freezer, and many other items. The monster could definitely not come in now. For a few seconds, everyone stood silently and looked at the door to see and hear if the monster could enter. Suddenly, instead of a zombie monster, they heard a woman crying. She covered her face with her hands. A man named Seong Chul Opa immediately approached her. He tried to calm his friend Misha down. He hugged her and said that he would protect her no matter what. But the girl still cried a lot. She could not bear the loss of her friend. It seems they were quite close. Like here, the soldier asked if they were okay. It was impossible not to notice the girl's despair. The man expressed his condolences and said he was very sorry for what had happened to their friend. Sung Chul just nodded. He was also grieving, but he kept all his emotions inside. Here, the soldier asked whether the couple was also going to the shelter and with this phrase seemed to invite them with him. But surprisingly, the couple knew about the shelter, and the man said that they were also going there, but wanted to rest a bit before reaching the shelter. He also added that all the local people were in that shelter. Suddenly, Kang Min spoke up. He said that the distance from the gas station to Seoul Station was less than one kilometer. It was close enough, so most likely everyone had evacuated long ago. 
At the same time, the guy was looking for something on the table. Kang Ji-hoon noticed this and asked what his friend was doing. Kang Min replied that he was looking for something useful and continued to look for something. The headman asked another question, whether it was really that important in this situation. Kang Min didn't even turn to his friend and just did his own thing. He thought that Kang Ji-hoon just wanted to hit on someone. Suddenly, Kang Min made a triumphant sound. It seems that the guy had found something after all. He opened a drawer in his desk, which contained various office supplies. Scissors, glue, a stapler, tape, and a book. Kang Ming shouted happily that he had found something. His voice sounded triumphant, as if he had won the lottery. This time, it had to be something better than a small hammer. Suddenly, the guy picked up the key and jingled it merrily. Kang Ming shouted for everyone to look at him and showed him what he had found. The boy seemed to think it was a car key. Kang Ji-hoon picked up on his friend's joy and gave him a thumbs up and told him he was doing well. Kang Min said they were now able to get to the shelter more or less safely. He asked if it wasn't wonderful. After all, no one was as happy as he was. Suddenly, he heard something strange, a sound, so he looked down to see what it was. Suddenly, all his joy disappeared as frog eggs began to crawl out from below, spreading the virus. They were right next to Kang Min's leg. Suddenly, everyone jumped up quickly and screamed. Kang Min jumped away from them because it seemed that the eggs could sense the boy's presence, so the virus released its white tentacles at Kang Min. A zombie monster began to crawl out from under the rubble. It simply turned into a liquid and somehow got through all the objects and into the room. The first to react, as always, was a military man. The man shouted for everyone to disperse, took a chair and swung it to break the window and escape from the room and the monster. Everyone started to climb out through the hole one by one. Kang Min and So Young went first, followed by the soldier, and the last were a couple of newcomers. Meanwhile, the monster was getting deeper and deeper, leaving its slime all over everything. Kang Ji-hoon was the first to get down to the ground. The height was not high, but it could have been an obstacle for Seo Young because of her leg. But everyone managed to jump out of the window, the first guys ran the fastest to find the car and open it. Kung Min reacted quickly and looked at the keys he was carrying. He looked closely and shouted happily that it was a Honda, because this sign was painted on the keys. This would have helped them greatly in their search and narrowed down the range of options. But unfortunately, all the cars in the parking lot were Honda. The soldier said so and added that they should keep running, because at this rate, they would not find the car they needed. Suddenly, as the soldier was running, he noticed something that made him stop for a second. He turned his attention to a large Honda car. The man thought it was this car, so he ran to it and asked Kang Min for the keys. It turned out that the keys did fit the car. The man got behind the wheel, although he did not say he knew how to drive, and started the car. The soldier shouted to the others to run to the car and get in. With it, they could get to the shelter quickly and relatively safely. Three people were left. So Yeon and the newcomers Miju and Seong Chul Opa. Suddenly he noticed something. What he saw was not good. A zombie monster was flying behind the runners. Miju's wife was the last to run and complained that it was too far and she couldn't keep up. The military man immediately shouted to warn them that a zombie monster was running behind them. He shouted as loudly as he could because he was sincerely worried about his friends. Everyone turned around to see what the danger was. Kang Ming had almost climbed into the car in the meantime. Suddenly, a zombie monster attacked someone. Unfortunately, Miju didn't have time to escape and was captured by the ugly giant's tentacles. Seo Young and Seong Chul Opa put their hands over their ears in fear. The woman screamed and begged for help. Opa turned to the girl's scream. She was calling his name. Miju was screaming for him to help her. She didn't realize that she was actually dead and had to give her friend a chance to escape. For a second, Zhang Chulapa stopped and looked at his friend and what the zombie monster was doing to her. But the man ran on. He was crying because he had just lost his second loved one in an hour, but he realized that he had to save himself. His heart was clenching from helplessness. Meanwhile, the teenagers all managed to get into the car. Suddenly, they were startled by the man's scream. They all turned to him. Son Chul Opa shouted out the window and told the soldier to start the car quickly. There was little time, because if the zombie monster had time to pounce on the car, they would not have survived and would have been trapped. 
Appa got into the car, pushing the teenagers into the car, because there was not enough space for so many people. Everyone did not understand the man's emotions and just stared at him in a stupor. Suddenly, Xiongchul Appa shouted loudly again for the soldier to start the car faster. His eyes looked so frightened that they seemed crazy. It was very frightening. The soldier immediately stepped on the gas and drove off. Suddenly, they saw a sign that said, Soul Station. The people in the car shouted with joy. It was such a great victory for all of them, because it seemed like they were about to be safe. Sonchul Opa shouted joyfully that they had been rescued. Everyone was looking at the road with wide eyes, expecting something extraordinary to happen. Suddenly, their happiness did not last long. After all, Kang Min's phone received a notification that clearly did not announce good news. It was a notification that this Seoul station was now a level 3 danger zone. The teenagers immediately raised their heads to see what was so dangerous in the area. They could not believe their eyes. The whole city was like a spider's web covered with this frog egg virus. It was simply unrealistic to survive here. The teenagers could not believe their eyes. They all had their mouths open and sweat was streaming down their faces from fear. Meanwhile, the events moved back to the shelter. A bunch of people were standing in line outside the blue tent. John Wu stood at the very end of the line and looked at someone. It looked like he had found the guy who had survived the zombie monster. He was a young man with bright red hair who was immune to the virus. John Wu had to go up to him and ask him everything. The guy was staring at his hero too much. This aroused suspicion. Because of this, the mysterious immune guy noticed John Wu's stare and looked back at him. Suddenly, the guy's arms started to hurt badly and sharply. Then he looked at the guy and seemed to feel that this pain was because of him. The red-haired guy's face looked rather strange, as if he realized that he was provoking John Wu's pain. Meanwhile, Seoul Station was completely covered in slime and white frog egg virus. Suddenly, one of the monsters stood up and growled loudly. Suddenly, I heard a loud sound of the wheels breaking on the asphalt, followed by a loud and dull thud. The car in which the company was traveling began to lurch from side to side. It was skidding because it had hit a zombie monster. The people inside were not wearing seatbelts and were thrown around the cabin with the car. The soldier shouted at them to hold on better. But fortunately, the man was able to steer the car and simply hit a zombie monster that wanted to attack the company. The soldier looked in the rear view and saw the zombie monster lying unconscious. Perhaps he had knocked it to death, which meant that they could be defeated by force after all. But the adventures did not end there, and Sonchul Opa shouted to Mister that there was another obstacle in front of them. The driver braked hard, so all the passengers leaned forward. In front of them was a pile of cars covered with white slime and the frog egg virus. Suddenly, another monster stood in front of them. It was bigger than the one the soldier had just shot down. The man realized that they were trapped and did not know how to get out of it. He had to act quickly and most likely turn around or get out of the car. But the soldier decided to act differently. He stepped on the gas and turned the car around. All the passengers in the car were hit in the side. The man continued to turn. His plan worked and he simply shot down a zombie monster that most likely intended to attack them. The monster rode on the ground and ended up in the back of the car. It got hit a lot, but the car survived and didn't get any viruses. They didn't have time to stick to it. The soldier turned the car around again, but in the other direction. The passengers inside were already thrown to the other side. Kong Ji-hoon lost his footing and hit his head on the front of the car. He may have been injured or wounded. The soldier turned the car around and drove onto the oncoming lane. He was about to crash into the yellow car, but managed to dodge it. It seems that the man still had a license and knew how to drive a car, and very well. But still, the rearview mirror is a military one. But the owner will not be angry, because most likely he was not alive anymore. Sonchul Opa told the man that he was going the wrong way. He replied that there was no other way. He had to do what he did. The soldier asked Kang Min, who was in charge of the map, how far they were from the shelter. The guy replied that they were almost there. They had to keep going straight, and then they would reach the shelter. Suddenly, Kang Ming saw something in the window that made him ask to slow down. He pointed somewhere through the window, and all the passengers looked at what Kang Min was pointing at. He pointed to a blue bus with people on it. The soldier stopped abruptly, and everyone was thrown forward. They all looked closely at the bus with people to see if it was also stuck because of the monsters. The company saw that the people on the bus were still alive and showing signs begging for help. 
Kang Min said that these people were alive and added that he would feel guilty if he pretended not to see them. Kang Jihoon told him to shut up. Suddenly, Son Chul Opa yelled at the soldier. He asked what was happening to him. The man looked at him to see what was wrong. He yelled at the man and asked why he started stopping. The whine was that Son Chul was very much afraid of everything and didn't want to take any risks. The man was shouting at the soldier very loudly. His face looked so crazy. He said that the soldier had gone completely crazy because the shelter was right in front of them. He added that they were just supposed to get to a safe place. The soldier looked at Xiong Chul Oppa with a strong lack of understanding. It seemed that their values did not match. But according to this logic, the company should not have rescued this man and his friends. Suddenly, the voice of his fiancée sounded in the soldier's head. In her memory, she begged him to go to a safe place. He recalled how his beautiful bride screamed at him on the cable car to go without her because she was being consumed by a monster. These memories were very painful for the man. The last thing he remembered about her was her look. Eyes that were about to fill with tears because the bride realized that this was their farewell and she was leaving her beloved alone to grieve. This was not how they had imagined their married life. Suddenly, the soldier opened the door and just ran away. Kang Ji-hoon shouted after him and asked where he ran to. The man did not even close the door behind him and did not say a word. He just realized that he had to save these people. The soldier ran to the back of the car. There was a rope and some devices there. He stood back and looked at the instruments and quickly figured out what to do next. He had to act very quickly because the people on the bus were probably hiding from the monsters. Kang Ji-hoon shouted at the soldier. He thought that the soldier was acting absolutely stupidly and putting them all in danger. The headman shouted at him, but it was useless. The man was going to finish his job to the end. Kang Min also shouted that he didn't mean they had to rescue those people on the bus when he said he couldn't pretend he didn't see them. As if on cue, Seo Young came up with the idea that maybe the soldier was going to set the fire. Kang Ji-hoon looked at her. His look said that he had just realized everything, as if he had solved some difficult problem. Soyeon realized this and added that there was fuel in the truck the company was traveling in. It all made sense. Meanwhile, the man continued to search for something in the back of the car, not listening to anyone. Kang Ji-hoon couldn't just let it go. He had to come up with something and solve it immediately. He had a plan of action. Suddenly, Son Chul Opa started shouting at the teenagers and pushing them around. He was pushing them and shouting for them to leave. The man was going to go instead of the soldier. Did he really want to leave him alone like that, even though he had recently saved his life? But Kang Jihoon did not pay attention to this, and simply asked in response if Son Chul Opa had anything that could have started the fire. But the man simply remained silent, stunned by the teenager's question. Then Kang Ji-hoon asked him again, this time louder, about whether he had a lighter. Shang Chul said that he did, and the boy shouted at him to get it as soon as possible. Before the man could get it, Kang Ji-hoon snatched it out of his hands. The guy was going to get out of the car and go to the military. But at the last moment he turned to the man, gave him a threatening look, and told him not to even think about driving. Then, Kang Ji-hoon got out of the car and shouted to his classmates to keep an eye on the man because he did not trust him. The soldier did not even look at the boy, but the teenager asked what the soldier was doing and why he was not sitting in the car. He received silence, so he continued to say that the man had promised him to find and save Honmi. The soldier did not expect such an answer and such behavior from a guy who had recently lost control of his emotions. Kang Ji-hoon went on to say how he wanted to find Honmi if he stayed here. The soldier began to think about the teenager's words. The elder continued that the man probably thought they were some kind of heroes, but in reality they were not. First of all, they had to take care of themselves. Unfortunately, they could not save everyone. But the soldier's response surprised him greatly and made him go into a stupor. The man apologized to him. He raised his head, looked Kang Ji-hoon in the eye, and said that he did not expect them to understand him. With his words, he seemed to make it clear that the company could go on without him. The soldier just walked away from the guy. He took the hose and ran to the bus with people. He shouted to them that he would help people get out of the bus and save them all. People looked at him as a savior. He was their last hope. The man shouted that he would pave the way with fire 
and people just had to wait a little bit. One of the women on that bus looked at him rather surprised. Suddenly, she screamed loudly, closed her eyes, and put her hands over her ears. Was it the soldier's words that affected her so much? Suddenly, the woman told the soldier to turn around because there was someone behind him. The man was already scared, with drops of sweat running down his face. But he still turned around, and what he saw made his eyes pop out of his head. The soldier expected a lot, but definitely not this. On top of him was a big pile of zombie monsters that had already spotted him. To deal with them, it was necessary to burn the entire bridge and possibly more. One of the zombie monsters growled, making itself known. One sharp movement and he would be down, and there was nowhere to run. Meanwhile, the teenagers Xiu Yong and Kang Min, who remained in the car, tried their best to stop Xiong Chul Op from driving. They shouted at him, but the man was not going to stop. He was acting very selfishly. So Young decided to see how Kang Ji Hoon and the soldier were doing. But this picture did not make her happy. She loosened her grip a little. The girl shouted to Kang Min to look at the monsters that were already attacking the soldier. He had nothing to defend himself with because Kang Ji Hoon had the lighter. The teenagers were distracted and didn't hold Son Chul Opa as tightly. Soyeon said they were supposed to help a soldier. The man saw what was happening and panicked. His heart was racing and he did not want to risk his life for anyone. So he took advantage of the moment when the teenagers let go of him and simply kicked his two friends out. He did it with all his strength, absolutely ruthlessly, and shouted at them to get out. Meanwhile, the zombie monster was about to attack the soldier. The man stared at him in a stupor because there was nowhere to run. He could only fight and quickly come up with a plan of escape. Suddenly, some yellow liquid poured onto the zombie monster, preventing it from attacking first. It turned out that the man was pouring gasoline on the nasty giant to save himself. The man acted quickly and decisively, and did not seem to panic at all. It was clear that the soldier felt like a fish in water. He was looking at the monster which he had poured gasoline all over and stalled a bit. Suddenly, the man realized something important. The soldier realized that he hadn't brought a lighter, and now the zombie monster would just attack him, and then the man would be finished. He let himself, his company, and the people on the bus who were waiting for him to be rescued. Because of his haste and rash actions, the soldier gave the monster the opportunity to pounce on him. It opened its huge maw and lunged at the man. But the soldier's reaction was excellent. So he quickly jumped away from the zombie monster, and it did not have time to attack or hurt him. The man immediately started running away. Meanwhile, the zombie monster fell to the ground so the soldier had a little time to quickly find a lighter and finish the job. But unfortunately, the monster recovered quickly enough and was about to strike back. The giant threw its nasty tentacle at the soldier and screamed. Meanwhile, the man was running away, shouting back at him to turn around. The people on the bus were closely watching the fight and trying to help their rescuer in some way. It turned out that Kang Ji Hoon was running to the man. He shouted at him because he wanted to give him the lighter. The boy raised it above his head and shouted for the soldier to run to him, because the teenager could not keep up with him. The man noticed this and was happy. Half the job was done. All that was left was to set the monster on fire and save the people from the bus. Kang ji -hoon swung to throw the lighter, because time was running out. The guy was sharp, so he didn't worry about her. But the guy changed his mind about quitting. He said loudly that he would finish the military's work. His eyes became stern again and he gained courage. Meanwhile, the man was about to be overtaken by a monster. It was literally a meter away. Time was running out. Kang Ji Hoon decided to run towards the soldier. He was shouting at him that he was coming to him and it looked like he was going to set fire to a giant zombie monster. The man shouted at the boy to see if he still remembered how to throw a Molotov cocktail. He wanted to remind Kang Ji Hoon that the fire had to break first. But the guy told him to just run away as fast as he could. After all, Kang Ji Hoon had just been the one to take care of them last time. The guy swung hard and threw the lighter on the floor. It immediately broke and started burning. Like here, there was a pretty big explosion. The lighter exploded and created a fire that ignited the zombie monsters. But the guy and the soldier were simply thrown back and fell to the ground, hit by the shockwave. They lay on the floor and watched as everything caught fire. Kang Ji Hoon did it all. He saved the soldier. The friends were lying there laughing loudly, assessing the consequences of their actions. They started swearing and saying that they were literally one step away from death.
the guys miraculously survived. Meanwhile, all the monsters were burning. Suddenly, they heard familiar voices and turned toward the sound. Someone was running toward them and shouting the boys' names. It was Kang Min and So Young. The boy was cursing and coughing heavily. The girl was running after him and was also barely breathing. The company saw their car with gasoline drive away, and Son Chul Opa was inside. The man looked in the rearview mirror and saw the confused faces of his rescuers. The bastard justified himself out loud and said that he had no other choice. He still felt guilty, but said he didn't want to die. This was the second time the company had saved someone who betrayed them later. If it wasn't for them, Xiong Chul Opa would have died at the gas station. Kong Jihoon and the soldier just watched their car drive away and did not understand anything. Suddenly, they noticed that the handle from which the soldier was pouring fuel was coming out of the pen. It had caught fire from the fire that Kang Jihoon had started. The pen lit up more and more. Suddenly, the man began to realize what was about to happen. The car in which Son Chul Opa was fleeing was about to catch fire because the cable was burning further. And since there was gasoline inside, the fire spread quickly. Suddenly, there was a very strong explosion. In a matter of seconds, the car caught fire. The shockwave was so strong that everyone was thrown to the ground. Soyeon covered her face with her hands and fell to the ground. No one expected this to happen. The explosion was so strong that it was visible even from the rooftop. The fire was spreading more and more, engulfing the entire space. If there were any people near them, they would have heard the explosion. All the teenagers were lying on the ground. They were thrown to the ground by the shockwave. The soldier was the first to regain consciousness, stood up and asked how the others felt. Suddenly, other people responded to his voice. The man was coughing loudly because there was more and more smoke, and they were right at the epicenter of the explosion. The soldier heard someone running up to him. Two men in yellow uniforms with assault rifles and bulletproof vests were running toward the company. One of them was shouting on the radio to the headquarters that they had found survivors in the area of the operation. The soldier looked up to see these people. Although his mind was still foggy, he clearly realized that they would finally be safe. He had saved these teenagers, and at the same time, the people on the bus. The man could be proud of himself. Finally, the men in uniform found the company and asked if he was okay. They said they would accompany them all to a shelter. Finally, they found him, and he would be safe. Life was starting to get better. The events moved to the shelters. People just sat there and went about their business. A couple was sitting together. The man was sleeping, and the girl was guarding his sleep and was on her phone. People were just living their lives as best they could under the circumstances and the situation in the country. Suddenly, the entire storage facility shook. It went dark, and a loud explosion was heard. Everyone started screaming and panicking. People took out their phones and turned on their flashlights. The man who was closer to the window saw a sharp light after the darkness. He cursed loudly. Through the window, the man saw a lot of smoke and fire in the neighboring building. People realized that something terrible had happened. This could not help but panic. Meanwhile, night fell. There was still no power. It seems that a powerful explosion had caused the power grid to break down. People were saving themselves with flashlights from their phones. Suddenly, workers in yellow shirts entered the room. A man with glasses apologized to the people for all the staff for this temporary inconvenience. He also added that the emergency generator was about to be turned on, and then the power would be restored. Meanwhile, Yon Wu walked around the room with his phone flashlight. He listened to the others in the room complain about the lack of electricity and the unclear timing of when the generator would be turned on. But the guy was calm. He was just walking around the storage room, probably looking for something or someone. John Wu was going up the stairs. Suddenly, the young man entered a corridor that was fenced off with ribbons. There were two workers standing in it. One of them was wearing a white suit, and the other was wearing a yellow suit, probably a military one. A man wearing a white uniform and a mask with gloves reacted sharply to the boy and blocked his passage with his body. The officer stopped Yonva with his hand and said that he was not allowed to come here. The teenager simply apologized and played dumb. John Wu was in that room for a reason. He was looking for something. When he was refused, he went back down the stairs, looking back at the worker in the white suit. The boy thought about him. 
about who was hiding behind the mask. Suddenly, John Wu heard a familiar voice. His eyes widened and his pupils constricted, even though it was dark. He turned toward the sound. Then, a sharp pain gripped his hand again where he was holding his phone. A voice asked if he was looking for it. John Wu saw footsteps. It was a man. He was coming down from above and laughing at the boy. The man came down enough to see his face. He said he had figured it out a long time ago. When Yon Wu recognized the familiar voice, he confirmed his hunch. He was a guy with bright red hair who was immune. The man went on to say that he had realized everything while John Wu was still running around looking for him. He suddenly asked the teenager if he was less susceptible. But Yon Wu answered him with a question. The boy asked if what was said about him was true, that the man with the bright red hair was immune. The man didn't move an eyebrow when he heard this. His face was stone, but Yon Wu was more emotional. He shouted that it meant that this man with immunity was infected. But before he could finish speaking, someone behind him scared him, and he turned toward the sound. A man with bright red hair stood steadfastly, showing no emotion. It turned out to be nonsense. So Jun Wu continued to speak. He looked with his big frightened eyes at the man. The guy gathered courage and decided to ask him directly about the fact that it turned out that the man with red hair was infected with a virus that had no cells. The man looked at the boy with his stone face. His emotions were not visible or understandable. But John Wu was waiting for an answer. He wanted to get all the explanations and understand what was happening to him. Suddenly, he heard laughter. The man was just laughing in his face. Yan Wu looked at him, and the red-headed boy covered his mouth with his hands and simply choked on his laughter. He finally showed some emotion. The man began to apologize to John Wu when he saw that he was not laughing at all because these were important issues for him. The red-haired boy said that John Wu was very funny to him. But the teenager did not understand what was happening at all and just looked at the man with an incomprehensible look. Finally, he stopped laughing and said that he didn't think John Wu would ask such a thing. He added that it was very funny. It turned out that what made the red-haired guy laugh so much was the phrase that the virus had no cells. He said that everyone has them, but the cells are so small that they could only be seen under a microscope. In other words, it is very stupid to believe that the virus without cells was not dangerous. The virus continued to grow, just very imperceptibly. With these words, the red-haired guy ended his speech. After a silence, the immune guy continued to speak realizing that Yon Wu had nothing to say. He added that this was why there was an incubation period, although people had not been told about it yet. The guy said that the authorities knew everything. Otherwise, it would not have taken any radical measures to isolate the infected. Suddenly, the man said something that made John Wu's blood run cold and his eyes go wide with surprise. The man with the red hair said that he and John Wu were already immune. The boy asked if he understood everything correctly, and the man said that the teenager was immune. The red-haired boy said that it was true. He explained that even though the virus was inside them, the boy's bodies would not have changed. John Wu listened to this and could not believe his ears. From how the red-haired boy knew that John Wu was infected to the fact that he had survived it and was now out of danger. The red-haired boy asked John Wu if the infected part of his body hurt after the incubation period. He seemed to notice it when the boy grimaced as he felt a sharp pain. Yan Wu was silent and just listened to the red-haired boy. He was saying that the frog egg virus and the body were supposed to become one, but the cells were already inactive so they couldn't do it. He added that there had to be some logical explanation for this. Yan Wu looked at the guy with his mouth open and a look as if he was his hero and only savior. But in truth, the red-haired guy was really saving John Wu from severe anxiety and panic. After all, knowledgeable equal sign protected. The guy smiled at his new friend. His smile was a little strange and at times frightening. He looked at Yonva and just considered him. Suddenly, the red-haired guy pointed his second finger, folding his hand into a gun, and then he pretended to shoot it and added a soundtrack in the form of the word bang. Yon Wu was frightened by this development. The guy yelled at his friend and asked him what he was doing. Yon Wu was genuinely scared of what was happening. His life had changed so much in the last few days. He replied that Yon Wu shouldn't be afraid because he was just joking. His manner of speaking and voice sounded a bit arrogant, as if he knew more than he said. Suddenly, 
a man in a blue uniform and a mask came into the corridor holding a phone. He addressed the red-haired guy and called him Lee Tane. The officer asked if he had finished smoking and then told him to follow him. The red-haired guy waved at the man in the blue suit and told Yan Wu that he had to go. When Li Tian walked by Yan Wu, he leaned very close to the boy, at which point it even looked quite intimate, and asked if Yan Wu wanted to know something else. Tain replied that if Yan Wu met the monster again, he should not immediately run away, and then he would learn a lot. After these words, the red-haired boy laughed and walked on, leaving the frightened Yonva alone with his thoughts swirling inside him. The teenager turned back to look at Li Tian. This guy was somehow touching him, even fascinating. Li Tain went downstairs and apologized to the uniformed officer for keeping him waiting for so long. He replied that everything was fine. Then Yon Wu went downstairs to the gym where all the people were. It was dark. The two men were looking out the window and shining flashlights. They were talking about Seoul Station. It turned out to be Park Min and Ham Xiong Yu. Yon Wu approached them and asked what they were doing. Ham Sung Yu seemed to be happy even with his classmate, and he immediately showed Yan Wu what he had captured on his phone. The video showed a burning building. The guy commented that at first he just filmed the burning Seoul station, and then he asked Yan Wu if he could hear him screaming in the video. It turned out that the boys were talking about the monsters screaming in the video because they were burning alive. Park Min commented that he wanted to burn them all to which Ham Sung Yu said that he could have done it when the monsters all came here. Their classmate Isuri was just passing behind them. She called the boys stupid because there was no one who was not afraid of death. Everyone was afraid of it. But no one heard her. Meanwhile, a crowd of people stood in front of the window with flashlights on, or it was a flash from shooting in the dark, and watched what was happening outside. Then Yon Wu and Isuri missed each other. The boy saw the girl, but she didn't look at him. But suddenly the girl asked her classmate if he had read the messages in the group chat. Yon Wu picked up his phone and opened the group, because he hadn't read any messages. It looked like there was something interesting there. The report said that Park Min asked Kang Ji Hoon why he had left Hong Mi. The boyfriend added a question about how he must have left the girl when he ran away. Park Min intentionally spread this rumor. Park Min overheard Yon Wu and Isuri talking and commented that those who betray their friends are not worth a penny. The guy said this with a smile on his face, as if he was supporting Yan Wu, even though they both knew and remembered that Park Min had betrayed his classmate with Sojo. He probably hoped that Yan Wu had forgotten about it, but their conversation was interrupted. Suddenly, two men looking out the window shouted that everyone should immediately look at what was happening outside. Outside the window, the rescuers were taking someone out of the ambulance on a stretcher. Events began to develop quickly. Several workers in white and yellow suits were carrying a man. They shouted for everyone to disperse. An employee who had been in the shelter the whole time asked if he was seriously ill. He seemed surprised that he was brought to the shelter. The man in the white uniform replied that there was no place to put him in the isolation room. Classmates stood behind everyone and watched as new people entered. Ham Sung Yu asked who they were and rejected the hypothesis that they were survivors of the explosion. Someone said they were lucky. Then, in the crowd of people, they began to notice familiar faces. Ham Song Yu was the first to notice and react. He screamed because he could not believe his eyes. Kang Ji Hoon, Kang Min, and Seo Yong entered the room. They were all covered with bandages, probably because of burns from the explosion. Seo Yong then told Kang Min that even the hammer was useless. They still managed to get to the shelter. The two classmates smiled at each other. Everyone was happy that the nightmare was finally over. John Wu saw his beloved Soyeon. His heart was painfully tight, as if someone was stabbing him with a knife. He was experiencing such a storm of emotions that he thought he was about to burst. Then, Kang Min spotted Yan Wu and shouted. They all did not expect to see each other. So Young heard her classmates scream and looked up. She saw John Wu. She was afraid of this meeting the most. At the same time, So Yon was so happy to see that Yon Wu was alive. It felt like time stood still for a moment, and everyone was walking in slow motion. They looked at each other, and no one knew how to react. After all, the people you seemed to have known for a long time, since elementary school, now seemed like strangers. Yon Wu, Park Min, and Ham Xiong Yu looked at the newcomers, 
without a drop of friendliness. They held a grudge for a long time, even though it seemed that their relationship had long been strained. So Young looked only at Yeonwoo. She was frozen. It felt as if her heart had frozen, and she didn't know how to behave or react. John Wu looked back at her. Suddenly, he realized that this was not the person he had once loved so dearly. He had been wrong. The boy abruptly began to recall how his classmates fled from the Namsen cable car building and abandoned Yan Wu when he distracted the monster from them. The boy remembered Soyeon's face. She did not stop for a second and clearly noticed her classmate. This escape was intentional. She did nothing then. Suddenly, Yan Wu's body became aggressive. His eyes were filled with rage because he remembered his best friend, Kim Jubin, and the way he was in the last moments of his life. Yan Wu suddenly realized that it was because of them that his friend died. Meanwhile, the soldier was entering the shelter separately with another crowd. As if on cue, the bus driver noticed the company he had left behind. His eyes narrowed sharply. His heart beat faster, and the coward realized that he should run away as fast as possible. A soldier noticed this out of the corner of his eye. When he turned to look, he saw the unfortunate bus driver already running away. Meanwhile, Kang Jihoon was already shouting at Park Min, and the boy was looking at him without order. They just stared at each other for a while, Kang Jihoon holding his hand. Then the first one to speak was the headman. He said that Park Min had made a fuss in the chat room, but he hadn't told a word of the truth. Park Min replied by asking what Kang Jihoon meant by that. And ironically, Ham Sung Yu asked if he felt deceived and angry about it, hinting that this was how Yan Wu felt. Kang Jihoon replied to him rather rudely, telling him to shut up because he was just Park Min's henchman. These words hurt the boy a bit. Park Min abruptly began to argue that this was not the case, which further proved that Kang Jihoon had hit the nail on the head with his words. Ham Xiong Yu began to yell at the headman and call him names. But Kang Jihoon said that Park Min first had to apologize to his friends for talking about them all in the classroom group chat. But Park Min answered him with a counter question. He asked why Kang Jihoon had such an angry face, and he added ironically that he wondered if the headman was going to hit him. This question was clearly a provocation, so that Kang Jihoon would attack first and be the one to blame for the fight. But the guy figured out Park Min and kept his cool, saying that he would have done it before. His classmate just laughed at him. The teenagers got quite close to each other, but Park Min didn't give up. He wanted to get Kang Jihoon emotional because he knew that aggression was his weakness. He reminded him that the headman had been summoned to the principal's office for beating up students at school. He asked if he wanted to brag about it here. Then Kang Jihoon couldn't take it anymore and became aggressive by grabbing Park Min's shirt. The boy simply told him to let go because he could tear it. Even now, Park Min was thinking about how he looked. But the fight didn't have time to start because the boys were interrupted by Yan Wu. He approached his classmates and addressed Kang Ji Hoon. Yan Wu asked him if he was the one who had abandoned him and Kim Jubin on the Namsan cable car. Kang Ji Hoon tried to say something and justify himself, but Yan Wu didn't want to hear anything. There was no excuse for what he had done, it was just whining. Yang Wu had changed over the past few days. He no longer wanted to let others wipe their feet on him. The boy interrupted and said that he had heard everything when Kang Jihoon and his classmates left him and Jubin. His friend told Yan Wu everything. He said that Kang Jihoon had simply told the truth, without lies or unnecessary excuses. The headman looked at him with a frown. He could feel Yan Wu's anger and at the same time a little shame for what he had done. Then, the teenager repeated his question because Kang Jihoon remained silent. Yan Wu called him a scumbag and asked him again if he had betrayed them and left them on the cable car. The boy was on the verge of exploding with all the anger and resentment that had been building up inside him all this time. Meanwhile, someone was running very fast up the stairs. I heard loud exhalations. It was a bus driver. He was shining his phone flashlight and running up the stairs, looking back to see if a soldier was running after him. The poor coward was running away and shouting to himself that he did not understand how they could all be so lucky to have survived. The bus driver reached the door. He kept shouting that they could not get here without the bus. Then the man decided to open the door to hide. But a surprise awaited him. A military man was standing on the other side of the door. He asked the bastard if he thought the military would not find him. The bus driver's face was in severe pain. 
He was very scared, as if he had met death. Now that the man had no advantage and no manipulation in the form of the bus, he realized that the military would not have spared him. The soldier looked bad. His face was covered with burns and plasters. This gave him courage and scared the thin and unhappy bus driver even more. The man abruptly grabbed the traitor by the collar. It was obvious that the soldier had so much strength, fueled by anger, that it was very good that the man knew how to control his emotions. The bus driver screamed like a small child and begged the soldier not to do anything to him. But the man just wanted to know from the bus driver where the girls who were traveling with him were. He repeated this question several times and took the driver upstairs. The soldier's grip loosened a bit so the bus driver was able to escape. He started running away and shouted why the man was asking him about it. The bus driver began to attack the soldier for taking them with him. These words made the man go into a stupor. The traitor shouted that they had all run away from him. The girls just got off the bus. The driver was screaming as if his life depended on it. Meanwhile, Kang Jihoon and Yan Wu continued to sort out their relationship. The situation was heating up. Suddenly, Kang Min and Seo Young came over. He greeted everyone as if they had never quarreled and had always been good friends. Kang Min just shouted out words of surprise, and that was it. So Young remained silent, hiding behind him as if they were a couple. Then Kang Min shouted Yan Wu's name. He seemed genuinely happy that his classmate was alive. So Yeon also expressed genuine surprise, even though she had read the class chat, which said that Yeon Wu was in the vault. Both of her classmates had their mouths open in amazement. So Young immediately began to speak to Yeon Wu. Her voice trembled, as if she were about to cry. She looked at him and apologized. Meanwhile, the guy covered his eyes with his cap to avoid seeing the girl's expression, which was unpleasant for him. But the girl continued. She said that she was very sorry because she was so scared then. She didn't know what to do. But now she was very sorry for her actions. But her apology was interrupted by John Wu. He cut her off and told her to stop apologizing. It was as if something died in the girl's eyes. She did not expect to hear this from John Wu. But the guy looked her in the eye and said that he was disgusted to hear her apologize. John Wu was as cold as ever. But he couldn't do anything else. The teenager continued to talk to Kang Ji Hoon as if the conversation with Seo Young had never happened. In fact, he wanted the girl to suffer and be tormented by her conscience if she had one. Young Wu said that if they hadn't left Kim Jubin on the cable car, he would still be alive today. The guy looked at Kang Ji Hoon with such an angry look that everyone was shocked. No one had ever seen Yan Wu so angry. He was really hurting for his friend. The boy began to accuse them all of being the reason why Jubin died there and was burned alive. His classmates just looked at him in silence. So Young and Kang Min looked quite scared and did not expect Yeon Wu to behave like that. He went on to say that he understood that they had to escape because it was very dangerous inside the cable car. But he added that Kim Jubin could have also escaped with them and survived. Then Yeon Wu could not stand it and started shouting. He asked again loudly why they all abandoned Kim Jubin and called his classmates pieces of shit. Suddenly, their argument was interrupted by a man in a military uniform and yellow suit. He asked everyone present to put their names on a list. He took the teenagers somewhere and said that he hoped for their cooperation. Then Kang Ji Hoon turned to Yeon Wu and wanted to say something last. He asked that Yeon Wu had asked them why they had abandoned Kim Jubin, but instead of answering, Kang Jehoon asked Yan Wu a counter question about why he thought they had abandoned his friend. Suddenly, the headman asked something that made the boy's blood run cold and his heart break. Kang Jehoon asked Yan Wu if he would trust someone who betrayed his best friend. The boy remained silent. Then, Kang Jehoon spoke again to Yan Wu to make him speak. The elder's statement was quite serious, so the teenager thought about his words and gathered his thoughts. Suddenly, Kang Jehoon said that it was Kim Jubin who dumped him. Yan Wu's face immediately changed. His eyes dilated and his pupils shrank, and his mouth dropped open in shock. Then, Kang Jehoon began to talk about what happened on the Namsan cable car. Kim Jubin ran to them all out of breath. He started screaming like a madman. Meanwhile, John Wu was driving the monster away from everyone. Like here, Jubin was screaming and saying that they were all idiots and should have left without Yanwu, not waited for him. After all, according to the guy, they simply had no choice. 
In the end, Kang Ji-hoon summarized once again that it was all Kim Jubin, his best friend. He was the first to betray Yan Wu. Then the guy's face turned white. He didn't want to believe what Kang Ji-hoon was saying. Suddenly, Yan Wu's mind was blown. He shouted so that everyone in the room could hear that it was all a lie, and the headman was deceiving him, because it is easy to put the blame on someone who was already dead. But then, soldiers in uniforms and yellow suits ran up and took Jan Wu away from Kang Ji-hoon. The boy didn't have time to attack the headman with his fists, although he didn't even move. It was clear that Ji-hoon was not ashamed of his actions. Yon Wu was screaming and calling him a freak when the soldiers carried him away. Meanwhile, all the newcomers were taken to a blue tent, where they took turns signing and giving their contact information. Xiao Young sat on a chair, while Kang Min and Kang Ji-hoon stood and looked in different directions. So Yon could not find a place to sit. She looked down, her eyes filling with tears. As she did, she started to cry. She put her hands over her face. She was very sad about what had happened in the last few days. The fact that they had survived the explosion and finally reached the shelter did not give her any joy. Kang Ji-hoon heard this. In fact, it was hard not to hear the girl's bitter cries. Surprisingly, the boy became imbued with the girl's feelings. He suddenly began to remember how they were running away. Everything was covered in white slime with the frog egg virus. There were monsters everywhere, and they had to act quickly. The teenagers began to jump out of the window one by one. Kim Jubin was next in line. He was detained for too long. The guy looked at the height and the amount of danger below and realized that he could not overcome the fear inside him. Kim Jubin was breathing very loudly, sweat dripping down his face. From behind him, Kang Jehoon was yelling at him and pushing him. Suddenly, they heard a zombie monster snarling from below, already sniffing out new victims. This was the final straw. And then Kang Jehoon yelled at Kim Jubin even harder for not remembering. The boy replied that the headman should help him, because Jubin couldn't do it on his own. Kang Jehoon was very hot-tempered at the time, and he was terribly annoyed by Kim Jubin's timidity. He was holding up the line. Then Kang Jehoon just pushed the guy and told him to leave. Jubin fell to the ground, and the headman called him an unfortunate eccentric. Kang Jehoon didn't even look at him and said that it was his idea to run away from here, and now he was acting like a coward. Kim Jubin's last words finished him off. He said that he did not know how such a wretch could have any friends at all. Kang Ji-hoon was not emotional and did not filter what he was saying at all. These words cut Jubin like a knife. Kang Ji-hoon finally said how poor Li yong -woo was and then added that it was up to Kim Jubin to decide whether he wanted to go with him or not. Finally, the guy came back to reality. He began to feel guilty for what he had done and said. Kang Ji-hoon did not like what he was feeling. Then the teenager said loudly that it didn't matter. Seo Young and Kang Min looked at him in disbelief. Before that, everyone had been silent. Kang Ji Hoon added a little clarity and said that everything was already in the past. That was the end of the topic. The starosta then decided to address the employee in the white suit with a request. He asked them to look for his girlfriend's name in the lists. Kang Ji Hoon said this very politely. It was clear that this was very important to him. The man gladly agreed to look for his friend Li Hong Mi. He flipped through all the pages on the tablet several times. But in the end, the man said that his name was not on the list. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon heard a familiar voice, not just one. The two men were talking about Hannah and Kim Min-ju. Then the teenager's eyes widened sharply. His blood was filled with anger and he looked for the exit. Kang Ji-hoon and all the other classmates saw a soldier enter the blue tent, followed by the bus driver. The trader walked behind and looked guiltily at the floor. As soon as he approached the teenagers, they attacked him with screams and accusations. So Yon began to resent the fact that the man had abandoned her friends. How could he do that? She added that the bus driver had even abandoned them, even though they had saved his life. But it was impossible to shout down a hysterical person like this bus driver. He was shouting for everyone to listen to him. And in fact, the girls themselves swore that they wanted to get off the bus and help others whom the driver did not let on. Then a soldier stood up for the teenagers. He asked how the man could have left the children alone at such a time. He also asked if this rotten, unfortunate bus driver had any humanity left in him. But this traitor switched to ultrasound again in response and shouted that the soldier should not talk to him like that, because the man also had a daughter, and that he had already tried to stop them. 
But according to him, the girls threatened him with small red hammers so he could do nothing. After that, the bus driver looked at Kang Min and asked how the girls knew that there were hammers in the bus. Then the traitor said for the last time that it was not his fault. Of course, he was especially not guilty of beating a child and leaving others to die. The bus driver looked at Kang Jihoon. He was the only one who was silent and didn't say a word, even though he expected him to react the most. Suddenly, the traitor laughed. In a cheerful voice, he asked the headman why he was so sad. And then he told him not to worry, because the man had allegedly already asked the army for help. And when the morning came, they would come. But the bus driver did not have time to finish. Kang Jihoon interrupted him. He wasn't interested in the idle talk and excuses of this lowlife. All he wanted to know was where the girls had gotten off. He looked the bus driver straight in the eye and ordered the man to tell him where the girls had gotten off. Meanwhile, in the shelter where all the people were, it was time for sleep. It was dark, so most people just went to bed. Ham Xiong Yu looked at this and told his friend Park Min that he didn't understand how everyone present could fall asleep. He added that he couldn't even close his eyes. Park Min congratulated him and said that it meant he was normal. Behind them, Yan Wu sat listening to this conversation, looking down. The boy was devastated. Meanwhile, the friends were talking about how everyone else was crazy because they were able to fall asleep. The conversations of the friends were never very intelligent. Just like that, Park Min turned to Yan Wu and asked him with a smile if he thought he was cool. But the boy didn't even raise his head. He kept hugging his legs and looking down. Park Min said he was cool because he stood up for Yan Wu, but the teenager was silent and did not answer. Then Ham Shang Yu returned. Park Min asked why Yan Wu was so sad all the time. His friend joined in and asked if the boy also wanted to sleep. They seemed to be trying to cheer Yan Wu up, but they were not doing a very good job. Then the friends discussed among themselves how surprised they all were to see Jonah. They were genuinely amused by this. The boys told Yan Wu that no one could be trusted. Then they started laughing at what Kang Ji Hoon said about Kim Jubin. They didn't believe him, but they also didn't want to look into the whole situation. Then someone approached John Wu. It was Isuri. She called the boy because he was not responding. The girl asked if she could sit next to John Wu because she said there were no seats available anywhere else. In reality, it sounded like an excuse to be together in company. But Yan Wu was still silent. Didn't anyone realize that he had been through so much? Betrayal, loss of a friend, and then his own betrayal. He had to pull himself together and wanted some peace. Isuri rolled her eyes. She said that she didn't really need Yan Wu's permission. She could have just sat down and said it out of politeness or to strike up a conversation with him. Isuri sat down, but Yan Wu continued to be silent. She began to worry a little about the boy's condition. It seemed that the girl had purposely sat down next to him to somehow support Yonva. After some thought, Isuri asked Yan Wu if he was okay. This was more of a rhetorical question because it was clear that nothing was good. After another silence, Isuri said that this is why you shouldn't expect much from anyone, not even a friend. She continued that people can adapt to the situation and change. Even Yonwu. That was why Isuri did not trust anyone. The boy remained silent. But it was clear that he was slowly coming back to reality and even listening to what Isuri was saying. Suddenly, Jonwu started talking. He started talking about the events on the cable car. He said that there were people begging the guy to open the door to the stall for them. But instead, he just closed it. It seems that these thoughts bothered the guy all this time. Yon Wu continued that he could never forget their gaze, which showed all the hatred that those people felt for him at the time. Isuri's reaction was quite strange. She looked at the guy with surprise, even a little irritation. Later, she sounded unhappy that she didn't understand what it was all about. What did Jon Wu mean by these words? The guy ignored the girl's angry tone and said that he did not know what to do if a similar situation happened again. He asked me that if such a situation would force me to abandon my friends, why the fear? But the girl was silent. Then, John Wu asked her if she trusted him. It seems that the boy was very sad and decided to seek support from his classmate, whom he had not noticed for several years. But this question infuriated Isuri. She asked if Yan Wu was even listening to her because she had said before that she didn't trust anyone. And then she added that the guy was hiding something from her. Suddenly, John Wu began to tell her about a secret. This phrase caught the girl's attention, and she listened attentively to her classmate. The teenager asked her if he told her about his secret, 
would she believe him then? But Isuri did not understand what John Wu was talking about. She looked at him with her stone face. Then the guy started complaining to her. He said he was very lonely. He had no friends to rely on. Suddenly, Isuri just got up and left. She said that she got goosebumps again because of Yon Wu's words. The girl rudely said that she didn't want to sit with him because the guy was strange. But suddenly, John Wu told her not to leave. These words made Isuri stop. She turned to John Wu in surprise and asked him what he meant. He answered her and asked her not to leave again. He said he would tell her his secret, but only for her safety, because it was no longer safe here. Yon Wu said that those people who had just come in after the explosion, most of them were infected with the frog egg virus. The guy looked at them. They all looked quite sick. Some of them were even coughing and had no strength. Isuri immediately asked what John Wu meant, because what he said sounded even crazy and did not inspire confidence at all. A group of newcomers sat on the floor in one of the rooms. Kang Min was on the phone. Xiao Young and the soldier were making up the bed. Suddenly, the teenager fell defiantly on the bed and made a sound that signified extreme fatigue. Kang Min said he was dying. Soyun was searching for something on her phone, reading the news, and just killing her time because she had nothing to do. Kang Min then began to complain that they were supposed to be having fun at this time on their school trip. He asked why everything happened the way it did. It seems that the guy had only now had time to think about what had happened over the past few days and analyze the chronology of events. After a short silence, the soldier suddenly spoke. He asked the others if he had always been so stubborn. Kang Min immediately realized who the man was talking about, but he asked if he was asking about Kang Ji Hoon. He adjusted his glasses and then told him not to mention him again. Still, Kang Min kept the conversation going and continued to say that his friend was as stubborn as he was stupid. Then, the guy asked why Kang Ji Hoon decided to go out so late and then added that it was good that no one was allowed to go out before sunrise. But the soldier was thinking about something. He asked if it was really as they had been told. And then he suddenly asked how their meeting with their classmates went. Kang Min and Xiao Young were immediately embarrassed. It was good that the soldier came out at the moment the fight started and didn't hear anything. Kang Ming replied sadly and briefly that it was better not to talk about it, and immediately stared at the floor. He was genuinely sad and sorry that things had turned out this way. But the boy again contradicted himself and began to talk about how he and his classmates used to fight together. But now they behaved as if they never wanted to know each other. The soldier picked up on this idea and said that now, on the contrary, was the time when they should have helped and supported each other because hard times united them. Then he suggested that they become a team again. Soyeon was very sad listening to this. The girl could not stand it and went to the window to be alone for a while and look at the night sky. She recalled the words of John Woo, who told her not to apologize. He had been so rude and abrupt with her. She remembered his expression at that moment. The guy looked her straight in the eye and clearly minted every word. The girl's eyes were filled with tears. Soyeon was so sensual and emotional. It sometimes made me uncomfortable, but she was really very kind. It's a pity that Yeon Woo never realized that. She stood alone by the panoramic window and cried bitterly, covering her mouth with her hands so that no one would hear because it was late. Suddenly, she heard someone coming. Soyeon wiped her tears quickly so that she would not be noticed. Two men were coming down the stairs and discussing something with each other. One of them said that someone had run away and left him. Soyeon quickly tilted her head down and returned to the corner of the corridor. The man went on to say that he was shouting at the top of his lungs to get the door opened. Another picked up the conversation and called someone a nasty bastard. For some reason, Soyeon decided to overhear the conversation between the two men. The second one said that it was supposed to be a life lesson for him. He quoted someone who said that the true face of a person is revealed between life and death. These words were so timely for Soyoung. She looked out at the city, which was completely empty, and thought that this was her true face revealed to Yeon Wu. The girl came to a little bit of consciousness and decided to go down to the company and try to fall asleep, because she needed to gain strength. So Yeon was climbing the stairs and wiping her face with her hands, which still had some tears on it. She was thinking about how she was so scared this time. She even seemed to voice her thoughts because she thought everyone was already asleep. Suddenly, she met Kang Jehoon. He was the first to attack her, asking what she was doing here. Soyeon raised her crying face and looked at the boy. Unfortunately for her, the light was falling in such a way that it clearly outlined her features. 
Kang Ji-hoon looked at her in response. All Seo Young could say was his name. She was even a little scared when she saw the headman here. Meanwhile, Kang Min was lying on his bed looking at his phone, wasting his time because he couldn't sleep. The guy was on a social network when he suddenly noticed something. This made him stand up. He said that this could not be true. The guy was talking about some Leah Honmi. It turned out to be his classmate Honmi. He went to her channel, and there was a new video. The guy could not believe his eyes. He was in a pleasant shock. The video was only 52 seconds long. Kang Ming looked at it again to make sure it was the right one. He shouted with joy that it was really it, a new video by their classmate Han Mi. Although, in fact, Kang Min was very surprised. After all, even in this situation, his friend Han Mi was still posting videos on her channel. Suddenly, he smelled a strange odor. Then someone called out to the teenager. The smell came from the same place as the sound. Kang Min turned around to see who it was. A homeless man came to the boy. He sat down to be on a level playing field with the teenager and asked if he had anything good to say, but it scared Kang Min a lot. He shouted and pointed his phone flashlight at the eye level of the homeless man. The boy didn't do it on purpose, but he blinded the man. He reacted by screaming and asking Kang Min to turn off the light. Then, a soldier joined the conversation. He put his hand on the teenager's shoulder and asked him what was wrong. The soldier became like a big brother to the teenagers. Then other people without a permanent place of residence joined the conversation. The man said that he should have asked what was going on because the second floor was their territory. Meanwhile, Kang Ji-hoon and So Young were having a strange conversation and no one wanted to participate in it. The headman asked the girl what she was doing on the stairs so late alone. So Young was a little confused by this question and thought quickly about what to say. The girl decided to lie and said that she just decided to get some fresh air. But her face showed that she was not telling the truth she was a bad actor. Kang Ji-hoon looked at her for a long time, into her eyes. He wondered whether he should ask her further or leave it at that. But the headman decided not to pry into Soyeon's heart and just left, telling her to go back to the others. The boy already realized that her sadness was because of Yonwa. Suddenly, Seo Young also decided to ask Kang Jehoon if he was okay. This question made him stop and not leave. After a short silence, the girl repeated the question that Kang Jehoon had asked her. This trick made the guy turn to her. It piqued his interest. Then, Seo Young continued. She asked if Kang Jehoon was tired of this situation. After all, now they were all cursing their company. Kang Jehoon just listened attentively and didn't say anything. He wanted to give the girl a chance to talk. She asked him how it all happened. How did it all come to this, that they became enemies? Suddenly, Soyeon started saying that everything was her fault. She blamed herself for everything that happened. She added that she ran away despite the fact that she had seen Jonwa. Her eyes began to well up with tears again. Surprisingly, Kang Ji-hoon decided to support her in this. He asked her why she thought it was her fault. What was her fault? But the girl did not understand this question and asked him what he meant, to which Kang Ji-hoon said that Seo Young was very hung up on this topic. And then he asked if Yan Wu had asked Seo Young for help. The girl's eyes suddenly widened. It was as if she began to realize that there were other ways to look at the situation. Then the guy added another question, whether Yan Wu had asked him to wait for him. But the girl started saying that she meant something else. Then Kang Ji-hoon asked if it was because of them. The girl watched and listened attentively. The headman angrily began to say that those idiots had blamed them for everything. And really, in Seo Young's opinion, it was now entirely their fault. Hate was brewing in Kang Ji-hoon's eyes again. He switched to a quiet shout and asked if in such a situation, someone could have stayed and helped Yong Wu. Kang Ji-hoon himself answered his question with a sharp and rude, no. But the girl started to say again that it was not true and she was not talking about that. So Yan began to tell her opinion. Kang Ji-hoon looked her in the eye and listened attentively. Suddenly, she was interrupted. The teenagers heard a loud scream, which clearly did not mean anything good. Meanwhile, inside the gym, a man in a mint shirt was shouting loudly. It was his voice that Seo Young and Kang Ji-hoon heard on the stairs. The man was shining a flashlight on his wife. She was covering her face with her hands. Something strange was happening to the woman. Suddenly, a man in a mint shirt and glasses screamed so loudly that the entire shelter could hear. Workers in yellow uniforms immediately ran to him. 
The man fell to the ground and they picked him up. Then his wife looked up and spoke to him. All the others looked at the woman. Their eyes widened. They could not believe their eyes. The woman's face was covered with white blisters of the frog egg virus. Her voice changed dramatically and she started screaming and calling for her husband. Then his wife got up and started looking for him. It seems that she didn't see anything or saw very badly. People started to panic more and more. Someone shone a light directly on her, so everyone saw a horrifying picture. The woman's face was completely covered with white blisters with cells. Her eyes were completely closed by the frog egg virus. It looked very disgusting and creepy. Then one of the workers screamed and said that the woman was infected. Meanwhile, there was a lot of panic and chaos in the room. People did not know what to do. There was nowhere to run. Everyone started running wherever they could and saw. There was no plan. Even the workers in yellow shirts were panicking. People were shouting that there was an infected person here. Meanwhile, an adult man was lying on the floor, unable to understand what was happening. The man was asleep and the noise of screaming and running woke him up. He didn't know what was going on, so he was in no hurry to get up and was yawning. He only managed to ask why everyone was making such a big fuss and yawned again. The man reached for his glasses, as he could not see at all without them. When he put them on, he shone his phone and saw that everyone was panicking and running away. Suddenly, the man heard strange sounds, as if someone was growling like an animal, but as far as he remembered, animals were not allowed in the shelter. Then, the man saw a woman above him, who was turning into a monster. Her face was completely covered with white bubbles of the frog egg virus. She looked very scary, because she didn't even have hair. Everything was covered with white mucus. The woman screamed and opened her mouth, which had not yet turned into a zombie mouth. Her only eye, which had not yet been covered with frog eggs, was visible from below. Meanwhile, Kang Ji-hoon and Soyeon opened the door to the second floor and burst in screaming. The guy ran to his friends to tell them that they had to run away again, and the company just had time to rest and feel at least minimally safe. Kang Ji-hoon came running and asked if his friends had heard the same sounds. The soldier said that it was worthwhile to find out what was going on, but the guy shouted that it was too dangerous and there was no time for talks. Suddenly, behind him and Soyeon, he heard a heavy thud of feet and someone abruptly opening the door to their second floor. They turned around and saw a man running in, out of breath, asking if anyone else was on the floor. The man was followed by several other people. They all stopped at the entrance. He did not filter what he said and shouted that there were only homeless people on the floor. Then the homeless started to get indignant again and said that the man was no better than them. The fact that they did not have a home did not make them worse than others. Suddenly the man closed the door. From the other side, I heard someone order him to do so. The homeless man came to the closed door and started shouting what was going on. He said he had already suffered so much all this time. He grabbed the door handle, but it was locked. He turned it several times in different directions, but it was useless. It turned out that the man on the other side of the door was holding the handle by force and telling other people who were approaching the entrance that there were homeless people on the other side of the door and saying that it was no less dangerous. Then another homeless man joined the door and together they kicked at the door, breaking it down and shouting for their mother. The company watched with fear what was happening. They realized that the door was closed and said they had to go to another exit. Suddenly, Soyeon heard something that caught her attention. She turned toward the sound of the noise. Her face changed dramatically. Suddenly, she saw Yeonwoo, Isuri, Ham Sungyu, and Park Min running away from the other side of the balcony. Among them all, she was the first to notice Yeonva, of course. The guy did not give her peace of mind, or rather a feeling of guilt towards him. Jeonwoo seemed to feel her gaze on him, so he paused a little and looked in their direction. The guy looked Soyeon straight in the eye. He didn't panic at all and just walked with a calm step. Soyeon noticed this and stopped too. They walked and looked at each other. The teenagers could not take their eyes off each other, as if they were attracted by something, but at the same time strongly repelled. Something strange was happening in the first aid room. Strange sounds and screams were coming from it, as if someone was being killed. Some guy was holding a phone and watching the comments under some YouTube video while screaming like hell. It said that it was the second day of the closure of the entire territory of Seoul. Just then, a siren went off. The guy with the phone was Lee Tain. He just smiled when he heard the siren and realized that someone in the shelter was infected again. Then, 
A man in a uniform that completely covered his body from head to toe came running to him. He asked Thane if he was going to leave. The man seemed to be very worried about him, but the red-haired guy just smiled slyly. He wasn't worried at all. He was having fun with everything that was happening. Li Tian asked the man in the blue uniform what had happened and why he was shaking so much. He ironically asked if he was afraid because of those guys and pointed to the two uniformed officers lying on the floor. One of them was covered with white bubbles of the frog egg virus. He was screaming and shaking. Then, Li Tain said that it was not his fault, to which the man sitting in front of him said that he must have misunderstood at the time. Li Tain began to say that he did not know how to spread the virus in any way. He explained that these guys had just entered the incubation period, and with a smile and irony, he asked if it was because they had been working too long. Suddenly, Li Tain stretched out his hand and pointed it at one of the men in blue suits. He commented that he himself was surprised by his ability to control the secrecy of cells and the time of the body's response. Suddenly, the man who had just been covered in frog egg virus cells and screaming in pain suddenly became completely clean and could not feel anything in his body. Then Li Tain laughed happily, but something in his smile was not good. Suddenly, he directed his power at the man sitting in front of him, and he was suddenly covered in frog egg virus cells. Then the red-haired guy asked if the man also had an incubation period. He asked this with great mockery. The blue-uniformed worker, who had just been infected with the virus, began to cover himself all over with this nasty virus and begged for mercy. Li Te adjusted his arm, and the man in uniform shouted that it couldn't be. He could not believe what was happening. The red-haired, omnipotent guy sat down next to a man in a blue uniform. The officer began to tell the man that to tell the truth, he was looking for a drug. Li Tian heard this and laughed loudly in his face. He understood what the man was hinting at and what kind of drug it was. The red-haired guy laughed out loud. He asked if they wanted to know how the young man had gained immunity. The staff thought that Li Tain had done something to make it happen. Meanwhile, back at the shelter, Ham Sung Yu and Park Min saw Yan Wu stop and look at something with unusual emotion. Then, Ham Sung Yu asked if they had seen them too and pointed to a group of traders running from the opposite side of the balcony. The guy shouted loudly that it was them. No one expected to see them. Then, Ham Sung Yu shouted happily to his classmates on the opposite side. Kang Ji Hoon and Kang Min looked over at him. Suddenly, the guy started screaming and calling them freaks. He asked how they were still alive and he called them children to boot. Park Min looked on and smiled. He liked to make fun of others. The others heard it. Kang Ming shouted the name of the classmate who was calling them names. No one liked what was happening. Seo Young didn't expect this kind of behavior from the boys at all. Everyone froze and looked at each other like animals in a zoo. Suddenly, Kang Ming heard something downstairs. It was the roar of the zombie monsters that had already transformed in the meantime. There were a lot of them down there. The shelter was no longer safe. At all. Then, the company took off running. They did not feel safe for long. Not for long at all. Yon Wu and Isuri stood in a stupor. The monsters weren't on their side, but they were still terrified of what was happening. Yon Wu shouted that it was no longer safe here, as if to make it clear that they should have fled immediately. Suddenly, the boy felt a very sharp pain in his arm again. It was so strong that the teenager almost fainted. Yon Wu twisted so hard, and Asuri, who was standing behind him, noticed. She asked if the boyfriend was okay. John Wu could not get up. He breathed loudly and deeply to calm himself and regain consciousness. The guy looked at the people below who were turning into zombie monsters and thought to himself that he didn't want it to start again. Ham Xiong Yu and Park Min were shouting from behind Asuri's back that Yon Wu was scaring them. They wondered what was going on with the boy and if he was contagious. John Wu held his hand and moaned softly in pain. His consciousness moved somewhere else again. He did not feel real now. In fact, everything that was happening did not feel real to him. Downstairs, meanwhile, more and more people were turning into zombie monsters. The floor was literally covered with the corpses of these poor people and the white slime of the frog egg virus. Yan Wu kept looking at his arm, then at the people below, who were screaming in pain as they turned into ugly zombie monsters. The boy seemed to feel something in common between him and those people. He felt that the pain was different from the previous one. Then Isuri approached John Wu. She put her hand on his shoulder to support him and asked him something. 
Isuri asked if it was true that John Wu was in pain when he was near the virus. She asked this twice because he was silent and could not speak because of the pain. But he didn't have time to answer because he heard terrible screams and footsteps. A whole frightened crowd was running toward them. They ran to the company and shouted for help. Yonwu and Isuri looked up to see what was happening and why there was so much noise. Suddenly, they saw a horrific scene. The zombie monsters started to reach the second floor balcony and almost caught the people who were running toward them. Then, the teenagers suddenly stood up and started running. Even Yonwu overcame his pain to escape and not be crushed by the crazed crowd. My classmates were screaming and cursing that the frog egg virus had infected them. They did not know what to do. Suddenly, John Wu saw something that made him pause. Something caught his attention. He saw that a group of traitors was running toward them. They had to meet. There was no way out. It all looked like a cruel, unfunny joke. All the companies on both sides stopped and just looked at each other for a while. No one wanted to break the silence and be the first to speak. But inside, they knew they had to unite to survive. Then Park Min spoke first. He shouted indignation that they had met again and had to be in the same room together. Soyeon looked down. She was very ashamed of everything that had happened. She couldn't look her classmates in the eye because she was afraid they would judge her again. But Yeon Woo was not ashamed and looked at Soyoung. He felt that the girl was ashamed and that it was very interesting for him to watch her behavior. Suddenly the crowd was approaching. They were shouting and running after the teenagers. Then the crazy people started pushing and shoving the company around, trying to get ahead. They behaved like crazy people. But here, someone stood up for the teenagers so that they would not be crushed. He shouted for people to calm down and behave normally. It turned out that it was a military man who shouted that they had just come from where the crowd of crazies was trying to get to. The man added that it was also dangerous on the other side. But people were so scared that they did not want to hear anyone or anything. They responded rudely to the soldier to shut up and resented the fact that he was in charge and continued to push everyone around. Suddenly, a man behind them pointed somewhere and screamed. It turned out that there was a huge zombie monster behind the soldier, which was about to get him. He was already on the second floor. They had to think of something fast, otherwise they would not survive. The soldier took control of everything. He stopped the crowd with his hand and told them to stand back. The zombie monster was a few meters away. People had minimal time to think. Meanwhile, downstairs, more and more people were getting infected with the frog egg virus. The room looked like a mass grave. Everyone huddled in a corner and just shivered. At that time, no one was thinking about quarrels or truces. The bravest men huddled in a corner and screamed in fear like children. Meanwhile, down below, the zombie monster seemed to be merging and turning into one big monster, trying to reach the top with its tentacles. John Wu fell to the ground again. He could not ignore the pain for long. It was getting stronger and stronger. The more monsters there were, the more painful it became. He looked at his hand as if he wanted to find the answer to all his suffering there. The pain was getting worse. It was simply impossible to bear. He asked himself if he could have survived after all this. Because even though Yan Wu didn't turn into a zombie monster on the Namsan cable car, he could have died from the pain. Suddenly someone shouted and pointed in the other direction. Everyone else looked and reacted by screaming. It turned out that the door also had a virus on it. Now people could not leave for sure. They were all doomed to die, unless something was done quickly. Suddenly someone shouted about the fire. Everyone else turned to the sound. It was John Wu. Even though he felt as bad as possible, and as if he was not from this reality. His instinct for self-preservation worked well, and the guy figured out how to save them all. He was breathing very loudly and deeply, and paused between words, but he was able to command them to get the fire quickly. The soldier was the first to react, but he was frightened by the teenager's stature. He looked very unhealthy. But still, I decided to trust John Wu because I had no other ideas. The man said that they would first try to light a fire, then at least the zombie monsters would not come close to them. While the soldier was trying to find a lighter, So Young noticed Yan Wu's condition. She looked at him with concern. The guy was still breathing heavily and told them to start a fire with a carpet that was lying on the floor. So Young could not just watch her classmates suffer. Even though he hated her, she now realized that she had to do something. Even if she was rejected, she would know that she had done everything in her power. 
Soyeon dared to say words of encouragement to Yan Wu, but she was interrupted by Yasuri, who approached her friend again and asked him louder and more confidently if he was okay. The boy could barely speak, but he was able to say Asuri's name. Soyeon watched the whole thing and even moved a little closer to her classmates. She acted very cautiously because she was still afraid of being judged. Isuri told Janwu that he was dripping with cold sweat. He turned pale and looked very unhealthy, which was hard to ignore. They both looked at Janwu's hand. It was shaking with pain. Then the boy looked down again, at the monsters and people who were turning into zombie monsters. Yonwu realized that he was feeling something very strange and unusual, something he had never felt before. The sensations were from the very tips of his fingers. The guy assumed that he felt what the monsters around him felt. Meanwhile, a military man and another had already set fire to the carpets and successfully scared away the zombie monsters around them. Two men were talking to each other. One of them asked if his friend was okay, and they answered that he needed something quickly. Everyone was working for their salvation and running errands. Meanwhile, Seo Young realized that she was the third person in their conversation, so she had to switch to something else. Suddenly, she noticed that Kang Min was standing behind her, seemingly filming something with his phone. She decided to ask him what he was doing. It even scared the guy a little out of surprise. So Yon approached her classmate. They were standing right next to the railing at the edge of the balcony. She asked what Kang Min was doing and why he was staring at the ground floor. Kang Min was a little confused by this question, but decided to be honest and answered that he was just observing. Of course, Seo Young was surprised by this answer. Kang Min went on to say that they were all just running away from these zombie monsters all the time. But if they kept doing that, it would never end. And now, the boy had to understand what those creatures were. Meanwhile, Park Min and Ham Sung Yu were actively looking out the window. They were indignant that the army was still not there. No one was in a hurry to save them. Meanwhile, the tent where the aid was being provided and where Lee Tain was was being burned by the military. It seems that it was not safe because there were monsters in it. Inside were workers in blue uniforms. I think they were the ones Lee Tain was bullying. A military officer was telling someone on the radio that the virus had already spread at control point number three, but they had successfully managed to burn down the quarantine zone. Suddenly, he added on the radio that they were going to start setting fire to the shelters. They were not even going to rescue people who were probably not infected. Meanwhile, the people inside were successfully burning the shelter themselves. There were a dozen zombie monsters on the floor of the room, actively transforming. Meanwhile, on the balcony, they were shouting for everyone to move to the wall and stand aside as quickly as possible. The tent caught fire very strongly. The fire was at the height of the buildings. The people inside were also already suffocating from the smoke and stench emitted by the fire and burning carpets. There was a risk of smoke poisoning. They ran to the window and saw the tent burning. This did not add to their hopes. Suddenly, something terrible happened. The floor of the balcony began to crack. A zombie monster was crawling out from inside it, like a stalk of a plant sprouting from the ground. The tentacles of slime and the frog egg virus were approaching people in search of new victims. The crowd began to panic and scream because the zombie monster was very close. They needed to get out of the room to save themselves. Someone shouted that everything should be burned. Another said not to go crazy because then the whole building would catch fire with them. To which he was told that of course the building would catch fire because they were the ones who set it on fire. Others said that if they had waited a little longer, the military would have rescued them. They did not know that no one was going to save them. They were only going to burn them alive. Park Min was nervous. His heart was beating faster and he was inhaling loudly and deeply out of control. Suddenly, he noticed Yanwa and Isuri sitting on the floor quite calmly talking about something. Meanwhile, people were still arguing about what they should have done and why the military had not yet come to rescue them. Yanwu and Isuri talked about how the boy had already dated a man who was immune. He was talking about Li Tian. Isuri, like the boyfriend, did not believe these words at first, because this phenomenon was not common and seemed rather strange. After all, how could someone be immune to a virus that had never been in the world before? Yon Wu continued that the man seemed to know a lot about the virus and the incubation period for a regular volunteer. For some reason, this information made Isuri angry, and she got angry. 
She asked where this guy was now whom John Wu had told her about but the teenager did not know this information, unfortunately. But he went on to say that they didn't understand anything because the virus was inactive and no symptoms were showing up. And if it suddenly activated and spread, there would be nothing they could do. Isuri looked at Yonwa and listened intently. For some reason, she trusted this stranger. Yonwu looked down. His eyes were completely upset, and the pain did not subside, but it seemed that the boy himself was used to it. Tears or sweat were pouring out of his eyes. Suddenly, the guy remembered that even the last time he came face to face with a person whose virus had already spread through his body, he did not feel as much pain as he did now. The guy came back to reality and looked at the people in front of him, more precisely, at the man in the shirt who was sitting on his knees. John Wu looked at him and said that he was in pain again, even though he was not near the activated virus. The guy was like an x-ray he saw through the man. The boy looked at the floor again. There were so many thoughts running through his head. He could not cope with them alone and he wanted to talk to someone so that he would not have to carry this burden alone. Park Min was watching their conversation, but he didn't seem to hear them. Suddenly he called out to his classmates. Ham Xiong Yu joined him to watch. Now the classmates looked together at Jonwa and Isuri who looked quite close. Park Min told Ham Xiong Yu that it was quite strange that from that moment on, they were always together all the time. Meanwhile, Kang Ji Hoon opened his friend Li Hong Mi's channel and noticed her new video. It made him a little angry. It seems that the guy was worried about her, that even though she was in danger, Han Mi was still recording and posting videos for her channel. Kang Min heard this and said that he had already watched the video, but the connection was not clear. He suggested that maybe Han Mi had accidentally turned on the recording, but that way they could at least realize that the girl was definitely alive. This phrase motivated Kang Ji Hoon to act. He shouted that it was enough to sit around. It was clear that the headman wanted to get out of the room. Kang Ming immediately understood his friend's intentions because he knew him well. He asked him where the headman wanted to go. He added that they had to stay here, telling Kang Ji Hoon to take a look at something. Then, Kang Min took his phone and turned on the flashlight on it. The guy pointed the light down at an area of the floor that was clean. There wasn't even any white slime on it. All of a sudden, all the monsters in the area immediately came running to this area. It looked very ugly. Kang Min commented that the zombie monsters reacted to the light and immediately gathered together. Seo Young joined the conversation and asked Kang Ji Hoon what they would do if they left the shelter. She added that in that case, using a flashlight would be dangerous, and walking in the dark was even more dangerous. Kang Min supported So Young's opinion and said that from the outside they would not have seen anything. The boy continued to look at the zombie monsters gathering around the light. They looked like a whole herd about to bow to some kind of totem. Kang Ming watched everything carefully and studied their behavior. The boy asked if they could take some advantage of the fact that the zombie monsters were reacting and gathering near the light. Suddenly, a man in a brown shirt who was looking out the window suddenly screamed loudly with emotion. This attracted the attention of the others. The man said he saw the military behind the glass. They were walking to the shelter with machine guns. The man in the shirt turned to everyone and happily said that the military was coming to save them. The women began to cry because they hoped to be saved. People started shouting and banging on the window so that the military would notice them. One of the workers looked up and actually saw people in the window. They shouted that they were upstairs and asked the military to rescue them as soon as possible. People started shouting joyfully that they had been noticed, so they were saved. Suddenly, Kang Min and Kang Ji Hoon noticed something and turned around together and stared at it. It was Park Min and Ham Sung Yu staring back at the boys. Suddenly, the guys told them to stop staring at them so brazenly. The tension was building. And then, Ham Seong Yu gave me the middle finger. He felt very cool at that moment, as if he had done something important and noteworthy. Kang Ji Hoon reacted calmly to this miracle. He added that he seemed to care. Park Min then noticed something strange. It caught his attention. He looked at Jonah. He was sitting on the floor holding his hand. It was obvious that the boy was sick again. Isuri was not with him either. Meanwhile, the man and woman hugged each other and cried. They were happy to be safe. Suddenly, the woman looked down and saw Jonah screaming in pain, his arm shaking. The woman could not let it go and approached the boy to ask what happened to him and if he was okay. Suddenly, she saw something terrible. Her eyes grew very large and her pupils shrank. The woman screamed very loudly in fear. 
This attracted the attention of others, and everyone was looking at what was happening to John Wu. The guy looked up. Everyone was horrified by what they saw. The teenager's eyes were white, without pupils. He was shaking for some reason, and sweat was pouring down his body. Then the woman screamed that John Wu was infected. The woman started repeating and shouting that she was infected here. Meanwhile, John Wu did not even hear it. He could only hear the echoes of her scream. The boy was feverish and no one was there to help him. The woman looked at him and shouted loudly that Yon Wu looked exactly like the monster from the first floor and that everyone should get away from him. Suddenly, Yon Wu began to regain consciousness. He looked at the woman who was screaming and staring at him. The boy's eyes returned to what they were and he was no longer shaking. Although his consciousness took longer to recover, he was still able to see this crazy woman. Everything was blurring in his eyes. Suddenly, Yan Wu noticed something terrible. Even in this light and condition, the guy noticed that a monster was sneaking up behind the woman. The nasty big zombie screamed, which meant that it had found its victim. Through the pain, Yan Wu held out his healthy hand to the woman and shouted at her not to go there. But the woman screamed for Yan Wu not to touch her and pulled away from the guy. She screamed at him and called the teenager a crazy psycho, but he only wanted to help her. The woman was so scared that she didn't look at what was in front of her. She was just running away. When the woman realized that she should look ahead when running, she saw something more terrifying in front of her than a teenager who was just cowering. There was a real huge zombie monster in front of the woman. It was growling at her and was two seconds away from attacking her. The chances of survival were minimal. The frightened woman did not even have time to react fully when the inevitable happened. The zombie monster released its white, ugly tentacles on the woman. She didn't have time to save herself or even scream. It happened so fast. In a matter of seconds, the poor victim was already lying on the floor, all wrapped up in the ugly white tentacles of a zombie monster. All the other people present watched. Her husband screamed in fear and pain from the loss of his closest person. Meanwhile, the woman was already in the clutches of the ugly giant. She was screaming from the pain she felt from the infection. The soldier quickly reacted to what happened and came to the rescue. Someone had to resolve the situation. He pushed the poor woman's husband away and took the burning carpet. Then, the man swung and threw it at the monster. His strength was enough to throw the heavy carpet, which was on fire quite a distance. Meanwhile, Li Yongwu got to his feet, but was still breathing heavily. The events were moving too fast for him to keep track of them. All of his classmates were watching him because they were afraid and worried that Yonwu had been infected. They shouted to him to react and turn to face them so they could see if the boy was infected or not. Park Min was the first to resent and betray Yonwu. He said that his classmates didn't like him from the beginning and were suspicious of him. Cold sweat ran down his face. Park Min was worried because he had touched Yonwu more than once and was close to the boy. He was at risk. The boy asked if Yongwu was infected. The teenager was breathing loudly. He was still coming to and trying to overcome the pain. Isuri looked at Yonwa with a stony and rather dissatisfied face. She began to have doubts about what her classmate was telling her. After all, his behavior was very frightening given the situation around him. Eventually, Yonwu gathered his strength and was able to defend himself by saying that things were not as they thought and that the boy was not infected with the frog egg virus. Isuri did not get out of her character and asked Yonwu to tell them how he knew people were infected. She asked if the man with the immunity told her. The girl said it in front of everyone, even though Jonwu had told her in secret. Isuri betrayed him too. Jonwu replied rather rudely that it was none of Isuri's business. Meanwhile, the guy was able to get up and come to his senses. He spoke and looked much better. Everyone around him began to believe that Jonwu was not infected. But Isuri was a stubborn girl and said that she demanded that Jonwu tell her and everyone. Jonwu just exploded then. His nervous system could not withstand such a load. Everything that had happened in the last few days, the loss of a friend, betrayals, the virus, terrible pain, and now the pressure from his classmates. The guy told them to shut up and remember that he was the one who saved them all. The company of traitors was shocked by John Wu's behavior. They all did not expect the guy to react like this and yell at his supposed new friends. Yan Wu added that he had already said that he was not infected, but he was still under suspicion. His eyes looked so crazy. John Wu added that they should all take care of themselves instead of blaming him. 
The teenager said this out of emotion, and he knew he would soon regret it. Isuri caught the essence of his words. Her expression immediately changed and her eyebrows furrowed. The girl did not like the fact that John Wu did not say something. She asked if it was one of them. Then, Yon Wu's eyes grew wide. He suddenly realized what a stupid thing he had said on the spur of the moment. He should have been more careful, because the boy knew too much. Isuri went on to say that she had come to this conclusion from his words. She could see by his expression that he had said too much. But now they would not leave John Wu alone until he told the truth about who he was. Suddenly, Isuri's face changed dramatically. From a stone, faceless expression, it became frightened. The girl realized from Yon Wu's reaction that there was an infected among them. She turned to her classmates and asked Yon Wu if it was true and there was someone infected among them. Suddenly, my eyes fell on Park Min. He looked quite frightened by what he had just heard, somehow even more than the others. The guy started talking to divert suspicion from himself. He asked John Wu who he was. The boy stared at everyone and looked at his classmates. Park Min looked at Yan Wu in confusion and asked him again as he didn't say what he was staring at. The boy's gaze was indeed slightly downward. Yan Wu replied that he was looking at his feet. Then Park Min asked what it meant. His voice began to tremble. Yang Wu looked Park Min in the eye with a calm expression and told him that the boy was infected. The teenager was dripping with cold sweat and he was scared. All of a sudden, Park Min attacked Yan Wu and grabbed his shirt. He called him a bastard and was very angry. But Yan Wu was as calm as possible and did not react to Park Min's actions. He only asked if his classmate understood what he was saying. After that, he repeated that he was infected. Yan Wu looked up at his classmates and said that he didn't know about it until he was hurt. And now he decided that he had to tell everyone. After all, soon the hidden cells would start to activate. But Park Min was not confused and said that he thought that Yan Wu started accusing everyone only because he was under suspicion. He said that the teenager had crossed the line when he decided to take care of him. Park Min still hadn't let go of Yan Wu's t-shirt. Suddenly, Kang Jae Hoon broke into the fight. He broke up the fight and attacked Yan Wu outraged by his actions. The headman told Yan Wu to stop. He asked who the boy thought he was for accusing Park Min of being infected. Yan Wu did not look up. He looked down at the floor and asked Park Min if he really thought Yan Wu was joking with him. After that, the teenager raised his head and looked into Park Min's face. John Wu spoke very seriously and confidently. He looked his classmate straight in the eye and said that he had been clear and precise. At the end, he added that they would see who was right. He added that he didn't know how much longer Park Min could ignore him. The classmate looked at Yan Wu with intense hatred. His eyes were burning with anger. Suddenly, soldiers in suits and with a fire hose in their hands entered the room, interrupting the teenager's fight. At that moment, everyone turned to the sounds coming from the first floor. Suddenly, one of the soldiers gave the command to start the fire. As if on cue, I heard the screams of zombie monsters burning alive. The whole first floor became so hot from the intense fire. It felt as if the lights had been turned on again because it also became very bright instantly. Meanwhile, the woman attacked by the zombie monster was screaming in pain. She was being devoured by a big, ugly giant. The soldier noticed this and realized that he had to act immediately. He had a Molotov cocktail in his hand. He started running to the woman to set her and the monster on fire. Suddenly, he heard the soldiers say they were going to the second floor. That was where they were all located. This made the soldier stop. Two men in uniforms with fire hoses stood on the other side of the door. One of them said that the target had been found. Did they really want to burn all these innocent people alive? Meanwhile, the woman was screaming and begging for help while the monster wrapped its white tentacles around her. The victim thought that the military would have saved her. They were looking at her and the zombie monster eating the poor thing and pointing fire hoses at her. She was screaming and begging for help. She looked at the military with her eyes filled with fear and sincerely hoped for salvation although inside she realized that her death had come. But the military could do nothing. One of them gave the order to burn, and then the men started shooting, which completely enveloped the woman. She was not visible at all, only screaming. The screams were hellish. You wouldn't wish that on anyone. Other people were watching. They were frightened because they were worried that she would not suffer the same fate. 
The woman's husband screamed. Before his eyes, the love of his life was being burned alive. A few minutes ago, they had been hugging and crying with happiness that they would soon be rescued. The man was broken, so he started shouting at the military and calling them freaks. He was indignant and asked what they had done. The military did not pay attention to this. It was clear that this was not the first time this had happened to them. They were just doing their job. Suddenly, the man said again on the radio that they had found several carriers of the infection, hinting at all the survivors who were on the second floor. Suddenly, the muzzle burst into flames. Fire began to pour out of it like water. The military man was the first to notice it because he was the closest. His look changed dramatically. He realized what was about to happen and reacted quickly. The man shouted for everyone to run as fast as they could and flee as far as they could. People began to react, although not everyone understood what was about to happen. Suddenly, the entire balcony of the second floor went up in flames. The military just ruthlessly decided to burn these innocent people. They did not know for sure whether these people were infected. The teenagers ran as fast as they could while the entire building was on fire. Suddenly, everyone present began to realize that the government didn't care about them at all. They were just bargaining chips that could be burned just like that. The shelter was no longer a safe place for them. Kang Ji-hoon said that the soldiers were right. They thought that people were in contact with zombie monsters. The starosta was outraged by this. It was unfair to them. Kang Ji-hoon shouted that it was some kind of punishment. Just then, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed that soldiers with fire hoses had also entered from the other side of the entrance. Kang Min saw this and screamed. He realized that he was probably going to die. They would all be burned alive. A group of homeless people were sitting in front of the military. A hose was pointed at them and they were about to open fire. Just then, one of them told the military to stop. The man raised his hands in the air as if to show that he was surrendering and shouted that they had done nothing to warrant being burned alive. The homeless man asked the soldier what was wrong with them and why they did it. Kang Min saw that the homeless people were not going to run away and hoped and believed that the military would help them. But he realized that they would face the same fate as they would have if they had not run away. Suddenly, something lit up the faces of the soldiers. They could not see anything. Then Kang Min shouted for the homeless to run away and pointed his flashlight at the soldiers. All the other teenagers were hiding behind him. The uniformed soldiers shouted at Kang Min to turn off the flashlight and called him a freak, shielding their faces from the light. Suddenly, monsters began to descend from above. Kang Ming made it special through his observations. He realized that the monsters were flocking to the light and took advantage of this to have them attack the military, who were eager to burn them all. Kang Ming continued to shine the light on the soldiers while they pointed their hose muzzles at the zombie monsters and burned them. A soldier ran to the teenagers. He was sincerely worried about the boys and asked if everyone was alive. When the man reached the door, he pushed it with his elbow to get out of this hell as quickly as possible. After all, they would not leave them alive. But the door did not give in easily. Then the soldier began to use his legs to kick it open. The man was nervous because he had to act quickly. Behind them, Park Min and Ham Song Yu stood and watched as Kang Ji-hoon and the soldier tried to kick down the door to get out of the room. Suddenly, Park Min turned to his friend. He told him that the only way he would be saved was if he got out of the building. Park Min continued that he saw a point outside the window where people were gathering. He added that only Ham Xiong Yu knew about it. Suddenly, Park Min suggested that his friend get rid of everyone else and head to that spot together. Ham Xiong Yu was surprised, but answered positively, because he wanted to get out of the room alive. Suddenly, the homeless began to run toward the teenagers and shouted at Kang Min to wait. The man asked to go with them. The soldier was a little surprised by this request. The homeless man shouted that they had to take them with them because the company didn't exactly know Seoul like the back of their hand. Unlike the homeless who knew every nook and cranny of the capital by heart. After these arguments, the idea of taking the homeless with him no longer seemed so ridiculous to the military. Suddenly, the company heard the military running behind them with fire hoses. One of them shouted to the other workers that he had found the fugitives. The man in uniform added that they had found people who were possibly infected. This meant that they were about to open fire on the company, so they had to run and get out of the room immediately. The soldier realized this. 
and shouted to the others to start running away immediately because they had to save themselves. At the same second, a lot of fire was fired at them, which caused everyone to fall. The fire even poured out of the window of the room. There was a lot of it. Meanwhile, the news showed that public peaceful rallies against the government had begun. The civic group Justice said the government had known about the mutated cell problem in Seoul beforehand. According to Zhang, Si, and Bong, the first report was received from Yang Zhang in Mapogu, 15 days before the blockade of Seoul began. Anonymous sources obtained relevant documents confirming the systematic concealment of information by the authorities, but the government claimed that this was impossible. As for the fake news that fueled the conflicts, the government's clear response was to maintain its position. People were watching all this. It looks like they were sitting in another shelter. It looked exactly like the shelter where the teenagers were. A man with a white shirt and stubble walked through the people and carried hot ramen in his hands. Some girl was looking down. She had dark short hair and looked very upset. The man sat down with the woman and complained that the line for the canteen was so long. He offered the woman ramen and called her his beloved. They seemed to be husband and wife, but she didn't want to eat, didn't even look at the steamed noodles. The woman said she could not think about anything. The man hugged her and said that she should eat. He asked her how long she planned to starve. The woman cried and said she couldn't get in touch with John Woo. She was waiting for a call and said she was just going crazy over it. It turned out to be John Woo's parents. The father immediately began to calm his wife down and said that maybe the boy was tired and was sleeping. He added that the woman had called before and said that everything was fine and they were in a shelter. Suddenly, the news showed such news that everyone started listening attentively, and their attention shifted to the information the reporter was talking about. The news showed a room that was a shelter for teenagers. The man began to talk about the terrible fire that occurred last night, which destroyed the evacuation center of Seoul Station. The news said that the fire was caused by refugees who did not follow the rules of quarantine. They deceived everyone. Yan Wu's parents were listening to all this. His mother's eyes grew as big as an orange when she heard that there had been a very large number of victims. The woman screamed her son's name. The puzzle was solved, and she decided that the boy had not answered the phone because he had died in a fire. Meanwhile, the teenagers were all sitting in a dormitory. It was a room with a lot of beds. Everyone was united and didn't talk about quarrels. The homeless man was also there. He must have brought everyone to this place. Some people were lying on the bed and sleeping. Others couldn't sleep and were thinking about something else. But in general, the room was quiet. The man came into the room and went to the window. He said that Seoul was closed. A soldier came up behind him. The homeless man asked him if he thought the man should just sit in the room and wait for a miracle. There were some soldiers walking downstairs in uniforms that resembled the uniforms worn by the workers in the shelter that burned down. The soldier told the homeless man that these children had come from the village for a tour of Seoul and had no place to stay. The soldier asked him if he could ask the homeless man for a favor. The man told him not to worry, because the homeless man already owed a debt to the military for saving them from a burning shelter. He told the soldier that they could stay as long as they wanted. It turned out that the room where the company was located was a homeless shelter. Meanwhile, the soldiers in yellow suits asked someone for cooperation and added that it was for their own safety. They told people that they must have escaped from the shelter earlier that night, so the military did not burn them alive. The military asked if they had been in contact with the cells at night, or if someone close to them had. But the frightened people were silent. Some were not sure they were not infected and some were afraid to tell the truth. The soldier began to talk about how they might have felt nauseous or upset or other people around them. Suddenly, Park Min raised his hand from the crowd. The man asked what he wanted to ask him. Park Min said he ran away and asked what he should have done. He added that his friend was showing signs of infection. And then he asked if he had reported it. Would the military have taken care of it? Meanwhile, John Woo stood alone in front of the window on the stairs. He wanted to be alone and think about what had happened that night, to analyze how he felt. He took his hand again, although it no longer hurt this time. John Woo suddenly remembered a woman yelling at him that he was infected because he looked like that. The teenager's breathing became faster again. The memories came flooding back one by one. Then Yon Woo remembered how Kang Ji Hoon said he was immediately suspicious of him and then asked if Yon Woo was infected. The word was running through his head. He thought about how he could be sure that he was not infected. Meanwhile, 
Park Min was reporting a friend of his to a uniformed soldier. He began to say that as soon as he got to the shelter, he realized how suspicious he was acting. They put a blue mask on the guy, apparently to prevent him from spreading the virus. The guy continued that his friend looked very shocked and sometimes even flinched when he spoke to him. He went on to say that one day a woman noticed his condition and immediately said that he was infected. And then he said that this bastard just walked up to the woman and gave her the virus. Park Min was a great actor because he played his role as a victim perfectly. The soldier looked at the guy and sincerely believed him. He added that it was a very sad story and that the guy was a real devil. Then, another uniformed officer approached them. The man who spoke to Park Min asked the officer if they had verified the boy's story. The officer replied in the affirmative and said that they had found the boy's name on the list. They discussed that if they believed the public opinion about the super vector, it would undermine their credibility and responsibility. Park Min heard this conversation and thought about Lee Youngwoo. He was very angry with him for daring to talk about Park Min like that. The soldier and the teenager were leaving the ward. The man in uniform told Park Min to follow him. Then, the man asked if the boy had definitely not been in contact with the infected person, to which Park Min said that he had stayed away from Yanwu from the very beginning because he thought he was too strange because of his behavior. Li Tian heard this conversation. The guy was standing in the front of the crowd and was also wearing a mask. Meanwhile, the soldier told Park Min to go to the waiting room. Li Tain turned around to see who was slandering Yanwu. He immediately realized that it was him, especially since the red-haired guy could also sense the frog egg virus in Park Min's body. The soldier led Park Min to a waiting room. Some buildings were still burning. Meanwhile, the company was still in the dormitory where the homeless lived. Kang Ji-hoon jumped up abruptly on the bed and started scratching his head and screaming as if there were some nits there. The starosta turned to the audience and asked why everyone was itching so much. He continued to scratch his body. Suddenly, the boy heard someone laughing at his behavior and asked if he was bothered by severe itching. That was Kang Min. He advised his best friend to be careful with pillows. Kang Min said that all the bedspreads and pillows in the room had nits on them. Kang Ji-hoon jumped up and down and shouted in indignation. Meanwhile, Kang Min checked his phone, but it was almost dead. The guy went to the switch to check if the lights were on, but it turned out that there was no electricity. He asked what they needed now. Kang Min said that his phone was dying. Kang Jihoon asked again if there was a power outage. Ham Seong Yu was listening in on their conversation. Suddenly, the guy laughed at them and called them morons. The two friends turned to his provocation. Ham Song Yu looked down and laughed at them. He asked if the boys could do anything or if they were so stupid and incapable. Then, Ham Sung Yu looked up at his classmates and took out a power bank. He then added that they could forget whatever they wanted, but they couldn't forget about the extra phone charger. After that, the guy smiled sarcastically. Ham Xiong Yu made fun of his classmates and ironically asked if he could share with them. But the boy forgot that he was without his friend and was in the minority. While Ham Xiong Yu was choking on his laughter, Kang Ji Hoon and Kang Min noticed that he was without his faithful friend, Park Min. They asked why Ham Sung Yu was alone. This question made him very nervous, and cold sweat began to drip down his cheeks and his voice shook. He said that he did not know where his friend was because they had separated when they came here. Ham Sung Yu started to say that in any case, they were not close and they were not friends at all. Then a soldier came into the room and overheard their conversation. The soldier decided to knock on the door so as not to distract the others from the conversation and not to scare anyone. Kang Min and Kang Jihoon turned toward the sound. The man sat down on the bed and said that he had studied the entire room. Meanwhile, all the teenagers gathered around him. The only one missing was John Wu. The soldier said that it didn't seem like the building was in as bad a condition. He advised them to check it out for themselves and go downstairs. The conditions were normal so the company could stay here. He began to tell me what was in the building. On the ground floor, there was a waiting room for the homeless. There was even a machine that made coffee, but without electricity, it was of little use. There was an office on the second floor, but there was no one there. It looked like all the workers had already been evacuated to the shelter. The soldier then suggested that the third floor was for sleeping, and downstairs was most likely the dining room, so there must have been food there. The teenagers hadn't eaten since last night, so they could use some food. 
He went on to add that maybe the homeless would still come here, but it was quite safe to stay inside. Suddenly, the man was interrupted. He turned to look this impudent person in the face because the military man felt he was in charge of the company and expected to be treated properly. It was Asuri. She apologized for saying that even though they had just met, but she said it didn't make any sense. She asked if the soldier really thought it was safe indoors because even in the shelter, it was not that safe. In general, nowhere in Seoul was safe and they were not allowed to go outside. Then she added that the homeless were going to go back and forth Isuri said that her husband had to close all the doors, otherwise they would have been infected as well. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon interrupted the conversation. He said that the girl didn't have to worry about the homeless because Yon Wu was with them. The guy looked the girl in the eye and asked if Yon Wu wasn't more dangerous. After all, his behavior yesterday was very suspicious. The boy was not acting normally around the zombie monsters. But Isuri began to defend her friend and asked if Kang Ji-hoon knew anything about Yeonwu to speak of him in such a way. They had never spoken, and no one knew what the boy had been through in those few days. Then, Kang Ji-hoon asked, stammering, if Yeonwu was infected. After all, Isuri's words sounded very confident, and she wanted to believe that the girl had never been stupid. Suddenly, the girl screamed. She broke down, saying that she did not know this information for sure, she told everyone to stop asking her about it because she had no idea what had really happened. In the back of her mind, she knew that John Wu probably didn't fully understand whether he was infected or not. Suddenly, the girl asked them if John Wu was not their friend. She added that if they were so curious, they could ask John Wu about it themselves. Isuri continued that it was all quite strange. It was like they had left the guy in Namsan. She started to talk about something else when Kang Ji-hoon interrupted her. But Kang Min did not let the boy explode and shout and asked Isuri in a calm voice not to mock them. The guy took on the role of an elder, as it were, and started saying some pretty reasonable things. He said that they would try to understand the situation that had happened. He added that they had to cooperate now, otherwise they would be in danger. He sounded like a military man. But Isuri did not understand this tactic. She just laughed and said that no one would want to unite and cooperate with anyone. She added that no one would want to team up and work with him. The girl showed by this that she was clearly mocking and ridiculing the guy for everything they had done. Kang Min exploded and began to quarrel with Isuri. She was provoking the company, but he was the one who was acting out. Suddenly, a soldier joined the conversation. He started to get up and said that the teenagers had stopped fighting. He himself did not want to work in such an environment because his life was also at risk because of their arguments. He told them to think again about where they should have stayed. But first, he suggested that they all go to the canteen and look for food. Kang Min and Isuri were the first to leave. The boy asked the girl if she had to behave like that in such a situation. She answered in the affirmative and ended the conversation. Kang Ji-hoon and Ham Xiong yu were watching. The boy asked his classmate if Kang Min and Isuri had been close before. The headmaster replied that it was nonsense. But Ham Xiong yu said that the two were always standing up for each other. Meanwhile, Soyeon was just watching what was happening. The girl didn't speak much and spent most of her time lost in thought. Soyeon went to the restroom to wash her face and clean up a bit. She didn't feel safe anywhere now. She was constantly stressed and anxious. She looked up and began to recall what had happened that evening when they fled the burning shelter. As she was running away, she noticed something. This memory made her shake with terror. There was a person in the fire directed by the soldier. He was screaming in pain. He was alive and felt everything that was happening. Perhaps that person was not infected at all and could have lived to a ripe old age. The girl was shocked then. Seeing someone burned alive was unbearable. The girl fell to the ground and held on to the sink. So Young wished so much that these memories would be erased from her mind. In fact, she wished that the last few days would be a dream, and she would wake up in her room in Namsan and get ready for a tour. Suddenly, the girl began to shake with terror. She did not want the enemy to see with their own eyes what she had seen yesterday in the shelter. After regaining consciousness, she decided to find a company and went up the stairs. But her mind was still full of thoughts. She was thinking about how others hadn't gone crazy after everything that had happened. She thought that they were being bullied because of her. 
She thought in her head that she really couldn't take it anymore. It was all very hard for her. She looked down as she walked, so So Young didn't notice that Yan Wu was coming down the stairs in front of her. It seemed that the teenagers were avoiding each other and did not want to meet even by chance. When she saw someone standing in front of her, she immediately looked up and was terrified. So Young did not expect to miss John Wu. Her face betrayed the girl's surprise. John Wu looked her in the eye as if he were superior to her. The feeling of guilt that emanated from So Young gave Yan Wu a sense of power over her. The girl decided to talk to the boy and stammered out the boy's name, but he didn't even stop. He just went on downstairs, pretending that Soyeon hadn't been here. And the girl tried to say that everyone had gone downstairs to the dining room, but she couldn't finish. No one listened to her, and she realized that she should not have stooped so low. John Woo was not ready for reconciliation. The girl stopped. Her legs did not want to walk away from this encounter. She realized that Yeon Woo had to come back sooner or later, because there was nothing on the top floor but the exit. But the guy did not return. He walked on and did not even turn around to look in the girl's direction, although he had previously admired her beauty whenever he had the opportunity. Then Soyeon turned around to see what Jeon Woo was going to do, but what she saw surprised and even shocked her. Yeon Woo was heading straight for the exit, and he had a briefcase on his shoulders. Why did he have a briefcase in the room? He didn't stop and confidently walked up to the door and then just opened it. Then the girl immediately rushed to him to stop him. She didn't want to lose her boyfriend again. The girl grabbed the boy's hand and shouted at him not to leave. She didn't even let him open the door an inch. She yelled at Yonwa and asked him why he needed a backpack. She bombarded her classmates with questions about how it was very dangerous outside and that he shouldn't have gone. But Yonwu began to resist, and Soyeon clung to him even more with both hands and begged him not to leave her. But Jeonwu shouted at her to let him in immediately. The guy was behaving very aggressively and strangely. He was suddenly overcome with incredible anger and irritation. Suddenly, the guy pushed poor So Young and shouted at her to get out of his way. She fell down and screamed, because she could not imagine that John Wu would do that. So Yeon fell down and almost cried from the insult. She was hurt both physically and mentally. She had just been humiliated. It was the second time. Suddenly, John Wu screamed again. He was saying something, something he didn't know. The girl turned to look at her classmate. He looked at what he had done and screamed with anger. He was angry at her, angry at himself for hurting her just now. The guy said that he did not know whether he was safe or not, and that is why she was not supposed to approach and touch the boy. So Young was silent and just looked at Yanwa in horror. She didn't recognize her classmate. It turned out that she did not know the guy at all. In difficult situations, you begin to realize who is who. Meanwhile, the group looked around the dining room. Kang Ji-hoon was sitting at the table, and Kang Min and Ham Sung Yu were looking for something. It looked like the guys were actually starting to reconcile a bit and form a team. It turned out that the boys were trying to figure out the stove. Ham Sung Yu was indignant that it wouldn't turn on. Kang Min said that the stove was supposed to turn on and probably needed electricity. Ham Sung Yu asked what they should have done then. Meanwhile, Kang Ji-hoon sat behind them, looking intently at something on his phone. He was looking at maps. From the outside, it looked like he didn't even blink and just stared at his phone. Kang Min, meanwhile, asked if Ham Xiong Yu had a lighter. He was told that why would a high school student have a lighter? Kang Min didn't believe it and asked again, but his classmate told him that he really didn't have one on him. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon turned abruptly and looked at the door. The boy asked aloud why the others did not come down. They seemed to be the only three in the dining room. Suddenly, the guy heard a ringtone coming from his phone. He looked at the screen, but the number was unknown. Kang Ji-hoon finally decided to pick up the phone and speak. On the other end, he heard a woman's voice that sounded familiar. She was asking if it was Kang Ji-hoon. Suddenly, he recognized this familiar female voice. His pupils dilated sharply, and his heart suddenly beat faster. Kang Ji-hoon jumped up and asked if it was his classmate Hannah. Meanwhile, on the ground floor, Soyeon was getting up after falling. John Woo looked down, but in Soyeon's direction. He was still ashamed that he had hurt his classmate. The girl tried to talk to him normally again. She said she did not understand the boy's feelings. Everyone was worried because the situation was unusual and dangerous. Soyeon added that going out alone was not an option anyway, because it was too dangerous outside. 
John Wu turned away from the girl and just looked at the street. She suddenly said that since he was not infected, he had to stay inside with them all. But the guy did not respond to her. He clearly decided that he had to leave to sort himself out and not put anyone in danger. Yan Wu looked down and simply opened the door and started to walk out, leaving So Young. Suddenly, he heard some sounds from the street. It made him look up. Then, Yan Wu saw another batch of homeless people enter. There were three men of different looks. One of them saw John Wu and asked who he was and what he was doing here. Suddenly, the guy felt this pain again. His body seemed to shake and his heart was beating frantically. Meanwhile, in the dining room, Ham Sung Yu heard Kang Ji Hoon talking about Hannah. He turned around to see what was going on and what was going on. Kang Ji Hoon was actively talking on the phone and asking Hannah where they all were. Hannah said quietly, covering her mouth with her hand, that they were hiding in a building. In fact, the girls were trying to get back to them, the girl explained on the phone. Meanwhile, Han Mi was sitting behind her. She wrapped her arms around her legs and looked down. Suddenly, she heard that Hannah was talking to Kang Ji Hoon. This information made her happy. Hannah, meanwhile, continued that they hadn't been able to contact them because their phones were dead. Then my classmates started to say that they were now in some alleyway, and there were a lot of signs for travel agencies and companies. The last thing the girls said was that their phones were almost completely dead, when suddenly, the connection was cut off. It seems that her phone had died after all. Meanwhile, Kang Min and Ham Xiong Yu had already approached Kang Ji Hoon and asked what had happened to the girls. The headman told them that their phone had died. The guy quickly tried to call the girl again. But in response, he heard from the phone that the number he was trying to call was unavailable. Meanwhile, John Wu and Isuri were already sitting together. It seemed that the boy had changed his mind, perhaps because he felt threatened by the homeless and wanted to warn others. Isuri suddenly suggested that they go together. John Wu immediately turned to the girl. He did not expect to hear this from her. She repeated that if John Wu wanted to leave, he would have taken her with him. She didn't even look in his direction. Again, she had a stony expression on her face. Suddenly, Yon Wu said something that made Isuri look at him. He agreed to go with her. There was even some romance in it. He looked at what was happening outside and said that they would definitely escape from this room, but not now. Yon Wu added that they would first observe the situation before running away. But Isuri did not understand what John Wu meant. She asked him if it was a rejection on his part. She added that it hurt her pride, to which the boy replied that he did not mean it. John Wu explained that he was worried about something. He could feel the presence of the infected and wondered if it would be okay to run away on his own. What if these people became really dangerous? Isuri grimaced. Once again, John Wu said things that scared her and gave her the creeps. She suddenly grabbed the guy's t-shirt and yanked, telling him to follow her and stop talking like an idiot. She dragged him up the stairs. Yon Wu shouted for the girl to let him go. Isuri eventually let the boy go. He asked her what she was doing with him. Suddenly, her tone changed, and she said that it seemed Yon Wu had misunderstood her. The boy's face changed dramatically. Isuri began to say that among all those present, only Yon Wu was suspected of being infected. She added that the boyfriend made her feel special because he could tell the difference between the infected. Yon Wu did not like this tone of communication, so he interrupted her as much as he could. Yon Wu said that it was he who saved them then and did not understand why the girl was exaggerating. He then added that she had also saved him in a shelter when they were in danger. She suddenly called the guy a fool and said that she just knew the location of the hydrant and the emergency exit. How else could she have helped him escape? The girl added that she would never have acted if she had doubts. Yon Wu felt deceived by her words. Then he asked if he could just leave the girl here if he had doubts. This development of events did not suit the girl, and she openly showed her indignation. John Wu said that she should understand the feeling of being left behind in danger. He said he didn't mean anything by it. These were the last words of the boy. After that, he simply turned away from Isuri without even looking her in the eye. Then the guy just left. He was going down the stairs and probably intended to escape from the premises. Isuri swore out loud and said how sick of it she was. John Wu continued to go down, waiting for the girl to do something. He wondered to himself if he had gone too far. He thought about what had happened when the homeless people went inside. Yan Wu thought about how, even when he wasn't thinking straight, he still grabbed So Young's hand and simply led her along. 
They ran away together, and John Wu protected her. He wanted to do this unconsciously, without realizing it. He began to recall the beginning of the school trip and how in love he was with Soyon, how he used to look at her all the time. John Wu began to think that maybe all he wanted to do was get closer to So Young. Suddenly, his dreams were interrupted, and the guy returned to this terrible reality. Three homeless people stood in front of him. One of them pointed at Yonva and said that he was the guy who ran away from them when he barely saw them. Yon Wu realized that from the outside it didn't look like it was happening, so he began to explain to the men why they had fled. Suddenly, a man in a hat told Yon Wu to come over to them. He added that they were all very offended and called the boy a jerk, but the homeless people surrounded him, not giving him any passage. Another said that Yon Wu still had the courage to snap at them, but the guy only offered to discuss everything, and he would explain how it really happened. Suddenly, someone intervened in their fight. This, someone told the gentleman to be careful. All four turned to see what was happening and who was saying it. It turned out to be Asuri. The girl looked at what was happening with a stone face. She suddenly said that Yan Wu had symptoms of infection and that even among their company they tried to avoid him. The homeless people immediately started screaming and getting scared. The men ran upstairs, screaming in fear that they had not touched him. Isuri's plan worked, and Yan Wu's face was left intact. The girl saw that Yan Wu was just staring at her and told him to stop doing that. She explained that she didn't help him because he was nice. She added that staying here wasn't such a bad option as long as they didn't let the infected in. Then, she looked at Yonwa. She looked him straight in the eye and told him that if he was going to leave, he just had to take Isuri with him. Meanwhile, the teenagers were sitting in the dining room. Soyon joined them. Behind the door in the next room, there was a homeless man and a soldier. They were looking out the window and discussing something. The homeless man asked if the soldier wanted to leave the room for a while. He received a positive answer from the man. But the homeless man decided to ask if the soldier was sure of his intentions, because it was very dangerous outside. The homeless man went on to say that he had heard that much of the frog egg virus had been exterminated, thanks to the fire at Seoul Station. But there was another danger. If they faced the cleanup army, they would have no chance. The homeless man continued that this army exterminated all the people of no fixed abode in the area, hiding behind the virus warning. The homeless man said that the man should have realized this himself. He asked if the soldier wanted to go that far and advised him to value his life as well. He agreed with his friend's words, and then he started talking about a woman who really wanted to become a teacher. Although she never took any tests, she still remembered her unrealized dream while working in the private sector. Suddenly, the soldier said that this wonderful woman had always wanted to teach children, and then he added that she was his fiancée. The soldier started talking about his beloved. He wanted to finally get it off his chest. He said that his fiancée always bought the children all kinds of sweets after their exams. And when he asked her why she did it, the bride replied that she just liked to make children happy. She liked children's simplicity. Suddenly, the soldier said something that shocked the homeless man. The man revealed that perhaps his wife could forgive him if he helped and protected these teenagers. Then the soldier decided to join his classmates and tell them about his plan. He said that he had learned from a man about a square with a bunch of private bureaus. The man put together the information from the driver and this information and found the location. Kang Ji-hoon's briefcase contained Molotov cocktails. The soldier distributed them based on past bitter experiences so that the bottles would not explode all at once. They also prepared special clothes. The soldier was going to go with Kang Ji-hoon because it was his idea and desire to save Hanmi in the first place. The starosta turned to his friends and cursed the girl, saying that she was nothing but trouble. Suddenly, Kang Jihoon told his classmates not to worry at all, and that their team would be back in less than an hour, so fast that they wouldn't even have time to blink. The team was leaving the room. Kang Jihoon looked down as he left. Suddenly, his gaze went up. He noticed someone, which made him stop. John Wu and Isuri stood in front of the team. The boy was carrying a briefcase, which raised questions. The classmates just looked at each other. Suddenly, they exchanged a glance, looking each other straight in the eye. I could see in their eyes that they had a lot of questions for each other, but they were not going to talk. So the teenagers just missed each other and went their separate ways. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon stopped. He had something to say, and he couldn't hold it in any longer. The headman told Yan Wu to forgive him. 
Kang Jihoon began to sincerely apologize to Yan Wu. The guy turned his head in his direction in surprise. He did not expect to hear this from a traitor. Kang Jihoon continued and said that he did not expect the guy to forgive him. The starosta suddenly remembered something. A memory from the Namsan cable car came to his mind. When he and Yan Wu went down to the floor where the girls were, they were in danger because the zombie monster was about to grab them, and then his beloved Hanmi would have died as well. Suddenly, Yon Wu was not afraid. He ran to distract the monster and thus saved the girls. Then everyone survived. These memories made Kang Ji Hoon's heart beat faster. He was very worried about his Hon Mi, even though he didn't show it. Then, the headman simply said that he was indebted to John Wu for this act of his. Meanwhile, Isuri heard someone in the room arguing and talking about someone bringing someone here. The teenagers didn't say anything to Kang Ji Hoon. They just all went on their way. Yan Wu turned to look at his classmate and consider the sincerity of his words. Kang Ji Hoon simply walked out of the room and went to look for Han Mi and the other girls. When Yan Wu and Isuri entered the room, they saw a picture of a soldier telling Soyeon that she could not go with them. The man held Soyeon to keep her from going out the door and said that she could not leave because it was dangerous. Yan Wu looked at Soyoung, so many emotions raging in him, but his face was completely disinterested. Soyeon screamed and pleaded with the soldier, adding that she could not sit idly by while her friends were in danger. Suddenly, Isuri interrupted their conversation. She ironically asked what Soyono could do to help them and be useful. Her face was not just stony, it expressed dissatisfaction. The girl continued that anyone would die if they encountered a zombie monster. She asked what So Young could do about it. The girl replied that she would have done anything, but Isuri said that this was not true and that her classmate would only be in the way. She added that she had repeatedly said that it was dangerous even in this room, but Soyeon simply did not want to accept or understand it. Isuri added that it was possible that Hanmi would bring the virus with him, and that there were ten days before Seoul opened. She asked Seo Young if she could live through those ten days and survive. The military officer suddenly supported Isuri, adding that no one should have left the room for the sake of everyone's safety. Soyeon looked at the soldier in shock. She knew inside that she was powerless, but she wanted to save her friend so badly. She did not want her to regret her inaction. The soldier said that they could do nothing if a virus appeared in the room, so the man asked the teenagers to protect him in their absence. Finally, the soldier spoke to the homeless man. He asked the man to take care of these children. Yan Wu thought about what So Young had just said and looked down. Suddenly, the phrase that the girl couldn't sit idly by when her friends were in danger came to mind. He walked past the girl and thought about who he and Kim Jubin were to her then. Suddenly, the boy raised his head and looked at his classmates. He was again filled with anger and hatred. Then, Kang Min was about to say something. Suddenly, Isuri interrupted him rudely and told him to give her a chance to think. The girl was a spark. She began to command that everyone had to listen to her first. All the other teenagers looked at Isuri and for some reason listened attentively, as if she were in charge. She looked at Kang Min and told him that his classmates had something to do now and that it was important to remember it. Meanwhile, another homeless man named Huang was approached by another homeless man who was in the group of newcomers. Suddenly, everyone started to panic and yell. He told Huang to run quickly after him. When the homeless man came running, he saw that there was a fight between two other homeless people down there. A man with blonde hair was holding a broken bottle and threatening another man with it. Then Huang ran up to the man to calm him down and take the bottle away from him. Meanwhile, Isuri was telling something about her experience when she was able to prevent the virus but not kill it completely. Meanwhile, Huang suddenly became very sick. His eyes grew bigger and his pupils constricted. It turned out that a homeless man with white hair had stabbed him in the stomach with a broken bottle. Blood immediately poured out of his body. Everyone else just laughed and stood by and watched as they mutilated poor Huang. They wanted to kill him. Suddenly, someone called Huang Dong Chul's name. The man turned toward the sound. He was a healthy man with broad shoulders and a white t-shirt with a cap. He said that Huang had to solve the problem peacefully. The homeless man looked at the man directly in the eye and called him a bastard. After these words, all the other homeless people started beating Huang and calling him names. The man fell to the ground. Meanwhile, Isuri said that the only ones who ruined all the plans in the end were the people. 
Ham Xiong Yu interrupted the conversation. He asked why they should have been careful with other people, judging by Asuri's speech, and then added that it was all nonsense. The girl reacted to the boy's words with defiance and indignation. Suddenly, Soyon turned to her classmate and asked her why she was telling them all of a sudden. It looked like something was about to happen, and it made Soyon scared. Suddenly, Isuri said that a lot of infected people had just arrived. Soyon's face changed dramatically, and she became frightened. Isuri told them not to ask how she knew this information. She added that even in this place there were infected people, and then they could have been killed. Ham Song Yu and the others were very indignant at what they heard. They told the girl to stop fooling around and stop mocking them. Suddenly, their conversation was interrupted. Someone came into the room and called out to the teenagers. They were homeless. A fat, tall man in a white t-shirt and cap called the teenagers rats and told them to come to him. Something terrible was brewing. Meanwhile, the news was talking about a public gathering for the realization of justice, which held a press conference again. They claimed that the government had been covering up the mutated virus incident in Seoul. At this conference, Shim Guyon, as vice president of the CCO JAR, provided information on the status of military preparations to combat the virus in connection with the emergence of the non-mutated virus. According to the document, using the word cell, which likely referred to a mutated virus, infected people could have been at risk of being killed by acts of murder. The government took measures to contain the spread of the virus as they were classified from Class A to Class D. Meanwhile, the authorities have yet to comment on the matter. Meanwhile, the city was in chaos. Two people were running fast somewhere. They were holding burning torches to protect themselves from monsters, and in such a situation, perhaps, from the army. It turned out to be Kang Jehun and a soldier. They were hiding behind the wall of the building from the army in front of them. There were a lot of soldiers on the bypass. They had to somehow get through them to find Hanmi and the girls. Kang Jihoon asked what the military was burning and hypothesized that it was infected people. The man said that it seemed to be true. They ran on, and Kang Jihoon said that they might as well have turned around and run home. It turned out that the torch was in the possession of a soldier. The team ran between buildings and alleys to somehow get around the army. The man told the boy that they had to be careful because the virus could spread. Kang Jihoon looked at the soldier, and suddenly memories of the man began to surface in his mind. He recalled how the soldier said at the gas station that he wanted to help Kang Jihoon find his friends. Suddenly, the starosta addressed the man as Mr. They all called him that, usually. Kang Jihoon wanted to ask him something. Suddenly, the soldier was outraged and told them to stop calling him that, and that in fact, there was no such difference between them as to make him a Mr. Then the soldier said that his name was Ha Jiman, but they could have just called him Jiman Hyun. Then Kang Jihoon said it was strange to call him Hyun, and then he decided to make a joke about his name, Hajiman. The man replied that the boy's name was no better. Then Kang Jihoon decided to finish his thought and said that he didn't expect Hyun to really help him in his search for Hong Mi. He added that he was a little surprised. The soldier was a little indignant at Jihoon's distrust and asked him who he thought he was. After all, Hyun had promised to help. The man added that he was also the only one who was surprised. Kang Jihoon didn't understand why, so Jiman Hyun said that he didn't expect the headman to come out and save Hong Mi because he was so close to her. He added that usually kids his age didn't do such things, so Jimin Hyun was very curious about who she was to him. At this question, Kang Jihoon was a little flustered. He hadn't expected such frankness, and he had kept his amorous affairs under wraps. He started to defend himself and attacked Hyun that it was a stupid question. Suddenly, the man interrupted him and told him to wait. There was a large number of monsters in front of them. The whole road was dotted with them, so they would not have been able to pass safely. Jim and Hyun said that there were too many monsters ahead of them, so they had to get around them somehow. The man turned around to say something to Kang Jihoon in closing. But the guy was already holding a lighted Molotov cocktail and was ready to defend himself. Suddenly we heard an explosion and the screams of zombie monsters, and from the height of the buildings a large fire was visible. There was a mini-market near them. The road to it was clear. A soldier came in and said it was good that there was a mini-market. That way they could get some water. He added that the children might not have anything to drink. Kang Ji Hoon was standing by the door keeping watch. He asked Hyun if Hong Mi was okay. The soldier replied that he was supposed to be. 
Then he asked if the girl had called the headman. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon returned to the intimate topic himself. He repeated the military officer's question about who Han Mi was to him. He began to tell me that when they were in high school, the guy was a bully. You could really see it in him. Kang Ji-hoon began to reminisce and talk about his dark past and the not-so-good company he was in back then. There were five guys. One of them was on a blue motorcycle. One of the company members said he thought Kang Ji-hoon was dropping out of school. The headman laughed and called him a jerk. He told me that he hated school then and felt empty every day. It was during that period that he became close to Lee Hong Mi. The guy was standing at a traffic light, waiting for the light to turn green. Lee Hong Mi noticed him then and asked if Kang Ji-hoon also lived nearby. The girl was standing with her mother. Han Mi's mom asked who Kang Ji-hoon was. She replied that he was a classmate of hers. Then Han Mi started telling her mom that Kang Ji-hoon was good at sports and added that he was very cool at the last festival. Kang Ji-hoon blushed. Han Mi's mom was immediately interested in this guy. She asked Kang Ji-hoon to be her friend, adding that he was very handsome. Lee Hong Mi was immediately nervous when she heard this. She didn't expect her mother to set her up like that, but Kang Ji-hoon said that he would certainly be her friend. He had never spoken to Han Mi before. The girl said goodbye and left. Since then, she has always talked to Kang Ji-hoon at school, every day. He started to feel really happy then. His life made sense again, and being at school seemed less terrible. The graduation ceremony came. Parents congratulated their children, who did well in school, and brought flowers. Kang Jehoon stood propped up against the wall in the hall and looked at his phone. Suddenly, he heard someone talking to him. The person said that they had heard that Kang Jehoon's parents could not make it, and that he must have been very sad about it. It turned out to be Lee Hong Mi's mother. She was smiling at Kang Ji-hoon and holding flowers. The woman sincerely wanted to support the boy so that he would not be sad. The woman said she was sure that his parents would have been happy to come and gave Kang Ji-hoon flowers, saying it was a gift for him. She congratulated the boy on his graduation. His face changed dramatically with surprise. Lee Hong Mi's parents asked to take a picture together. Han Mi and Kang Ji-hoon stood next to each other, with the girl's parents on their sides. Kang Ji-hoon told the soldier that her parents were very nice people and treated bad guys like him well. The boy added that he could only hope that happiness would not go away. The soldier listened carefully to the boy. He realized that it was important to him because it was probably the first time Kang Ji-hoon had ever spoken to someone at all. The man approached the boy and put his hand on his shoulder as a sign of support. He promised that Lee Hong Mi was fine. The team ran off. It was time to go in search of Kang Ji-hoon's friend. Suddenly, they heard that they had been found. The team put their hands up. The army said they had found those responsible for the arson. The guys were in danger because the military pointed their guns at them with fire. Meanwhile, in the shelter, the teenagers kept talking to homeless people, who apparently did not want to be friends with the children. Isuri told the homeless people that two of their friends had gone to the shelter to bring them supplies. The man with white hair who had injured Huang with a broken bottle asked what his boss was doing and told them to just kill the teenagers. A fat man with a cap yelled at him and said that they had no food supplies. Then the boss threatened the children that if they lied to him, he would kill them all. Isuri asked with a calm face and rather claimed that the man was acting like this because she was constantly cheating him. And then she said that they would give them half of their supplies if the homeless people did not touch the children. She spoke so confidently as if the homeless were supposed to be afraid of her and obey her orders. Then the homeless threw the children into a room behind a glass door. They said that their friends should have hurried, because if there is no food on their table by evening, they will do to the children what they did to him. The man in the cap pointed to the floor. Huang was lying there. He was almost unconscious and barely breathing. The boss would come out and tell the homeless man in the hat and red jacket to keep an eye on the teenagers. The children quickly ran to their friend Huang. The man was covered in blood. He had been beaten badly by those bastards. Kong Min leaned over to the homeless man. Huang was alive and barely breathing. The guy said he thought the homeless man was a former boxer. That's what he told them. Ham Xiong Yu shouted and was indignant that he didn't know what they were supposed to do now, because no one was supposed to bring any supplies. He yelled at Isuri, asking why she had told the men. Ham Song Yu added that they would die at this rate. Isuri responded by asking him if he had any other ideas. Then John Wu interjected himself into the conversation. 
The guy said that, in fact, it would be better if the infected people just started showing symptoms. Yan Wu turned to Isuri and said that those who were infected would have started showing symptoms even before Kang Jihoon and Jiman Hyun returned. Meanwhile, the homeless people were sitting in another room, laughing at the teenagers. Suddenly, a friend of the homeless man wearing military pants started coughing and shaking. His friend asked him if he was okay because he noticed his friend's strange condition. He looked at the man and asked if he was feeling well. Suddenly, the infected man started vomiting on the floor. He was shaking all over. Suddenly, the friend who was lying on the bed saw this, and his eyes widened and his mouth dropped open in surprise. He suddenly realized that his friend was infected and was about to turn into a zombie monster. Meanwhile, the teens came up with a further plan of action. Isuri said that if the mutated virus appeared in the room, everything would go wrong and the homeless would flee the room. She added that they had already encountered the frog egg cell virus. Isuri summarized that they could all have gone through all of this too if they had planned well. She said they were all very lucky because she had always failed all of her tests and exams. Meanwhile, Soyeon was looking at Isuri very closely. The girl noticed this, so she asked her classmate if she had anything to say to her. But Soyeon remained silent. On the contrary, this question, which sounded more like a hit and run, scared the girl a lot. She did not want to have any problems or clashes with her classmates. With a serious face and a little rudeness, Isuri asked So Young why she was looking at her like that. She ended by telling her to stop doing it. So Young immediately began to apologize, but she was a little nervous. Isuri's mood scared her. Meanwhile, Ham Sung Yu stepped away from everyone to think. He said out loud that he shouldn't have followed his classmates here. He was swearing and it was clear that he was very sorry. Suddenly, he received a notification on his phone. He read it on a closed screen, and what he read surprised the guy. He did not expect to see it. It was his friend Park Min. He texted Ham Sung Yun a simple hello on the messenger. The guy's heart started beating rapidly, and cold sweat began to pour down his face. He did not reply to his friend, and simply sent Park Min away out loud. Ham Seong Yu's behavior was quite strange, because they had agreed together to go to the point that the boy knew about and escape. Ham Seong Yu was supposed to be with his friend in a shelter. Kang Ming said that the virus with a new incubation period had already begun to spread, and no one knew what was coming. The guy continued that they were now in the basement dining room. They were not able to escape, but the teenagers could still use fire. He pointed to a gas stove standing nearby. He added that, fortunately, Ham Seong Yu had a lighter. In a pinch, he could have just burned everyone. Kang Min was saying that if the virus started to spread, they would have to figure out how to start a fire. Meanwhile, Yong Wu was listening and found a gas stove. He looked at it carefully and made some conclusions. John Wu suddenly said that lighting the gas stove was no problem. Everyone else turned to him. He added that the problem was that they all should have been more careful because the infected people caught fire very quickly, so the fire spread very quickly. Finally, Yon Wu added that they were all in the basement now, and it would have been more logical to set fire to them from above. Then, Ham Sung Yu asked with irony and mockery what the boy proposed to do. Suddenly, the boy started shouting and getting aggressive. He asked Yon Wu why he was still here with them and called his classmate a little piece of shit. He added that in addition to the homeless, they also had the problem of Yon Wu being infected. Kang Min stood up for his classmate and told him not to be an idiot. After all, they shouldn't all be suspicious of each other and quarreling. But the classmate responded by saying that he was just saying what he thought, and unlike Kang Min, he was not in debt to Yon Wu. Then John Wu himself intervened and told them not to worry, because he would leave before they knew whether the boy was infected or not. He turned to Isuri and asked if she still wanted to go with him. The girl did not understand his actions, so she just remained silent for the time being. Then, Yon Wu said he should have left when she said before they all got stuck here. Then he said he was so stupid to try to save her after they left him. Soyeon looked down. She felt ashamed again because she thought he was talking about her. After this speech, he turned to Ham Xiong Yu and suggested that his classmate just shut his mouth. He looked him straight in the eye. In response, he heard Ham Sung Yu curse him and asked if Yon Wu was hoping that after talking to him a few times, they would become friends. After that, he asked what kind of bullshit Yon Wu had just said. John Wu looked him straight in the eye without any fear. On the contrary, he was so angry at him for everything he had done to him. 
The guy said he had just ordered Ham Xiong Yun to shut his mouth. Suddenly, Kang Min intervened in the fight. He tried to calm them down and told them that now was not the time to start a fight. Kang Min turned to Yan Wu and said that he understood why the boy despised them all, but there was no time to work things out. Yan Wu looked at Kang Min. It was unclear what he was thinking at all. His classmate continued that they had no choice but to help each other now. Suddenly, Isuri echoed Kang Min's words, adding that they should have stopped fighting every time. The girls shouted that they should have fed themselves for something, but she was unable to finish. Kang Min interrupted her and asked her to let him speak. He apologized and politely asked that everyone listen to him. The guy said that this thought had not left him from the very beginning, even when they were on the cable car. He was thinking about how this virus appeared and what it was. Kang Ming said it was a virus that kept growing until the host died, and the cell division didn't stop. So to summarize, the guy said he settled on the next option. He looked at his classmates with his crazy eyes and said that the virus would be very similar to cancer cells. Kang Min quickly began to explain before everyone had time to laugh at his hypothesis. He said he had tested all the types of cancer cells they knew, and they were similar to each other. Isuri was skeptical of her classmate's speech. She ironically asked if Kang Min wanted to burn the zombie monsters with radiation. He understood the joke, but answered seriously. He asked if teenagers had ever heard of high-frequency heat treatment. The guy started talking about it, because he realized that this was probably the first time they had all heard of this phenomenon. He said that it was one of the ways of treatment to kill cancer cells with heat. They are usually heated up to 40 degrees. Isuri asked if Kang Min meant that they should all pay attention to the temperature. He smiled because he was glad that his classmates understood his point. Isuri started thinking and developing Kang Min's idea. She wondered out loud if they could use water for such a thing. The girl added that water would not cause fire and they would not all burn, and it could easily destroy the virus. Soyeon looked at her carefully. Isuri went on to say that if they wanted to take control of the situation, they could indeed try using water with different temperatures. Soyeon suddenly thought about how Isuri looked like a cold bookworm at school. She sat at her desk all the time reading. She didn't talk to anyone and had no friends. But in this situation, Isuri just shone. Kang Min started to rejoice and say that they were all finally on the same side. He gave Isura a high five, and the girl told him to go and die. Meanwhile, Soyeon continued to think about Isuri. The girl's confidence made Soyeon believe them and lean on her, until she realized that she was helpless. Suddenly, everyone screamed at the strange sound they heard outside the door of the room they were in. They turned around and saw two homeless men who were supposed to be guarding the teenagers. One of them had fallen down, and the other seemed to be lying on a chair. Suddenly, the homeless people above heard it. They thought it was the teenagers trying to escape and starting a riot. Isuri asked Kang Min if it was a scream. She wanted to make sure she wasn't the only one who heard it. The boy confirmed the screams. Kang Min suddenly screamed and asked if it had already started, and the homeless began to turn into zombie monsters again. Yeon Wu reacted quickly and shouted for them to close the door faster, whoever was closer. They had to lock them before the homeless people started coming downstairs. The guy was looking at the company, but Soyeon decided that she had to do it herself. She didn't want to be helpless and had to show that she was bringing some value to the company. The girl suddenly screamed that she was going to run and close the door. But unfortunately, Soyeon was not tall enough to reach the lock which was on top of the door. Soyeon realized this and turned to Isuri, saying that she was not reaching and needed something like a chair. But Isuri was already holding it in her hands. She was so annoyed. Soyeon couldn't think while being yelled at, so she stood there in a stupor for a few seconds. Then Isuri yelled at her again and told her to get in quickly. Soyeon got up on a chair and started to close the door. The girl was really reacting very strangely to Isuri. Meanwhile, Huang, a homeless man, was lying unconscious on the floor. No one was responding to him anymore. The teenagers ran around looking for things that could burn. They didn't have enough water to use. Kang Ming, meanwhile, searched through all the drawers in the kitchen to find some cooking utensils. The guy said that it could be tied with napkins, doused in oil, and used as a wick. Meanwhile, Yong Wu had already made the first wick, following Kang Min's instructions. The boy praised him and told him to continue knitting. Suddenly, Yong Wu heard strange noises in the room. It made him scared and turned around. He saw Huang, a homeless man, suddenly start to get up. 
The teenagers didn't think the man had survived the beating. John Woo approached the man and asked if he was okay. Suddenly, the homeless man looked to the side. Something caught his attention. Huang did not respond to Yan Wu's words. The man began to stand up and said that the subversives had to run as fast as possible and get out of the room. Yan Wu was still offering Huang his help. Suddenly, he heard strange sounds coming from the door. He looked up and could not believe his eyes. Homeless people came running to the door and started breaking into the teenager's room. A man in a red jacket shouted to the teenagers that he was infected. White slime began to flow down the stairs, catching up with the homeless. Suddenly, they started banging hard on the glass inside and begging the teenagers to open the door and let them in. It was so funny from the outside. Karma kept coming back. John Woo looked at them and did not know what to do. Time was short, and he didn't want to decide for everyone. Meanwhile, the team of Kang Jihoon and Jiman Hyun did not fare any better. The army was heading somewhere. There were no boys among them. The men were holding firearms and giving commands that the road ahead was clear and very quiet. It was even frightening. Suddenly, a zombie monster screamed from above. He stuck to the glass of a building and roared loudly, making himself known. The man said that it was just a one-time goal. He ordered to open fire. Because there was only one zombie monster, only one soldier fired at it. All the others did not even bother to look in that direction. Suddenly, behind the soldier, Jim Hyun could be seen. The man in uniform asked him if the place they were looking for was definitely around here. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon was standing next to Ji Man Hyun. The boy said he was sure of it because his friends had called him. The girls said they were hiding somewhere in the building of a private bureau. The soldier said they would continue to search the area. He said on the radio that there were four schoolgirls who managed to survive and claimed that they were hiding somewhere in one of the buildings. The man said they would rescue them and bring them back. These words did not sit well with Jiman Hyun. He told Kang Jehoon that it looked like the men weren't going to take it. Then someone said that the military should be more careful. The man continued that they had found an accumulation of level A virus. And first, they had to burn it. It was just a white slime that was located in the same alleyway of houses. Another soldier said that it would be better to wait a bit. He gave the order that they should have been more careful because it was dangerous. Jihan Hyun became curious about the process and asked the army if it was a level A virus. Then, the man answered positively and reiterated his words. He added that viruses are classified by their size and density. For example, level A, most of them were larger than a human, and sometimes they could reach sizes of more than three meters. Kang Jihoon and Jihan Hyun listened attentively to the soldier's speech. Then the military man thought that perhaps the virus at the station was one of them. Ji Han Hyun decided to tell the army about how he had seen the infected cats join together and become bigger. The soldiers could not believe what the man was telling them. They had never heard of such cases before. Meanwhile, two soldiers entered a room, but they said that unfortunately the girls were not there. They were joined by two other men who also said that the girl was not there. Suddenly, the soldier noticed that the door to one of the rooms was already open. He decided to tell his partners about it so that they could inspect the suspicious premises together. But it was Kang Ji-hoon who reacted faster. He ran over and saw that the door was open. He was very motivated and excited to start searching again. He suddenly felt that his Han Mi was about to be found. He knew she was somewhere nearby. The soldier came in and looked around the room. He said that the footprints indicated that there were some people inside but no survivors were found. Kang Jihoon himself carefully examined the room once again to find at least a hint that Han Mi had been here. Suddenly, the guy shouted her name. Then the soldier said that there were also footprints somewhere there. He came out of another exit. The company went out into a passage and the military officer said that it looked like someone had gone that way after the arson. But unfortunately, no traces were found. They all kept walking. The man added that someone had definitely passed through this alley. Kang Jihoon clearly understood the military's words and decided not to waste a second. Suddenly, the guy broke away and ran down this alley, which was probably where his Han Mi was going. Kang Jihoon ran as fast as he could. He was not afraid of anyone or anything. He just wanted to see Han Mi as soon as possible and save her. The military yelled at him that he was an idiot. The guy realized this himself. He knew that he was acting completely rashly. Suddenly, memories came flooding back to him. Kang Jihoon remembered when they were at school, and Lee Hongmi told him that she had learned a very cool English word. 
Kang Ji-hoon was sitting at his desk, or rather lying on it. In front of him, Hon Mi sat and asked if he knew the meaning of the word destiny, to which the boy replied that of course he knew. It was a computer game he was playing. Han Mi looked at Kang Ji-hoon and said that it must have been fate. She added that she liked this kind of thing because it was very romantic. But Kang Ji-hoon was definitely not in the mood. He said that it was all cool, but the girl had to fail. He added that he was very sleepy, so she shouldn't have woken him up. Han Mi looked at the boy with resentment. She was not pleased to hear this. After that, Kang Ji-hoon woke up and stretched loudly. Suddenly, he saw something on his hand. It caught his attention. On his hand was written destiny. It looks like Han Mi wrote it and left, just like Kang Jehoon asked her to. The guy kept running when suddenly he saw something that made him stop and turn around. There was a handbag on the floor. It looks like it was his Han Mi's purse. So she was here and ran into this alley. The boy was looking at a large old building. It was an apartment building that looked pretty bad. The events were transferred to Kang Jehoon's memories. He stood on the threshold of the room. He looked at his apartment and thought to himself that he didn't understand when he started to hate the moment he opened the door and walked into his home. Kang Ji-hoon looked at a completely empty apartment. No one was there to greet him. The apartment was saturated with an atmosphere of emptiness and loneliness. It was this atmosphere of emptiness that made him feel empty inside. Kang Ji-hoon came in, dropped his briefcase and wanted to go to his room. Suddenly he saw money and a note on the table. It said, to my beloved son. It looked like it was from his parents. Then the events moved to the game room. Two boys sat at computers and played games. One of them was shouting slang phrases and leading the game. The room was dark, so it was late at night. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon leaned back in his gaming chair and said indignantly that they had played very poorly. Then he went to a mini market that was open until night and bought something to eat. Kang Ji-hoon bought himself some ramen and a soda and ate it right in the store. The boy thought about how meaningless his days in the old third grade school were. They seemed to last forever. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon saw someone walking through the window, carrying a briefcase and wearing a uniform. It was obviously from school. It turned out to be Han Mi. The girl noticed the guy through a shop window and was surprised to see him. Kang Ji-hoon was chewing when she saw him. Suddenly, she screamed and came closer to the glass to see Kang Ji-hoon. She was happy to see him. In fact, the guy was happy to see her too. She made his meaningless day brighter and added a little meaning to it. The couple returned home together in the meantime. Hong Mi said they had been seeing each other a lot lately. She also added that she had returned home at 9 p.m. every night after her preparatory courses, but had never seen Kang Ji-hoon here before. The girl talked a lot, and Kang Ji-hoon didn't have time to say a word. She asked what the boy was doing there, and then she said that they often had a two-for-one promotion. And then the girl added that if he waited for her, she would give him hers. Suddenly, Han Mi got very excited about something and screamed. The girl was very emotional, and that made her special. She was surprised that a small shop run by an old lady was still open. Han Mi stopped and said that usually the store closed by seven, as the goods were all sold out. Her mouth was about to water. She told me how good the tokpoki made by the woman behind the glass were. Kang Ji-hoon then asked if Han Mi really loved this street food so much. A few minutes later, Hon Mi had a whole plate of various delicacies in front of him, including tokpoki. She immediately started eating it, stuffing her mouth full. Hon Mi invited Kang Jehoon to try it too, because he was silently watching her eat, but he refused. The girl was so talkative that even when she was eating, she couldn't stop talking and talked a lot. She told Kang Jehoon that it would be nice to buy an ice cream, but only one. The guy saw that she was talking with her mouth full, jumped away and told her to chew it first and then speak. He looked at her as if a little disgusted and said how much she ate. And she responded by offering him something to try again. Han Mi put the dish right in Kang ji mouth and he shouted that he was talking at that moment. The girl apologized but still asked why he ate so little. He replied that he had already eaten the noodles and that was enough for him. At that, Han Mi laughed out loud. She saw Kang ji face and something in it made her laugh hard. It turned out that the guy had ketchup on his cheek. She laughed at this and asked if she could take a picture of it. It was time for them to leave. The girl said she was very full, and when she left, she said she would buy them sweets next time. And in the end, she added that they would definitely meet again at school. Kang Ji-hoon stood and watched Han Mi leave, and he followed her with a look. In his mind, he wondered what she wanted to do next time. 
A new day had come. My classmates were sitting in math class. The teacher was solving something at the blackboard. Kang Jehun sat at the back of the classroom and was sad. He was not solving or writing anything. He just propped his head up with his hand. He was not at all interested in what the teacher was talking about and what square root the equation would yield. His attention was drawn to something else. It turned out that the guy was looking at Hanmi all the time. It was obvious that she was not looking at the board either. Something was catching her attention. The girl was looking at the clock on the wall very carefully and with a kind of horror in her eyes, biting her nails. Kang Ji-hoon wondered what his girlfriend was looking at so intently. It turned out that she was watching the clock, and as soon as the big hand passed five, the bell rang. Hanmi stood up abruptly and started to get ready. Meanwhile, the teacher told her that everything else had to be done at home. Then the girl abruptly opened the door and ran out into the hallway. She ran as fast as she could, not turning back. Two guys were running behind her. She said that there were no chicken wings on the menu today. Kang Jehoon watched this performance as the teenagers fought in front of the cafeteria. He thought to himself that since then, he had been paying more and more attention to Han Mi at school. He looked at it all and said to himself how noisy they all were. The boy's face expressed dissatisfaction with what he was seeing. But inside, he wanted to look at Han Mi. The scene shifted back to Kang Jehoon's old company. They were discussing a friend's new purchase and its higher price. Some kind of motorcycle thing cost one and a half million won. The guys made fun of their friend for paying such a price for it. The owner defended his purchase and said that this case protected against water and even radiation. But his friends joked that they thought the guy on the moped wanted to become a courier. The owner further defended himself and said that his trusted source had given the person the amount of money to do so and that the boy had not realized the power of this investment. But the boys continued to joke and mock their friend. Meanwhile, Kang Ji-hoon sat alone and looked at the floor. He didn't seem to be interested in these conversations at all. My friend noticed this and approached the guy. He asked if Kang Ji-hoon had forgotten about today's case. He added that he had looked at someone's photos and they were very hot. The guy said without looking up that he didn't know if he would have gone because he didn't like crowds. His friend began to persuade him and said that he had already told them about him. Then, the three boys were walking somewhere between the crowds in an alley. Kung Ji-hoon walked behind and his friends hugged each other in front. One of my friends told me that he had found a store where they could definitely sell them cigarettes. The friend replied that it was because he had a round face. The friends were laughing and discussing something. They were having a good time together and didn't notice Kang Ji-hoon walking lonely behind them. The guy didn't even look up. He was absolutely not interested in what his friends were talking about. His head was full of personal thoughts, when suddenly, something made his friends pay attention to Kang Ji-hoon. He suddenly said he was going to go home. When they turned around to look at the boy and start talking him down, he was already walking away and waving to his friends. It turned out that Kang Ji-hoon was supposed to treat them today, but he didn't go. His friends called him irresponsible. The boy rushed to the place where he had met Hanmi the last time. He wondered to himself if he would see her here again, or if he was just thinking about it too much. Kang Jehoon pulled out his phone to check the time and noticed that it was almost nine, and there was still no sign of Hanmi. Then, he decided to go to a mini market. He confidently opened the door and greeted the cashier. Suddenly, he turned around sharply because he saw something. It made him pay attention. It turned out that it was Han Mi who was crouching down and picking out some sweets that she had promised. She also turned around to see Kang Ji-hoon. She got up and approached the boy. The girl started talking a lot again and asked if he wanted to see the promotion that the mini market was offering. Suddenly, she pointed her finger at Kang Ji-hoon and asked what happened to him. She asked if the boy had run here because he was sweating profusely and was all wet. The boy's eyes grew bigger. He didn't want Han Mi to know. Kang Ji-hoon did his best to show that he hadn't run like that before Han Mi. So he said that he used to run all the time. He had to train. And then he added that he was very hungry to quickly change the subject. Han Mi realized this, but pretended to believe the guy and just smiled at him. And then she asked him if he liked toast. A few minutes later, the two of them were already eating two pieces of toast. The girl said they were very tasty. And Kang Ji-hoon said they were only a little bit, although you couldn't tell by the way he ate them. The guy looked at Hanmi. He couldn't get enough of her. 
Kang Ji-hoon thought about how good it felt to eat with someone at that moment. And not just anyone, but Lee Hong Mi. The girl stuffed her mouth full of the sandwich and smiled. The girl looked very cute in the guy's eyes. Then, Han Mi suddenly offered Jehoon some more pork toast. The boy joked that Han Mi was a pig. The girl replied that it was a special kind of pork toast. Kang Jehoon ate a lot that day. The teenagers had already left the mini market and were eating ice cream. The girl asked why her classmate was behaving like that at school. Kang Ji-hoon did not understand. So the girl explained to him that the boy slept every day and she had never seen him talk to his classmates. She said that his friends said that he was just fighting for his life every day. Kang Ji-hoon looked up. He immediately asked who had said such things behind his back. But Hanmi said she didn't want to tell him that. The guy came home and looked at something on his cell phone. He had a smile on his face. Finally, he would come home and not feel empty inside. Suddenly, he looked up and saw something very strange. There were scattered things on the floor. Broken dishes, photographs, and bottles of alcohol. His mother was sitting next to him. She asked him what time it was. Kang Ji-hoon saw his mother like that and immediately ran to her to find out what was wrong. My mom had her head down. She suddenly asked the boy why he had decided to quit school. She knew because his teacher had told her. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon's eyes widened and his pupils narrowed. He didn't expect his mother to know about this. My mother was sitting on the floor. Her head was not supported on her neck, so it was down. She was wearing a big shirt. She did not look up and asked if it was true. Kang Ji-hoon started to make excuses and say that he didn't really mean it, but the guy couldn't finish. Something made him stop. Suddenly, the boy's eyes went to his forehead. He was shocked by what he could see as he walked over to his mom faster. In her other hand, she had an open jar with some pills. The mother's hand was so weak that she couldn't hold it, so half of the container just spilled out onto the floor. Kang Jehoon ran up and started to collect all the pills. He yelled at his mom that she had promised not to take them anymore. They were hidden, but she found them anyway. Suddenly, the mother took her son by the face and began to say something incomprehensible. Then Kang Jihoon saw his mother's face, and this picture gave him goosebumps. Her eyes rolled up and saliva flowed from her open mouth. The woman said that everyone made her suffer, and then she said that it was like a knife stabbing Kang Jihoon in the heart. The grieving mother said that it was he who had brought her to this state. She also asked if the boy understood her. She added that Kang Jehoon was the only one who made her the person she was now in front of him. The boy's world just collapsed after those words. The birth mother imposed guilt on her son. Kang Jehoon will carry this pain for the rest of his life. A few hours later, the boy was already in the hospital emergency room waiting for his mother. He looked down and thought about everything that had happened. Two doctors worked on her to pump out this so-called mother. Some kind of tube was inserted into her throat. The boy began to recall that the last time he saw his father, he told him to protect his mother at all costs. But since their divorce, his mother has been in the intensive care unit countless times. It was a common thing for the boy to see her in such a state. So, because of this, he would never forgive his father for abandoning them both, and now Kang Ji-hoon had to carry this burden with him. It was very hard for him because he was just a child. It was dark and Kang Jehoon was returning home, walking his usual path with his head down. Suddenly, he looked up and saw something. Han Mi was standing in front of him, as if she was expecting a boy. Then she looked up and looked her friend in the face. She was standing under a streetlight, holding some books in her hands, waiting for the guy to come up to her. Han Mi immediately asked where her classmate had been all this time. After all, she had been waiting for him for so long, but Kang Jihoon only responded by asking how the girl had gotten his address. And Hong Mi said she got it from her teacher. She attacked Kang Jihoon with questions about why he didn't go to school. And the teacher said that it was impossible to contact the boy. But Kang Jihoon did not even look at the girl and told her to leave. He added that he was not in the mood to talk to anyone. But before he could finish his sentence, the girl interrupted him. She grabbed her friend's hand and asked him to stop and not walk away from her. But the guy reacted abnormally. He pulled away abruptly and took his hand away, asking who Han Mi was anyway. The girl asked why Kang Ji-hoon was so angry. She said that he was not his usual self. But Kang Ji-hoon suddenly ridiculed the girl and said she was stupid. 
The girl's face changed dramatically. She didn't deserve to be treated like that. He looked down and asked what Lee Hong Mi even knew about him. And then he asked if she really thought they were friends. Kang Ji Hoon suddenly said that she wouldn't even have had the desire to look the guy in the eye if they weren't classmates. Suddenly, the guy turned to Han Mi, looked her in the eye, and told her to leave him alone and not to spoil his mood. In response, Han Mi told him that the guy had been very cruel to her. She added that she came here because of Kang Ji Hoon, because she was worried about her friend. He kept his eyes on her and thanked her for her concern. Then he told her to get behind him. The guy had already moved to the mat. Kang Jehoon saw Hon Mi leave him. It was very painful for him because he was very happy to be with Hon Mi. He was happy at such moments, but the guy was afraid to get closer to her. He had no choice but to run away from his feelings. Meanwhile, in reality, Kang Jehoon went inside the building and shouted the girl's name so that she would hear and come down to the boyfriend. Others joined him. The army opened fire and Kang Jehoon lit a Molotov cocktail to clear the area. Then, hell broke loose. The room was very warm because there was an unrealistic amount of fire. Kang Jihoon kept calling out for the girl. The soldiers in front of us shouted for everyone to move back, and then more fire was launched. For moments, there was no air to breathe because of the smoke and stench coming from the burning corpses of the zombie monsters. Suddenly, Jihan Hyun noticed something on the other side. One of the soldiers shouted about the exoskeleton, it seems that the man saw something in the midst of the fire. Then everyone turned back to the sound and saw the almost corpse of a soldier from this army on the floor. He was screaming that there was an exoskeleton inside. He fought a kind of unusual goiter monster, which was nicknamed an exoskeleton. Everyone else was watching as the man desperately tried to fight the zombie monster. Suddenly, the soldier noticed something that was visible from the corner at the end of the corridor. Suddenly, he saw the paw of a zombie monster. It was approaching them, and for some reason was not afraid of fire at all. Jihan Hyun's eyes widened sharply and his pupils narrowed. He realized that something terrible was about to happen. Suddenly, the whole zombie monster came out of the corner. It was crawling on the ground like an animal and looked like a skeleton with all the bones outlined. The monster got up and growled. It was definitely going to attack all these people. We had to react quickly to survive. It was a huge zombie monster, three meters high. It was bigger than people. There were some spikes on its back. Even army soldiers with firearms were afraid of this monster. Their faces showed fear and stupor through their masks. A huge zombie monster stood over the corpse of a soldier and roared. Suddenly, one of the soldiers shouted Sojun's name. It was probably the name of an innocent man who was about to be eaten by a monster. The man picked up an assault rifle and started shooting at the monster. By doing so, he only angered the zombie monster but it didn't seem to care about bullets and gunfire. Then the ugly giant threw out its healthy tentacles to attack. In a matter of seconds, the monster attacked the soldier. He did not even have time to react. He growled at the man, but he was looking straight at his victim. Other soldiers saw what was happening and were in a stupor. They all did not know what to do. Suddenly, the zombie monster roared very loudly and opened its mouth completely. Its mouth was huge and had many teeth. The zombie monster looked very frightening. Then, the other soldiers from the army turned to Mr. Park and told him that they had to leave immediately before this monster ate them all. But Mr. said they had to ask for reinforcements first. Jihan Hyun saw this and realized that he had to run away immediately. Someone shouted that they all had to run the other way now. Meanwhile, a huge zombie monster began to eat its victim. Suddenly, he noticed that the others started to run away. He could not let it go and let his victims escape. Jihan Hyun was the last one to escape, so he noticed it and realized what was about to happen. He said they should have left the building as soon as possible. Suddenly, another monster began to run after them, this time a different one. It growled, making itself known. Then one of the soldiers fired at him to burn the creature alive. Suddenly, the man noticed that their fire was over, so they were all in danger now. The soldier told the sir that they were all out of fuel and in danger. But Kang Ji Hoon had a Molotov cocktail that was on fire. Suddenly, the soldiers screamed that a zombie monster had come down the stairs and had just eaten their friend. It seemed to be chasing them all. Mr. realized that they all had to leave the room immediately. He came closer to the monster and started shooting at it. But it seems that the big zombie monster didn't care about that. So he just ran to attack the man and everyone else. Mr. Parker turned to the others and told them to run away. 
while the man would distract the zombie monster as far away from them as possible. The soldier realized that they would all die, so one of them had to sacrifice himself. The others, without hesitation, immediately began to run away as fast as they could. The soldier with the fire ran in the other direction, so the giant zombie monster ran after him so the others could escape and find shelter. The company noticed that there was a free space ahead of them, so they could run into this wing of the residential building and escape until reinforcements arrived. Four guys, two of whom were soldiers from the army, and Kang Jihoon and Jihan Hyun. They went into a room and closed the door behind them. The soldier immediately picked up the radio and contacted the base. He said that it was the third squad. Meanwhile, the team of Kang Jihoon and Jihan Hyun laughed out loud at such adventures. Suddenly, the man asked the military what had just happened. The soldier looked at Jihan Hyun and remained silent, making it clear that he was waiting for the question to continue with details. The man shook his head and spoke with pauses. But eventually he formulated a question and asked how the army knew about this monster. But this question angered the military officer. He asked if Jihan Hyun had really asked the troops, whose goal was to exterminate such monsters and the virus, about the zombie monster. He said with irritation that he didn't understand what Jihan Hyun was trying to say. The man explained that he had seen many monsters himself, but he had never seen anything like this. And he hadn't even seen people who could see such a zombie monster. It was some new species they had never seen before. He asked what, as a soldier, the man should have known about this monster. While Jihan Hyun was talking, the soldier began to undress. It seemed that the suit was not very comfortable. The soldier began to explain that when a normal mutant tends to soften their body, they then cover the exoskeleton with enlarged bones. Meanwhile, the man had already taken the backpack with fuel off his shoulders and put it on the floor. He continued that it was difficult to deal with them because the virus cell had already penetrated the bones, and it was almost impossible to burn them with fire, only to set them on fire for a few seconds but no more. The soldier added that they had also run out of fuel. All the men looked down at the backpack, which was completely empty. Jihan Hyun took his face mask off and asked if the zombie monsters could mutate into other shapes and species besides the exoskeleton they had just seen. The soldier answered the man's question positively. He said that there were also zombie monsters that could merge with other corpses and turn into one big monster. Therefore, the man added that the army always tried to burn infected corpses so that zombie monsters that did not burn could not merge with them. Kang Ji-hoon suddenly took off his mask and asked the man why they hadn't told them anything about it before. Even though the military knew everything, the guy was angry and even furious. He said that if they had been told earlier, Kang Ji-hoon would never have come here. The boy started clenching his hand into a fist in anger. He added that his friends would never have been like this then. The guy's face suddenly became very angry. He looked at the soldier and sincerely blamed him for all this. The uniformed man looked at him and did not understand why Kang Jihoon was so angry with him, but he did not respond to these provocations. Suddenly, someone interrupted their conversation. Someone addressed this gentleman. It was another soldier who said that he had been informed that reinforcements were about to arrive, and they had already been sent. The man said that this was great news, and added that they would all wait here until someone came to rescue them. Kang Jihoon still could not calm down. He looked at the man and his face was very dissatisfied and angry. Then, he suddenly asked to have something explained to him. In all this conversation, the boy did not understand only one thing. The soldier looked at the boy to hear his question. Kang Ji-hoon then looked the man in the eye and asked what would happen to his friends. After all, the team never found them. The soldier told him in all seriousness that it would be better to surrender because it was simply impossible. The man hinted that the girls had probably already been eaten by the exoskeleton monster. Kang Ji-hoon was furious when he heard this answer. He was about to explode. Suddenly, the phone rang in the room. It was a very old-style phone that worked by light. Its sound interrupted a quarrel that was about to break out. All the boys turned to the sound of the phone. They did not expect anyone to call them. Their faces showed great surprise. They even froze a bit and no one dared to be the first to come up and pick up the phone. But still, the soldier came over and decided to pick up the phone. Perhaps it was something important. On the other end of the phone, someone first coughed loudly and then stammered out a greeting. The voice sounded quite old and sickly. 
It turned out that he was a rather old man who was already sick and lying down. He asked if the boys had just gone into the next room. The old man apologized and said that he had accidentally overheard their conversation. Suddenly, the old man said something that made Jihan Hyun's eyes widen and his eyebrows rise. The old man asked if the team was looking for a group of girls. The man could not believe his ears and what he had just heard. So he asked the old man again what he had just said. Meanwhile, in the shelter where the rest of the teenagers and the homeless were staying, a man in military print pants was already completely covered in frog egg virus blisters. The teenagers made their own homemade wicks and were already pouring oil on them to set them on fire. Yon Wu held the wick, Kang Min poured oil on it, and Yi Suri set the whole structure on fire. John Wu waited until all the participants said that everything was ready and the wick was lit. Then, he dropped what he was throwing. The guy swung and aimed straight at the homeless man, who had almost completed his transformation into a zombie monster. John Wu hit the target, and the homeless man caught fire and screamed in pain. Then all the other teenagers ran up. Ham Xiong Yu and Seo Young were holding fire extinguishers. From behind, someone shouted for the boy to be ready and put out the fire before it could spread. Ham Song Yu said he would do so, but asked the commander to calm down. Even in such an important and stressful situation, he did not tolerate orders. Soyeon asked if the homeless man was already dead to know if he could be watered, to which Ham Xiong Yu irritably replied that he didn't know, so he just started watering the corpse. Seo Young followed suit and also pulled the handle of the fire extinguisher. Suddenly, Yeon Wu's attention shifted to something else. After that, his arm suddenly hurt again. John Wu was afraid of another attack, then his classmates would definitely think he was infected. The boy saw a door that did not give him peace. He realized that the cause of his pain was hidden behind that blue door. John Wu went to them and opened the handle to see what was inside the door. Suddenly, he realized that this pain he was feeling was different from the previous one. When he opened the door, he could not believe his eyes. The entire room was covered with white slime from the frog egg virus. He immediately decided to go inside with a lighted homemade torch and check why the pain was so different. Kang Min followed Yan Wu into the room. Another homeless man could be seen lying on the floor among a pile of white frog egg slime. It looked like he was the one who had spread the virus. The boys suddenly heard someone crying. They looked at the painting and were so frightened that they had shivers down their spines. Another homeless man sat in the corner of the room. His body seemed to be fused to the wall. Only the man's head was not covered with white mucus. Everything looked very creepy. The homeless man suddenly asked the teenagers to help him right away. The man could barely speak. Every word was very difficult for him. Suddenly, he said something that gave the boys goosebumps again. The homeless man asked that the teenagers kill him right now so that he would not suffer and would not be able to infect other people in the room. Suddenly, Ham Song Yu ran up to them and immediately took a torch and ran to set the man on fire fulfilling his dying wish. The guy had already taken a swing and was about to throw a wick and fire at the zombie monster. Suddenly, Yon Wu stopped his classmate Ham Sung Yu and asked him not to light the homeless man. The boy was surprised by John Wu's desire, but he did not contradict him and did not set the man on fire. John Wu didn't even look in his direction. He told everyone to wait. The guy came a little closer and noticed that the man had no cells. It was a fused form of the virus. But Yonwa was very surprised by the fact that the homeless man could speak. Even though his body was completely covered with virus cells and the transformation process had started. Ham Sung Yu was standing behind him, shouting for Yong Wu to kill this zombie monster as soon as possible. But the guy instead just started walking and approaching the zombie monster. He was still homeless and could talk. So maybe Yong Wu could get some answers to his nagging questions. Suddenly, the man roared out in a very terrible way. It was a cry of pain. The homeless man was in incredible pain because of the transformation. Suddenly, Yan Wu felt a pain in his arm at the same time as the homeless man's scream. The guy was now sure that the pain in his arm was the same as the pain of facing a zombie monster. Jan Wu began his interrogation. He asked the homeless man if he had heard the boy. If so, he asked the man to answer some of his questions. Jan Wu immediately said that he had a fire so I had to respond without joking. It was a rather strange threat, given the fact that the homeless man was begging to be burned. Suddenly the man looked at the boy very strangely, as if he recognized him. The homeless man asked if John Wu was the first to enter the room. 
The man seemed to sense him and called him over. Meanwhile, Ham Sung Yu yelled at Yan Wu not to talk to the homeless man and just burn him, calling his classmate various curse words. But John Wu did not pay attention. He had to find out the answers to his questions. Suddenly, the homeless man screamed in fear and asked John Wu to just kill him with fire so that the man would not feel this pain. The guy immediately began to calm him down and promised to help the homeless man. But first, he had to answer a few questions. John Wu asked why the man was conscious, even though his body was infected. This question surprised the man. He laughed and looked at Jonah. Suddenly, the homeless man understood. He looked Yonwu in the eye and told him that the boy was also infected. The boy was surprised to hear this. The classmates behind him were also horrified and afraid. The homeless man said he could feel the virus in John Wu's body, just like the boy felt the frog egg virus in the bodies of others. He yelled at John Wu for still having a normal body. The homeless man didn't understand it, why John Wu hadn't turned into a zombie monster yet. The guy started to defend himself and told the homeless man not to joke with him like that because John Wu was not infected. He repeated his question and asked the man to answer it. The homeless man began to explain incomprehensibly that there was a tumor in his head. The virus didn't like that, so his head was not infected with frog egg cells, and that's why the man was still conscious and able to speak. The homeless man said he had already answered the question and shouted once again for John Wu to burn him. John Wu was starting to get a little nervous. He said he would definitely help the man, but he had to answer a question. Yon Wu asked if the homeless man meant that his brain was not infected because there was a tumor. Then he added a question about how the man had found out. This question even annoyed the man a bit. He said that the virus still kept talking to him, so that's how the homeless man found out about everything. Suddenly, he looked at the already frightened Yonva again and said that the boy had heard that voice too. It was supposed to be a question, but it sounded more like a statement. Then Yonwu really started to hear his own voice in his head, but no one else's. He thought that maybe the homeless man was talking about the pain in his arm. John Wu did not voice his thoughts. Suddenly, the homeless man laughed and said that John Wu had understood everything correctly, as if the man had read his mind. The homeless man added out loud that Yon Wu had obviously heard the voices as well. Then the guy looked at his arm and thought about whether the pain in his limb could be caused by the interaction between viruses. Isuri stood behind the boy. She trusted him, but as the zombie monster said all this, she began to doubt her classmate and feel deceived. Meanwhile, the homeless man began to say that he did not know how John Wu managed to stop the transformation. And then, the man added that inside his body, the virus was still growing and spreading. John Wu became increasingly nervous because he could not feel the virus cells spreading or growing in his body. The homeless man, meanwhile, said he could feel it inside the boy's body. It was unclear whether it was the man or the virus that was communicating with him. Suddenly, the man started talking about how Yon Wu would become like him. His voice became that of a madman. The man's head fell to the floor. The homeless man added that Yon Wu would be sure to eat when he transformed. Suddenly, the homeless man said something that gave John Wu goosebumps again. He said that the boy would eat all his friends. Suddenly, aggression took over the guy's emotions. He shouted at the homeless man that he was talking nonsense and added that he should get out. The homeless man raised his head and looked at Yonwa. He laughed at him and asked if he wanted to bet with him. Suddenly, the man just screamed that Yonwu would not be able to avoid the merger. It was as if the virus inside the man was already speaking. It was as if he was threatening John Wu. The homeless man said that the virus didn't like it when it couldn't infect the whole body. And in John Wu's case, the virus could not infect the guy at all. Yon Wu's eyes widened at what the homeless man was saying, and he was already confused. The last straw was when the man said that in the end, Yon Wu would eat all his friends. The homeless man wanted to continue threatening the boy, but he was unable to finish. Yon Wu shouted at the homeless man to shut up and stop talking nonsense to him. Then, in his emotions, the guy waved a torch and threw fire at the man, burning him alive. Suddenly, the homeless man's body quickly caught fire and burst into flames. The man did not threaten Yonwu anymore and did not say these nonsense things. The guy started to loudly shake his head. He had experienced a lot of stress in those few minutes. His heart was beating frantically. Suddenly, he realized that he was being watched. He turned to look at his classmates. Meanwhile, 
While the boy was talking to the homeless zombie monster, all his classmates came into the room and watched and observed what the homeless man was saying. Suddenly, the boy's eyes grew very large. Even though he wanted to leave them, he was still scared that his classmates thought John Wu was infected. Perhaps inside, he didn't want to leave because he was so worried. Meanwhile, a homeless man, Huang, who everyone thought was already dead, entered the room. He looked at Yanva. Perhaps the man had heard everything the teenagers were talking about. The man was looking at the boy and analyzing him. It seemed that he wanted to ask him something. Meanwhile, the teenagers and Huang moved back to their temporary shelter. The homeless man was commenting on the brain tumor that was in the body of the man who burned down. He said it was normal for homeless people. After all, it was very common for people without a permanent place of residence to get sick with various sores. Huang added that when they were sick, they had to sleep on the street. Someone said that the man was poor because he had to sleep on the street. Isuri was listening, but she noticed something out of the corner of her eye. She turned her attention to Yonva. The boy slung the briefcase over his shoulder again and walked toward the exit, head down. Huang asked if it turned out that the part of the body where the tumor was, was not contagious at all. He laughed and said it was very interesting. Suddenly the homeless man said it was time for him to go. He turned to John Wu and called out to the boy. This made everyone present look at him. The homeless man approached John Wu and asked if he could help him. Of course, the teenager answered positively. Then the boy would come out and look at his classmates out of the corner of his eye. He understood what they were all thinking and he knew that as soon as the teenager walked out the door, they would all start discussing him. They all stood and looked down. Only Isuri was brave enough to look John Wu in the eye. It was all very awkward. The boy understood everything without words. John Wu knew that he had to leave the room because his classmates would be afraid of the boy and would not want him with them at all. Perhaps they could even betray him again during the danger, and John Wu really did not want to go through that again. When a homeless man asked the teenager to just walk him to the canteen. It was very difficult for him to walk because of the many injuries he had suffered from other homeless people. As soon as Yan Wu closed the door behind him, Ham Sung Yu began to get indignant and discuss what the zombie monster had said. The boy was just shouting that Yan Wu was infected. Ham Sung Yu didn't like the teenager, so he easily believed everything the zombie monster said. The guy started swearing that it was now an official statement and they were all in danger. He added that they almost didn't die. Ham Shang Yu said that from now on, if any of his classmates approached Yan Wu or touched him, the teenager would slap that person in the face. Soyeon felt guilty. She was already constantly thinking about how she was useless and a burden to everyone. And now she had touched Yan Wu so she could probably be infected. But Soyoung didn't let on. She didn't want to rush things. The fact that Yan Wu was a threat had not been proven. Suddenly, Isuri asked Kang Min what he thought about Yan Wu. Meanwhile, the boy was looking out the window, and the girl was as stony-faced as ever. Kang Ming did not miss the opportunity to make fun of Isuri and make an ironic comment about how it was very unusual for a girl to ask his opinion. Of course, Isuri fell for this provocation and irritably told Kang Min to just answer already. The guy suddenly became very serious. He said he didn't know for sure. But as far as he knew, according to his hypothesis about cancer cells, this could not simply be the case. After all, cancer could be completely cured. Meanwhile, in the dining room, homeless people were lying on the tables. There were two of them in the room. Suddenly, someone called out to them, and then the men raised their heads. It was Huang and Yan Wu who was holding the man because he was limping. Huang said the homeless people looked happy. The two homeless men were genuinely surprised to see Huang alive. One of them even started to sign in, but they both tried to put on a friendly face, as if they were happy to see the man. Huang called them assholes and asked if these rats were trying to take his side now. The men immediately started apologizing to Huang and blaming their boss, calling him an idiot. Another began to thank the man for opening the door for them. Without him, they would not have survived. Huang did not react much to this scene of the two victims. He just said he was glad the two of them realized it. And then the homeless man asked where the others were. One of the men said that they did not know where everyone was and that they only said that the shelter was sharing some supplies. Then, the homeless man said that the boss and other homeless people had gone there. For some reason, this information surprised Yanwa. His face clearly showed shock. 
Meanwhile, there were many soldiers from the army in the shelter tent. One of them was saluting another and telling him something. Homeless people were kneeling on the floor with their hands behind their heads. All the soldiers were holding weapons. The boss and another homeless man were indignant, saying that they shouldn't have come here at all. The man said that he was very scared because he could have been shot. Suddenly, one of the soldiers said that strange people kept coming to the shelter. The boss of the homeless heard this. The man in uniform reported to his commander that he was the one who spoke about these homeless people. Meanwhile, the classmates continued to discuss Yonwa and what they should do with him. Suddenly, Soyon spoke up. She looked at the floor and looked guilty. The girl said that even if it was true, how could they just label Yonwa as infected? She added that Yonwu hadn't shown any suspicious symptoms yet, which didn't give them the right to just brand the boy. And it was not wise to believe a zombie monster. It seems that Isuri and Kang Min thought about the girl's words. But Ham Shang Yu had a different opinion. He exploded and shouted that Yan Wu had a bunch of suspicious symptoms. The guy was just beside himself with anger. He shouted that almost everything about him was suspicious. The guy shouted at Seo Young that he promised to kill anyone who touched Yan Wu. Ham Shang Yu added that he wasn't joking at all. Seo Young's face suddenly changed dramatically. The girl decided to come clean and said that they had been together for some time and that she hadn't noticed or experienced any problems until now. If John Wu was infected, something would have happened by now. But Ham Shang Yu just laughed at her. He looked down and adjusted his glasses, telling Park So Young that this was exactly what happened and something was already happening. He looked down at the girl and added that this was why So Young shouldn't have defended Yan Wu too much. The way the girl was doing. Suddenly, the teenagers heard a strange sound of wheels. All four turned to see what it was. Kang Min and Isuri went to the window because they were closest to it. Outside the window, they saw many military vehicles approaching them. There were four of them. Kang Ming was surprised to see this. He didn't think it was good news. All the cars were parked near the building where the teenagers were. Later, uniformed soldiers with machine guns started coming out. Kang Min cursed. Ham Song Yu and Kang Min looked through the door and asked what they were supposed to do. This army had recently wanted to burn them alive. And now they had come right to this room where they were all hiding. Soyon and Isuri were at the window and suggested that the boys go out through it to save themselves. But when the boys were running, they said that the window was too narrow and they would not fit through. Then the girls offered to break the window. Ham Xiong Yu, of course, cried and said that the girls could break the window. Kang Min remembered that they had emergency hammers. He would definitely give one to Seo Young. She started to take it out of her bag. Ham Xiong Yu interfered and yelled at them to do it faster. The two guys had two hammers each. They started breaking windows to get through them. Suddenly, Soyeon remembered something very important. Her eyes widened again, and her heart started to race. It was as if she was experiencing a kind of deja vu. She suddenly gathered courage and shouted for everyone to stop. Then the girl asked what they had forgotten about Yonva. Kang Min stopped and looked back. Ham Song Yu continued to break the glass. So Young looked down at the stairs and said that Yon Wu wasn't here, hinting that this was a problem. The girl added that she had to find him. Otherwise, if he was left alone, the soldiers would notice him. When Ham Song Yu heard this, a vein stood out on his face and he was furious. Suddenly, he yelled at So Young. She turned to him and saw the following picture. The guy took a swing at the glass. He decided not to be petty and break everything. The glass immediately broke and its particles flew down, making a lot of noise. The military definitely heard this and were running toward the sound. Ham Song Yu did not think for a second and climbed out the window to escape. He didn't even turn to Seo Young and say whether she wanted to attract attention for some Li Yong Wu who was infected at all. Ham Song Yu added that the soldiers would then capture them all without exception. Finally, the boy turned to the girl and asked if she was willing to take the risk and take responsibility for it. In the end, Ham Sung Yu added that someone had to survive. After that, the guy jumped out of the window. Kang Min immediately followed him. He told Seo Young to get away quickly because the soldiers were getting closer and closer. They had little time left. But the girl didn't even move. She was screaming and didn't know what to do. So Young didn't want to leave John Wa again and betray him, especially since he was under suspicion. Suddenly, someone approached So Young. It was Isuri. She asked if the girl was okay. She said that Soyeon would not have had the courage to take the risk. 
Isuri was rude. She spoke clearly and even with a touch of humiliation. She told Soyeon to calm down because it was impossible to help others. After these words, Isuri climbed out the window. Soyeon just stood there and watched her classmates run away. They shouted at her to run faster, but Soyeon stood there. She could not make up her mind and did not know what to do. She wanted to help her friend Yeon Wu, but she didn't want to die either. Her classmates were right. So young was not brave at all. Suddenly, Isuri realized that her classmate had stayed behind and had not climbed out the window. She turned to see what had happened. She saw Soyeon standing in the window, watching her classmates run away. Isuri then shouted at Soyeon that she was crazy, that she should have run away with them all. The girl clenched her fist. There was a storm inside her that was tearing her apart. She looked at the window. In a few seconds, Soyeon would have been running away with her classmates. But she realized that everything was exactly the same then. She did not want to betray Yonva again. It broke her heart. She remembered when her classmates were running away from the Namsan cable car. At the last moment, she looked toward the room. In the window, she saw Yonva, whom they had all just abandoned. She suddenly realized that she could not make the same mistake again. So Young had to go to John Wu and run away with him. Suddenly, memories of the field trip came to mind. Then Soyeon heard her classmates putting on makeup in the restroom and talking about how the girl was trying to be cute on purpose. They were making fun of their friend. Soyeon heard all this and felt very uncomfortable. She heard one of her classmates say that she hoped Soyeon would die. And another classmate laughed at her. These memories brought her terrible pain. She dropped her head and sank into herself for a second. Suddenly, she heard someone run in and ask her what happened. It was Lee Yong Wu. He came running downstairs and said he heard the sound of glass breaking. So Young was very happy to see her classmate. He looked at the girl. She looked bad and was all alone. The boy saw the broken glass and asked why the girl was alone and where all the other classmates were. Soyeon shouted that they had to get out of the room as quickly as possible. Right now, suddenly her expression changed dramatically. The girl's eyes widened greatly and her pupils narrowed. Behind the boy's back, Soyeon saw an army of soldiers enter the room with assault rifles and point their muzzles at the teenagers. Yeonwoo saw the expression on his classmate's face and turned his head to see what was wrong. His face suddenly became frightened. For a second, Jeonwoo thought it was the end. The events moved to a shelter. They went into a tent that was fenced off and guarded by a soldier. Inside it was Park Min. He was sitting on a chair wearing a mask and texting with someone on his phone. The guy's correspondent said that Park Min was trapped. He asked the other person how he was doing, and he replied that everything depended on Park Min. He wondered why he was being protected by soldiers with weapons, or maybe they were protecting him. Suddenly, Park Min heard that the soldier standing in front of the boy's tent was asked if he had been following him. Park Min turned toward the sound and suddenly realized that they also suspected him of being infected. Suddenly, the guy had a terrible feeling. He felt pain all over his body and his consciousness seemed to become unreal. Park Min screamed in pain. Of course, the soldier on duty at the tent heard this and immediately reacted. Two soldiers went inside to see Park Min. The boy was shaking all over, but he pulled himself together and said that he was fine, although his voice said otherwise. Cold sweat dripped down Park Min's face, and he was feverish. He didn't understand why he was in so much pain. His arm was all stiff. He felt a sharp pain in the middle. Suddenly, Park Min remembered how Yeonwoo had told him in the shelter when they were running away that the boy was infected, and the virus was about to mutate. Park Min couldn't believe it. He couldn't be infected. The guy fell to the ground from his chair. He looked down and told the soldiers that he was fine. Park Min was afraid that he would have been burned to death right then and there. He nervously argued that everything was fine and that he just needed to rest and go to bed. Park Min gathered his thoughts and looked at the soldiers and managed to force a smile. But the soldiers saw that cold sweat was dripping down his face. The teenager looked very unhealthy. He said that the military were free to leave and had nothing to worry about. But of course they didn't believe him. The men pointed their guns at Park Min. He fell down and started crawling back, begging the soldiers to wait and not kill him. Park Min shouted for them to stop, and that there was nothing in his behavior that indicated the boy was not infected. The teenager's heart was leaping out of his chest. He realized that he was about to die. One of the soldiers pointed the muzzle of his assault rifle at the boy and said that the other one went to report the situation to the commander. Park Min suddenly realized that he was finished. 
The soldiers did not believe the teenager. Suddenly, a guy entered the room and interrupted Park Min's execution. It was a red-haired guy named Lee Tain. He came in and asked the soldiers if he could see Park Min. He added that he wanted to know what happened to his friend. He acted so arrogantly, as if he were omnipotent. He walked in and approached Park Min. The boy looked at Lee Tian with a scared look. The red-headed guy said it wasn't that bad. And then he added that he had to talk to Park Min. Lee Tian had a smile on his face, as if the whole situation brought him joy. The soldier began to get indignant and asked who this guy was and why he came here. He began to threaten him if Lee Tain did not leave the tent immediately. But the soldier did not have time to finish. His friend interrupted the soldier. The soldier ordered them to leave. The other soldier was outraged, but his comrade called him an asshole and repeated the order to leave. Lee Tain just stood there smiling the whole time. He was genuinely laughing at the whole thing. The red-haired guy just smiled at the military, but something in his smile was frightening and unpleasant. In general, this man was quite repulsive. Then Lee Tain came closer to Park Min when the soldiers came out of the tent. He was on the floor and did not understand what was happening and how the soldiers had obeyed him so easily. The red-haired guy spoke first because Park Min was in a stupor and couldn't say a word. Li Tain asked if they had met him before. Park Min remained silent. So the man continued to ask questions and at the same time put a chair in place for him to sit on. Li Tae Kyung asked Park Min what was happening to his body and if he felt nauseous. But the bold Park Min wasn't going to make new friends that easily. He asked Li Tain who he was and how he knew about Park Min. And in his mind, the teenager was thinking about the fact that Li Tain was not wearing a mask. This fear in his voice amused the red-headed boy. A smile appeared on his face, which was more like a grin. Li Tain said that he was the one who could help Park Min. Meanwhile, the man had already sat down on the chair where the teenager had been sitting before. He looked up at the boy, as if to make it clear that he was in charge, and Li Tang should be listened to. Meanwhile, Yon Wu, Soyun, and three homeless men sat on the floor with their hands behind their heads as if they were about to be shot. Several soldiers stood near them. One of them was pointing at the company and ordering his partner to contact headquarters. The soldier added that he should find the other suspects through his connection to headquarters. His partner accepted the command and left. Yonwu and Soyeon were scared. Cold sweat was pouring down their faces. Jonwu asked the girl if the others had just run away. Soyeon understood this as a rhetorical question and asked what they should have done. But the guy did not answer. He felt really bad. He knew that if the military had noticed how the boy reacted to the zombie monsters, they would have killed him on the spot. No one would have dealt with him. John Wu mentally reassured himself. He thought that if they were not all infected, then everything would be just fine and they would survive. Suddenly someone spoke to the military. His manner of communication left much to be desired. He was a homeless man wearing a hat and a red jacket. He stood up and started shouting indignantly at the soldiers. He asked what was going on here. Another homeless man tried to calm down his friend, who was more daring than he was. But the man in the hat turned to his friend and told him to let him go. The homeless man continued to shout at the soldiers. He asked why the soldiers were intimidating civilians. And then, the man switched to the mat and called the soldiers, Bastards. Then, one of the soldiers took an assault rifle and pointed the muzzle at the homeless man. This did not stop the man. He began to approach the soldiers and aggressively ask them how many more divisions they had and where the other freaks were. The homeless man behaved inappropriately as if he were drunk. The soldier gave the man one last chance and ordered him to immediately step back. But the homeless man did not listen and continued to call the soldiers names. The man started a sentence that implied threats but could not finish. Suddenly, a loud shot was heard. So Yon even covered her ears with her hands because she expected it to be loud. The soldier began to comment on his actions, but he explained to his partner that they all had a permit to shoot. If the suspected infected person was approaching, they could shoot him for safety reasons. John Wu took his hands away from his head in fear. No one expected a soldier to just shoot an innocent homeless man. It was someone else's life. What did the soldiers think of themselves? That they gave themselves the right to take someone's life? Then. His partner asked the soldier if all the suspects were infected. The man would shoot them all. 
but there was no answer, and the soldier realized that the question was unnecessary. But it was too late. When John Wu heard about it, he felt very sick. He turned his head and saw the corpse of a homeless man lying dead on the floor. Blood was pouring out of his head, and there was a lot of it. Yon Wu saw with his own eyes how a living person was killed. Not an infected zombie monster, but an innocent man. Suddenly his thoughts were interrupted by the military. One of them pointed a machine gun at John Wu and asked him where he was with his friends. John Wu panicked so much that he started waving his hands in front of his face. He thought for a second that they were going to shoot him too. For some reason, John Wu's reaction surprised the man and he asked why the boy jumped. Yan Wu stammered and replied that he did not know why this had happened. It was clear that he was scared to death. The teenager was afraid that they would shoot and began to justify himself by saying that he really did not know why he reacted that way. Another soldier laughed. He found it funny that a teenager was afraid of soldiers with guns who could just shoot innocent people because they saw them as an imaginary danger. But Yan Wu could think of nothing else but the muzzle that the soldier was still pointing at the boy and the corpse of the homeless man lying next to him, bleeding. The teenager's eyes widened sharply, and his pupils shrank. Cold sweat dripped down his face, and his heart was beating fast. The boy thought that he was going to die and be shot by these scum who were hiding behind the uniform and the government. Yun Wu felt the soldier's finger go down on the trigger of the machine gun. He began to press it a little. The man asked if the teenager could not simply answer his question. Yanwu was so scared that he could see a white leash in front of his eyes. He could not think about anything but the muzzle of the gun that was about to shoot him. The guy was in a stupor and silent. Suddenly, the young man screamed and lowered his head, holding it with his hands. The teenager was very scared. The soldiers were watching. They were shocked. A man with an assault rifle asked what was happening to Yanwu, but the guy did not answer. His consciousness was not with him now. John Wu did not understand what was happening at all and just held his head with his hands. The military asked him again what was happening to him. The boy's eyes were swimming. He could only see their feet and heard the man with the machine gun ask if the boy was so scared that he was behaving like that. His partner replied that it looked like he was. John Wu did not understand what was happening to him. He thought his head was about to explode. Everything was still swimming before his eyes. Soyan was watching. The girl covered her mouth with her hands in fear. She asked if Yan Wu was okay, and then she asked what had happened to him. The soldiers left the teenagers and walked away, realizing that they would be useless now. The soldier asked his partner what they should have done with them, and suggested quarantining them all. But the man did not receive an answer. He turned his head to the other side of the street. There were several other soldiers standing near a building. The soldier turned his head because something caught his attention. He told his commander to come back and see something. There was fear in the soldier's voice. He was frightened by what he had just seen. The commander was irritated and returned with aggression, but his anger quickly turned to fear. When the man turned his head, he saw a large army of zombie monsters coming out of the road. There were a lot of them, and they were all running toward them. Perhaps the zombie monsters had heard the sound of the gunshot and so ran. Meanwhile, in the tent, Park Min and Lee Tyne were talking. The boy did not believe that the red-headed savior could help him. Lee Tae-in asked with a smile what was wrong. He could see from Park Min's expression that he didn't believe him. So Lee Tae-in decided to ask him directly. Then the man smiled even wider and asked if Park Min needed help now. Lee Tae-in suddenly said that he was helping people like Park Min. He added that he meant the infected. These words sent shivers down the teenager's spine. How could the red-haired boy know that he was infected? Park Min pulled himself together and said it was great. The guy suddenly started to get up and said that Lee Tain had suddenly appeared and started saying something so incredible. He sounded like he was mocking me, but the red-haired guy didn't get out of character and kept smiling at Park Min. He just asked what the guy meant. Park Min stood up and shouted at the boy. He asked him if he was in league with those soldiers. And then he asked if Lee Tae-in really believed that Park Min would not have guessed. The teenager was very aggressive. Even if Lee Tae-in had been with the military and didn't know for sure that the boy was infected, Park Min's behavior gave him away. The boy began to ask if Lee Tae-in had any proof that Park Min was infected. Then, the teenager began to threaten his father. 
Lee Tae-in had a full mouth and puffy cheeks. Park Min continued to talk and threaten his father, saying that he was in charge of the Daesan Clinic in Cheonan. He started to threaten that when he returned home. But the boy did not have time to finish. Suddenly, Lee Tian could not help himself. A wave of laughter erupted from his mouth. Park Ming looked at the guy, and his face showed complete incomprehension. The red-haired guy grabbed his head and laughed out loud. He couldn't just hold back his emotions. In a burst of laughter, he asked Park Min what kind of nonsense he had just said. Lee Tae In even had tears in his eyes. He kept laughing and then apologized for interrupting and told Park Min to go ahead and finish what he was going to do to him. But the teenager did not understand what was happening. He looked at Lee Tian and remained silent. The red-headed boy looked at Park Min and said that he was very funny. Suddenly, Lee Tain stood up because he had already calmed down. He looked at Park Min directly into his eyes and started talking. Lee Tae In suddenly pointed his index finger at Park Min and pointed to his stomach. Suddenly, the teenager shook all over. He did not understand what was happening to him. A sharp and terrible pain went through his entire body, as if a million needles were being inserted into him at the same time. Park Min immediately fell to the floor and clutched his stomach. The sight was terrifying and even humiliating. The teenager was moaning and screaming in pain. Lee Tae-in started laughing at Park Min and asked what was wrong with the boy. The teenager begged him to stop doing that, but the red-haired guy didn't show any sympathy. His face was very calm and relaxed, as if he didn't have a guy screaming like hell next to him. Lee Tian said he would help Park Min, but only if he agreed with him. Park Min was hardly crying. His eyes began to water. He couldn't even say anything because of the intense pain he was in. The guy looked at the soldiers and could not understand why they were just standing there doing nothing. The soldiers were completely unresponsive to what was happening in the ward. Park Min became even more afraid of Lee Tae-in if he was able to control the military. Lee Tae-in walked down to Park Min and put his hand on his back as if to show support. The red-haired boy talked about what he liked to watch, but he didn't say what he liked to watch. Park Min couldn't resist asking what Lee Tian liked to look at. The red-haired boy had this wide and crazy smile on his face. It was even more frightening. Lee Tai-in looked Park Min in the eye and asked him if he wanted to get better. Park Min could not speak. He was in so much pain, he couldn't even lift his head and kept looking down at the floor. Meanwhile, Lee Tai-in continued to mock the teenager and asked him if he liked what he was feeling. He laughed at the boy and asked if Park Min wanted to go home. He added another question asking if the teenager thought he could get out of Seoul. Then he laughed out loud and said that the fool was very wrong. Lee Tae-kyung stooped down to Park Min and asked him with a smile what he had decided. Meanwhile, things were no better in Seoyoung and Yeonwoo. The soldiers began to burn the zombie monster army that wanted to attack them. Huge, ugly giants were coming from all sides. There were more of them than the monsters themselves. Suddenly, the soldier asked his commander if he had noticed correctly that the zombie monsters were coming from the quarantine zone. Zombie monsters ran out of the doors of a large room one after another. It was as if someone was controlling them all. Behind the soldiers were teenagers and homeless people. They continued to sit on the floor. Yon Wu still felt sick and was breathing deeply and loudly. The soldier shouted that zombie monsters were everywhere. Suddenly, Huang began to realize that they would not all be able to escape and survive. There were too many zombie monsters, and the military couldn't handle them all. The homeless man shouted to Soyeon and called out to the girl. He suddenly began to lift her up and told the teenagers to get up, because they all needed to save themselves. Meanwhile, one of the soldiers' guns stopped emitting flames. It looks like the fuel simply ran out. The man noticed this and was in a stupor for a few seconds, not realizing what had happened. These few minutes were enough time for a zombie monster to suddenly appear out of nowhere and attack the soldier. The man screamed. His eyes widened and his pupils constricted. He realized that he had no way to escape and was about to be eaten by a hideous zombie monster. Meanwhile, the teenagers and homeless people had already gotten up and started running away. There were only four of them. The soldiers did not even notice them because they were busy with their own business. Yon Wu still couldn't fully recover. His eyes were swimming. Huang noticed this, but he kept him safe. He shouted at him to run faster. But for some reason, John Wu looked back. Something made him do it. The teenager saw a picture where a zombie monster attacked a soldier and started eating him. 
The commander who was nearby just looked on in stupor as his partner was being devoured. The zombie monster almost completely enveloped the soldier, although he tried to escape. The commander just closed his eyes. It was hard for him to watch. It's strange that it was not hard for him to watch him shoot innocent people in the head. The soldier took one last look at his commander, who had closed his eyes. The tentacles of a zombie monster had already managed to crawl under his helmet on his head. The team finally opened its eyes. It looked like he was about to cry. Tears flowed from the soldier's eyes. Almost his entire face was covered with white mucus and the frog egg virus. The commander gathered his thoughts and shot the soldier with his assault rifle. Suddenly, a soldier standing next to him told the commander that if he did that, it would be murder. It seems that the military had their own classification, and shooting an innocent homeless man in the head was not considered murder for them. Suddenly, the commander heard someone screaming and rushing someone. He looked up to see what was happening. Then he saw that their suspects were simply running away from them. The company turned a corner. They all ran as fast as they could and shouted loudly. But some people in the company slowed down the whole process. The homeless man again noticed that John Wu was weak and could barely move his legs. He asked the teenager what was wrong with him. Cold sweat was pouring down his face. He was breathing very loudly and deeply. It seemed that the teenager was about to fall over. John Wu stopped and put his head down. He just couldn't run anymore. It was too hard for him. He told the others to run forward without him. The group turned their heads to see what was happening to Yan Wu. So Yeon began to care about her classmate the most. The teenager was breathing very loudly, as if he was short of breath. He repeated that they should go on without him, and that he was fine. But Soyeon was outraged because she saw that it wasn't true. She was angry that she had stayed with him in the shelter, only to have him leave her. Yan Wu watched the view and took deep breaths to regain his composure. There were many thoughts in his head. It seemed to him that the infected cells were going to his head. He could feel it. The guy had a feeling that the cells in his body were breaking out to the monsters. It was like a self-preservation instinct. The guy suddenly began to remember, various memories popping up in his head. John Wu recalled running away from monsters on the Namsen cable car. He began to analyze what happened when the monster from the third floor died and burned alive. Then the monster from the second floor came right away. And when Jubin died, when a zombie monster that infected a friend burned alive, the creatures from below began to rush to him through the windows. He realized that the virus seemed to sense danger. He thought that maybe they were sending signals to everyone and trying to gather in a pack. Yon Wu suddenly stood up. The teenager realized that if what he had realized was true, he could be the reason monsters appeared. So Yon was shouting to her classmate that they had to go together. She asked if the boy realized what would happen if John Wu was left alone. She was genuinely worried about her friend. She didn't want to let him down. Suddenly, Yan Wu told them all to just leave. So Yeon's expression changed dramatically. She hadn't expected to hear that from the guy. He did not raise his head, looked at the floor, and said again that they all did not stop and just walked. Suddenly, the teenager raised his head and looked at So Yeon. John Wu explained that he needed them all to leave, and then the boy would understand. He added one last time that the company should leave as soon as possible. He said something that broke Soyeon's heart. He said that he no longer needed their help. It turns out that he has now betrayed So Young. Huang was very surprised and asked if the boy was serious. He asked if Yan Wu was okay. The homeless man suggested that the teenager should just go with them, to which John Wu replied that they should all go first, because the teenager wanted to go alone and be alone. Another homeless man pushed Soyeon and said that they didn't have time for idle chatter and they all had to run away as fast as possible. She did not understand what was happening and why John Wu was pushing her away, but she just gave in and left with the homeless. Yan Wu stood and waited for the company to move far enough away from him. He found a shop or a mini restaurant and sat down in it. He came in and immediately fell to the floor exhausted. He reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. He saw his reflection in the dark screen of the phone and thought that he would take over now. The teenager thought that his mother must have been very worried about her son. Yan Wu shook his head and thought about everything that had just happened. His mind was a jumble of thoughts. He did not know what he should do. Because soldiers were chasing him and the guy was not protected from zombie monsters, they were all gathering around him. And inside the boy's body, the virus cells just grew. Suddenly, Yan Wu broke down and started crying. He was so tired of it and of not understanding what was happening to his body. 
The thought flashed through his mind that he was going to die. The teenager sat in the corner of the mini restaurant and wrapped his arms around his legs. Suddenly, a soldier with an assault rifle in his hand walked by the establishment. As if on cue, he decided to see if anyone was inside. Through the glass, he noticed Yonva sitting in the corner, looking down. It seems that the teenager had found a very bad hiding place, because he was found very quickly. Meanwhile, Park Min and Lee Tae-in were still being guarded by the military on the outside of the tent. His partner asked a corporal named Kim if the guy was really infected, and he got a response that the man himself did not understand. It seems the military was talking about Park Min. Meanwhile, the teenager was looking down and sitting on a chair. It was clear that Park Min was very concerned about something. It turned out that he was holding an empty pillbox. Lee Tae-in asked if it had worked. It seems that Park Min had taken the pill. Suddenly, the red-headed guy said it wasn't just a pill. It had a side effect. Park Ming raised his head and looked at Lee Tian. The teenager's face showed that he was very excited. Li Tain said that it was not just a pill, but a cure for cancer. He looked at Park Min. He liked that the teenager was scared. The red-haired boy could not stand it and laughed out loud, saying that Park Min was surprised. Li Tain asked the teenager if he wanted to know why the boy was helping him. He didn't wait for Park Min to answer and said that the teenager had seen what was happening outside. Li Tain commented that these soldiers were rich. He asked how they even had flamethrowers. He added that he had never seen one himself, but Park Min was still silent and did not get up. Li Tian laughed again and asked if the teenager was scared. He asked if Park Ming knew what it was like to be really upset and broken. Li Tain turned to look the teenager in the eye. The red-haired boy said that these soldiers were now their enemies. Park Ming suddenly thought. He needed time to think about all the words that Li Tian had just said to him. Suddenly, the teenager heard the sound of a phone, someone calling his cell phone. Park Min picked up the phone and asked who he was talking to because the number was unknown. The guy got up and walked away to talk. Suddenly, his gaze became excessive again. It turned out that he had received a call from Yan Wu's mother. She knew Park Min's number because he had once lent his phone to Yan Wu when he first entered the shelter. Meanwhile, Yan Wu was still sitting in the mini restaurant, mulling over his thoughts that needed to be organized in his head. Suddenly, the guy decided to look up, and at the same time, he heard something. A soldier with an assault rifle ran into the mini restaurant and ordered Yan Wu to quickly raise his hands in the air and not move. He suddenly realized that he was trapped. As he thought, he was going to be shot and die. The soldier asked what happened and why Yan Wu was alone. The teenager did not raise his head, only stood up slowly and raised his hands. John Wu was in no hurry to speak. Then, the soldier inspected the premises of the mini restaurant to find others who might be hiding somewhere. He couldn't find anyone, so he asked where everyone else was. But Yon Wu still kept his head down and remained silent. The soldier asked if the teenager was going to answer him. The soldier picked up an assault rifle and pointed the muzzle at Yonva. He shouted loudly at him again and asked where everyone else was, clearly threatening to shoot. But Yan Wu answered simply and briefly that he did not know where everyone else was. He kept his head down and added that his friends had left alone, hinting that they had allegedly abandoned him. Meanwhile, Soyun and two homeless men were running away. Suddenly, she heard a sound. It made her turn around. What she saw made her scared. Meanwhile, a gun was pointed at Yanva. The boy looked down and said that all the others had died because of them. The teenager suddenly started shaking. He looked at his hand and it was shaking as well. It was not a good sign. The soldier said that John Wu would have been better off answering seriously and not joking with him like that. The man asked again where John Wu's friends were. Meanwhile, the boy knelt down and held his arms high. The teenager suddenly started asking the soldier for something. His voice was trembling. Suddenly, John Wu raised his head and said that he really did not know where his friends were. The teenager was crying tears streaming from his eyes. The soldier did not expect to see this. John Wu covered his face with his hands and began to cry loudly. He begged the soldier not to shoot him. John Wu looked so helpless at that moment. I wanted to feel sorry for him. The teenager twisted all over and almost fell to the floor. He begged every time for the soldier to have mercy on him and not shoot. The man was still pointing the gun at Yanwa. Suddenly, he thought about it. It was clear that the soldier was hesitating and did not understand what he should do, because he was still a child. Suddenly, the soldier lowered his weapon and cursed. Yonwu was shaking and still had his hands above his head, 
showing that he was afraid and wanted to protect himself. He called out to Yonwa and was already turning around. The man told the teenager to appear in front of him more often. The boy realized that the trouble seemed to have passed and sank completely to the floor, keeping his head down. Yonwu was breathing loudly and deeply, tears streaming from his eyes and dripping onto the floor. He could not believe that he had survived and had not been shot. Suddenly, the teenager felt something. He looked at the soldier. Suddenly, his tears all went away and the guy began to act quickly and actively. He saw something when the man was leaving the convenience store. John Wu shouted for the soldier not to come out because it was dangerous for him. But the soldier did not understand why. John Wu quickly began to look around for something. Suddenly, the teenager found something he was looking for. Meanwhile, the soldier stopped and turned to Yon Wu to see what had happened and what was the reason for the commotion. The teenager saw the stove and screamed. The soldier looked at it all and did not understand what was happening and who this guy was. Meanwhile, Yon Wu suddenly jumped up and ran to the stove. Suddenly, the soldier heard a familiar sound. It was the roar of a zombie monster. The man turned around and could not believe his eyes. In front of him stood a huge, ugly giant who was about to attack him. Meanwhile, Soyon ran off somewhere. It seems that she changed her route because a homeless man ran after her and asked where she was going. Suddenly, the girl screamed John Wu's name. She was so scared. She saw a street that was on fire. There were lots of flames coming out of different shops. The girl screamed. Meanwhile, the homeless man had already run up to her. The two of them stopped and watched the street burn. Soyon suddenly screamed that there was a monster there too. It was lying on the ground and burning. Suddenly, the girl heard the sound of another monster. She turned toward the sound and screamed in fear. A huge zombie monster was flying at her. She and the homeless man were in danger. Suddenly, we heard fire from a flamethrower. The ugly zombie monster didn't have time to attack Seo Young and Huang because it was immediately burned. The girl and the homeless man sat down on the ground and covered their faces with their hands. They were very scared. Soyeon suddenly turned her head and noticed a uniformed soldier standing next to her. She was very surprised by this. She was looking at a man in uniform, pouring fire on a zombie monster and burning it alive. Suddenly, she heard a familiar voice shouting and asking why Soyeon had returned. She looked to where the sound was coming from. It turned out to be John Wu. He was running with a burning flower pot in his hands to save his classmate. The guy took a swing and threw his bomb at the zombie monsters. Meanwhile, the soldier continued to fire his flamethrower. The burning flower pot flew straight at the monster. John Wu was breathing loudly, shaking himself off. Sweat dripped down his face. He looked at the zombie monster burning. Suddenly, the teenager remembered who was behind him and whom he had just saved. John Wu turned to Soyeon and started yelling at her. He said he told the girl to leave him alone. After that, the guy asked if Soyeon had come back to interfere with him. The girl almost started to cry. She was offended why John Wu was yelling at her again. Why did everyone have to yell at her all the time? The girl suddenly said that she could not help herself. This answer surprised Yonwa. Soyeon looked down, didn't dare to look up, and said that all their classmates had split up and they were the only ones left. She suddenly began to list everyone. Kang Min and Isuri were no longer here. Kang Jihoon went to Namsan to look for Han Mi. She continued that there was no guarantee that they would be able to meet them all. Soyeon said that she did not mind being called a hypocrite. Yeon Wu turned to her. This monologue struck him. Soyeon ended her speech by saying that he was now the only classmate standing next to her. She turned to look John Wu in the eye and asked if it was natural for them to help each other. Suddenly, the soldier heard their conversation and reacted sharply. He suddenly asked about the Namsan Tower. The teenagers immediately turned to him. They were even shocked by what they heard. The soldier asked what his classmates had said about the Namsan Tower, that their friends were there and that they were heading towards the building. The man said that since the quarantine measures were taken around Seoul Station, then a small detachment was sent to the Namsan area. The soldier even took off his protective mask. He said that what they were telling him reminded him of something before the man came here. The soldier said that he had been ordered to help them in that area before. The teenagers immediately changed their faces after these words. He added that they told him they were looking for two people. The teenagers shouted that it was definitely their classmates. The soldier replied that in that case, they had all been helped long ago. He added that their friends were most likely safe. Soyeon listened to all of this and asked a question. She asked her husband if he had heard from any girls back then. But the soldier thought about it. 
scratched his beard and said he knew nothing about it. Soyon then apologized and asked if the soldier could tell her where the place was. The soldier looked at the girl with a stony face and said that if it was just a matter of location, he could tell her where it was. Soyon screamed. She was glad to hear it. Suddenly, the girl stood up and bowed to the soldier and thanked him. But the man was a little embarrassed and said that the girl shouldn't have thanked him. Suddenly, So Young asked Yon Wu if the boyfriend had heard it all too. The girl was very happy and said that they could meet Kang Jehun, and if they were lucky, they would meet others. But Yon Wu was not so happy. To be honest, he sat there with a stony face and simply said yes to So Young. The girl noticed this, and then her smile abruptly fell off her face. A military man interrupted their conversation and said that he was also about to join his team so he could help his friends. And then the wig replied that he would, provided no one knew about it. He asked Soyun if the fact that the children had escaped from the shelter could be a coincidence. Suddenly, the soldier turned red. Soyun did not really understand what was happening, but it looked like the soldier was flirting with her. John Wu decided to keep silent and not comment on the situation. So the company and the military man started running. A man was running ahead and told Soyon that it was dangerous here, so they had to run after him and stay behind. The place was not that far away. So Young then looked at Jeanwa, who was running beside her. The guy didn't look at her back, he just ran and didn't think about anything. But the girl was still worried about something, so she couldn't take her eyes off her classmate. Yan Wu told the girl when they were still in the mini restaurant with the military man that she did not trust him. He explained that he meant for Soyeon not to count on him too much if they got into danger. John Wu thought about what he had said as he ran. He thought that he had said the right thing, because he himself would have been in danger even if he had been alone. John Wu thought that maybe it was because of Isuri that she reached out to him, but then he remembered that she had left him behind. The guy still thought that it was not so. He thought that maybe it was normal after all. Meanwhile, Kang Jihoon and Jihan Hyun were in a room with light wallpaper. There was a grandmother sitting on the bed in front of them. They asked her if she knew where the girls were. She replied that she could only tell him the direction where the girls had gone, as she could only hear their footsteps. The soldier asked if the grandmother could have oriented them. She said it was about two or three hours ago. Everyone had already evacuated and she was the only one left. My grandmother began to recall how she was going to bed when she suddenly heard footsteps from running. She added that the girls were talking while they were running. The boy immediately asked what they were talking about. The grandmother said they were talking about Minzi chasing them. The grandmother went on to say that the girls then ran in that direction. She added that the men should just try to follow. The woman asked if the military had evacuated people and the soldier told her that they would take her to a safe place. Grandma thanked the military. Jihan Hyun, meanwhile, looked at Kang Jihoon. The guy could not find a place for himself. He was so worried about his Honda. Suddenly, Jihan Hyun put his hand on the boy's shoulder to support the teenager. He tried to reassure him that everything would be fixed as soon as reinforcements arrived. The guy looked at his friend and the man asked Kang Jihoon not to worry so much. Meanwhile, the soldier started talking on the radio to the headquarters again. He said it was the second squad and they had an emergency. It turned out that the virus had spread inside. Most likely, the virus had spread in the shelter and they had to burn the place right now. Suddenly, the eyes of the military man sitting behind the wheel widened greatly and the pupils narrowed. He was scared. He saw his partner next to him, whose mask was filled with the virus. The soldier's eyes were not visible at all. There were two cars on the street, one of which was upside down. All the soldiers inside were infected. Meanwhile, other soldiers were looking for teenagers Isuri, Kang Min, and Ham Song Yu. The soldiers called the children rats and laughed at them. One of them suggested checking one alley between the buildings to see if there were any teenagers there. But it turned out that the classmates were looking out the window at the military. Isuri and Kang Min were not very careful about looking through the glass. The guy said that they were passing by with a relaxed air. He asked what they should do and added that they must have already caught Seo Young and Yan Wu. Ham Song Yu stood behind them and told them to get out of this strange place first. He added that the fate of these two was no longer their business. Suddenly, someone said that they had a lot of reasons to go rescue them. The guy's expression changed dramatically and became dissatisfied. It was Isuri. She said that even if it was dangerous to be around John Wu, it would still be much safer with him. Ham Sung Yu swore when he heard this. He asked when the girl had started talking so much and added that they hadn't had much time to do so. 
He started to say what they needed first, but he didn't finish. Isuri interrupted him and asked who they were. The girl looked out the window and did not even turn to Ham Shong Yu. She asked if it was Isuri and them. Suddenly, Isuri turned to her classmate and said that she wasn't going to go with him. Ham Song Yu was swearing at his classmate. Suddenly, someone spoke to him. Isuri asked if the boy believed that the girl knew nothing. She looked him straight in the eye. She suddenly said something that gave Ham Xiong Yu goosebumps. She said she knew how she and Kang Jihoon had escaped from the Seoul TV tower. Meanwhile, the classmates, the homeless man, and the soldier kept running. The man told the group to hurry up and not to slow down. The soldier added that they were all very close. He said that very soon they could all meet their friends. A homeless man named Huang was running behind the group. Suddenly he stopped and let out a loud laugh. Soyeon was the first to notice this. The man stopped completely and put his head down. It was obvious that Huang was having a hard time running. Seo Young called out to him. She approached her husband and asked if he was okay. Then everyone stopped and approached the homeless man. Soyeon asked if it was probably because he had been beaten and cut by other homeless people. The soldier panicked. He asked in which area Huang felt bad. He added that they were almost at the city already. The homeless man was screaming and holding his stomach. It was obvious that he was in pain. He said that his ribs were broken. The man added that he had been trying to hold on all this time. Soyeon felt so sorry for the homeless man. Huang said he didn't think he could hold on much longer and added that they would all be better off without him. Seo Young said that was not the case. She asked Huang to go with them to a safe place. Meanwhile, Yan Wu was distracted by something else. So Young and the soldier continued to persuade Huang to go on, adding that they would go slowly and that the man should try to get up. Suddenly, everyone turned their attention to Yanva. The guy opened the door of a room next to them. The soldier shouted at him and asked why he did it. John Wu said he was shaving to find some medicine. The soldier was outraged and told him to go back. Soyeon was also surprised by her classmate's action, but remained silent. John Wu ran off somewhere. Suddenly, someone called his name and asked him to stop. Soyeon was there. She said that they had recently passed by a pharmacy. The teenagers made their way to the nearest pharmacy. There were many different medicines there. Soyeon asked which medicines they needed to take. The girl suggested looking for some painkillers. John Wu agreed. Suddenly, the boy said he had found a shelf. Soyeon turned and looked at the boy. John Wu said there were a whole bunch of them. Meanwhile, Soyeon suggested looking on the bottom shelf and sat down. She asked if people usually did not take Tylenol. John Wu looked down at the girl but didn't have time to say anything. The guy suddenly heard something very strange. He abruptly covered Soyeon with his arm and told her to hide. John Wu looked out the window to see what was happening outside. So Young did not understand anything. The boy cursed. In the window, he saw a zombie monster with brown hair and girl's clothes. It looked quite human. Perhaps the girl had changed recently. John Wu said they must have been spotted. The zombie monster looked at the pharmacy and growled, as if to intimidate the victim. Yan Wu came back and told Soyeon that they had to stay here until that horrible zombie monster left. Soyeon just looked at her classmate and agreed with his opinion. The teenagers were hiding behind the cash register table. Soyeon suddenly spoke up and asked if it wasn't the same as before. But Yan Wu didn't understand what the girl meant. So Yan explained that the way they were hiding reminded her of something. The girl said she suddenly remembered the incident on the cable car. John Wu looked at her and listened attentively. His gaze suddenly turned stony again, and he turned away from the girl, saying that it was true. So Yan felt uncomfortable with this pause. It was clear that she was a little embarrassed. She suddenly started asking why something like this happened, and why it happened to them at all. Soyeon wrapped her arms around her legs and suddenly remembered her classmate Gail and how she looked then. The girl was shaking. Suddenly, Soyeon started to cry and said that she was looking forward to their school trip, wiping the tears from her eyes. John Woo suddenly became imbued with the girl's feelings. He said he was also looking forward to this school trip. Soyeon did not expect to hear this. She looked at her classmate, but he turned away from her. He added that he had been looking forward to it and preparing for it. The guy looked out the window to see if the monster had left, but it was still near the pharmacy. Yon Wu added that this virus was sporting everything. Suddenly, the zombie monster turned as if it had seen something. Yon Wu said that if they touched on this topic, he would like to ask Soyinka a question. But before that, he asked if his classmate could answer this question honestly. Soyeon did not understand anything but asked what he wanted to tell her. It was clear that Yon Wu was uncomfortable with the question. He was even a little afraid. 
but he started to speak, stuttering a little. He asked the girl if what his friend Kim Jubin had told them was true. John Woo couldn't believe that his best friend had actually told them to leave him on the cable car. So Yon did not know what to say to the boy. She began to speak, but the sentences were incomprehensible. It was clear that So Yon did not know how to say it to him correctly. But by the way So Young reacted and spoke, John Woo understood everything himself. The guy looked at the door and saw that the monster was nowhere to be found. It looked like he had left. John Woo suddenly stood up to see where the monster was. The boy gave a short, I see. So Yun looked at the boy and felt so sorry for her classmate. Yon Wu said he had been in such situations himself. He added that he understood Kang Min completely. He went on to say that he realized that fear made them weaker. Suddenly, the teenager wanted to justify his friend and said that Seo Young should have known what Kim Jubin was like. Yong Wu's memory began to resurface when Jubin saved the boy by throwing a pot of flowers at the zombie monster. He told Seo Young that Kim Jubin was really brave at that moment, much braver than his classmates. Soyeon was genuinely moved by the story. She felt very sorry for Yonwa that he had been treated this way. The guy went to the shelf, took a painkiller, and said they should have come back. A few minutes later, the soldier said they were almost there. Soyeon and Yon Wu held the homeless man on their backs and helped him walk. They all went to the burning cars. There was a soldier in front and others behind him. They did not dare to approach the burning cars. Huang said that this was impossible, that the entire base was infected. The man asked what was going on here. There were indeed corpses of soldiers lying on the floor, all covered in white mucus and frog egg virus. The soldier saw this and cursed. He didn't even know about the case of his fellow soldiers. Suddenly, John Wu saw something that caught his attention. There was a flamethrower on the floor that had not yet been set on fire. Meanwhile, the company had already reached the right place. The soldier ran first and stopped at an open door to a room. He turned to the others and was about to say that this was supposed to be the place, when suddenly he couldn't finish because he saw something very strange. Behind him ran John Wu, who was carrying a fire extinguisher that the military had. It was obvious how hard it was for the teenager. Yon Wu began to complain about how heavy the fire extinguisher was and how the soldiers carried it at all. The soldier cursed because he was annoyed that the teenagers were quite slow. He said that it looked like their friends were hiding somewhere inside the building. He added that they should look around the area. The soldier added that it was very dangerous to enter the building without any other support. Soyeon asked what about their friends. This question surprised Yon Wu quite a bit. The girl said they had better just hope that they were okay. They had no choice. They didn't know what was inside. Suddenly, Yon Wu refused to back up like everyone else. He ran straight into the building. A military officer noticed this and asked where John Wu was going, shouting at him to have a mother. The guy said he had to see something. He wanted to check the condition of the inside. He thought to himself that he wasn't 100% sure, but Yon Wu didn't feel that there were any infected people there. The soldier asked Soyeon if her classmate had lost his mind. He said the boy was doing whatever he wanted. But Soyeon herself was shocked by what had happened and what Yon Wu had done. He ran inside, everything was on fire. John Wu complained about how hard it was to breathe. It was very hot inside because of the large amount of fire. Yon Wu said out loud that it looked like it was clear inside, but they were calling for help for a reason. He thought that there must still be some monsters left here. But the problem was that the structure of the building was very intricate and John Wu didn't know if he would be able to find them quickly. Suddenly, he heard some footsteps behind him. He turned around and saw Soyeon running toward him. The girl said she wanted to go with him. Soyeon ran to the boy and hid behind his back. Meanwhile, the military kept talking to the grandmother and waiting for reinforcements. Suddenly, another soldier came up to Yang Heng and told him to look after his grandmother, while the soldier wanted to go and finish the investigation. Ji Han Hyun approached Kang Jehun and said that he heard his grandmother say that there were several exits in the building so they had a chance to meet Kang Jihoon's friends. The guy thought about it and said no. Jihan Hyun was surprised by this answer and looked at the teenager. The boy replied that they would definitely meet his friends. Meanwhile, another monster crawls in front of Yon Wu and Soyeon. He was roaring and half burnt and at times still burning. John Wu immediately lit his flamethrower to kill the monster. The guy sharply pressed the switch and a large amount of fire poured out of his flamethrower, which instantly burned the zombie monster. The teenagers watched as he burned and roared. Meanwhile, Soyeon hid behind a classmate. Yeonwoo commented that some of the monsters were still alive, 
but it looks like most of them are long dead. The guy said that he didn't think it was that dangerous in the building. Soyeon looked down in fear and said how relieved she was. The girl was almost crying from fear. She tried to show that she wasn't a coward and that she was doing some good, but that wasn't who Soyeon really was. She saw the head of a zombie monster on the floor, screaming in pain as it burned alive. Yanwu realized that So Young was not feeling well and told the girl that she could leave if she wanted to. He said it didn't make much difference if he was with her or not. Janwu would still tell her when he found their friends. But So Young replied in a trembling voice and stammering that everything was honestly fine. Janwu realized that she was lying, but decided not to expose her. They walked on. Seo Young said she was worried about where Kang Ji Hoon might have gone. Could he be hiding in one of those rooms? Yan Wu supported the girl's opinion and said it sounded like the truth. He said he thought they would have been able to find him if they had followed that fire trail. Seo Young said she hoped so. She then asked if everything was okay with Kang Ji Hoon and the man who was with him. John Wu exhaled a tired breath, and then he said that he had hoped for that as well. But then he added that if they found any problems, they would have to burn them with their own hands. So Yon looked at her classmate in fear. She knew it was the right thing to do, but she had never thought about it, and the idea scared her. She looked at Yonwa and the way he just talked about it, as if he didn't feel sorry for his classmates at all. But suddenly, John Wu's eyes fell down. He was thinking about something. He remembered how his best friend Kim Juba was burning, because it was actually Yon Wu who set him on fire. He suddenly realized that he didn't want that to happen again. Suddenly, Soyeon told Yon Wu to look to the side. The girl saw a soldier sitting on the floor in the corridor. John Wu and Soyeon were shocked by what they saw. The girl asked if he had seen it too. John Wu asked if it was a soldier on the floor. The teenagers ran up to the man. Yon Wu said that the soldier did not appear to be infected. He then asked if he was one of the soldiers who had asked for reinforcements. John Wu ran and asked if the soldier was okay. The man managed to look up and see the teenagers running toward him. But the man said that the teenagers were running away. John Wu and Soyeon did not understand what he was talking about. The soldier said through the pain that he was a decoy. He wanted to lure people to their base and used the soldier as bait. Suddenly, John Wu felt a shiver go through his body again. He felt the same pain again. The boy turned his head and saw something terrible. A big and huge zombie monster was coming out of the corner. It was the exoskeleton that Kang Ji-hoon and Ji-han Hyun's military talked about. John Woo was scared. His heart beat very fast. His eyes widened and his pupils narrowed. He realized that he had to do something and act immediately. Suddenly, he was again pierced by terrible pain. The guy tried to do something, but he couldn't. In front of him stood a huge, three-meter-high, ugly exoskeleton, snarling at the boy. John Woo screamed. He was very scared. He had never seen such big zombie monsters. Meanwhile, a soldier with an assault rifle was coming down some stairs. Suddenly, he looked up to see something. He did not understand the structure of this stupid building. The man took off his mask and said how stuffy it was. Sweat was running down his face. Suddenly, the man noticed something downstairs that caught his attention. It was an emergency exit. It was open, so someone was coming out of it. The soldier stood at the entrance and wondered if he should have gone inside as well. He wondered out loud why the boy in the cap had decided to go inside in the first place. The man felt that this city scared him very much. Meanwhile, the teenagers were in real hell. Seo Young screamed very loudly and even regretted going into the room with Yan Wu. A huge monster stood in front of them and growled at their classmates. They had to do something fast. Yan Wu stood there, staring at the exoskeleton like a man staring at a rock. It inspired great fear in the boy. Meanwhile, the zombie monster did not wait and opened its huge mouth to devour the teenagers. Yonwu saw this and his eyes popped out of his forehead. Its mouth was getting closer to Jonah. The monster had a large number of teeth. It looked like it was not one person but a merger of several zombie monsters. Jonwu closed his eyes and just waited for his inevitable death. Suddenly, he felt that the zombie monster had stopped and was not about to devour Yonva. The guy was in a trance, looking at the mouth of a giant zombie monster. Suddenly, the boy's body and consciousness seemed to be transported somewhere else. Something very strange was happening to John Wu. The guy seems to have realized that the zombie monster was reacting to the virus in his body. John Wu realized that he had to do something, right now, at this moment. The guy pointed the muzzle of the flamethrower directly into the mouth of the zombie monster and lit the fire. Yan Wu flipped the switch and fried the huge zombie monster. 
It roared in pain and was thrown back. Yanwu and Soyeon also fell backwards. The shockwave was too great. The girl looked at the huge exoskeleton burning in front of them, which no one had been able to overcome before. Janwu could barely stand on his hands. Soyeon asked if the boy was okay because she had seen him being eaten by a zombie monster. The soldier behind them shouted for them all to run faster because they didn't have much time. He added that this monster was not as simple as it seemed. Meanwhile, the giant was indeed beginning to rise a little bit, as if what John Wu had done was nothing to him. The soldier told the teenagers to run to the lower floor and added that soldiers from his base were also there. He shouted again for the teenagers to come to their senses and run away. Soyeon turned to Yang Wu and told him to leave as well. She picked up her classmate and helped him to the shelter. Soyeon was not even afraid that John Wu was infected. Meanwhile, the zombie monster was lying on the ground and growling. A soldier sat next to him and laughed at the monster. He called this ugly giant names and picked up a flamethrower. The soldier looked the zombie monster in the eye and asked him if he thought the soldier would let him walk away and light a flamethrower. Suddenly, the teenager saw fire and felt intense heat. Meanwhile, the teenagers were going down the stairs. John Wu suddenly screamed as if he was in pain. So Young asked the boy what had happened to him and if he was okay. The classmate was genuinely worried about Yan Wu. She stretched out her hand to help the boy not fall. He looked down and said that he was fine and that they should get out of here. Soyeon tried to express words of support but was unable to finish. Something caught her attention. The girl saw someone sitting in the corridor. It seemed to be a girl because she was wearing a pink t-shirt. The teenagers looked in the direction of this man and were sincerely surprised. Soyoung noticed that it was Minju, her classmate, whom they were looking for. The girl ran up to her joyfully. She asked if Minju was okay and shouted happily. Seo Young couldn't believe it, that she had found her friend. She asked her classmate where everyone else was and said that only she and John Woo were left. Suddenly, he felt something strange. Suddenly, he realized a terrible thing. The guy yelled at Seo Young to stay away from Minju. She stopped and turned to Yeon Woo, but she didn't understand what he meant. Yeon Woo shouted that their classmate Minju was infected and ordered Seo Young to come back to him as soon as possible. Unfortunately, the girl was one step away from Minju, and she even heard her classmate growling. She was making the sounds that zombie monsters make. Soyeon could not believe her eyes. She did not want to accept reality and just stood there, not knowing what to do. Suddenly, Minju turned to her. Her face was covered in white frog egg virus slime. She stood up to attack Soyeon. The girl had to react quickly, otherwise she would be eaten. But Soyeon could do nothing. She was afraid and stood there frozen. She could not believe that it was her classmate Minju. Soyeon suddenly remembered how she and Hanmi used to shoot videos for her channel. It was such a bright time. Soyeon was telling the camera about something. Suddenly, she didn't have time to finish because she was interrupted. Someone shouted to be given the floor as well. It was Kim Minju. She went to her friend and hugged her. She looked at Soyeon and said that they were close friends. But now, it was a horrible zombie monster. Its goal was to devour its own friends. Suddenly, in a second, Minju was already pouncing on So Young and growling. So Yinka ran fast. John Wu yelled at her not to stand still. Yan Wu also ran up to his classmate and burned Minju's zombie monster. Meanwhile, So Yan hid behind him and turned away. The teenagers watched the corpse of their classmate Kim Minju burn. So Yan put her hands over her face and started crying. She never expected this to happen to her friend. Yan Wu watched and made sure that the zombie monster was burned. In fact, it hurt him to do it, but he had to, even though he didn't want to. Kim Minju's face was burning. Her classmate was dead. So Yeon began to cry a lot. It was as if something had just broken inside her. She returned to see what was happening there, but Yeon Wu stood in front of her and told her not to look at it. He blocked the picture with himself so that his friend So Yeon would not suffer from what she might see. It was not a pleasant picture. The corpse of a girl was lying on the floor. Because she was not completely transformed, she was easy to recognize. Soyeon leaned on John Wu's back. The boy felt it and said that it would be better for her. He repeated that it would be better for Seo Young not to see her friend's corpse. He spoke from experience, as he still remembered Kim Jubin's corpse with horror. So Young understood and trusted Yan Wu. The girl just turned around and wiped her tears. Her grief was great. Yan Wu took it upon himself to make sure that his classmate Kim Minju would burn to death. He recalled that he remembered the girls spending a lot of time together. They were really close friends. Soyeon was crying bitterly. She was having a hysterical fit. 
The girl was very empathetic and had a hard time dealing with difficult moments. John Woo went over to her. He heard his classmate crying hard and repeating her friend's name. He realized that he had to support his classmate in this difficult moment. John Woo could not make up his mind, but he knew he had to. He wanted to put his hand on the girl's shoulder and ask her if she was okay, but he couldn't speak. Suddenly, the girl screamed before Yeon Woo could touch her back. So Yeon covered her mouth with her hands because she saw something really horrible that scared her a lot. Jeon Woo now also noticed what the girl had noticed. The same giant zombie monster was running at the teenagers. So Young screamed and asked Yeon Woo what they should do. The monster ran after him as if it was chasing the teenagers. The giant somehow knew where his classmates were. Jeon Woo cursed and looked at his hand. She was covered in blood. The boy realized that the zombie monster was chasing them because he could smell the blood. The monster was getting closer and closer to them. The teenagers had to think of something fast to save themselves. John Woo turned back and saw something. He looked behind them. It was a dead end. Yeon Woo told So Young that they could not get out because of the cul-de-sac. So Young apologized and said it was all her fault. John Woo covered the girl with his body and said that she should have stepped back. Soyeon asked her classmate what he was going to do now. The boy replied that he was going to use the flamethrower to its fullest potential. Meanwhile, the zombie monster was about to attack the teenagers. Yanwu pointed the muzzle of the flamethrower at the giant, ugly exoskeleton and said they had no other choice. But the monster's behavior was very strange. Janwu noticed this and could not believe what he was seeing. He was looking at this giant three-meter exoskeleton and did not understand what was happening. Yanwu concluded that it was clear that the zombie monster was afraid. It was scared. But at the same time, he kept looking at the guy and growling at the same time. Janwu decided that the zombie monster was afraid of the flamethrower. The guy felt that it was his mouth. He was afraid to open it again in front of Janwu. The teenager realized and felt that the virus was inside his mouth. That is why the zombie monster was afraid to open it. Suddenly, the teenagers heard someone running and shouting at them to run away. It was a military man with a weapon in his hands. Kang Ji-hoon was running behind him with a Molotov cocktail. They were going to attack the zombie monster and save their friends. A large amount of fire was poured on the zombie monster. Kang Ji-hoon shouted to Yun Wu. The guy swung his Molotov cocktail and threw it at the monster. The large exoskeleton caught fire. The soldier, Ji-han Hyun, shouted for the teenagers to run away as they would distract the attention of the huge monster. Suddenly, the man could not believe his eyes. John Wu attacked the three-meter-tall exoskeleton with a flamethrower. The guy didn't seem to be afraid at all. Yeon Wu screamed and realized that there was no point in burning other parts of the zombie monster's body. It was necessary to burn its mouth specifically. They had to burn this virus directly, and it was in the monster's mouth. To do this, John Wu had to get as close as possible to the zombie monster's face. But it was John Wu who was afraid of the exoskeleton. It began to run away from him as if it realized that the boy had found its weak point. The zombie monster started running up the stairs. John Wu saw it and was surprised. The guy was about to defeat a nasty zombie monster, but it just ran away. Yeon Wu was about to run after him to kill the bastard when someone stopped him. The soldier took hold of his arm. The teenager turned around and got scared. The soldier asked where Yeon Wu got the flamethrower. The boy first screamed for the soldier to let him go, and then said that he had taken it from a place where a group of soldiers were lying dead. The soldier and Jihan Hyun could not believe what they were hearing. Yeon Wu shouted that he had almost killed this zombie monster recently. But he added that if not now, it would be much harder to do so later. But soldier Jihan Hyun looked at Yeon Wu and realized that the boy was too young for that. The man began to approach the teenager and told him to give him the flamethrower. Yeon Wu resisted, but Jihan Hyun stood his ground. Nevertheless, the teenager complied and began to remove the flamethrower. Jihan Hyun asked how many shots could be fired with this weapon and was told that only six shots were possible. Yeon Wu said he had already fired four shots. There was almost no fuel left. Jihan Hyun put on a fire extinguisher and said that it meant he had to finish in two shots. The soldier and the man were climbing up the stairs to find the monster. The soldier asked if Jihan Hyun would be okay, as it was very dangerous. The man replied that he saw it as protecting citizens. The man explained that if she didn't get rid of this monster, the old lady downstairs would be in more trouble, and the reinforcements never came. The soldier told Jihan Hyun not to forget that even if the soldier helps him in case of danger, he should not run for his life. 
Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon ran in front of the men. Ji Hun Hyun noticed this and asked where the teenager was going. The guy came back and said he would put a bait for the zombie monster. He asked that the exoskeleton might run away again if it saw the flamethrower. They told him that it was very dangerous and that he should go back down. Yeon Woo was standing behind them listening to this conversation. Suddenly the boy said he was here. Ji Hun Hyun turned to look at the boy. Yeon Woo seemed very confident that he knew where the zombie monster was now. Meanwhile, the zombie monster suddenly raised his head because he heard some strange sounds. Someone was running toward him and screaming. It was Kang Ji Hoon who ran at an exoskeleton with a Molotov cocktail and yelled for the zombie monster to eat it and die. Kang Ji Hoon threw his Molotov cocktail right into the face of the zombie monster. He realized that he would not have defeated the monster with this, but it seems that the guy had a plan. Kang Ji Hoon looked at the zombie monster and asked if it was angry with him. Then, the large exoskeleton growled as if answering a teenager's question and began to open its mouth. Kang Ji Hoon began to move away from him and run back, because the exoskeleton was running very fast. The zombie monster began to open its mouth more boldly and forcefully. Kang Ji Hoon began to be afraid, but he still waited. Suddenly, a huge zombie monster opened its huge mouth to the fullest and roared. Ji Han Hyun stood around the corner. Kang Ji Hoon shouted at the man and gave him a signal. Then Ji Han Hyun jumped around the corner and pointed his flamethrower right into the zombie monster's mouth. The fire hit the exoskeleton right in the mouth. It was on fire. But there was something surprising about the military. His face showed incomprehension. He pressed the handle of the flamethrower and thought to himself that it was different from the last time. Ji Han Hyun made a very large amount of fire. He thought about how he already knew how this thing worked and now, with its help, he could easily deal with the monster. Suddenly, Yonwu appeared next to me. The guy said that it was no use attacking the monster from the outside. Yonwu screamed that the virus was in his mouth. The guy said the soldier was supposed to get closer to the exoskeleton and burn the virus from the inside. For some reason, Ji Han Hyun trusted Yonwu completely. He asked him again what he was supposed to do. The teenager repeated that Ji Han Hyun should aim directly at the zombie monster's mouth. Then, the man began to approach the monster closer to do his job. He saw that he was right on target. The exoskeleton's mouth was open, and Jihan Hyun brought the muzzle of the flamethrower closer to its mouth. The man was thinking in his head that he would finish off this damn zombie monster now, but the soldier and Kang Ji Hoon were surprised that the man came so close. They shouted for Jihan Hyun to move away from him, but the man did not listen. He was fulfilling his goal. Suddenly, Jihan Hyun noticed something strange in the zombie monster's behavior. Suddenly, the man's eyes grew sharply larger and his pupils shrank. It was as if he felt incredible pain. Ji Han Hyun's coordination has been disrupted. Kang Ji Hoon noticed that something was wrong. He shouted to the man. It turned out that the zombie monster had put its bony paw right into Ji Han Hyun. It cut through the man's body because it was as sharp as a sword. Suddenly, Ji Han Hyun realized that he was dying. Meanwhile, the door to one of the apartments was open. Inside sat. The girl suddenly heard some sounds. I could hear some voices behind the door. Someone was discussing why the door to this apartment was open while all the others were closed. Suddenly I heard the sound of a pen scrolling. A soldier came inside and asked if anyone was alive in the apartment. The man opened the door more forcefully and saw the teenage girl sitting sadly hugging her legs. The soldier asked if she was okay. Suddenly, the man saw something terrible when he went further inside. He looked around the room and noticed something in the corner. The corpse of another schoolgirl was lying next to the girl. There was a pool of blood under her body. Suddenly, everyone else realized that something very bad had happened. Kang Ji Hoon was about to run to Ji Han Hyun and save him, but the teenager was stopped by a soldier with his hand. Suddenly, the zombie monster roared again, as if it was happy to have killed the man. The soldier then started shooting to kill the exoskeleton somehow, but the monster only growled harder and got even angrier. There was blood inside the monster's mouth, so the virus was wounded. The exoskeleton's bony paw went all the way through Ji Han Hyun's body and even pierced the backpack with fuel. The man saw that the zombie monster was running away and asked him where he was going. Ji Han Hyun brought the muzzle of his flamethrower very close to the zombie monster's mouth and commented that he still had one shot left. The man clutched the handle of the flamethrower and fired directly into the exoskeleton's mouth. There was a lot of fire. The zombie monster was screaming in pain. Ji Han Hyun held on. He had to finish his work. Suddenly, the man felt severe pain in his wound. He groaned in pain, but Ji Han Hyun did not dare to die. 
He gathered his strength to kill the zombie monster. The man's knees began to buckle and Jihan Hyun became weaker. But the man had a goal. He had to get closer to the monster's mouth and burn all the virus inside. Jihan Hyun managed to take a few steps. He was seized with a terrible rage because he had nothing to lose. The exoskeleton screamed. Jihan Hyun literally shoved his hand, along with the muzzle of a flamethrower, into the monster's mouth and burned everything inside. The zombie monster was defeated. Jihan Hyun completely burned the virus. The man was still on his feet and breathing loudly, shaking himself off. Jihan Hyun was looking at the corpse of a huge three-meter zombie monster and enjoying his work. Suddenly, the man fell down because he could no longer stand on his feet. He had absolutely no strength left. Others immediately ran up to Jihan Hyun. They were shouting and asking if her husband was okay. But the man told them all to stay away from him. Jihan Hyun looked down at the monster. He said he didn't think it was the end. The man added that the monster was still alive. Soft, growling sounds were coming from its mouth. The teenagers looked at this with their mouths wide open. They were all scared to death of what they saw. Jihan Hyun was wounded through and through by a zombie monster bone. The soldier started to say something to the man but could not. He was interrupted. Jihan Hyun interrupted and said that he had only one request. The soldier asked what it was and he was ready to do anything for his courage. The man said that he realized that things had to be different. But he added that he was going to keep fighting. Jihan Hyun said he would stay here and set himself on fire with the monster. Thanks to the oil barrels on his back. Kang Ji-hoon shouted at the man not to even think of saying anything like that. He was scared to death of what he was seeing. He shouted at Jihan Hyun a lot because he was offended and did not want to lose his new friend. The teenager said that the man promised to help him, but the man only replied that he had asked Kang Ji-hoon to call him simply Hyun. He added that even now the teenager called him Mr. Jihan Hyun said that he could not even help himself because he was in a very difficult situation. If you took that thing out of him, he would have died immediately. Soyeon covered her mouth with her hands. She couldn't bear to see it. The teenagers hoped to the last that Jihan Hyun would live. John Woo was no less worried. He apologized to the mister and said it was all his fault. It was all John Woo's fault. But Jihan Hyun said that the teenager did not have to apologize. The man suddenly said that he could not have lived to see today. He looked at the teenagers and said that if he hadn't met them, he would have given up a long time ago. These words touched them all. Meanwhile, the monster growled and began to move. Jihan Hyun immediately noticed this and told others about his observations. The man stood up and said that he was allowed to do so. Jihan Hyun looked at the soldier and addressed him. The man understood what he had to do, but he really didn't want to. The soldier took off his weapon and handed it to Jihan Hyun. In the end, the soldier said that he was very pleased to meet him. He also asked Jihan Hyun to end it all. The man smiled as best he could at the soldier and took up his weapon. The soldier ordered the others to leave quickly before the monster woke up. He told the teenagers that they would go with them in the direction their friends were going. Kang Ji-hoon couldn't take his eyes off his friend Jihan Hyun. The man noticed this and looked back at the teenager. Jihan Hyun turned his head even more because he thought he had noticed something. He was not satisfied. Kang Ji-hoon walked and cried. He could not take his eyes off his friend. The teenager could not believe that it was over. Suddenly, they all ran away and left Jihan Hyun alone with the monster. The man looked at the monster's open mouth and asked if it had died yet. The man started to get up. He said that he had a gift for the zombie monster at the time. He took the machine gun, aimed it at the zombie monster, and asked if it was a good one since he decided to see it off. The man was thinking in the end that in the end, it all ended this way. He apologized to his beloved Jisun before he died. The man recalled how they ran away from the cable car back then. He was running ahead when he suddenly noticed that his fiancée had stopped running. Jihan Hyun turned around to see what had happened. Jisun crouched down, and behind her was a huge zombie monster. The man looked at his bride and stood in a stupor. His beloved also looked back at the man and breathed loudly. He recalled his last look at his fiancée, Jisun, before he died. He asked if she would forgive him. The man suddenly started crying. He was apologizing for not being able to help her and for not reacting in time. Before her death, his beloved shouted to her fiancé, Jihan Hyun, to run away quickly and not wait for her, but to save himself. The man cried hard and said out loud that now they would finally see her. Jihan Hyun couldn't wait to see her. Suddenly there was a sound from the top floor window, followed by a big wave of explosion and lots and lots of fire. 
The company quickly went downstairs in search of her classmates. They ran up to the corner and saw something that caught their attention. The company saw a girl in a pink blouse and the military in the corridor. They shouted at them to run to them. So Young and Yonwu could not believe what they were seeing with their own eyes. It was their military officer who brought the teenagers to their friends, and he found their classmate. But the girl did not look happy. She looked at her classmates and shook with fear. The soldier asked where So Young and Jeon Wu had been all this time. The soldier asked if the girl was their friend. Kang Ji Hoon noticed her and shouted to Hannah. The boy suddenly started running to his classmate and asked where everyone else was. Kang Ji Hoon did not know that Minju had burned to death. Suddenly, Khan Hannah ran away. The soldier was approaching the teenagers, and the girl just ran away from them all. The girl ran outside and climbed the stairs. Someone was running behind her and yelling at her back to stop. It was Kang Ji Hoon. He asked why the girl was running away and where she was going. They were calling for help. The boy was shouting loudly he wanted to see Hanmi, and only Hannah knew where her classmate was. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon wanted to stop his classmate, but he couldn't, so he just pushed her. Hannah fell on the stairs. She had nowhere else to go. She had to answer all the questions. Kang Ji Hoon was indignant that the girl had started running away so abruptly. He asked her why she was doing that. Hannah started to get up and turned to her classmate. Meanwhile, the boy asked where all the other classmates were. Suddenly, the girl started screaming at Kang Ji Hoon and saying that it wasn't her fault. The boy didn't understand what had happened. Hannah started crying a lot. She was hysterical. She could not speak normally. Hannah started making excuses again and saying that it really wasn't her fault. Kang Ji Hoon began to worry because he was guessing all sorts of things. He asked Hannah what she meant. Others had already come running behind him. Kang Ji Hoon became nervous and started shouting. He demanded that Hannah explain everything. Suddenly, a soldier came up behind them and found the girl. The man said that it looked like Hannah was the only one who survived. Kang Ji Hoon could not believe it. His body shivered and his heart ached. The man continued that when he found Hannah, everyone else was already dead. Then a classmate interrupted the conversation. She said she was against it from the beginning. Hannah was crying a lot and said that they shouldn't have run away from the bus because they didn't even have batteries with them. Suddenly, the girl looked at Kang Ji Hoon. Hannah looked him straight in the eye and told him that it was all the boy's fault. She said it just like his mom. Kang Ji Hoon's heart broke into pieces. The girl stood up and held her hand. She turned to face her classmates. Hannah started blaming Kang Ji Hoon for everything again. The guy was broken. He didn't know what to say or how to react. It just couldn't be. It was a cruel joke. Hannah repeated that it was all his fault. Kang Ji Hoon was so broken that he even believed it. If it weren't for him, Han Mi would still be alive. Han Mi's corpse was lying on the floor of the apartment. There was a pool of blood under her body. The girl was not breathing. Kang Ji Hoon entered the room and saw his beloved Han Mi. The guy stood silently and looked at the girl. He was in a stupor. All I could think of was Hannah's phrase that it was all because of him. The guy did not want to live. He had lost two close people. Meanwhile, Seo Young was yelling at Hannah for what she had said to Kang Ji Hoon. The girl realized that her classmate was very wrong. Kang Ji Hoon let these phrases pass him by and asked only what had happened. Kang Hana began to cry. The headman asked only about Lee Hong Mi. The guy asked again what happened to Lee Hong Mi. Suddenly, the memories of that horrific situation came flooding back to Hannah. Lee Hong Mi was running away from a huge exoskeleton but it caught up with her and sliced through her body with its bones. Hannah simply said that she was attacked by a monster, without giving any details. Kang Ji Hoon fell to his knees. He was powerless and could not stand on his feet. He lowered his head and sat next to his beloved Li Hong Mi. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon began to shake. His body could not take it anymore, and then he started crying softly. He looked at the corpse of his sweet, beautiful Han Mi. She was supposed to be his. How much the guy hadn't had time to tell her. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon began to cry hard. His heart was breaking into pieces. He felt so much pain inside. The guy was constantly apologizing to the girl. If only she knew how sorry he was for everything he did to her and for not saving her. But Kang Ji Hoon could not forgive himself. Meanwhile, the events moved to a small shop. The teenagers sat inside with Huang. Hannah was holding her legs with her hands and Yeon Wu was talking to a man. So Young just sat there. Huang asked if all the friends they were looking for were like that. The man spoke carefully, not mentioning the word death. Then he asked if Yihan Hyun was like that too and looked at Yeon Wu. The guy looked down and was silent. And without words, 
Everything was clear. Suddenly, Soyun cried out loudly, wiping the tears from her eyes. Huang exhaled loudly and sadly. He was a good man and was experiencing this tragedy together with the teenagers. Suddenly, the man remembered his last conversation with Jihan Hyun. He asked Huang to take care of these children. The man added that Jihan Hyun followed his fiance and wished his friend to rest in peace. Huang told Seo Young that she shouldn't have been so upset. The girl was just having a tantrum. The man tried to calm them down and said that everyone who was left had to try to survive as best they could. John Wu looked up. He was interested in the man's words. Kang Hana also looked at Huang and listened intently. The man continued that he had heard that the teenagers had gotten separated when they arrived at the evacuation site. John Wu suddenly decided to ask Hannah what had happened. The boy felt that something was wrong. He asked his classmate why she had run away earlier. The girl was silent. Suddenly, horrific memories of that situation began to surface in her mind. Hannah was the last to run. Before her were Hanmi and Minju. The girls were running away from the bus. Hannah suddenly stopped and got scared. She didn't think it was a good idea to run away from the bus. On the way out, she heard the bus driver yelling at the girls and calling them all idiots. The man said that he had saved them all, and now they were attacking him. His last words were that they would all regret it later. Hannah came back to reality and said that she couldn't. Soyon was looking at her. The girl hugged her legs, lowered her head, and said that she could not trust anyone. She said that after what she had been through, she could not trust even Soyon. Hannah remembered again how they ran away with the girls. In front of them was a street that was completely covered with white mucus and frog egg virus, like a spider's web. Minju turned to them and screamed. Behind them, they heard the monster growling. Minju said they should run faster. Behind them was a big zombie monster. The girls ran into a room. They all laughed loudly because it seemed that the problem was over and they were now in relative safety. Hanmi and Hannah looked at the floor and breathed loudly. Minju asked her friends if everyone was okay and if anyone was hurt. The girl looked out the window and saw something. Then Hannah suggested finding something to set on fire. Minju said it was a good idea and offered to go first. Hannah, meanwhile, commented on her story and said that they thought they could handle it well. But a zombie monster attacked them. Minju was breathing loudly. She was scared. The other girls looked on from the sidelines. They were also very scared. A huge zombie monster was burning near Minju. The girls suddenly screamed to their friend. They realized that something had happened to the girl. But Minju sat by the fire and did not turn to them. Suddenly, Li Hongmi started talking to her friend to figure out what had just happened. The girls heard Minju ask them why. The teenagers were very afraid of what they were about to see. But Minju told them that everything was fine, as if there was no reason to worry. The girl looked at her hands and said that she had not touched the zombie monster. She put her arms around herself and said that she was fine. Minju turned to her friends to look at them. She repeated that everything was fine. The girls were very scared. They were holding their heads and cold sweat was pouring down their faces. Hannah suddenly added that at the time they really thought Minju was not infected, but they were all wrong. Soyeon looked at the girl. She felt sorry for her friends, especially since they were the ones who burned Minya alive. Hannah said that Minju seemed to be pretending to be normal, but she was really deceiving them all. The girl told Soyeon that she had also deceived them, and Hannah asked how she could trust her after that. John Wu overheard this conversation. So Young went to Hannah and hugged her friend, saying that they really didn't know and asked her to believe them all. Yan Wu suddenly remembered the fight with Park Min when he said that his classmates were infected. The guy realized that it was an incubation period, so Minju didn't know she was infected at first. Yan Wu realized that anyone would initially categorically deny being infected, like Park Min. That is why the incubation period cannot be avoided. Suddenly the guy told Hannah that it was the incubation period in Minju. The girl looked at her classmate, but did not understand anything. Yonwu added that there were many others where they were staying. They did not feel that they were infected. That is why they believed her and searched for her. The guy added that if the girl really survived those mutant monsters, Yonwu was silent for a second, pausing to catch Hannah's attention, and she really listened carefully to the guy's words. He then said that Kang Hana should have thanked Kang Jihoon for saving her. Yan Wu explained that if he hadn't brought those soldiers to them and made a scene, the monster would never have let the girl live. Hannah's eyes suddenly grew bigger and cold sweat ran down her face. She had never thought about it before. She suddenly remembered Li Hong Mi crying and telling her friends that Kang Jihoon would come and save them. She repeated his name like a mantra. 
John Wu did not look at his classmates. He was still inside himself, thinking about what had happened over the past few days. He had an image of a huge exoskeleton that had killed so many lives. Yan Wu suddenly wondered if there were any other monsters like that out there. After all, that was the monster he saw and almost defeated. He just ran away when he was sure that John Wu could have killed him. Suddenly, the boy wondered if the monster could read minds. At that time, John Wu even felt his fear. It scared him. He was much closer to the virus than he would have liked. John Wu suddenly thought that maybe he could fight other monsters in the same way. Suddenly, his thoughts were interrupted. Hannah said that they had promised to meet here, but John Wu didn't understand, so he asked the girl what she meant. Hannah said once again that she and her classmates promised to come back here again, but the boy still did not understand anything. John Wu asked Hannah what she was talking about. Hannah asked if they really didn't know about anything. The girl said that since the signal was back to normal, they were sharing information. And then they said the safest place was Namsan Tower. John Wu was shocked by what he heard. He did not understand who the people were who said this to the girls. The girl began to explain that there were many restaurants in front of Namsan Tower, so there was plenty of food and a place to isolate oneself. Hannah added that if her classmates had not found her, she would have gone there too. She also said that Minji said she knew a safe way. Soyeon pulled out her phone and started scrolling through the class chat. She said there was nothing about it. But suddenly, Hannah said it wasn't in the class chat. Soyeon was surprised. She didn't know about any other chats. Hannah explained that there was a different time. It was created by Park Min. Suddenly, the girl said something that surprised Seo Young. Hannah said that Park Min had deliberately left them out. Meanwhile, the military entered the building with my grandmother. They evacuated her as promised. The old woman suddenly asked if she could ask them for such a thing. She said that she would now be in their debt. Suddenly, the soldier examined everyone and said that one of them was missing. The soldier asked where the guy with the duck briefcase was. The man was referring to Kang Jihoon and added that he should be brought here immediately. Another soldier went to look for the teenager. He was a little nervous. The remaining soldier began to explain that he realized that the current conditions were not very good. John Wu looked at the man. The soldier added that soon they would all go to the evacuation site. The soldier told all those present to wait a little while so that they could check everything. Suddenly, the man was interrupted. Someone said he didn't want to go. It turned out to be John Wu. He said that he did not want to go to the evacuation site. He just didn't want to go. The soldier was surprised by the teenager's statement and asked what John Wu meant. Did he really want to stay in such a dangerous place? To which Yon Wu calmly replied that he would like to stay here. The soldier said it was his job to look after him, so he could not leave Yonva here and added that they would all go with him. Suddenly, Soyeon interrupted the conversation. She said that their classmates were waiting for them all here. Yon Wu did not expect such a statement from Soyeon. He was sure that the girl would want to go to a safe place. The girl said that they had met near the Namsan Tower. She added that they had to go there right now. Soyeon was nervous. John Wu realized that the girl was lying and supported her. She said that was the case, so they couldn't go to the military. The soldier turned and looked out the window. He asked if they were really talking about the Namsan Tower. The soldier said it was dangerous, to which Soyeon replied that they were waiting for them right in front of her and they would be back soon. The soldier said he could not allow it, and then he added that he would only allow it if they did it quickly and came right back. The soldier turned to his partner and told him to go with them and report everything to the military. The man looked at Soyeon then. The girl looked back at him, a little nervous. The soldier was embarrassed. The man seemed to like Soyeon. He was ordered to do everything quickly and if it was not safe there, to call the army. Yonwu was silent, and it was clear that something was wrong with the guy. Soyeon suddenly called out to him and asked if he was okay. Janwu turned toward the sound. The girl said that she was referring to the hand of her classmate that the monster had attacked. So Young wanted to touch Yan Wu's hand and asked if he was in a lot of pain. It was a big wound. But the soldier who liked Soyeon did not let that happen. He yelled at them to stop talking and get ready. Jan Wu told Soyeon to leave. The guy added that it was where the others were. But he did not finish. Yan Wu spoke incomprehensibly in fragments. He said he was more than sure he could do it. He said he thought he could have avoided the virus and made it to Namsan Tower. So Young was shocked by what she heard. The soldier was getting irritated. He yelled at the teenagers for taking so long. The man wanted to say something else, but he didn't have time. His attention turned to something more interesting. When he turned his head, 
he saw Kang Ji-hoon entering the room with the military. His classmates were surprised and called out to him. They were worried about the boy because he hadn't been seen for a long time. Meanwhile, the guy was talking to the soldiers about something of his own, with his head down. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon saw his classmates and raised his head to look at them. He said he was going to kill all those monsters. Meanwhile, a group of teenagers and a soldier were already running toward Namsan Tower. The soldier was outraged because earlier the teenagers had said that they had to go to the entrance to the tower. And now they said we should go straight into the tower. The man asked if they wanted him dead. Soyeon apologized to her husband because she was the one who deceived him. The girl said they were worried about their classmates and asked if they could at least look inside. The soldier was angry, but if Soyeon asked him to, he could have agreed. The soldier asked indignantly why they couldn't have done it earlier. John Woo ran after everyone. He was feeling a little sick. Suddenly he began to remember something. He recalled Soyeon asking if his arm, which had been attacked by a monster, was okay. He clearly remembered that there was a wound there. It was bleeding, and there might have been a scar. But now there was nothing on my arm. Junhua was surprised by this. He was 100% sure that his wound had healed too quickly. Suddenly the soldier stopped and shouted. All the others stopped as well. They were standing in front of the stairs. Black smoke was visible at the top, as if something was burning. The company quickly began to rise to see what had happened at the top. The man commented that everything had gone up in smoke. There was a parking lot with cars in front of them that was completely on fire. He said that they wanted to kill these monsters at any cost, so they just burned everything. Yan Wu was standing behind the soldier. Suddenly he felt very sick. Everything seemed to turn green in his eyes. He realized that he could feel all the monsters more clearly now. Much better than before. It was as if he had a thermal imager in his eyes. Yan Wu said they all had to leave immediately to the military. But the soldier did not understand anything and wanted to go forward. But Yan Wu blocked his way with his hand and said that there were monsters there. Kang Ji Hoon pushed Yan Wu as if he wanted to get ahead. Suddenly, one of the monsters actually came out from behind the car and growled at the company. The guy jumped up and swung the Molotov cocktail he was holding. Kang Ji Hoon threw it at the monster and hit the target. Yan Wu shouted to his classmate. He was acting rashly. The soldier asked if the teenager was crazy. Yan Wu ran after him because Kang Ji Hoon was not going to stop. The guy was holding some kind of twigs and put them in front of the fire so that they would catch fire. After that, Kang Ji Hoon ran further and screamed. Yan Wu saw the aggression and hatred with which Kang Ji Hoon fought the monsters. He was shouting at them and throwing fire. The guy acted as if he was not afraid at all. Kang Ji Hoon shouted that they should all die. His aggression was boiling over. Now, the entire parking lot was on fire, along with all the monsters that were on it. When Kang Ji Hoon realized that he was done with it, he began to breathe loudly, shaking himself off. Meanwhile, the others had already come running to him. The company looked at his back and came to their senses after the show he put on for them. The soldier began to condemn Kang ji -hoon's actions. He asked if he had a problem with aggression. Suddenly, the boy just walked away from them in the other direction. The soldier shouted at his back and asked where he was going and called the teenager a fool. The soldier yelled at Kang ji -hoon not to go there alone. He asked that the teenager was not even going to return. Yan Wu looked at the boy and thought for a long time. He wanted to understand why Kang Ji Hoon was acting like this. The soldier said that every team would have someone like this guy, and then he added that everyone should follow him. The soldier added that he would not worry if someone died with him if they behaved like him. Meanwhile, Kana was on the phone. The girl corresponded in the same class group. She wrote that she would soon be with them. Someone asked her who else was with her, and she listed all the names of her classmates. Meanwhile, the tower was close enough. Kang Ji Hoon walked alone and was in his own thoughts. He wanted to be alone. The same memories came to mind, one after another. He remembered Li Hong Mi's body lying there, not breathing. Her beautiful face in the pool of blood. Kang Ji Hoon cursed out loud. These memories hurt him deeply. Suddenly, John Wu appeared next to the teenager. He asked what his classmate had said about wanting to kill all the infected. He looked at the floor and asked if he meant it then. Kang Ji Hoon remained silent and only looked at Yan Wu from the corner of his eye. Then, the guy repeated his question again. He wanted to get an answer. Yan Wu said he understood how Kang Ji Hoon felt and then asked if it would be better to avoid danger. To which his classmate did answer him. He said it was nonsense. Kang Ji Hoon asked if Yan Wu really thought they could just avoid it all. 
The guy looked directly at Yonva and said that only by killing each monster did they avoid danger. Yan Wu also looked at Kang Jihoon in return. His classmate asked him when he would stop running away from it, but Yan Wu reacted a little strangely. The guy went ahead and said that Kang Jihoon continued in the same spirit. And then he stopped a little and added that if he was going to go alone and get infected, he had to make sure he didn't hurt anyone. Kang Jihoon put his head down and kept walking. Then he looked up and looked at Yonwa. The guy commented out loud that these idiots were getting on his nerves. Suddenly, Kang Jihoon noticed something. He turned to see what it was. He saw a sign that led to the stairs downstairs. It read, only you can prevent forest fires. Meanwhile, the soldier talked to Soyeon. He seemed to really like the girl. They were climbing the stairs and talking about how the teenagers were from Cheonan, specifically from Shindong. The man said he did not know the place. He asked if it was a town near the terminal. Soyeon happily replied that it was true. The man said that he had friends there and often went to the sauna. Suddenly, the soldier turned to the girls and said that they were very good. Soyeon was surprised by this. It was strange for her to hear this from an adult. The man began to make excuses and explained that they were good for going to a dangerous place to meet their friends. Soyeon simply thanked him, but she felt that the soldier was flirting with her and it made her uncomfortable. The soldier wanted to add something else, but suddenly he stopped talking before he could finish. He abruptly took the weapon in his hands and aimed it somewhere to the side. Yonwu watched him do this. He didn't feel any monsters around. The man was watching the bushes. He thought he heard a rustling in the bushes. Suddenly, the soldier heard several more rustling noises. He was ready to shoot. Suddenly, a little squirrel came out from behind the bushes. Its cheeks were full. The man cursed because he was frightened by an ordinary little innocent squirrel. The soldier lowered his weapon and commented that there was no threat. The soldier looked at the teenagers and added that they could not worry and that everything was fine. Suddenly, he didn't finish. He saw So Young and Jonwa. The girl automatically hid behind the boy when she felt threatened, and John Wu in turn covered her. They did it very naturally. The soldier was upset by what he noticed. He probably thought that the teenagers were a couple, or definitely had feelings for each other. John Wu told Soyeon that he was not afraid. The girl smiled and told him not to lie. They were very nice. The soldier did not want to see it and told everyone to hurry up. John Wu told his classmates to leave. The soldier walked ahead and listened to their conversation. Soyeon said she couldn't believe they were scared of a squirrel and added that they were weak. Yonwu repeated that he was not scared at all. The soldier was thinking about this guy. He had leaked the soldier. The man recalled how he met him for the first time and how Yonwu cried like a girl. The soldier thought about it and did not understand what Soyeon saw in him. He suddenly shouted to everyone to come faster. He didn't want to listen to their sweet talk. Soyeon suddenly stopped and looked to the side. Something caught her eye. John Wu felt that the girl had stopped for some reason and decided to see why. It turned out that Soyeon wanted to take a photo. She thought the area was very beautiful. Yeon Wu asked what the girl was doing and added that the soldier told her to go faster. Soyeon couldn't take her eyes off him and began to explain. She said she just had memories of this place. The girl added that she and her friends took a photo together at this spot and said that if nothing had happened, she would have done it. Suddenly, John Wu also remembered that moment and the photo. They were standing there and Lee Hong Mi was taking pictures of them all. Everyone was so happy then. So Yan said it was very funny. She explained that back then, teenagers did everything to escape from this place, and now they have returned to it again. Soyeon added that she hoped Hannah was telling the truth and that the tower was still safe. The girl explained that she did not want to see anyone die anymore. John Wu said that everything would be fine. After all, if the others stayed there, it was a really safe place. Soyeon understood this, but something still bothered her inside. She decided to tell Yeon Wu about it. Soyeon said that she was worried that if they had rested, they would not be able to bear it all. She continued that as soon as they felt safe again and could rest, something would happen again. Suddenly, tears began to flow from Soyeon's eyes. Her voice trembled and she started to talk about her friends, but she didn't have time. John Wu interrupted her and said they would think about it when they got there. Soyeon's eyes were filled with tears. He told her to just wait for it to happen. Suddenly they heard someone cursing. It was not good. John Wu and Soyeon started running because they were lagging behind the others. The guy asked Hannah what had happened and what was ahead. Suddenly, John Wu felt a strong, piercing pain in his arm. Then he looked up and saw something that caused him pain. There was a big pile of monsters in front of them. They were all blocking the road to Namsan Tower. The zombie monsters sensed their new victims. 
Some of them woke up and growled. The soldier asked why there were so many monsters there. It was very strange. Kang Jihoon cursed. Yeon Wu heard this and turned to look at his classmate. The boy asked Yeon Wu if he had imagined it all that way, that there would be no monsters. Kang Jihoon told everyone to step aside. He was already holding a bottle of Molotov cocktail in his hands. The guy was serious. After a while, everything was on fire and the screams of monsters burning alive could be heard. After that, the company calmly climbed up the ladder. The Namsan Tower was much more visible, and the company was almost there. The soldier was sincerely surprised by this fact. He added that it was quite fast. The soldier said that they had a good look around, but the teenagers could already hear the sounds of monsters coming to them. The sounds of growling came from some room. There was a zombie monster inside with dark hair. It looked like a girl. Suddenly, Yan Wu felt something. It looked like there were some zombie monsters nearby. Soyeon noticed that her classmate was wary. The girl asked him what happened. The teenager looked at the stairs they were climbing. But they weren't wearing anything, so he said that everything was fine. Then Soyeon told him to keep up. John Wu said he was leaving. But in his mind, he was thinking about what he had just experienced. He felt that something was wrong, but he put it down to his imagination. Meanwhile, another soldier was with Huang, a homeless man. The man asked what the soldier was looking at. The soldier replied that he was looking at the condition of the cells. He explained that if you look closely, you can roughly understand when and how much they multiplied. He gave an example that if cells spent a lot of time without finding a host, their color and movements became cloudy. The soldier commented that the cages had probably been without an owner for about two days. Huang then asked if the place was safe back then. The military officer said this was true when compared to places where the virus was still active. He added that in such places there were no infected cats or rats left at all. The soldier went on to explain that when the host's body was small, the cells tried to merge again to hunt for new food. The man added that this food was usually humans. The virus was constantly looking for the energy it needed to mutate. But if they did not find food for a long time, they began to merge with each other. He clarified that back then the stronger devoured the weak. It was the law of the jungle. The military man said that the virus had developed a remarkable instinct for self-survival. Suddenly, the soldier turned to Huang and began to say something. He asked the man where the teenagers were and why they had been gone for so long. It turned out that the company still hadn't contacted them. A lot of monsters stuck to the window of the room. They were screaming and growling. Kang Jihoon was on the alert and looking around. The soldier was angry and asked where their friends were. The man looked around but saw no one. It was not clear that anyone was in the room at all. Hannah was worried and said they were supposed to be in the Namsan Tower. The soldier became even more irritated and shouted that they were in the Namsan Tower. The man said it was a joke, but he didn't have time to finish. He suddenly fell silent because he saw something very strange. A lot of zombie monsters came around the corner. They growled at the company and wanted food. The soldier shouted that these creatures were here too and told the company to follow him. The soldier told Kang Hannah to contact her classmates right away. But Hannah said she hadn't been able to contact them all this time. Suddenly, the man stopped and stopped running. He looked at the teenagers and asked if it was a joke. They all looked at him accusingly. The man recalled that they told him that their classmates were already waiting for them here. He added that if they could not contact them, the company had to go back. Yon Wu panicked. He was outraged and said they hadn't checked the other floors yet. The soldier repeated that Hannah could not contact them. He added that the teenagers should be thankful that they came here in the first place. John Wu shouted and asked if he could look on the lower floors. He promised that he would not endanger them. But the military man was silent. He was already angry with this guy, and here he was making a hero out of himself. He addressed him as the guy in the cap. The soldier told the boy to follow him and ordered the others to wait for them upstairs. They went downstairs and saw the game plaza. Yan Wu commented that they seemed to be lucky because there were no infected people here. John Wu wanted to go into the room and ask the soldier to wait until he saw what was inside. The guy told the soldier to wait for him there. Suddenly, the soldier swore. The man asked the boy if he wanted to die. Meanwhile, other classmates were waiting on the stairs and looking at Hannah's phone. Soyeon asked her classmate if she still hadn't contacted them, and then she asked who the girl had corresponded with before. Hannah was worried about something and was indignant about why Seo Young was asking. Kang Jihoon was listening to this conversation. Soyeon said she would try to call them. Something must have happened. Suddenly, 
Kang Ji-hoon spoke to the girls and told them to stay here. Soyeon asked where her classmate was going. The boy replied that he wanted to look around the top floor again. The girl told him that they had been ordered to stay put. Ji-hoon asked, a little irritated, if he looked like a soldier. He added that the girls could keep listening to the soldier as if it were something to be ashamed of. The guy finally added that he would be back soon. Hannah looked at her classmate's back, sending him off with a glance. Her expression changed. Kang Ji-hoon was annoying her for some reason, as if he was spoiling some plans. Meanwhile, the boy went upstairs and looked around the corner to inspect the room for monsters. Everything looked very clean. It was impossible that a monster had not set foot here. Kang Ji-hoon walked cautiously and looked around suspiciously, but the floor was still perfectly clean. It was as if a monster's foot had never set foot here. The guy started thinking out loud. He was looking for some cafes because he was almost out of Molotov cocktails. Kang Ji-hoon thought that unfortunately, a few bottles would not stop monsters. He realized that he needed a bigger fire. Suddenly, he remembered the sign on the way to the tower about forest fires. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon returned. Something caught his attention. The guy saw a machine gun. It was working and glowing. Kang Ji-hoon stopped and thought about what he should do. Meanwhile, Soyeon and Hannah were sitting on the stairs. The girls said that the boys had been gone for a long time and added that they shouldn't have gotten separated. And then Soyeon thought that maybe they could find the others that way. Meanwhile, Hannah sat and looked down. Soyeon said she hoped the boys would return with their classmates. Hannah was suspiciously silent, as if she was hiding something. Suddenly, the girl said that this would never happen. Soyeon didn't understand and asked her friend what she meant by owl. Hannah said they would never find their classmates because they would not be here. Soyeon was surprised. She was shocked and could not believe what she heard. The girl asked if Hannah knew where their classmates were. Soyeon immediately started running downstairs to the boys and said that she was going to call them all. She was indignant that Hannah hadn't said anything right away. But a classmate stopped Soyeon. Hannah began to speak incomprehensibly and unintelligibly. Soyeon did not understand anything and asked the girl to explain everything properly. Hannah then said that they asked not to bring others. The girl was looking at the floor. She added that they said they would not accept Li Yongwu and Kang Jihoon or even this soldier. Hannah said they were the only ones who could come to them. The girl suggested that Soyeon and I run away together right now. Meanwhile, John Wu was shocked by the military man's question. He asked why the soldier asked him this so unexpectedly. It was very strange, but the soldier started laughing at the boy. He asked if John Wu hadn't realized anything yet. He said that the boy probably thought that after the soldier's charity, he was a simple man. John Wu was shocked by what he heard. The soldier began to say that they were all trying to trick him, but the soldier said he did not believe everything they told him. The soldier said that Yon Wu said he was going to look for friends, but it was a complete lie. The teenager was even more shocked. The soldier asked if John Wu wanted to brainwash him. The soldier added that the boy behaved like this because he was afraid of a shitty life in the shelter. So he used the search for his friends to escape. John Wu was very scared. He did not understand what was happening. If the guy had wanted to run away, he would have done so long ago back at the convenience store. Suddenly, the soldier pointed the muzzle of his weapon at the boy and asked him again if he wanted to die. John Wu's eyes grew very wide and his heart began to beat faster. He did not understand what was happening. Suddenly, the teenager fell to the ground and screamed. He started telling the soldier to stop. John Wu shouted and begged the man to believe him. Suddenly, a smile appeared on the soldier's face. Yan Wu was breathing loudly and shaking his head. He heard the man asking him if he was a fool. The soldier took away the muzzle of the gun and said he was joking. Then he told Yan Wu not to act like a coward, because he was a man. He added that if he wanted to shoot Yonva, he would have done it long ago. The guy was shocked by everything that happened. The soldier asked if John Wu remembered how he had saved him the first time they met. The guy looked at the man and breathed loudly. What was the point of this joke at all? The soldier turned to him and told him to treat Yan Wu well, as if he was hinting at something specific. The man walked away laughing. John Wu thought that after such jokes, he should not have expected a good attitude. The guy was sitting on the floor and breathing loudly. He thought to himself that it wasn't funny at all, and John Wu didn't remember the man saving him at all. Suddenly, Yan Wu felt something strange. It seemed that there were monsters nearby. The guy shouted to the soldier to be careful. The man stopped and looked at Yanva. Suddenly, in front of them at the end of the room, stood a huge zombie monster with women's hair. 
It looked like an exoskeleton. The soldier saw it and was terrified. Meanwhile, Hannah took hold of So Young's hand and said that they had to get out of here, and quickly. The girl was scared and screamed for her and So Young to leave immediately. Cold sweat was pouring down her face. So Young said that Hannah waited for a while. She asked what they would do with the others. The girl said they had to leave with them all. Suddenly, the girls heard some screaming. They both turned around and realized that the sound was coming from downstairs. The sounds came from where Yanwu and the soldier were. Suddenly, Soyeon heard Hannah almost cry. She said the girl was the same way. My classmate started saying incomprehensible things again. It was as if she was trying to say something, but she couldn't. Suddenly, Hannah gave away that Soyeon was just like the others because she had betrayed her. Kana shouted at her classmate to leave, and then the girl ran and pushed Soyeon aside. The girl did not expect this and just fell to the ground. Meanwhile, the soldier and Yonwu were running away from the huge monster. They did not realize what had just happened. Suddenly he looked up and saw something that surprised him. Soyeon was sitting downstairs on the stairs. The boy shouted to her. He approached the girl and began to help her up. Jonwu asked what had happened. The guy shouted for the girl to get up because they had to run. Suddenly behind them, the company saw a huge zombie spider monster. Suddenly Soyeon realized something. Her eyes widened. She could not believe what she was seeing. Soyeon recognized that it was their classmate Gale who was the first to be infected. Suddenly a zombie monster threw its head into the company. Meanwhile, Hannah was running and coming down the stairs. The girl was breathing loudly. She could barely run. She ran to some room where her classmates were probably hiding. Hannah ran to the door of the restaurant. The girl began to move the doors of the restaurant and shouted for them to open them. Then the door opened a little, and the girl saw her classmates. Two girls looked at her through the crack. It was not clear from their faces whether they were happy to see her or not. Hannah went inside the restaurant. It was completely clean, as if the virus had never been there at all. The girl shook her head loudly. The girls looked at her very strangely, as if with some kind of disgust. Hannah was breathing loudly and intermittently, said that she thought she was going to die. The girl suddenly raised her head and started crying. She thanked the girls and looked at them. My classmates did not understand and were surprised. Suddenly, they asked why Hannah was alone. She didn't understand, so she asked them what they meant. One of her classmates asked that Hannah had promised to come with Soyeon. She asked where the girl was. Suddenly, the girl's face changed dramatically. Her eyes narrowed and became dissatisfied. Suddenly, she heard someone's voice behind her. He was surprised that the girl had really come. They were two of her other classmates, a boy and a girl. The girl with the big lips was surprised to see her. Hannah said Soyan's name and looked at her classmates. Meanwhile, the company was doing poorly. Gail growled at them and tried to eat them. The soldier began to defend the teenagers and fired his assault rifle at the zombie monster. Meanwhile, Yanwu was holding So Young and trying to put her in his arms. The teenagers screamed together and ran away from their friend's monster. The soldier was still shooting at Gail to save himself. The zombie monster started to fall. The shooting helped and the soldier shouted for them all to run until Gale came too, but they had plenty of time. The zombie monster realized that the victims were running away, so it growled and began to rise. The man turned to the side and saw something. He shouted to the teenagers that he had given them an order to run away. He asked them what they were doing. Yonwu and Soyeon were climbing up. The boy shouted for the soldier to follow them. Soyeon looked back to see if they were falling behind Gale. The zombie monster had managed to come to its senses and was running after them. It had six legs, like a spider. The teenagers had never seen such a monster before. Gale growled loudly at them. Suddenly, John Vu felt sick again. Everything was swimming before his eyes. He began to think that they would all die if they continued like this. They were running away from a zombie monster. But Yon Wu realized that they couldn't go on like this any longer, and sooner or later they would be eaten. He had to think of something. Suddenly, Yonwu remembered Li Tian's words. He went downstairs and finally whispered some advice into the boy's ear. Li Tain told him then that the next time Yonwu met a monster, he was not to run but to stand still. And then, after that, Yonwu would have realized a lot. The guy stopped then. He realized that he should have tried this advice. It was now or never. Then, the guy just stopped and stopped running or running away. The zombie monster Gale was shocked by the boy's actions. John Wu stood still even though he was scared to death of this monster. He was uncertain, but he seemed to have imagined something. He thought about the fact that when he encountered the eco-skeleton, he didn't touch it then. 
Soyeon noticed that John Woo had stopped. It scared her. She didn't understand what was happening. The guy told her that if something happened, she had to run. Mentally, John Woo began to talk to the zombie monster Gale. He put his sore arm in front of her and said that the monster had helped him. Gale stopped and did not attack them. Soyeon hid with John Woo and the boy continued to hold his hand. The girl shouted to her classmate and asked what he was doing. Soyeon thought John Woo had gone crazy. The boy continued to communicate with the monster in his mind. He said that Gale was looking at him. He told her that he was infected, just like her. He asked if the zombie monster could feel it in him. Then he wanted to ask her something. John Woo was scared to death. Cold sweat was pouring down from him. Yeon Woo took all his courage and asked the zombie monster Gale to leave. Her mouth was very close to John Woo's hand. Perhaps she wanted to bite him. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon ran up to them. He shouted at his classmates to move away. John Woo turned and saw his classmate running to save them. Suddenly, there was a loud explosion. Kang Ji Hoon lit a Molotov cocktail and smashed it on Gale. Yeon Woo saw the zombie monster start to burn. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon asked where the others were, and Yeon Woo still couldn't come to his senses. But the boy asked his classmates again why it was just the two of them. The teenagers started running and climbing the stairs to Kang Ji Hoon. The headman kept up with them and yelled again to tell them where everyone else was. Soyeon said she didn't know and suggested they get out of here first. Meanwhile, the monster Gale was melting and burning from the fire. The teenagers ran upstairs where there was no hint of any apocalypse. John Woo said he thought they were going to die. Then he began to tell me what happened. He said that the monster from the fourth floor appeared out of nowhere and the soldier ran to the lower floor. Suddenly, John Woo started talking about Hannah. He asked Soyeon if she hadn't been with her. The girl was silent. She was worried and did not know how to tell them. Soyeon couldn't think of anything better than to lie and say that Hannah ran away because of shock. John Woo asked if it was true because it sounded very strange. Soyeon then said that maybe it would be better for them to just leave the room. John Woo was surprised by his friend's answer. Soyeon explained that they didn't even know where their classmates were and they couldn't even contact them. John Woo told them what to do with Hannah. The first thing they had to do was find her. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon said that he thought he knew where Kang Hana was. Yan Wu and Seo Young were shocked by this. The boy said he had figured out where their classmates could be hiding. He added that Hana was lying to them. So Young and Yan Wu were shocked, especially the boy. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon said that the girl had been lying to them from the beginning. His face looked very angry. Meanwhile, the restaurant where the classmates were hiding was calm. The three girls gathered together and discussed what to do next. They talked about the sounds of gunfire and how scared they were. One of the girls said she hoped that others would come to them and help. She asked if there was anything new in the group chat. Hannah, meanwhile, sat alone far from the rest of her classmates. Out of the corner of her eye, she heard if there was any news from Park Min. Another classmate said that she had calmed down and that they just had to stick together. Suddenly, Someone came up to Hannah and said that there was a network here. The girl was scared. It was her classmate with glasses and freckles. He asked if he could give her the password. The girl was somewhere in her thoughts, so she didn't hear her classmate's question at first. And then she told him to give her the password. The girl began to enter it into her phone. The classmate stood silently and looked at Kang Hannah. Suddenly, the guy asked what it was like outside and added that they had been here all along. Hannah was a little annoyed and asked why the guy was asking if the answer was already obvious. It was dangerous outside. The guy gave a short, I see, and turned his head to the side. The classmate continued that it was safe here. He added that even though they were hiding, the view was incredible. He ended up saying that there were restaurants with a small supply of food. The guy said he would go see what they had left and bring the girl something. Hannah didn't even turn and look at the guy. He turned around and told her to call him if she needed anything. Hannah wondered to herself what was wrong with these losers and why they were so friendly to her. The girl looked at the group of girls. Suddenly, one of them noticed that Hannah was looking at her. Then her classmate decided to talk to the girl. She smiled sweetly at her and asked if she still had a charge on her phone. Hannah didn't understand why she needed it and asked what the girl wanted from her. The girl asked if Hannah could lend her her phone for a minute because hers had been disconnected not long ago. But Hannah said she didn't think she could share her phone. She said that her phone was also about to run out of power so she couldn't lend it to anyone. Hannah looked down and apologized to her classmate, to which she simply replied, I see, and left. This was overheard by two other classmates who were eavesdropping on the girl's conversation. The girl with the big lips turned to Hannah. 
She called out to her classmate. She looked up and saw a picture. The lipped girl looked at Hannah and held out her hand to her, hinting that she had given her her phone. But Hannah pretended not to understand and asked what the matter was. The girl said they had to check her phone. She added that otherwise they could not trust her. Hannah was outraged by what she heard. She asked why they needed to do this. But her classmate told her that if Hannah didn't agree, she could always leave at any time. And she smiled, but it was not sincere. Hannah was weak, so she was very scared. A few seconds later, her classmates were already checking her phone. They were laughing at her and saying that she had been using such stupid chats since high school. Hannah suddenly shouted that they had seen everything so they could give her the phone. But the girl with the big duck lips said she would take care of the rest of her charge on the phone. Hannah screamed that she wouldn't. A classmate reminded me that Hannah was supposed to come from Soyeon. She added that it was very strange. If Soyeon knew they were here, why hadn't she come yet? But Hannah didn't know what to say. She was even a little nervous. Suddenly, the lipped girl called out to Kiju, who was their classmate and the only guy here. The girl asked him to bring her a drink because her throat was dry. The guy left immediately. The girl sent him an airy kiss and thanked him. And when the guy left, the girl said that it was good to have friends like Kiju. Suddenly, she told Hannah that she was joking and wasn't going to do anything about her chats. And then she added that the girl had to do something for them as a thank you. She suggested that Hannah let the girls see her gallery. The lipped classmate added that she was sure there was a lot of bullshit in there. Hannah suddenly became even more worried. Her eyes widened and cold sweat dripped down her face. Hannah immediately started taking her phone away from the girl, but she wouldn't let her. She was having a lot of fun, making fun of the poor girl. She said she wouldn't steal it and opened a gallery at the same time. Suddenly, she saw something terrible. In Hannah's gallery, there was a photo of Lee Hong Mi's corpse. The lame duck opened her eyes wide. She clearly did not expect to see this on the girl's phone. She screamed and asked Hannah what she had done to poor Han Mi. Hannah screamed back. Another classmate put her hand over her mouth. Hannah began to say that it was not true and that she did not kill Han Mi. Suddenly, the nasty classmate heard a sound and turned toward him. The sound came from another room with a glass door. It was Kang Jehoon. He was knocking on the door of the restaurant and shouting for them to open it for him. Behind him were so Yeon and John Wu. The guy kept knocking and saying that he knew they were there and demanded to open the door. Kang Ji-hoon did not calm down and shouted for them to open up. John Wu, who was standing behind him, suddenly realized that he knew what he had to do. When Kang Ji-hoon came to his classmates and told them that Hannah had been cheating on them, the guy was holding a phone. Kang Ji-hoon said he knew it was wrong, but he took Han Mi's phone with him. He said that there was a class group chat where everyone was there except them. He added that Park Min did it and called him a freak. Yeon Woo and So Yeon started reading the messages from that chat. They were very surprised by what was written there. Yeon Woo read that someone had written about him and that if he came, he would definitely help them. Suddenly, that lipped girl came to the door. She told her classmates to leave because they didn't want any trouble. The girl gave them her middle finger and said she wasn't sure she could open the door and added that if they wanted to, they could try to open it from the inside. Kang Ji-hoon threatened that the girl had better open the door for them while the boy was in the mood, and then asked if she also knew about the second chat of their class, to which the lame duck replied that she didn't care about it at all right now. The girls who were standing nearby in hiding said that this was a very strong statement and praised their friend. Another classmate asked how Kang Ji-hoon had even heard about the group chat. Suddenly, the lipped classmate turned to Hannah. She yelled at her and said that she had given it away. Hannah panicked and said it wasn't true. Kiju approached them and offered to listen to Hannah first. He added that they still could not kick the girl out of here. And then he offered to let other classmates in. Suddenly, the lame duck started talking to the others through the door. She asked if they had left yet and then told them to listen carefully. The girl said that she really wasn't sure she could open the door for them. Yeon Woo said they had nowhere to go. He suggested that they leave and find another shelter. He added that it was dangerous to be here now. Suddenly, Kang Ji-hoon indignantly asked Yeon Woo what he meant. The headman asked if the boy knew that they had come here in the hope of finding shelter. Kang Ji-hoon told the girls that if they didn't open the door for them in a nice way, he would just break it down. He added that they had to fight for their lives. John Woo said he understood everything, but it was dangerous. Meanwhile, a soldier came running to them. He called his friends and they all came back to him. The soldier pointed his gun at the door and asked the teenagers what they were doing here. Then he asked if they had opened the door for them. 
Then the soldier threatened that he was counting to three so that the nasty rolling would open the door for them. The girl was afraid and opened her big mouth wide. The man pointed his assault rifle and ordered them to open the door immediately. Of course, these cowards who asserted themselves at the expense of others opened this door for them. The soldier began to scold them and called them freaks. The man asked them if they realized that they only survived because they stole food from here. The lame ducks just nodded their heads. The soldier started talking about how important it was for them to stay together now. He added that most of the monsters were here, and they had to be ready for it. The lipped classmate asked if the monsters were really there, and then pretended not to be afraid. The soldier realized that he was talking to a girl who was not very smart, so he explained that they could stay here for a hundred days, but that sooner or later they would run out of food. He told them to just stick together and follow him. Suddenly, Kiju raised his hand and nervously asked if he could ask me something. He asked how they could get out without the monsters noticing them. Kiju continued that this was the safest place to be right now. He said it would be better if they just found a store like this one. Suddenly, the lame duck poked Kiju and told him to shut up. She shouted at him and said that he had it so easy. The soldier said that everything was decided then and everyone had to get ready to leave. Meanwhile, Gubata almost beat Kija. Suddenly, two of my classmates turned to the soldier. They probably weren't ready to leave the room. The man said he had contacted the others. He added that this is why they had to return to the base. The man did not know what exactly was happening there, but citizens protested. The news showed citizens protesting. They said that the government had temporarily stopped evacuating people out of the country. At the border, there were a bunch of buses packed with people. The man said that all the survivors were now gathering at the base. He added that they had to go there before it was too late. The soldier said that they were no longer high school students or children. He said it was time for them to go home. The teenagers' faces changed dramatically at this news. They could not believe it. She said she was very happy that this moment had finally come.